here is Larry Hayes in the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. Like the song says, there's nothing like a day. And there isn't. You know. You've met all kinds, from the obvious barroom type who'll stop at nothing to sell a drink, to the Park Avenue smoothies who'll stop at nothing to get their Grecian profiles on a society page. Yeah, that's what you know about dames. So naturally, you're suspicious. Do you have to look at me as if I robbed the bank? Those are the first words you hear from this special representative of the weaker sex. Your tried and true secretary, Zelda, is gone for the day, and you're loitering around the office, minding your own bottle of bourbon, when in walks this 105 pounds of platinum-topped curve. You are my camera, aren't you? Well, I'm not the Wizard of Oz. My, my, isn't the man charming? Do you mind if I sit down? If I did... You're uh, interested in business, Mike? Oh, uh, you picked the wrong day. I just got news that I fell heir to seven Bessarabian oil wells, so let's talk pleasure, huh? My husband might object. Yeah, maybe he would if you had a husband. You're very observant, Mike. I should have worn my gloves. I'll take you the way you are. Later, perhaps. I would like to talk business first. If you say so. I do. And I also say there's a thousand dollars in my handbag. I also say that thousand is yours, Mike, if you want it. Uh, what'd you say your name was? I didn't say. Yet. Well, uh, you'd better or we're gonna find each other total strangers. There's no reason at all we should be strangers. I like you, Mike. My name is Laura Fenton. Mm-hmm. Well, look, Laura, uh, I get paid to help solve murders, not commit them. <laughs> commit murder? What's so funny? You. You have no sense of humor. Well, I do when I've got something to laugh about. Well, I nearly offered you the thousand dollars to look after a young lady from tonight until Monday morning. Mm-hmm. You still don't want the money? A grant to take care of a young lady? Well, there may be trouble. I have reason to believe Jolie's life is in danger. A Jolie? That's her name? Yes, she just arrived from Paris. I want to be absolutely certain no harm comes to her. A thousand's a lot of folding money for just uh, bodyguarding. As I said, there may be trouble. Well, Mike? Um, this uh, Jolie... (laughs) You're wondering what she looks like. Well... Let me just say she's won several beauty contests in France. Uh, man doesn't work for bread alone. Uh, you understand. I'm staying at the Phoenix Mart. If you come around tonight at, uh, say, 10 o'clock, I'll see that you and Jolie get acquainted. Well, that suits me. Oh, but uh, I don't speak a word of French. That's all right. Jolie doesn't speak a word of English. Oh, we'll get along fine, then. Your $1,000 has been this envelope. Count it if you like. Uh, yeah, thanks. I will. It's been a pleasure meeting you, Mike. I'll see you at ten. I'll be there. Ah, there's nothing like a dame. But there's nothing like a guy, either. The prospect of protecting a lovely morsel from gay Paris doesn't exactly turn your stomach. After all, you're not hired to protect the surely from yourself. So you have a late dinner, go to your place, shine up like a freshman going to his first prom, and then you drive to the Phoenix Hotel. You stand before the door of Laura Fenton's apartment, make a final tie adjustment, and ring the bell. Well, well, what have we here? Now, this is no French dish grinning at you from the doorway. This is Captain Pat Chambers, and it wouldn't take more than a crepe Suzette to knock you over. Come on in, Mike. What are you doing here, Pat? Well, I was about to ask you that very same question. Quite a coincidence, huh? All right, don't be comical. I'm here on business, I know. Laura Fenton is your client. She happens to be. Tell me more, Mike. All right, where is she? We made a date for ten tonight. Somebody beat you to it. Who? Never mind. You were about to ask me that very same question. Maybe I was. Mm. So I'm stood up, am I? Yeah, but not in the usual way. Meaning? Meaning look in the bedroom and find out. Only don't touch anything, especially the knife. We'll want that for fingerprints. So you walk in the bedroom alone and look. And you find out, all right. Laura Fenton is sprawled face down across the bed. And the knife Pat Chambers was talking about is buried in the left side of her back. You walk up close and you find out something else. You're not alone in the room. It's a dark, all right. Big and as angry sounding as a losing football coach between the halves. At first, you figure he's going for you, but when you back off, he just stands there growling. Dogs you can do without. 
And besides, you've seen all of that if you had to. Okay, Pat, I've had the 50 cent tour. What happened? I've already told you. Somebody beat you to your date. That's all I noticed. Look, Pat, this isn't so good for the home team. This afternoon, Laura Fenton walks in on me as alive as dynamo wire. Tonight, she's a dead corpse. Give me the rundown, man. Eh? Much as I can. A call came into my office around nine. The room clerk here. Somebody in the hotel complained about a dog barking. On investigation, they found her. By 9.45, I talked myself sick and come up with nothing. You walked in at 10. Now, you know as much as I do. Mm-hmm. Or maybe you know more. Well, now, look what I hold out on you, Pat. You don't want me to answer that, do you? No, not this time, but I'm not. Why should this time be different? It is. Take my word. Uh, you got a cigarette? Sure. Hey, thanks. She came to your office this afternoon. Around five. Why? Now, that's a silly question. Why does anyone? She figured someone was out to get her. Not her. Some doll who just came over from Paris. Oh, she wants you to look out for this doll. Yeah, that's right. From now until Monday morning. You gonna do it? If I can find her, yeah. I get paid for a job, I do a job. Mike. Yeah. Maybe I can help you. Laura Fenton didn't happen to mention the French doll's name, did she? Yeah, she did. Uh, the name's Jolie. What? Jolie. She didn't give it a rest. <laughs> All right. What's so funny? French doll. Jolie. Oh, that is terrific. Is it? Absolutely terrific, Mike. Uh, you should I can, I can help you find her, all right. The room clerk told me who she was. Who? We already met her. What? Inside, Mike. Huh? The poodle in the <laughs> just come over from France, and her name is Jolie. <laughs> <laughs> the young lady from Paris, and it turns out she's a French poodle. One several beauty contest on the continent. Very funny, Pat. Very, very Doesn't funny. Doesn't speak a word of English. Are you positively sidestepping, Lieutenant? <laughs> I haven't had so much fun since, since dear old Grandma <laughs> broke her leg. Why, Mike, how could you be so bitter? <laughs> yeah, the last on you, all right. But like you told Pat, somebody pays for a job, you follow through, no matter how embarrassing. So you clip the leash on and slink back across town to your place. Uh, pickles and milk go better together than you and a French poodle with a ribbon in its head. On the way up in the elevator, the nightman starts to make a crack, but has a fast change of mind when he spots the black scowl you're wearing. And no sooner do the both of you get into your apartment when Jolie pulls a fog. <sighs> Now look, fancy pants. Don't start beeping. Here, life isn't all champagne. I believe the animal is referring to me. But I'll be to introduce myself to Baldwin's name. Let him a Baldwin. Nice girl, easy girl. Let you get in here. Now that's a good dog. How did I get in? <laughs> Simple, sir. Open the door and walked in. What? It was open, was it not, Mr. Hammer? You should be more careful, sir. Other visitors might not be quite as gentle as myself. <laughs> oh, so your name's Latimer Baldwin. You wish to know more about me? I wish. I, Mr. Hammer, am a fancier. Fancier than what? That's a joke, I take it. I'm a fancier of canines, and both a breeder and a trainer. Okay, so you've gone to the dogs. <laughs> Definitely. Shall we sit down, Mr. Hammer? The sooner we settle our business, the sooner you can be alone with Jolie. Oh, you know this much name? Know it. Of course, Mr. Hammer, that's why I'm here. Will you have one of these, sir? Turkish blend. Very mine. Never mind cigarettes. What's why you're here? <laughs> Mr. Hammer, I see you're a devoted man. I like that. You do? I really do, sir. A man devoted to his work can be trusted. Now listen, Baldwin. All right, sir. Why I'm here, you say? The animals. Why I'm here. The dog, Jolie, and her most attractive mistress, Laura Fenton. God rest her soul. God rest her soul. <laughs> devoted, sir. And suspicious. I like that, too. Oh, well, you know Laura's dead. I do that. Dead, murdered, a knife protruding from her lovely, supple body. You see, I am devoted, too, Mr. Hammer. Keep talking. You're right, sir. And I will. We'll attack the very heart of the matter. 
The deceased told me to come to you on one condition. That condition being the event of her death. Go on. Should that event take place before Monday morning, I wish to present you with your instructions. Instructions? Precisely the word, Miss Fenton, used. You're sure you won't smoke? Yeah, I'm sure. Too bad. A really very mild blend. Well, Mr. Hammer, I put this to you man to man. Miss Fenton presented you with a sum of money. One thousand dollars, I believe. Are we together so far? You're carrying the ball. <laughs> Indeed I am. Very neatly put, Mr. Hammer. Oh, please, the applause turns my head. And for the sum of money, you were to take care of this young lady from tonight until Monday morning. Are we together? We're together. <laughs> In fact, Baldwin, I'm a lap ahead of you right now. Oh, yeah, if you're here to see whether or not I ducked out on the job, you're wasting your time. When I'm paid for my services, I follow through. Corpses or not. <laughs> you're an honorable man, sir. No one would deny it. But I'm not here in the capacity you mentioned. No, indeed. What capacity? I'm here, Mr. Hammer, simply to see that you follow out your instructions. And those are that you show Jolie personally. Show Jolie? Show it at home. To whom, sir? Why, to the judges, of course. Miss Fenton didn't tell you? Tell me what? My dear Mr. Hammer, this French poodle is a prized possession. Already she has won over 20 blue ribbons in Europe. Now she's entered in the annual dog show Monday at the garden. She's what? Entered in the best of all breeds class, sir. And you, Mr. Hammer, have now the signal honor of showing her... <laughs> dog laughs still on you, but you're not going to take it lying down in the manger. This, uh, Lattimore Baldwin character starts for the gate, but you're not letting him out of the kennel till you growl out a few opinions of your own. But try to understand, Mr. Hammer. It is imperative that you show Jolie. Now, uh, you understand. I'm not making a monkey out of myself at any dog show. I'll be there, I assure you, as a mentor to lend a hand to guide you. Uh, you'll be there, pal, but I won't. Sir, I quote your own words. When I'm paid for my services, I follow through. Your very own words. Okay, but I'm not eating them right now. I must be on my way. I'll let them you. Your phone, Mr. Hammer. I'm not going to... Good night, sir. I'll be seeing you at the show. <laughs> Definitely. Now, Paul, when... Uh... Yeah. This is Miss Johanna. It is. It is urgent, monsieur, that I see you immediately. Laura Fenton asked me to call. That's so? Oui. Well, for your information, sweetheart, Laura Fenton is dead. I know this. That's why I must see you right away. My life, it is in danger now. Oh, you don't say. It is no joking, madam, monsieur. Do you know where Bedford Street is? What if I do? I am at the number 205 Bedford. Can you be in here in half of an hour? I'll be in bed in half of an hour unless you tell me who this is. Oh, I'm so sorry. It is only that I have been so... Or how you say, upset. My name, Monsieur Hammer, is Jolie. Well, not only are you unhappy about one, Jolie, now it turns out there are two. Well, you parked the cane on one with the super down in the basement, and then you scoot over to Bedford Street. When you jab the doorbell at number 205, you're ready for about anything. Monsieur Hammer. Hmm. You're Jolie. Oui. Come in, please. May I take your hand? You won't be staying that long. Oh, I was hoping you would. See, I have everything prepared. Hmm? For a little bite. The sandwiches and coffee on the table over there. Oh. Nice place. I am so glad you approve. And I am so glad you arrived. Yeah? May we? If we are going to be in business together, we would be well acquainted. Is it not so? Oh, we're going in business together, huh? You're, uh, how do you say, out to do business, are you not, monsieur? Sit down, please. Some coffee? Is that the best you have to offer? It is at this minute. All right, I'll take some. Sugar? Anything but poison. Would I poison you? Would you? You make the joke with me. Now, what are you making with me, besides time? Your coffee, monsieur. I changed my mind. Uh, tell me, Jolie, uh, just how much did you plan for us to get acquainted? Oh, I do not know, monsieur. I like to allow things to go their own way, don't you? You won't change your mind again about the process? Not tonight. Well, this is, um... Uh, how you say... You say cozy. We. Oui. Oui. Or maybe just a little too cozy. Eh? Of course, the variation is interesting. Coffee instead of liquor. All right, sister, what do you want? 
Hard. Come on, all this set up, everything so, how you say, cozy. What do you want? What's the bottom line? I don't believe I follow, monsieur. Oh, sure you do. You follow just fine. In the first place, your name's not Jolie. In the second place, your accent is as phony as a ward heel has promised. And in the third place, you and I could get a lot better acquainted if that clown in the next room would keep his nose out of the door. <laughs> I liked you right away, Mr. Hammer. I think you got brains. I have, about dames like you. No guy's got brains about women. Okay, Carlos, come on in. Yes, I come. Shake hands with Carlos Rivera, Mr. Hammer. Uh, and the accent, no phony. No phony, I assure you, Mr. Hammer. Okay, no phony. Now about the pitch. You have something Carlos and I want, and we're willing to pay well for it. Gee, very well. Maybe not well enough. Well, there's no sense bargaining. I'll give you our top figure right away. It's 25000 25000 you say? Huh? That's right, and that's top. Is it a deal, senor? It might be if I knew what you wanted. Senor Hammer. Oh, wait, Carlos. You've no idea what we're talking about, I suppose? None. We're talking about the package Laura Fenton gave you in your office today. Oh, that. Give us that package and you'll have 25000 Sorry, no God. You must have it. The package wasn't in Laura's apartment. Having killed her, you know that. You said it, not us. Well, no matter who said it or who has the package, you're both wasting your time. Mr. Hammer, we're trying to do this the pleasant way. Don't push us. Who's pushing? You won't give us the package? You couldn't pay my price even if I did have it. Carlos? See? Si. Mr. Hammer is having trouble with his memory. Help him. Oh, I wouldn't try, Carlos, believe me. Knives don't go so easy into my bag, so you better not thought. Oh. You zigged Carlos when you should have zagged the Dane. You had it right smack in the back of the skull. You wake up screaming. Your head is swimming around like a fish in a ball. And your face feels as wet. Something soft, moist, and mushy is making slobbery laps against your cheek. It turns out to be Joey. That French poodle is making a St. Bernard grandstand play for a very amused audience. <laughs> Man's best friend is his poodle. Uh, never stop having fun, do you, Fat? Well, maybe it'll be even funnier when you give me the details. Um... Uh, did you bring me back to my apartment here for this priceless repartee? I found you here. Huh? Got a call from the super. He saw a guy lamb it out of here. Get him? No, but the question now is, did the guy get what he came for? What do you mean? Well, take a look around. Hey, nice mishmash. What was he looking for? How should I know? Look, Mike, I'm warning you. No holding back. I've now. got no client to protect. She's dead, so why should I hold back? All I know is, it was after a package. Which had in it? I don't know. Mike? I swear, Pat. But I do know it was worth offering me 25000 bucks for it. And that's all you do know? Oh, except for the woman. Now it comes. What woman? The one who was with the guy who shook this place down. Oh, super said he was alone. Come on, what about the dame? There's nothing more I can tell you, Pat, on it. Then who can? Maybe she can herself. So you take Pat Chambers back to 205 Bedford Street. If you're good and lucky, you figure you'll get both Carlos and the dame. But you only get the dame. And even that isn't lucky. Because the dame is dead. In just a moment, we'll return to that hammer guy. And now, back to the Mickey Spillane mystery, that hammer guy. in the same couch where you sat next to her. And the gape of terrible shock on her face tells you that her last living moment was the worst surprise of her life. When Pat turns her over, the handle of the blade points like the finger of death. Same kind of knife that killed Laura Fenton. Mm -hmm. In the same spot. What did you say this guy's name was? She called him Carlos Rivera. And Rivera's our boy, all right. Had a falling out with his partner. Figure? Figure. But over what? Could be anything from diamonds to gold. Uh, you're figuring way ahead of me, Pat. Diamonds or gold if this dame was running through the form. Well, you know who she is. Never forget a face I see on a bulletin board. Her name's Rita Shearer. She's wanted on a smuggling rap. So her partner got her first. He can have her now. Well, Mike, there's nothing else you can do. Oh, I don't know. And what's that supposed to mean? That show at the garden, Monday. What about it? I'm going to be there, Pat, to uh, see a dog about a killer. <laughs> Oh, 
So Monday, you and Jolie turn up at the garden and meet Latimer Baldwin. For a couple of hours, you don't go upstairs to the floor with a four-legged eyebrow put on the dog. You stay downstairs in the basement where the kennels were. Downstairs, the place is all the sound effects of a dyspeptic cat's nightmare. It really isn't too bad, Mr. Hammer, once you're used to it. Once I get used to it. Once you walk out on that floor upstairs, a great change will come over you. Now, look, Baldwin, I'm no dog lover, believe me. You'll become one. And you'll be very proud of Jolie when she wins. Pretty sure she's going to win, huh? Can't lose her. She is gone. Tell me just one thing. Why do they trim her that way with those crazy pom poms? Uh, uh, I'll bet the dog doesn't approve. <laughs> I see you're becoming sentimental over her already. Uh huh. Just embarrassed for it. It'll be different upstairs. Wait and see. I'll be watching you from the stairs. And I guarantee you, sir, you'll be as proud as a peacock. I don't think you'll be watching me, Baldwin. I beg your pardon? What were you doing before? Before? When you uh, sent me upstairs to find the papers for Jolie's entrance. I? Why, you know perfectly well. I took her for a stroll. Yeah, but why? Why? Well, because she was kiddish. You could see that. I could see you were, too, Baldwin. But you were much easier when you brought her back, weren't you? Sure, I failed to follow you. Yeah, but I didn't fail to follow you when you went for that walk. Huh? And I saw you change the dog's collar, too. And what she's wearing now is worth only a couple of bucks. But what, what about the one you took off? How much was that worth, Baldwin? Fifty thousand? Hundred? More? Mr. Hammer, you're a gentleman of discernment. Baldwin, you're a stinking killer. But that shouldn't preclude us from coming to an understanding. Like what? The diamonds in the car are worth in the neighborhood of two hundred thousand. I'm sure we can make some satisfactory arrangements. Uh, what about Carlos? Where does he come in? He went out. His body will never be found. Took care of all three of your friends, didn't you? Necessary, you know. No, I didn't. No. They weren't friends at all. They all wanted to cheat me out of my share. Well, Mr. Hammer, what do you say to a very generous offer on my part? Uh, I'd like to accept, but uh, what will Jolie think of me? The alternative, then, is very nasty for you. Perhaps not. I can't think of any other alternative. Does this stimulate your thinking, sir? Are you trying to kid, Baldwin? You wouldn't use that here. I'm not kidding in the slightest sense. The shot will turn this place into an even matter bedlam. My escape under such conditions will not be too difficult. I really think you're going to try it, huh? No doubt about it, sir. I'm going to try it right here in... It's Jolie thinking of early season to Baldwin's leg. You grab his gun fast and then squat him with it across the jaw. Baldwin goes down like a sack of dog wheat. Pat Chambers comes in through the crowd. He looks down at Baldwin while you give the Legion of Honor embrace to one of France's greatest heroines. You were right, Mike. What am I ever wrong? Ah, it's a nice girl. Tonight it's steak for dinner. Nice, nice girl. So all of a sudden you're a dog lover. Now look, Pat, this happens to be the girl of my dream. All right, all right. Come on down to the office, make out your report, and then you two can be alone. Uh, you'll have to wait for the report, Pat. Why? Well, uh, Jolie and I have a date upstairs on the floor. And, pal, a week on the show. So you show him, all right. Jolie struts around the judging ring as proud as a Republican last election day. And you? Well, you're not exactly heavy-footed yourself. Baldwin was right about one thing. The big change has come over you. Yep, that little hound has more savoir faire in her than ten queens. And when the judge hands you the blue ribbon, you look down at Jolie and you think, oh, yes, sir, there certainly is something about a dame. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Bernadine, anything wrong? You sound almost human. It's not Bernadine, Sam. It's me, Effie. Eff. But I'll tell Bernadine about the compliment. How are things? Well, uh, I've made out as best I could. I don't want to, don't want you to think that I begrudged you a vacation. After all, you have worked hard. You, uh, did deserve it. Sam Spade, is that all 
all you have to say to me. I am not putting the blame on you. After all, it is a state law, so I can hardly accuse you of letting me down at a time when I needed you most. You might at least ask me if I had a good time. I'm sorry if your conscience bothered you. Oh, well, it didn't. I had a divine time, and I met all sorts of interesting people. Mostly men. You don't say. What else? Well, it was this desert ranch, you know, with a lot of uh, buttes around. You uh, mentioned those. No, Sam. No, no, no. They're the result of erosion. Those outdoor types, they go to pieces. Sam, are you pulling my leg? Not over the phone, Abby, but stay where you are. I'll be right down to look at your snapshots. And when you have the time, I'll dictate my report on the missing news hawk caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Wild Root Cream Oil, that's the famous name to remember, men, next time you buy hair tonic. And look what Wild Root Cream Oil does for you. It grooms your hair neatly and naturally. Wild Root Cream Oil also relieves dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Yes, men, Wild Root Cream Oil is your shortcut to really handsome hair. So be smart. First chance you get, get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all. In the adventures of Sam Spade. Just outside of Canab on Virgin River. Canab, the Pearl of the West. Uh huh. And did I mention the buttes? Oh, well, they're very interesting. The uh, result of erosion. Yes. And it's authentic, too. Say Hamlin's Ranch. You, uh, mean a working ranch? Yes, you see, that way you get into the spirit. Mm -hmm. My job was to feed the chickens. And that's how I met him. <sighs> One of the buttes? Oh, Sam, he's a very cultured gentleman. Culture smosher. What's he do for a living? He, well, he's sure stammering. You don't say. What's his name? Charlie Shank. Charlie Shank? He's the founder of the Shank Institute of Artic Ar Articulative Correction, which Art I should learn. Articulative Correction. Where is this institute? Oh, I have the address here. Um, General Delivery, Butte, Montana. Mm hmm You're sure you didn't help him break parole, Abby? Oh, no, oh, no, no. We just went on long walks together. Where to? Oh, different points of interest. Like, uh, like Wolf Canyon. Check is. Uh-huh. He invited me on this camping ship, a trip. Honorable, of course. Mm. But I couldn't go on account of my sunburn. Oh, oh. an awful, awful. Oh, I still got that. it, you see. And then, then he went back to Butte. He had to leave in such a hurry, he couldn't even say goodbye. Wow. It was a pity, too, because an old friend he hadn't seen in years came looking for him, just a few minutes later. With a warrant? No. Well, he was an attendant in a nearby hospital. Mental? Oh, yes. Very intelligent. <laughs> he read me some of his poetry. Maybe you've heard it. Um, a loaf of bread, a jug of wine, and thou. Oh, wait a minute. Isn't that the ruby out of Omer Cayenne that was written by a guy named Fitzgerald? Well, of course. That's his pen name. Quite a penman. Yes, but he paid his debt to society. And the other time it was a bad beef. Oh, no. He told me all about yes. it. He cried on my shoulder afterwards. Sweetheart, when you make a mistake, it's a beaut. Sam, nothing happened. Well, I'm glad he cured you of stammering, anyhow. <clears throat> Ready? Oh, yeah. I've got a brand Work, new you notebook. you know. Life goes on. I've got a brand new notebook, Sam. I'll just turn over a new leaf. Not a bad idea, dear. <laughs> Uh, date, uh, July 18 to Mr. Alex M. Youngblood, uh, mm, try that again. Mr. Alex M. Youngblood, P.O., Box 317, San Francisco, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596, dear Mr. Youngblood, I need a vacation myself. You need Charlie Shank. <sighs> sounds hard. Fortunately, until I met you, my only experience with any of the men and women who make your newspaper run had been with one of your corner newsboys who shortchanged me two times within as many days. I have not read your rag since. But your name looked imposing, and so did the $300 check upon which you had written it. Per your instructions, promptly at 4 p.m. on the 15th inst, I mushed through the litter of your city room toward a door marked A.M. Youngblood, publisher, managing editor, and city editor. 
I wondered if you were ambitious, frugal, or three men. I did not know that you had good taste until I saw the trim, 20-ish, and toothsome secretary in your outer office. Hello. You're new here, aren't you? Uh, well, I'm not exactly here. I'm just here to see Mr. Youngblood. Oh. The name is Spade. Samuel Spade? Sam, except for my most intimate friend. <laughs> well, my advice to you, Sam, is to be the hasty retreat. He's in a foul mood. Oh? Uh, why? Is he blind or older than he feels? I refer, of course, to your spectacular charm, Miss, uh, if I may call you Miss. Please, this is neither the time nor the place. My name is Phyllis Watson, and my phone number is in the directory, if you're really interested. I could be. Thank you. And if a man answers, tell him you're my French teacher. We. Oui. <laughs> you better go in now. If you're late to an appointment with him, you're through. Do uh, you have any more words of wisdom? No, but I hope you can do something to improve his state of mind. He's been awful lately. Good luck, Sam. Uh, thank you, Phyllis Watson. Come in, come in. Yeah. One minute past four. You must be Mr. Spade. That's right. You're almost late. Sit down, Spade. Cigar? Uh, no, thanks. Well, don't expect me to offer a drink. You aren't a drinker, I hope. You don't listen to the radio, do you? Well, you'll not drink in this office. Nothing here but a cooler filled with water from a clean, gurgling, laughing mountain stream. You sound like a reformed drunk, Mr. Youngblood. What's that? Well, it was a good many years ago. If you don't mind, I'll just paste up the weather report for my morning edition before we talk. Oh, you do that too, huh? Yes, obviously. And with good reasons. I remind myself that I was once a copy boy, and I find it a splendid way to, uh, at least once each day, to lower myself to the level of the working man. There we are. Very hot in Phoenix, I see. Mm-hmm. Uh, just what do you want a detective for, Mr. Youngblood? I was coming to that, Mr. Spade. Sorry. Now, uh, well, first let me warn you that your assignment is a highly confidential one. They all are. In this case, a man's life may be at stake. Mm -hmm. The situation... My newspaper, at my order and under my guidance, has launched a campaign against crime. Not aimed at the petty criminal, but at the easy living leeches at the controls of the rackets. The hoods and bankers' clothing. The mansion house parasites who direct the pickpockets, the second story men, the housebreakers, who gamble away yeah, half a million uh, dollars a year easy. and uh, pay income tax. Yeah, yeah, don't go to pieces. Of that uh, yes, I understand, I understand. Uh, you're after the boys on the safer side of the fences. Uh, uh. Nicely put, Spade. Yes, yes thank you. Well, the long and short of it is this. The author of the expose series, Ray McCulley, my top crime reporter, has been missing for two days. I want you to find him. What makes you think he's still alive? Good heavens, Spade. Why must you suggest that he isn't? Because if I were a mansion housed parasite in danger of being unhoused by a newshawk, I'd see said newshawk standing in a cement block on the bottom of the bay. I will accept that only when no stone has been left unturned. Every straw and every haystack has been searched. Every... Uh, nook and cranny? Uh, yes. Sounds as though you need at least one police force, Mr. Youngblood. Now, why don't no, you... No, just, uh... no, no, no. Impossible. We've already had a brush with the police over the expose. I'll not be dictated to at this stage of the game. I started this investigation, and I'll finish it alone. Well, it's a pretty big order, Mr. Youngblood, but uh, times are tough. I'll see what I can do. Good. I hereby turn over to you all the resources and power of this, my newspaper. When one of my reporters is in trouble or danger, sir, I will spend every penny of my fortune, if necessary, to deliver aid and succor to his side. <laughs> You then gave me Ray McCulley's expose stories to date. I saw why you, his family and friends, and his creditors could have been worried about him. They were hot. One followed a stolen car from the time of the heist through the alteration of the body color, tire brands, license number, motor serial number, by the time it was shoved onto a used car lot. They named names all the way through. And another did the same to the firm of Otter, Badger, and Mole, Furians and alleged manufacturers of coats from clouted pelts. Ray McCulley had dropped out of sight right after that story had been published. So I left your office hoping that I'd reached the address of Otter, Badger, and Moe before closing time. I did. The plushy showroom was occupied by a dozen attractive fur-bearing models, female, but wax. The live models, male, were wearing padded shoulders, pointed shoes, and coats tailored for underarm artillery. 
They would have looked more natural at Madame Fassard's waxworks, Bertram the burglar section. Hey, oh, hey, what'll that be? Something for a little woman? Uh, where do I find Mr. Otter? Are you the law? Uh, Leo sent me. He's in his office. Come on. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't crowd me. You say you want to see the boss? On business. Stop nudging me with a rod. In there, hey, move. Okay, okay. Hey, your boss. Yes, Woody? Here's a Joe here to see you. Leo sent him. Well, nudge him in, Woody. No nudging, Woody. Well, well, well. So Leo's sending a man to see me. I wonder why. If you'll uh, comb this character here out of my hair, I'll try and tell you. Sit down, Woody. Mm. Thanks. You're new in town. Uh, yeah, that's why Leo sent me. A local muckraker named Ray McCulley interviewed you. He also interviewed Leo, but it didn't get printed yet. Uh, Leo wants to find him. So do I. How can I help? Well, uh, he walked out of here, went to his hotel, wrote the story, and mailed it in. That's the last anybody's seen of him. Uh, Leo was just sort of hoping that you'd already taken care of him. Not yet. That's all I wanted to know. Thanks. Just a moment. Yeah? Leo sending you out alone? Why not? That's a tough boy, that McCulley. He's got plenty of protection. That's what you need. What kind of protection? Go along with him, Woody. Who, me? You're Woody, aren't you? Now, look, uh, look, Mr. Otter. I don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth, but the way I see it, this is a, a lone wolf type caper. Hey, what's the matter? Hey, you think I'm too good for you? Well, Woody, I wouldn't say that. Good. It's settled then. Take care of him, Woody, and don't mix it up with any of Leo's boys. If he's out to get that rat McCulley, he's our friend. <laughs> I was beginning to wonder who Leo was. I'd grabbed the name off a calendar on the wall, Leo's Van and Story. I didn't know whether he was the Leo Mr. Otter didn't like, and I hoped I wouldn't find out. The best way I could think to keep from finding out was to shake Woody. On the way uptown, I walked him past four police stations. Crossing Market Street, I pushed him straight into the arms of a traffic cop who begged his pardon and let me off with a warning. At the Blue Bottle Bar and Grill, I gave Joe, the bartender, the Mickey Finn sign, but Woody liked it. He ordered another. And he said he knew a place on Columbus where the drinks were even better. It was called Leo's Place. I wondered if that meant anything. Hey, oh, hey. Uh, who, me, huh? I want you a drink. Don't you like this joint? Yeah, sure, it's fine. Uh, we're not getting anywhere, though. Do you really take your work serious? Me, when I go gun for somebody, I go where I'm least likely to succeed. You live long here. Yeah. Uh, Woody, what do you know about this guy, uh, McCulley? You hear the boss. He says he's a rat. Yeah, but he said he's got plenty of protection. Who's furnishing it? Well, you see, there's a... Boy, oh boy. Look at what just walk in. I looked. What I saw was not disappointing. She was wearing a skin-tight black satin with a plunging neckline and a new look only in places where it didn't matter. But she still looked enough like your secretary, Phyllis Watson, to be out of place in Leo's place. She didn't stay there long. She made a beeline through the kitchen to the rear exit. I made a beeline right after her. Woody was breathing down my neck as I started up the rickety outside stairway at the back of the building. I uh, stopped the landing and turned around to face him. See you later, Woody. I didn't wait to see if he made it all the way to the bottom of the stairs. I was more interested in what was going on at the top. The door had opened and Phyllis stepped inside. The man who let her in looked like Ray McCulley. Who are you? Well, the name is Spade. I don't know that name. Your boss hired me to find you. Private Dick. Yeah. Can I uh, talk to you for a minute? Sure. Put your hands behind your neck and walk up slow. Okay. All right. Go inside. Well, what's the matter? You're not acting glad to see me. This is the guy, fellas. Yes. Alex hired him this afternoon. There, you see. Now, uh, what do you want me to tell young blood? You're not going to tell anybody anything. Oh. It caught me right behind the ear. The last thing I saw was that plunging neckline as Phyllis rushed forward. I didn't know whether she was rushing to my rescue or to get in a few licks of her own. Five seconds later, I didn't care. The design of a linoleum slammed up at me. I had just time to wonder why, of all the people who were looking for Ray McCulley, I had to find him. Then I was out. Boing. Maced for my pains. The makers.
makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked Primus and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the missing news hawk caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I was lying on the floor in a room with nothing in it but a sink, an army cot, a square of dirty linoleum, and a body. I staggered to my feet, ran some cold water over my head, and took a closer look. It was Ray McCulley. He was a very dead, crusading reporter. He'd been stabbed clean through with a long-bladed kitchen knife. It's set on the handle, property of Leo's place. I went through his pockets. And his wallet, a press card, a police card, union card, and ten genuine, crisp, new thousand-dollar bills. That gave me a line on the killer. He was crazy. So was I. I left it on him, too. Folded up in his vest pocket, I found two newspaper clippings, one from the Chronicle and one from your paper. Both weather reports for the same date. It was very hot in Phoenix, according to both papers. But according to your weather report, the temperature in Needles, California, was 135 degrees. That needled me. So did the slip of paper I found on his shoe. The number nine and a date had been stamped on it with a rubber stamp. The date was the same as that of the weather reports. I turned it over. It said, Ruthie's Booth, Manson Bowling Alley. Don't tell me. Yes, you're the cigar type. Corona is a panicelli. Uh, thanks. I'm just shopping. Uh, I got a nice line of notion. So have I. Uh, no, I mean the dolls, the Hollywood dolls. You know, for the bed, only a dollar plus tax. Very reasonable. Say, what's on your mind? Uh, Leo sent me. Oh. Are you going to collect the slips hereafter? Well, uh, not tonight. You see, I'm uh, sort of a troubleshooter. Leo's uh, checking up on some of the numbers that didn't come out right. Listen, I'll tell him to his face. I don't want any part of those wrong numbers. They're scary. Nuts. Who bought this one? Let me see. Oh, last Thursday. Oh, number nine. How can I forget? He put $500. And honest, if he's been around once, he's been around a hundred times to see if it paid off. Did it? What's his name? Mr. Spinelli. He buys a slip every day. And if you ask me, he's learned a system. Because he's been winning, you know. Dimes and then a dollar and then five dollars. And then when he come in with 500 on number nine, I literally dropped dead. Did it win? Where does he live? Oh, it did. Wait, I'll look on the sheet. Hey, somebody else was in just this afternoon. Give me that address. Hurry up, will you? It's right around the corner on Manson, 810. Say, maybe that's his system, 8 and 1. Don't that add up to 9? Hey, what's the matter? Where are you going to sit your room? Please, come back later. Tomorrow... Next week. Are you Mrs. Spinelli? Yes, please. I had so much trouble. Is your husband home? Oh, my poor man. They take him away. He's dead. Oh, I'm sorry. How did it happen? Who are you? I'm a detective. Maybe I can help you. May I come in? All right. Come on. Quite a while to gain her confidence, and after that it took still quite a while to piece together the grief sickened grumble of words that poured out of her. When I got it down in the form of a statement, I asked her to read it over. Item. Statement by Mrs. Arturo Spinelli. All the time he played those numbers. 
I told him they're just a bunch of gangsters. They don't let you win. Then he met this man, Macaulay, a writer for the newspaper. My husband says this man shows him how to win. He wins and wins. Then he goes to bank and takes out all our savings. I begged for him not to do it. But no, no, you are greedy. And this Macaulay poisoned his mind. Sure, he won. He brought the money home in his hand. Ten thousand dollars. I don't want it. I'm scared. I took it while he was sleeping with wine and gave it to the men. I tell him all I want is the five hundred. He tried to tell me we do good. We help catch the big gangsters. I say we don't want to do so good we get murdered in our bed. So he says, okay. But if I change mine, here is address. I don't change my mind. Because already my husband, he is dead. At home. Stand. No. I don't change my mind. She signed it, and I left her alone with her grief. I wasn't working for you anymore, Mr. Youngblood. You hired me to find your reporter, and I had. And I wished I hadn't. The rest of it I did for myself. You weren't in your office when I got there, but Phyllis was. I found her behind the city desk in the act of dropping tomorrow morning's weather report into the slot. I grabbed her out of her hand. What? Oh, it's you. Where's your boss? At home, I guess. We'll talk in his office. Come on. Sam, uh, I can explain how I have You're going to be... explain plenty before I'm finished with you. Sit down. Oh, you... I have to be so rough. What's the matter with you? Plenty. I'm stupid. I was stupid to take this job, and I was stupid to play it cagey with you. I should have beaten the story out of you before the trouble started. It's a little late in the day now, but not too late to send you up on McCulley's murder. Oh, you're insane. Ray McCulley was... I'm the only one who ever tried to help and you. And I'm the only one who can place you in that room, not ten minutes before the murder. I told you I can explain Stop why... Stop trying to save your own skin. Spinelli was only one of a half million poor dumb yucks that lose their nickels and dimes and dollars every day in the policy racket. Only he had the bad luck to win. There won't be any more lucky dead people like him if I have to make a patsy out of you to stop it. It won't stop it. Nothing will. Ray talked big and brave like you. Now he's dead. Yeah, with 10,000 bucks dirty money in his wallet. I won't let you say things like that. Ray was an honest reporter. Too honest. He thought young blood meant what he said about that cleanup campaign. Yeah, he did. He wanted to run this town by himself, clean up his competition. When Ray started collecting material on the numbers racket, he still thought young blood was on the level. But that was before he stumbled onto the thing about the weather report. Yeah, yeah, that was a new one. The old Dutch Schultz mob used to add up the stock market quotations. If they cheated, they knew their customers weren't good enough at arithmetic to prove it. But who knows how hot it is in Phoenix unless they live there. I don't know what you're talking about. Listen. That's how the number game works, sweetheart. The suckers pick a number from one to ten, see? The operators tally up the slips, and the least popular for that day has to win. The weather report doesn't have to pass through the copy desk, and with young blood pasting it up with a few strategic corrections, it was easy to make their winners look as if they were on the level. Oh. But, of course, you had no way of knowing that. You only watched them do it day after day. You know, I couldn't understand why he did those things. It's, it seemed silly falsifying a weather report, but it didn't seem as if it could do any harm. What did you meet McCulley for? To get your cut of the ten grand Spinelli was killed for? How dare you? I went there to warn him about Who you. Who killed him? I don't know. You're lying. All right, I'm lying. But I can prove that Ray was on the level. I've got the proof right here. The whole story he wrote on the numbers racket, even naming Youngblood as the head of it, his own publisher. I went there to get it. I was going to take it to another newspaper. Why didn't you? I can't tell you that. You don't have to. Mrs. Spinelli was confused, grief crazed. She had to put the blame on somebody, and when she did, she got her revenge the only way she thought she could. She may have been right about that, but she killed the wrong man. Why didn't you tell me you knew who killed Ray? I wanted to give you a chance to tell me yourself. I'm glad you didn't. And that, Mr. Youngblood, is the crop. I'm sure you appreciate the fact that I gave the double scoop to your paper. Like uh, Mrs. Spinelli, I have my own ideas of vengeance. Besides, it may up your circulation a little, and you can certainly use a little extra money for your defense. Uh, by the way, who's Leo? Uh, period, end of report. But, Sam. Yes, Evie. 
I thought Mrs. Spinelli killed Ray McCulley. The vacation helped. You're absolutely correct. Mrs. Spinelli killed Mr. McCulley, if you'll pardon the expression. But why did she kill her husband? I was wrong. The vacation didn't help. You mean she didn't? She killed McCulley to avenge the murder of her husband. You mean Mr. McCulley killed Mr. Spinelli? Effie, stop. I'll go mad. Oh, you need a vacation, Sam. Look, type that up. The clatter of the keys may stimulate you to further cerebral activity. I beg your pardon, Sam? Brain work. Now, shoot. Oh, brain work. Oh, you know best. Tonight, men, or first thing tomorrow, get Wild Root Cream Oil and see what wonders it does for your hair. Notice how easy it is to apply. Notice what a neat, natural job it does of grooming your hair. Notice, too, how effectively Wild Root Cream Oil relieves annoying dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. No getting around it. Once you try it, you'll never be without it. So tonight, or first thing tomorrow, call at your drug or toilet goods counter for Wild Root Cream Oil. Get the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men... Who put good grooming first? Well, here it is, Sam. And you were absolutely right. The typing cleared my mind. It's all clear now except for one thing. Well, let's clear that up right away. Why did Mrs. Spinelli kill her husband? She did not kill her husband. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant, why did Mr. McCulley kill Mr. Spinelli? Kelly did not kill Spinelli. Who's Kelly? McCulley. McCulley's real name was Kelly? Now, let's start all over again. Disregard everything we said up until now. Make your mind a complete blank. All right, Sam. In the first place, McCulley did not kill Spinelli. That's what I said. It was his wife, wasn't it? Now, wasn't it, Sam? Oh, stop teasing me. Hey, why do you look at me like that? Effie, Mr. Spinelli was killed by one of the policy racket hoods to get back the ten grand he won on the numbers game. Then how did the money get into Kelly's pocket? McCulley's. Why do you insist on using his alias, Sam? Effie, Effie, that was a tip of the slung. I, I mean, look, Mrs. Spinelli took it to him because she was afraid her husband might be killed for then it. why didn't they take the money when they killed him? Because Mrs. Spinelli had already taken it. Then she did kill him. Go home, Effie. Oh, I see. I'm sorry I'm so irritable to you, but I, I thought it... Well, it's been so long since oh, I've no, been here, you know, Sam. Angel, and I... Angel, you're just tired. Vacations have a habit of doing that to you. After a week or two in the office, you'll be all rested up again. I'll take it. You easy. act as though you thought my mind were affected. Come here. Come Sam, on. now don't. My sunburn. Yeah. Oh, it hurts. Hmm. It's nice to have you back. You look good, too. All tanned and healthy. You're rough. It's great. I think my nose is feeling. Well, don't pick at it. <laughs> Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Speed are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spears' absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with Susan Lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Are you baldy? Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The 
sunlight that drifts into police headquarters has a different texture to it. That's because it touches concrete and iron grillwork before it finally breaks through the dust in the windows. That's why I supplement it with my own personal sunshine. His name is Sergeant Tataglia, and he never knocks, even on Thursday. And sometimes he brings company. This man's name is Harry Dean, Danny. Yeah, close the door, Tataglia. Okay, okay, you can stay. Just close the door. Sit down, Mr. Dean, over there. Thank you. You're the man I want to see? Well, that all depends. Uh, what's in your mind? I'm 46 years old, Mr. Clover. In four months, I'll be 47 in August. I live at 903 Hillcrest Road in Queens. All right. Once when I was six and a half, I stole a peppermint stick. I got caught. Well, I mean, I gave myself up to my mother. Hey, Danny, what is it? Go on, this? Mr. Dean. Well, I wanted to draw a parallel. Two days ago, I stole $20,000. And you're giving yourself up to me. Well, it was for my wife. You you understand that, don't you? Just that you stole $20,000, that's all. Yes, well, here's Marsha's photograph. That's my wife's photograph. Yeah? She's going on 42. No, she is 40, going on 43 now. Not very attractive anymore, I know that. She, she looks like what she is. After 20 years of me... Bank teller. You stole the money from the bank? Well, I stole $20,000 from the Charles Street National Bank where I work because I was told I could have Marsha back for that amount of money. Are you trying to tell me that Marsha was kidnapped? Yeah, but don't you see? All right, uh, go on. Well, I came home yesterday and Marsha wasn't there. About 9 o'clock, I got a phone call. A man said Marsha wouldn't be hurt if I brought the money. Then he put Marsha on the phone. And she was being brave, I know, but I... See, I could tell she was frightened, terrified. She pleaded with me. Whenever you can talk, Mr. Dean. I can talk? A man has a right to feel about his wife. The man said to bring the money, go to that summer resort, far Rockaway, register at the Idle Wild Arms, mm -hmm. put the money in the bottom bureau drawer and leave. But I did it, and they lied to me. Marcia hasn't come home. They've done so to her. I know. To Taglia. Uh, yeah, Danny. Nothing to the newspapers about this. I'll get this picture of Mrs. Dean on the wires and then go up to Far Rockaway. Okay, Danny. What happens to me, Mr. Clover? What you expected, you go to jail. There was no protest in him as Tartaglia led him away, only a tired, empty dejection that had stamped its shape on his body, stained his eyes with the color of despair. And when the room was empty of him, a question remained. Why had it been done to an ordinary man, an ordinary bank clerk? The answer was ordinary. The man was in a place where money flowed and teased. The right pressure, and for as long as was needed, the flow could be diverted. A loved woman can be that pressure even for an ordinary man like Harry Dean. At Far Rockaway, the beach is littered with the debris of those who have escaped for a day, for a weekend. The surf washes against the feet of a child and the child screams. The mocking sun touches a woman's shoulders and the woman giggles. The man lying buried in the sand next to her twinkles his toes. And strung behind them like a munch-rented backdrop is a string of leering resort hotels with screen porches and empty rockers. The Idle Wild Arms was one of these. Glory, hallelujah, a guest. Hey, give me room, boy. I've got a welcoming speech for you. Uh, just a minute, I... Don't I've... interrupt, boy. It's the off-season, and I got to rehearse it on somebody, and you're just as good a guinea pig as anybody, aren't you, boy? <laughs> uh, look, I... You're, you're, you're interrupting, boy. I'm going to have trouble with you. You may at that, <laughs> kid. I'm from the police. The idle wild arms welcomes you with open arms, and I promise you ain't going to be idle, but you might be wild. <laughs> Did I hear you, boy? You're from the police? It finally penetrated, huh, Don? Oh, look, boy, I got nothing to do with this crumb joint. They hire me to spread sunshine and disc clerk for a lousy sawback a week with meals. Meals. <laughs> Harry Dean, what did you do for him? Wipe their noses a bright... Uh, what? Harry Dean? I did nothing for him except show him to his room. 
He didn't react to my jollity, so I fluffed him. Which room? 6A. I guess it nauseated him because an hour later he checked out. That I had to do, too. Check out the crumble mouth. Where is it? The room. I told you. Outside. Oh, 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 you you mean you mean 6A. Right down the hall, boy. It says Harry Dean you want, not me, eh? Huh? Uh, not you. <laughs> For a minute there, you had me on my knees. Don't let me keep you, boy. I gotta rehearse my act. Glory, hallelujah. 5A. Hmm. 6A. Oh, what are you doing in my room? Get out. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought this room was unoccupied. If I Are th- you part of the recreation program? Get out before I call for help. I'm from the police. I want to search this room. Oh? Just can't stop you, then. No. That bureau, do you have your things in it? Not yet. I only just got in a little while ago. Haven't had time to unpack. What's in there? A mouse? A time bomb? Maybe money. Maybe $20,000 worth of money. $20,000? I wish I'd known. I could have got to it first. Nothing. You say you've been here only a little while. Just long enough to open a window and get a whiff of ocean air, maybe an hour or two. Did I do wrong? Who are you? What's your name? Edith Keller. I'm a stenographer. Got two weeks vacation, so I came here for peace and quiet. So far, it's not quiet. Take a look at this picture, Miss Keller. Have you ever seen this woman? Yeah, I saw her. Hmm? She did just what you did. I barely got my body into the room. There was a knock on the door. This woman, this woman here, says she left something in the bureau, bottom drawer. She took it out. I wish I'd known. 20,000. Was there anyone with her? Yeah, a man. He stayed in the hall. I didn't get a look at him. Just heard his voice. Gee. Gosh. I know, Miss Keller. $20,000. She smiled at me. It was the kind of a smile that had regret in it. So I returned in kind. Then she looked toward the door, so I left. On the ride back to Manhattan, I jotted it all down in my mind. It was simple. Marsha Dean was never kidnapped. Marsha Dean had made a thief out of her husband. Marsha Dean, 42, going on 43, had run away with another man. The money her husband had stolen would finance the production. It meant starting all over again, back to routine. Find out about Marsha Dean. Climb concrete steps. Ring doorbells and call Marsha Dean's neighbors. I know you. You're a policeman. I am? If you're not, you just stole a police car. Come on in. Thanks. But this won't take long, Mrs. Uh... Mrs. Graham. This way in the parlor. That's the mister sitting there in the rocker behind the newspaper. Graham? Uh, Graham, this is a policeman come to call. Mm-hmm. Just... What's your name, mister? Uh, Clover. Danny Clover. Graham, his name is Danny Clover. Mm-hmm. Once Graham saw a picture in a magazine picture of a man in a rocking chair who was retiring on $200 a month. Graham sent in the coupon. Now it's 15 years later. Graham sits in a rocking chair just like the picture. Don't you, Graham? Miss Graham, I wonder if you can give me some information about a neighbor of yours. Comings and goings of a neighbor? I can give you comings and goings of three houses on either side of me on this side of the block. Across the street, further down than that. I see. I stand at that window and a snoop. Oh, don't look down your nose at that, mister. Some people stand at a bar and drink. Their pleasure. I snoop. Mine. When was the last time you saw your next-door neighbor, Mrs. Dean? Mm, yesterday. Wednesday. What time was that? When she got into the cab. Uh, what time? About three... I'd say it was about that. What kind of a cab was it, Miss Graham? Mm, yellow cab, I think. Wasn't it, Graham? Mm. I said, wasn't it a yellow cab? Wasn't it? See, mister, I told you it was a yellow cab. It didn't take long if the cab company, a girl with rimless glasses and green eye shade, was courteous, efficient, and bored. 
She pulled the driver's route reports out of a steel file, checked them with me, and found the one that matched. At 3.12 p.m. Wednesday, hacky Stan Hodek had picked up a fare at 903 Hillcrest Road in Queens. If I wanted to talk to Stan about it, the girl said she was sorry. There was no way of reaching him. He'd report in at 10 o'clock. If I cared, I could wait till then. I cared. At 10.05, a cab rolled into the garage. It was Stan, she told me. I went over to it. Oh, the things your body will take just so as it can eat. You have that trouble, Mac? <laughs> Continually. Uh, the girl in the office told me you were Stan Hodek. That girl is always right. It's like an affliction with her. What's the matter, pal? Did you lose something in the cab? You think it's mine? Oh, nothing like that, Stan. I'm Danny Clover, police department. Oh, somebody made a complaint because I questioned the good name of his family? I do this many times a day. <laughs> On Wednesday, you picked up a fair stand in Queens. I want you to tell me about it. Wednesday? Yesterday's a long time ago. In Queens, that's a long place. 903 Hillcrest Road at 312 in the afternoon. Try to remember, Stan. Okay, I'll try. Queens, Hillcrest Road, Wednesday. Give me a hint, Mr. Clover. A man or a woman? A, a woman. Well, that makes it easier because it's easier to remember a woman. Yeah. Yeah, now I remember. What about it? I've got a photograph here. Was it this woman? Let's see. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I remember because this age-type woman is easy to forget. How did you happen to go there? Did she call you? No. No, a guy hailed me from the street. What guy? Who knows? Some guy out of a crowd told me to go to Queens, to that address. Pick up a lady and take her to where he'd be waiting for her. Where was that? On a corner in Brooklyn. I remember because all that was on that corner was an empty lot. Lousy meeting place. But Will you take me there now? I don't know. I just finished a day's work. You'll have to clear it with Miss Righteous in the office and... We'll clear it. Let's go, Stan. Right here, Mr. Clover. Here's where I left her off. Let's get out. Yeah. You're sure it was right here, huh? Sure, I'm sure. I ought to know. This billboard here was... You didn't see anyone pick her up? Will you tie my shoelace, mister? Hello, little girl. I fell down back there because my shoelace is untied. Here, and put your foot up on my knee, honey. Thanks. Aren't you out pretty late? No. Do you stay out this late every night? Oh, no. Tonight I'm big. Tonight I'm a big girl. There, there you are. Thanks. I've even got a big girl's pocketbook. Your mother should know you've got her suede pocketbook. Oh, it's not my mother's. I found it. But it... Give me back my pocketbook. In one minute. Where did you find it? Come on. I'll show you. You recognize this purse, Tim? I don't know. I didn't take notice. Right over here on the field. Over there. Near those tin cans. Stay here, Stan, with the girl. Yeah. Anything? I found something. Marsha Dean. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When Dan Seymour starts putting in those phone calls from coast to coast on Sing It Again this Saturday night, there'll be $55,000 in prizes and cash riding on the calls. Here's Sing It Again this Saturday and every Saturday on most of these same CBS stations. When the promise of summer touches Broadway, Broadway dons its Hawaiian shirt and stands on street corners to discuss batting averages, the men from Mars, the rise to fame and fortune of Hopalong, how much it costs to dress the kids because this Hoppy character is so famous, and then the real tidbit, murder. 
All the other conversation was just an appetizer. How a policeman found a woman lying dead in a vacant lot, lying under a shroud of tin cans, her funeral bouquet a clump of weeds. That was something to talk about. And her husband, a bank clerk, poor guy, stealing the bank's money to ransom her life and all the time she was there in the vacant lot. A lunch hour isn't long enough to discuss things like that. But at police headquarters, there's time. There's a cold, dank room that contains within itself all the time in the world, the morgue. Here he is, Danny. Oh, why did you have me brought here, Mr. Clover? I know she's dead. I know. Do I have to? I know what you must feel, Mr. Dean. This is something that uh, it has to be done. You understand that, Mr. Dean? You'll be all right? Yes, yes, Mr. Clover. Patrol McKinney? Yeah. Was this your wife, Mr. Dean? Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. I'm sorry, I'm sorry for all the bad times, all the hard years. Forgive me, Marsha. Mr. Dean. Mr. Dean. What do you want? When we brought the cab driver, Stan Hodak, to your cell this morning, he said he'd never seen you before. Yes? Had you ever seen him uh, loitering around the house or the bank? Oh, no, 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 no. Please, Miss, please, and ask me questions another time. Hodak's oh. voice, did you recognize it? Could it have been the one who made the kidnap phone oh, calls? Oh, no, I don't know. How could I remember a voice? Can other people do that? Remember the sound of... Maybe it was his. I don't know. Patrol McKenna. Yeah. Kenny, watch it. He's got your gun. Mr. Dean, give it back to me. Give it. You know. I've right, waited for it. It's fine. <laughs> Look, Mr. Dean, we'll find Marsha's killer. You can't take it on yourself. You'll have to kill us to get out of here and then kill a girl. You're wrong. No, it's not you I'll kill. No, this man here, I'm going to kill myself. Myself. To end the grief and the pain in my head. And there's no more pain. My... Kenny. Ah! Yeah. Give me my gun. Give it to me. Ah! Oh, you're such... Good. It's okay now, Danny. He's out. Let him come out of it himself and take him to Dr. Sinsky. Then lock him up. And thanks, Kenny. You were quick. Can I come in, Danny? Yeah, come in, Tadaglia. All right, thanks. Now, well, here they are, Danny. Wear them in good health. Wear what in good health? Uh, your, your shirts and your intimates. Tartaglia. Just... Your shirts and your intimates, Danny. A little plot Mrs. Tartaglia and I whipped up for you for Mother's Day. <laughs> I heisted your laundry out of your locker and took it home. And Mrs. Tartaglia got together with her Bendix washer. Here is your laundry, Danny. As clean as clean can be. <laughs> Thank Mrs. Tartaglia for me. I will, Danny. It gives her pleasure. And when you leave, tear down that note I got up from the police board. Officer who bored laundry, return it to Danny Clover. No questions asked. Hmm? We'll call. Roger. And now that we've solved the problems of the domestic life of the police department, may we get down to work, Gino? Oh, indeed we may. Then do it. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, Danny. Now, in the matter of the cab driver, Stan Hodek, to wit, we have had him sweating all morning over photographs from our rogues' gallery in an effort to identify the man who hailed his cab with directions to pick up the now deceased Mrs. Marsha Dean. Anything? Nothing. Also, in the matter of Stan Hodek... We have checked his call sheet. Right after dropping Mrs. Dean, he picked up another fare a block away from the scene of the crime. Took said fare to the Roxy, thereby confirming Stan's story as far as time is concerned. All right. Uh, what else? In the matter of Harry Dean, to wit, about 15 minutes ago, he was released on bail. Said bail being set at $10,000. Who put it up to Douglas? Oh, his sympathetic employers, the Charles Street National Bank. Yeah, I figured they would. Man works at one place for 20-odd years, works there faithfully... Then suddenly he needs a lot of money to buy back his wife's life. His wife gets murdered. Danny Clover speaking. Mugovan, Danny. I'm phoning from the call box at 45th and Broadway. What's up, Mugovan? Stan Hodak. The cab driver? Yeah, he's in the middle of the street there, and he's been shot to death. Danny? Danny, over here. Up the traffic, don't it, Danny? A sideshow like this? 
Not every day a spectacle like this. Give those words to the newspapers, Muggerman. They'll love you for it. Danny. Oh, sorry. Okay, I said I'm sorry. Now brief me. Oh, uh, like this, Danny. From eyewitness accounts, each one with personal variations because the eyewitnesses have personal problems. But essentially, they come out the same. All right, Muggerman. Uh, after a little prodding, they all agree on this. Hodak's cab came to a stop for a red light. Man got out, got lost in the crowd. Huh? The light changed. The cab didn't move. Unusual for a cab. Well, maybe not unusual. Depends how you feel about cabs. Off the dime, Muggerman. The cab still didn't move. All the traffic behind it was tied up and screaming. Finally, some brave guy got out to argue with Hodak. No argument. Hodak was dead. You saw him, Dan. Yeah. Bullet hole in the back of his head. A new way to pay a cab fare, huh, Danny? The man who got out, could any of these eyewitnesses identify him? I asked him that, Danny. They laughed in my face. Who bothers to scrutinize a guy gets out of a cab? Danny, oh, Danny. Uh, can I see you for a minute? Hello, Dr. Sensky. Uh, this, this thing, Danny, this uh, murder of the woman, Marsha Dean. Uh, may I inquire as to your progress? <laughs> what makes you so interested, Doctor? Oh, it disturbs me. A person like Mrs. Dean, who only saw her name in print in a telephone book, should... We've made some progress. Oh, I'm glad. I'm not a vindictive man, Danny, but whoever did this thing... Uh, I know what you mean. Uh, oh, Danny, I uh, got here the autopsy report of Marsha Dean. Uh, tell it to me. Uh, that she was shot with a thirty-two caliber pistol you already know. Mm-hmm. Uh, she died instantly, the bullet entering the sternum at close range pierced the heart. When found, she had been dead approximately 30 hours. Huh? Uh, one hour, more or less, Danny, but 30 hours is a fair approximation. Ah, and it makes a liar out of a person I talked to in Rockaway. Uh, forgive me, Danny, I don't understand. A stenographer on vacation, Doctor. A girl who said her name was Edith Keller. I saw her yesterday afternoon when Mrs. Dean had already been dead for a day. Edith Keller said she'd just seen Mrs. Dean. So? So what, Danny? So Marcia Dean never left Brooklyn. She was never in Rockaway. The beach fires smoldered along the stretch of East Far Rockaway. And clinging to their fringe of light and warmth, the shadows huddled and protested with small squeals of delight. There was background music, too. The portable radios and the rhythmic thumping of an out-of-tune piano, courtesy the idle wild arms. The lobby was decked with a desperate gaiety. Under torn Japanese lanterns, two people danced. Sitting alone on a wicker sofa was Edith Keller. I went up to her. You gonna ask me to dance? I'll dance. Miss Keller. Oh, I remember you. You're the detective. It's not against the law to ask a girl to dance, is it? I want to talk to you, Miss Keller. All right, we'll talk then. It's just as good. Watching the dancers and the fun, I was getting lonesome. Please sit down. Uh, not here. Somewhere quiet. But... Your room. We'll talk there. Now, Miss Keller. All right. See, so, yeah, I did what you said, but we haven't anything to talk about. Not like this. A bank teller, Edith. Let's discuss him. Bank teller? I don't know anything No, about... you didn't know him, Edith. You just knew that tellers handle money. You knew there was a way to get that money. I think you must be crazy or something. You and someone else kidnap his wife. Make him bring the ransom here to this hotel. Put it in the bottom drawer of the bureau. You got that money, didn't you, Edith? You're wrong. I told you that woman got it. The woman whose picture you showed me. I told you that. You lied. Marsha Dean was never here because she was dead in a vacant lot in Brooklyn. You and whoever you worked with got her to go to that lot. Then murdered her. Who are you working with, Edith? Please, I... I don't know what you're talking about. I don't Who know... Who is it, Edith? It could be easier, maybe, if you told me. Who was it that... No. Someone knocked, Edith. Open the door. Open it. Uh, darling. Harry. Darling. Go away. Huh? Go away. Come on in, Harry. Close the door. All right. I'm in. Now what? If you want to grieve some more about your wife, Harry, I'll watch. Oh, don't worry about it, Clover. Not me. You. You killed your wife, Harry, and made it look like kidnappers did it. And the ransom money you pocketed for Edith here, touching. She's worth killing twice for, Clover. If you knew her like I did, you'd know that. 
After being married for 23 years, a man misses what he can only read about. Harry. You'd understand that, Clover. Killing the cab driver had to be done. You brought him into my cell to see if he'd recognize me. Of course he recognized me. Why didn't he say he knew you? He got too clever. He caught on to what was happening. He wanted money. He said, let's go for a ride in my cab and talk about money. So I shot. An appetite like his was no good for Edith and me. Let's go, Harry. Well, then you know why I can't go with you. Two killings, three... Harry, no. No more killing, Harry. Edith, watch out. He's got to die. He's got to die. Harry! Harry! I didn't mean to shoot, Edith. Edith, 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 don't die. Don't die, please, please, now listen to me, Edith. Don't die, don't die, I didn't mean to... Just breathe, 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 Edith. No! Kill me, kill me, kill me. In May, the twilight sighs down on Broadway like a rosy promise. You walk toward it, then someone smiles and takes your hand, whispers to close your eyes. And your head gets banged against a wall. The lights are bright, the noise is loud, and your scream mixes well with the shriek of the night. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. It's time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction and one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled, The Case of the Ruthless Murderers. People appreciate Anison most when they want quick relief from sudden pain of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia. At times like that, you don't want to wait. You want fast relief. So get Anison and keep it handy. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Many people have been first given Anison tablets by their own physician or dentist. So for your own sake, Let me urge you to try Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. You can get Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N, at any drug counter. Now for Mr. Keene and the case of the ruthless murderers. Our scene opens in the office which Mr. Keene, the famous investigator, shares with his friend and partner, Mike Clancy. At the moment, Mr. Keene is in his private office, while Mike is at the outer office file case, unaware that trouble is about to make a sudden and unexpected appearance. Hmm, let's see now. Where did this go on file C? Hey, yes, mister. Can I... Stay where you are. Don't make a move or I shoot. You're still pretty fast on the draw, Clancy. Fast enough to be one step ahead of you, Rod Marble. Turn around. I'm not carrying a gun. You think I want to spend another five years stretching the pen? What's the trouble, Mike? Take a look at who just come into the office, boss. Rod Marvel, isn't it? That's right, Mr. Keene. 
I'm the man you helped send to jail for bank robbery five years ago. I got out this morning. Boss, do you remember the last thing this fellow said at the trial when the judge asked him if he had anything to say? Yes, Mike. I remember very well. I said I'd kill you in cold blood, Mr. Keene, when I got out. But you can tell your partner here to put his gun away. I didn't come here to your office to start anything. Well, he's not carrying a gun, Mr. Keene. But I wouldn't trust him anyway. All right, Mike. Let's hear what Rod Marble has to say. Mr. Keene, I'm sorry I made that threat against your life. Oh, apologizing, is he? Now I'm sure he's got something up his sleeve. Five years in prison gives a man plenty of time to think and change his mind. I forgot my ideas about getting revenge and hitting back at you long ago. All right, Marble. If you didn't come here to get revenge, why did you come? I wanted to ask you one question, Mr. Keene. What question? Someone gave you the evidence that helped send me up. Someone squealed, one of my old gang. Who was it? I'm sorry. That's something I can't tell you. Look, Mr. Keene, give me his name and you'll never hear from me again. What's more, I'll give you every dollar I own if you'll tell me. Do you want to go back to prison, Marvel? This time it might be the electric chair. I don't care. If I could just get my hands on the rat who squealed on me and sent me to the You pen, won't I... get that information from me, Marvel. Okay. But I'm going to find out who he is if it's the last thing I do. There's a man who's looking for trouble, Mr. Keene. If I ever saw a fellow who was out for blood, he's it. If it's trouble he wants, Mike, I'm afraid he'll get it. And it may be more than Rod Marvel bargained for. <laughs> Car's parked on the corner, Mr. Keene. Uh, this way, sir. Hey, Fred, get your back to This is a special edition of the afternoon papers, Mike. Yeah, I wonder what the extra is. I get a copy from that newsboy, boss. Extra business, my boy. Extra paper, mister. Yeah, here you are, boy. We are the party. Extra business, my boy. Look at the headline, Mr. Keene. Extra... Prominent businessman found murdered. His name is Neil Justin. Neil Justin? Let me see that paper, Mike. Sure, and he's some kind of a big manufacturer, isn't he, Mr. King? Yes. He was found with three bullets in his body in a phone booth downtown. There were no witnesses to the crime, the paper says. And it took place at about four this afternoon. Well, that was just an hour ago. Rod Marble was in our office at three. He could have had time to leave, track down Justin, and murder him. Yeah, but, Mr. King, what would Marble have to do with a, a man like Neil Justin? Mike... Mr. Justin was the man who gave me the information five years ago that helped send Marvel to jail. Saints preserve us. Then Marvel must have murdered him. He must have come to our office to establish an alibi by saying that he was with us at the time of the murder. It's entirely possible. Mike, perhaps you'd better drop me off to police headquarters. I think I'll have a talk with Lieutenant Hale. Okay, Mr. Kitt. Well... Looks as if someone made a mistake. A mistake, Mike? Yeah, there's a woman sitting in our car, boss. So I notice. Excuse me, ma'am. Don't you have the wrong car? Are you Mr. Keene, sir? No, I'm Mike Clancy, his partner. Mr. Keene's right here. Oh, one of the elevator boys in your office building pointed your car out to me, Mr. Keene. My name is Rena Soffer. I, I just had to see you. Why didn't you come up to my office? I didn't have an appointment, and I thought someone in your office might not let me see you. Mr. Keene, you've got to help me. They've arrested my husband, Tom, and he's innocent. Arrested him for what, Mrs. Soffer? The murder of Neil Justin. I, I know how you've helped people, sir. Everybody's heard how kind you are and how fair. And Tom's innocent. He didn't kill Neil Justin. If your husband is innocent, I'm sure the police will give him every chance to prove it, Mrs. Soffer. But you don't understand... Tom has a record, a criminal record. Now I remember his name, Mr. Keene. Tom Soffer's been under suspicion at police headquarters. They think he's a gang killer. No, that's not true, Mr. Clancy. My, my husband's weak, I know. I, I've tried to keep him away from his bad companions, but he's not a murderer. He'll get a chance to prove that, Mrs. Soffer. Mr. Keene, please, just, just go down to the jail and talk to Tom. That, that's all I ask. And if he doesn't convince you that he's innocent, I... I won't bother you again. Very well, Mr. Sather. Uh, there's a phone booth in that cigar store, Mike. We'll call Lieutenant Hale and ask if we can see Tom Sather. Oh, thank you, Mr. Keene. I'll, I'll never forget your kindness as long as I live. I'll go back now and tell Tom you're coming. All right. 
But I warn you, if your husband is guilty, I may have to help convict him. I'll take that chance, sir. Goodbye, Mr. King. Goodbye. Let's make that phone call to police headquarters, Mike. Right, boss. Well, here's an empty phone booth, Mr. Keene. I- I'll make the call, sir. You know, Mike, this case isn't as obvious as it appears. It may prove a lot more difficult to solve than we imagine. Hello? Police headquarters? Lieutenant Hale, homicide squad, please. Lieutenant, Mike Clancy. I- I'm calling for Mr. Keene. We hear you've just picked up a man named Tom Soffer for the Justin murder. Huh? What's that, Lieutenant? Uh, just a second. Mr. Keene. Yes, Mike. Tom Soffer broke away from his arresting officer. He's loose. Hmm. Well, let me talk to Lieutenant Mike. Lieutenant Hale, it's Mr. Keene. I suppose you sent out a general alarm for Tom Soffer. Well, I suggest you send out another alarm for Rod Marble. That's right. Marvel was just released from the state penitentiary. Yes, I'll explain when I reach your office in 15 minutes. Goodbye, Lieutenant. I'm sure now it's beginning to look as if this fellow Soffa may be just as guilty as Marvel, Mr. Kane. Well, they both didn't kill Neil Justin, Mike. And there's always a chance that someone new may enter this case. In any event, I'm going to the Lieutenant's office and then home. Get in touch with me there... If you learn anything new of importance. I beg your pardon, but are you Mr. Keene, sir? Yes. I've been waiting for you here in front of your apartment for the past two hours. I'm Arthur Justin, Neil Justin's son. Oh, come in, Arthur. Please sit down. Thank you. Mr. Keene, you've read about my father's murder. I've come here to ask you to help solve the case. I'll be glad to help you, Arthur. I happen to be working on the case already. You are? Yes, a criminal named Rod Marvel is involved in it. Have you ever heard his name mentioned? No, sir. But if you think he murdered Dad, you're wrong. What makes you so sure, Arthur? Because I think I know who the killer is. Although I need some evidence... That's why I want your help, sir. Who is the suspect you have in mind? A man named Luke Homer. My father was very worried for weeks before his death. He said someone was shadowing him. Dad was in fear of his life. What did this man Homer have against your father? I I don't know, Mr. Keene. And I never knew why Dad didn't go to the police either. But I did something about it. What did you do? I trailed Homer. I spotted him outside the house a few days before Dad's murder, and I followed him from then on. I found out his name and occupation. He's a mechanic. I can point him out to you, Mr. Keene, and you can do the rest. Where is he? He gets home from work about nine every night, and this is his address. If you meet me on this corner at five of nine this evening, sir, you'll be able to put a pair of handcuffs on my father's murderer. Well, we can certainly question this man, Luke Homer. Very well, Arthur. I'll meet you. Uh, Perhaps I ought to come alone, however, without my partner or the police. If Homer sees his house is being watched, he may not show up. All right, Mr. Keene. Then I'll see you on the street corner tonight at nine. And we'll proceed from there. Is that you? It's Mr. Keene, over here. Is that you, up? Mr. Keene! Mr. Keene, where are you? Over here, Arthur. I heard two shots. Are you hurt, sir? Let me help you. Just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the case of the ruthless murderers. Meanwhile, beware of unpleasing breath that breathes between the teeth. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Those cracks and crevices where food particles can decay must be reached to have a really clean mouth, a welcome breath. Your dentist knows this to be true. 
Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Kalanos gives amazing dental floss action. That is, sends thousands of active cleansing bubbles to penetrate hard-to-reach dental areas. Helps dislodge bits of food that can cause unpleasing breath and tooth decay. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Kalanos has high polishing action, too. Brightens dingy teeth by removing ordinary yellow surface stains. Kalinos is gentle, safe even for children's teeth and tender gums. Enjoy its cool, clean, minty flavor. Kalinos is dentist recommended. Cleans your teeth bright, keeps your breath right. Use Kalinos toothpaste with dental floss action. Get Kalinos with dental floss action today. Now back to Mr. Keene and the case of the ruthless murderers. Mr. Keene, the great investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy, have been investigating the murder of Neil Justin, a well-known businessman. Although Mr. Keene already has two suspects, Rod Marble and Tom Soffer, both men with criminal records, Neil Justin's son, Arthur, has come to Mr. Keene accusing still a third, a man named Luke Homer. Arthur Justin has told Mr. Keene where Homer lives and made an appointment with the famous investigator to meet nearby at nine in the evening. Now, as Mr. Keene keeps his appointment and waits for Arthur Justin, he's suddenly ambushed. Mr. Keene! Mr. Keene, where are you? Over here, Arthur. I heard two shots. Are you hurt, sir? Oh, let me help you. It was only a miracle that saved me. Some instinct made me drop to the pavement just before he fired. Oh, did you see who he was? No, no, I'm afraid I could never identify him. Oh, please forgive me. It was my fault. If I hadn't been a few minutes late for our appointment, I would... It doesn't matter, Arthur. It is quite possible if you had been here, you'd have been killed yourself. Mr. Keene, the man who tried to kill you was the murderer of my father. It was Luke Homer. It must have been. Well, there's no point waiting around here any longer. He'll never come back. I'm going to return to my office, Arthur. At this hour of night, Mr. Keene? I have a complete file of every known criminal in the country. And perhaps I'll find Luke Homer's name in it. We've sent out a general alarm for two other suspects involved in your father's murder, Rod Marble and Tom Soffer. Now we'll add this man, Luke Homer, to the list. Well, there's nothing in the file here about a man named Luke Homer, Mr. Keene. Oh, just about gone through the list. What time is it, Mike? It's almost midnight, sir. You know, I just had an idea. Seems to me... It's Rod Marble, boss. Don't move, Mike. He's armed. I've got six bullets in this gun, Keene, for you and your partner. I know he was lying, boss. That story about having a change of heart was full. I wasn't lying. I meant every word I said. Keene's the one who changed my mind. And how did I do that, Marble? By telling the police to send out an alarm for me for Justin's murder. You're trying to frame me, Keene, and I'm going to put you away just as I promised I would five years ago. Watch out, boss. Are you... And he's out cold, sir. And I'll relieve him of that gun. That's nice work, Mike. If you hadn't timed that blow so well, we'd both have a few bullets in our heads. Well, I'll bring him around and then lug him down to police headquarters. The boys will be glad to see this bucko, Mr. Keene. Undoubtedly. But I'm not so sure he's the man they want for Neil Justin's murder. After all this, and after what you told me about being ambushed? That's just it. Mike, I think I have an important clue to follow up. A clue that may prove to be an amazing revelation. Take Rod Marble to headquarters, then get a good night's sleep. We'll both need all our energy when we return to this affair tomorrow morning. Yes, you can reach me here in my office, Lieutenant Hale. I'm still working with Neil Justin's son, Arthur, on the Luke Homer angle. But so far, Homer seems to have completely disappeared... However, I have an idea of my own that I've been working on for the past two days. Yes, of course, Lieutenant. I'll keep in touch with you. Goodbye. Mr. King. Oh, hello, Arthur. Uh, has there been anything new, sir? Any any clues to my father's murder? No, nothing yet. Oh, I, I want you to meet my wife, Alicia, sir. Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Justin? I'm very glad to know you. I've heard so much about Mr. Keene, the famous investigator. 
And I'd like to help you in any way I can, sir. Arthur's father meant almost as much to me as he did to my husband. I think I understand, Mrs. Justin. Alicia's worried, Mr. Keene. She thinks they'll try to get at me in some way. Oh, oh no, that's not why I... What were you about to say, Mrs. Justin? Oh, Mr. Keene, I want to speak to you alone. Alicia, what's the trouble? Are you hiding something from me? Oh, Arthur, I beg you to trust me and do as I say. I can't keep this to myself any longer. I want to see Mr. Keene in private. You know, I've always trusted you, Alicia. I'll do as you ask. I'll be waiting in the car downstairs. Well, Mrs. Justin, what is it you want to tell me? Mr. Keene, I just couldn't bring myself to say this in front of Arthur. It would tear down all his ideals. But I believe I know who murdered his father. Do you? Neil Justin was involved with a woman named Sarah Blows. He'd known her ever since his wife died, and before as well. I see. I believe he tried to break off with Sarah, and she took revenge. She's a violent type, Mr. Keene, I know, because I've met her. Do you know where the Sarah Blows can be located? Yes. What do you intend to do, Mr. Keene? See her, of course, immediately. If what you say is true, I'll break this case wide open, Mrs. Justin, inside of an hour. Yes? Are you Sarah Blows? That's right. My name is Keene. Mr. Keene, the famous investigator. I'd like to talk to you about a man named Neil Justin, who was murdered a few days ago. Neil, please uh, come in, Mr. Keene. Step into the living room and we can talk. A couple of friends of mine are anxious to join the conversation. What? Don't move, Keene, or we'll blow your head off. What is this? A trap? <laughs> so this is a guy who's supposed to be the biggest investigator of them all. Take a look at him, Pete. I'm looking, Tracy. He don't look smart enough to trail a giraffe. Stop being a comedian, Tracy. Get rid of him and get it over with. Okay, take it easy, sir. Pete. Yeah? We better tie him up in the garage. It's way in the back. If we stay here, somebody on the street might hear us. Get moving, Keene. Somebody might hear you do what? Put a bullet behind your rear, Keene. Well, the great Mr. Keene is tied up good and tight, Tracy. Want me to plug him now? Take it easy, Pete. I'm enjoying this. It ain't often we get a fish as big as Keene to fry. I suppose you two know what the penalty for murder is. The electric chair. Listen to him talk, Tracy. <laughs> You're the one who's getting the death sentence, Keene. Only we're doing the job with a gun. I warn you. You won't get away with this. He's talking too much to suit me, Tracy. Let's get started. Let him talk. His mouth ain't going to be much good for talking in a couple of minutes. Pull that box out and put Keen in it. Mm -hmm. No, no. No, wait. You know what this box is for, Keen? You. You and a load of quick line. We're going to freeze you in solid, then drop you in the river. No, no, please. Have mercy. I'm an old man, but I, I don't want to die. Listen to them crawl. Yes, like they all crawl when their number's up. I'm not asking you to spare my life. But at least give me my choice. What's he talking about? What choice, Keen? I always feared this day. The day when I'd be cornered and helpless. Because of that fear, I carried a tiny bottle around with me, filled with deadly poison. So what? I've carried it to make it easy. When I knew there was no other way out to spare myself torture, at least let me take the poison. Holy smoke, he wants to make it easier for us. It'll make it easier for both of us. I'll have no pain. You can get away with this crime. I don't get it. All you have to do is leave my body here with the empty bottle of poison in my hand. The police will obviously think I was a suicide. It's a lot safer, Tracy, than having my body discovered full of bullet holes. Because the police would never rest until they'd caught you. What do you think, Tracy? I'm not sure, Pete. Yeah, what do we got to lose? If the old guy's nuts enough to want to do the job on himself, let him. Okay, we'll give Keen a break. Well, thank you. The poison is in a small bottle in my vest pocket. Look, I'm not taking them ropes off you, Keen. You can just open your mouth and we'll pour the stuff in. Anything you say. Just open the bottle and let me drink the poison. 
Here's a bottle, Tracy. Open it. A bottle of soup with it. I can't see. I'm blind. The I'll door. Where's the door? The door. Come on, put your hands up and no funny things. Like Mr. King, boss. Are you all right, sir? Here, I'll, I'll help carry you out. Just, just hang on. I got your message just in time. Oh, that's good work, Mike. And there's a squad of plain clothesmen outside, sir. We got the others, too. <laughs> Here, here's the door, boss. Here, easy now. I'm all right. <laughs> Let me cut them ropes, Mr. Oh, thank Jean. you, Mike. That invention of mine, the condensed bottle of tear gas, saved my life. I had to put on quite an act to get them to open it. <laughs> when they did, the results were perfect. I'm sure, and that was one of the, the slickest inventions I've ever seen, boss. Tear gas condensed in a tiny bottle. Everything okay in there, Clancy? Everything's under control, Casey. Send in the other two. They're putting Sarah Blows and them two murderers into the patrol wagon, boss. But here are two more I know you're looking forward to seeing. I put the handcuffs on them 15 minutes ago and brought them here. Well, Arthur and Alicia, what have you got to say for yourselves? All I've got to say, Keen, is that if I didn't have these handcuffs on... Oh, I'd... take your medicine like a man, Arthur. Keen was too smart for you. I've had my eye on you a lot longer than you think, Arthur. Did you? There was no such man as Luke Homer. You made up the name just to lure me into an ambush. And the boss saw right through that Sarah Blows story, mister, and tipped off the police. Then he told me to nab you and keep you under arrest until he located the rest of your outfit. You and your wife were responsible for the murder of your father, Arthur. It was a horrible crime. And maybe I can tell you why they killed him, Mr. Keene. <gasps> it's Rod Marble. Yes. The man who was a member of your room ring of criminals five years ago, before he was sent to prison. I didn't know it before, Mr. Keene, but you saved my life when you had me picked up on suspicion. Arthur Justin here was planning to put me out of the way along with you. You squealer! Keep your trap shut, Marble. Why shouldn't I squeal? Didn't your father squeal on me to save his own skin so I had to take a five-year rap? That's right, Marble. And at the time, Neil Justin's ruse worked. We believed he was a respectable businessman instead of a gang leader. I'm willing to talk to Mr. Keene. If I get a break... You'll get justice, Alicia. No more, no less. Keep quiet, Alicia. Do you hear? I won't keep quiet. Mr. Keene, do you know why he killed his father? He wanted to take over the racket. His father wanted him out of it. But Arthur got big ideas. And who gave me those big ideas? You did, Alicia. What else have you two got to say? Mr. Keene, Arthur's father had warned him that Marble might talk and convict the gang. So Arthur decided the only way to, was to get rid of you and Marble after he shot his father. Well, that just about cleans things up, boss. I think I'd be taking these two lovebirds outside to the police. Mr. Keene, you certainly put one over on Tracy and Pete with that tear gas invention of yours. Tracy said he thought you were going to take poison and kill yourself. No man ever has the right to take his own life, Marble. That's for God or the law. And as long as you're feeling so grateful to the boss, Marble, maybe there's one request I think he'd like to make. Mr. Keene would appreciate it if you said nothing about that trick bottle of tear gas. Yes, Mike, it might help me in the future. When I get into a spot like that again, if the invention would remain a secret. Mr. Keene, you can depend on me to keep it under my hat. All right. Mike will accompany Arthur and Alicia Justin and the others to police headquarters, where we can write the finish to the murder of Neil Justin, a finish that will end in the death house for all concerned. <laughs> And so Mr. Keene finds a solution to the case of the ruthless murderers. The next time you're suffering from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. You'll bless the day you heard of this incredibly fast way to relieve these pains. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician, and in this way have discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So next time such pain strike, take Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. 
Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30 and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. The name is Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is based on the novel Mr. Keene. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Ann Hummert. Dialogue by Lawrence Clee. Bennett Kilpack plays Mr. Keene. It is on the air every Thursday at this time. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday when the kindly old Tracer turns to the Forgotten Cave Murder Case. Hello, Yukon 38309. Yes, this is Candy Madsen. Yes, yes, this is Candy Madsen. Oh, Miss Madsen, I've been trying to get in touch with you the past two days. Well, I've been out of town. Just who is this speaking? Mrs. Allison Gray. You may have heard of my husband. The famous industrialist? Who hasn't heard of him? You've got to help me, Miss Matson. I'm, I'm desperate. Well, you sound it. What seems to be wrong, Mrs. Gray? I understand you do work of a confidential nature. You understand correctly. Can you drop out to see me, Miss Matson? Right away. Well, you'll have to give me some idea of what it's all about, Mrs. Gray. There are certain types of cases I refuse to accept. Do, do I have to tell you on the phone? If we're going to do business, yes. Well, it's my husband. For the past month, I've felt that he's been gradually losing his mind. What? It's horrible. But yesterday, he disappeared completely. You don't have to say another word, Mrs. Gray. I'll be right out. The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Madsen, Yukon 38309. That's the way it usually goes. I live in a penthouse on Telegraph Hill in San Francisco. Inside, there's a phone. It's listed, and it rings. Sometimes I wish it wasn't and didn't. But the phone is listed thusly, Candy Metzen, private investigator. And that's how I make my living. Do you remember that old gag about what's black and white and red all over? <laughs> yeah, a newspaper. Well, because of that telephone call from Mrs. Allison Gray, I had a switch. I had my palm red and got black and blue all over. And for good measure, I uncovered two very dead corpses along the way. I got the address of the Allison Grays out on Broadway in the Valley of Wealth, and that's where I went. As I pulled up at the front door, I looked for the bell, but there was none. Nothing but a huge knocker looking like it weighed about ten tons. I whacked it a couple of times and thought the house would fall off its foundations. Oui, mademoiselle? Oh, uh, oui. Je suis ici pour un rendez-vous avec Madame Gray. Oh, parlez-vous français, mademoiselle? Uh, oui. Lowell High School style. Entrez, s'il vous plaît, mademoiselle. Uh, oui. C'est un bonjour, n'est-ce pas? Oh, oui. Uh, <laughs> I'll bet you run out before I do. You can say that again. Oh, you speak English? Yes, yeah, San Francisco style. <laughs> uh, you miss Matson? Uh, that's right. Miss Gray's expecting you. You'll uh, find her in the <clears throat> library. Don't overdo it, Clyde. Uh, say, what kind of a place is this, anyway? You'll find out. Uh, right on in, please. Yeah, thanks. Oh, uh, Miss Madsen? Uh, yes, Mrs. Gray. Oh, do come in. My, how attractive you are. Uh, I expected a, a severe type of woman. Sit down, won't you, please? Well, thank you. You've got to help me, Miss Matson. My whole life has been turned into a phantasmagoria. Oh, that's a good word. Uh, tell me more about the phantasmagoria. Well, my husband and I have been married 30 years. All that time he's been kind, considerate, generous. And with money yet. That makes him quite a man. But in business he's just the opposite. He's ruthless. And I'm afraid he's made a good many enemies. Well, I guess you have to be like that in business if you want to be successful, Mrs. Gray. I know of at least a half dozen men who have been led into financial ruin because of my husband's operations. And this all leads to... Just this. I believe that his business tactics finally began to prey on his mind. For the past month, he's looked as though he were suffering from shock or concussion. Well, maybe that's it. Uh, no, Miss Madsen. I, I was a nurse before I married Mr. Gray. I know the symptoms. 
My husband, I'm sure, is on the edge of a complete mental collapse. If it hasn't happened already. Well, now, just how do I fit into the picture? Find him, please. Then perhaps we can get to the root of all the trouble. I'd, I'd die if anything happened to well, him. You should know his habits. Can't you find him, Mrs. Gray? Can an amateur pianist do the work of a Reuben Stein? No, Miss Matson. You're a professional sleuth. That's why I called you. Okay. You've got yourself a girl. As of now, I'm on the payroll. What is your fee, Miss Matson? Two hundred in advance, fifty dollars a day in expenses. That's reasonable. I'll make out a check for you right away. Fine. Oh, hello, Auntie. I just... oh. Excuse me. Didn't know you had company. Perfectly all right, Robert. May I present my nephew, Robert Warnicky? This is Miss Candy Matson. How do you do? It's the largest now, you. Matson, eh? That name is familiar. Yes, yes, you're a lady reporter or something of the sort, aren't you? <laughs> no, no. No, I'm afraid not, Mr. Warnicky. Let the girl alone, Robert. She's here on business. Here you are, Miss Matson. Thank you, Mrs. Gray. Well, I'd better be getting along. You'll hear from me soon. Oh, goodbye, Mr. Warnicky. I'll be seeing you. Yes. Yes, I have a hunch you most certainly will. I left the house, got in my car, and as I drove along, I did some thinking. It was a strange thing. Here was a, a family with all the loot in the world, but unhappy didn't make sense. Suddenly I realized I wasn't far from the studios of an old friend of mine, Rembrandt Watson, a darn good photographer, now that he's given up the grape, the, the kind that comes in bottles. As luck would have it, he was in and gave me a greeting worthy of the prodigal son. Candy, you minx. Where on earth have you been, Dove? Minx and Dove? You, you make me feel as if I should be molting. What do you mean, where have I been? Just what the question implies, dear. Where have you been? Up in Eureka on a case. Oh, and how did you find Eureka? With radar. You've never seen such fog. Oh. Well, why this deep concern about me whereabouts? I've been trying to get in touch with you. I've some business for you, dear. No, thanks, Rembrandt. I already have some. Oh, she's an old customer of mine. I've photographed her so often, I know every little wrinkle. <laughs> I've even given them names. No, I told you, Ducky, I couldn't possibly Her take neck it. has more lines than a California road map. Uh, Rembrandt, for the last time, her I... Her name is Gray. What did you say her name was? Gray, sweet little old fluff, lives out on Broadway. Mrs. Allison Gray? Yes, that's the one. Well, Rembrandt, I just now left her house not more than ten minutes ago. Oh, splendid. She got in touch with you. She dropped in my studio several days ago, and I recommended you. Get yourself a fine, fat fee, Dove. She can afford it. Well, do you know anything about the deal? Only that she's worried about her husband. That's nothing. I'm worried about mine. Oh, girl, you're not married. That's why I'm worried. You mean you still can't get Lieutenant Mallard to see the light? Right. Every time we even get near the subject of matrimony, Mallard ducks. Ah, Mallard Ducks. Okay, I'll leave. I would if I were you, Mallard Ducks. <laughs> really? Well, did you accept the case? I'm afraid I did, Rembrandt. Then you might be interested in this. <laughs> Here. What's this? A card. You can read. Yeah. Madame Natasha, palmistry, telepathy, sittings by appointment only. W what's this all about? May not have any connection in the least, but it fell out of Mrs. Gray's purse as she left the other afternoon. Palmistry yet? This gal goes in for wrinkles all over. Rembrandt may sound as though he has bird gravel for brains, but he's been around me long enough to know a lead when he sees one. So I took the card and left. I cut over to Union and down to Kearney Street and then to the Hall of Justice on the corner of Washington. That's where my boy Mallard hangs his hat. Lieutenant Ray Mallard of San Francisco Homicide. A wonderful guy if he'd only swap stars. The one pinned on the inside of his coat for the ones up in the sky. Well, bust my rank and call me patrolman if it isn't candy. Hi, you beautiful thing, you. Oh, what have you been doing? Sniffing too much sulfur and molasses? Oh, well, merely stating the truth. Gee, you look swell, candy. Oh, well, in that case, no comment. <laughs> I'd better quit while I'm ahead. Well, foot flat, what's new? Nothing, absolutely nothing. I'm liable to lose my job. In the last 24 hours, there's been only one crime reported... Some kid had his bike stolen. Oh, you can talk to me, Mallard. Was it an inside job? I don't know. We haven't got anything to go on. But give us another two days and we'll bust this bike heist wide open. Good for you, laddie boy. Now shift your cigar and listen to me. Okay. Got something? Well, not yet. It could be... Ever hear of a lady swami known as Madame Natasha? Crystal gazing done cheap? Uh, what does she make like, Conan Doyle? Out on Buchanan near Jackson. You know her real name? Nope. 
Well, I can't help you then. As long as they keep the crystal gazing down to a soft stare and a low murmur, we don't bother them. Hmm, just thought I'd ask. Know anything about an Allison Gray? Allison Gray, sure. Charming oh. character. Old apartment knows about him. There's nothing we can do about it. So? Yeah, so. The biggest crook this side of Jesse James. Jesse did it with a gun. This joker does it with pen and ink. Oh, all very neat and orderly. Can't get a thing on him. A happy chappy, eh? Very happy. He's got more guys who hate his... Uh, he's very unpopular. Sure. Nobody likes him. Well, his wife does. She loves him. Well, that's what wives are for. That's what I keep telling you. Now, how did I walk into that one? Mallard picked up a sheaf of papers and threw it at me. It seems I'd scored a point. I ducked out, got in my car, and drove up the hill to my place. I had some phoning to do, and I wanted to do it fast. Three, eight, six, two. Okay, then. The stars in their firmaments are all masterful. Good afternoon. Madame Natasha speaking. Good afternoon, Madame. I, uh... I'm calling for an appointment. Oh? You were recommended to Madame Natasha? Oh, yes, yes. I'm from New York. A friend of mine was here last summer. She said you were excellent. Oh, how nice of her. And what was your friend's name? I, uh, uh, Wallace. Uh, Mrs. Jennifer Wallace. I do not seem to recall the name of Wallace. Oh, well. And you are? Uh, Betsy Ross. Ross. Very well. I can give you a sitting at nine o'clock this evening, Miss Ross. Oh, and, and I'd like to bring a friend along, if I might. A, a Mr. Turner. That's a bit out of the ordinary, Miss Ross, but uh, the stars decree. Very well. I will see you both. That was number one call out of the way. Number two call was to Rembrandt. He was going to be my Mr. Turner. He's very sharp where photography is concerned, and I wanted him along in case of tricks. He said, yes, he'd always wanted his palm bread. So I told him I'd pick him up about 8.30. Then I showered, fixed dinner, and got into an outfit that made me look as mousy as possible. With no lipstick or makeup, and with a pulled-down hat and a dumpy old gown, I achieved the desired effect. Then I got into the car and went over to Rembrandt's place. I beg your... No, no, no subscriptions, thank you. I'm not sending any more boys through car... Oh, you're, you're a woman, I think. I'm not only a woman, Rembrandt, I'm Candy. Heaven preserve us. Did someone throw acid on you or something? <laughs> this is my costume. Halloween isn't until next month, Candy. I know, but the spooks are here. We're going to see them this evening. Oh, perhaps so, but the way you look, it's just a matter of who scares whom. Candy, you look hideous. Well, good, that's just the way I want it. What's the idea, Dove? I don't get it. Some of these so-called fortune tellers are real smart cookies, Rembrandt. For obvious reasons, I don't want this gal we're going to visit to know who I am. Rest assured, she won't. Not the way you look. Am I that convincing, Ducky? My dear, if I didn't know better, I, I, I'd swear you just stepped off a pickle boat. Fine. That's what I wanted to hear. Come on, Rembrandt. It's time for us to peek into our futures. We got in the car and drove out to Madame Natasha's place on Buchanan Street. It was one of those old three-story gingerbread houses that still stand in San Francisco. Cornices, gables, carved pillars, ornate handrails leading up the front steps, etc., and etc. I rang the doorbell on the darkened porch and expected to be greeted by Peter Laurie. I wasn't far wrong. Oh. Good evening. Madame Natasha bids you enter the Temple of the Zodiac. Uh, yes, yes. And you are... Miss Ross, and, and this is Mr. Turner. Ah, yes. Madame is expecting you. Good. Just follow me if you will. Mm hmm uh, Here we are. This room here. You may be seated, please. Thank you. A few brief words of instruction. Madame will be here shortly. At first, do not speak to her. She has been in touch with the outer world in preparation for your visit. She is on a highly sensitive mental plane. The least little noise will cause her great harm. You will remain where you are. Madame will sit at that table over there. She will address you. Once having done so, you may talk to her. In low tones, please. Is this clear? Uh, yes. 
Very well. I shall leave you alone. Remember, let Madame Natasha speak first. Smells like a mortuary. Part of the act, Rembrandt. The aroma of flowers all ties in with the supernatural. I can't understand why we're here, Candy. Well, I've got to start somewhere, Rembrandt. This was the only thing I had to go on. Look, dear. There's a light beginning to fade up on the door. Where does it come from? Oh, I don't know. It's a cute trick, you know that? Oh, better be quiet. I think this is the madame's entrance cue. You are gathered on the threshold of three powerful forces. The past, the present, the future. Prepare to travel with me through these three elements. The lady's name is Ross. The gentleman's Turner. That is right, is it not? You may speak. That is correct. Yes. We shall commence. Detach yourselves. Think of nothing but the past. Your childhood, your school days, vacations, your misfortunes, your happy hours, your parents. Think. Think. Yes. Our thought planes are beginning to meet. Music. Stars and music, they guide our lives. Yes, we are meeting. Look up there, Candy, on the wall, the face of a man. Someone is about to visit us. Do you feel the presence? Yes. Yes, I do. I seem to feel it's a relative of yours. Your father, perhaps. No. No, it's my Uncle Bart. He used to take me boating. Yes, yes, Uncle Bob. Now I know. My word, this is better than old movies. Hey, no, no, please, no, please! Oh, fool. What? What did you say? What? Why, your friend here, he is a scoffer. I cannot go on. I am in terrible mental pain. Please, you must leave now. Immediately. <laughs> The National Broadcasting Company is presenting Candy Madsen, Yukon 38309. It wasn't Rembrandt who had broken the spell. It was that scream and the anguished cry from the other room that did the trick. I would have given my eye teeth to do some snooping, but the lad who showed us in did a very firm reverse and made sure we took a straight line for the front door and out. I heard the lock click behind us and that was it. We went across the street, got in the car, and took off. The fog was so thick you couldn't see 20 feet in any direction. Why are you biting your lower lip, Dove? Are you put out with me for being a scoffer? No, no, not at you, Rembrandt, but I am put out. That babe's as phony as a $3 bill. Yes, you and your Uncle Bart, who used to take you boating. Indeed. That scream and the voice, that's what did it. Very good, I thought. Sounded almost real. Oh, it was real, Ducky. Didn't you notice how excited the madame was? By Jove. I thought she came out of a trance awfully fast. And what about the vision of dear old Uncle Bart? Oh, that was rearview projection, girl. Uh, shot through some very fine cheesecloth to give it a slight distortion. Uh -huh. Well, okay. I'm making another appointment with the madame for tomorrow night. I want to see what's going on behind the scenes. Oh, where are you going now, Candy? Home and to bed. I'm tired. Then let me out on Van Ness Avenue, will you? I'm dickering with a man for a used car. Oh, well, I'll take you there. What's the place? Diogenes Anderson, the swapping Swede. Rembrandt got out at the used car lot, and I went home and had a good night's sleep. I wanted to have all my buttons because there were a lot of angles that needed angling. I awoke in the morning feeling quite fresh and ready for come what may. First thing to come what may was another drive out to the Valley of Wealth to check in with Mrs. Allison Gray. The door opened, but it wasn't Mrs. Gray. It was her nephew, Robert Warnicky. Oh, Miss Madsen. Come in, won't you? 
I'm so sorry, but it's the butler's day off. Oh, what a shame, having to strain yourself on that heavy door. Thank you. Yes. I imagine you want to see my aunt, hmm? Yes, you imagine correctly. Is she in? Uh, no. No, she left about half an hour ago. Said something about having to see about her hair. Oh, where'd she leave it? Oh, <laughs> very clever, Miss Madison. <laughs> what about your uncle, Mr. Gray? Is he here? Oh, Aren't you the one who's supposed to know where my uncle is? What do you mean by that? To repeat, you're very clever, Miss Matson. I have an apology to make to you. Oh? Yes. Yes, you're not a reporter at all. My aunt corrected my mistake. You're a private detective person. So who's denying it? <laughs> you know, you're very attractive, Miss Matson. I think I should kiss you. You what? I've never kissed a detective. Oh. <laughs> Why, you clown. Tell your aunt that'll cost her another hundred. I was so mad I boiled over and out the door. I think I drove all the way home and low at 40 miles an hour. I dashed up the stairs in my penthouse and scrubbed my face three times. And then I got to thinking how the character looked after he'd kissed me. <laughs> Lipstick all over his mouth, and I started to laugh. <laughs> and I stopped laughing. It may have been the most nauseating kiss that man ever bestowed on maid, but certainly stopped me cold. I went over to the phone and called Madame Natasha's Temple of the Zodiac. in the firmament are all masterful. Good afternoon. Is Madame Natasha there? No. Madame is resting. Oh. Well, would it be possible to make an appointment for this evening? This evening? Have you been recommended by someone? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Miss Ruth Burdett. Burdett? Burdett? Yes. Madame Natasha doesn't seem to have a Burdett in the fire. Oh, oh, she must. Miss Burdett was there only a few weeks ago. Well, uh, very well. Madame Natasha will see you at ten o'clock. That's perfect. And your name, please? Um, uh, Taylor. Geary Ann Taylor. <laughs> Things were beginning to roll now, and I think I saw the light. And if I was proven to be right, the light wasn't very pleasant. This time I didn't go as the mousy little character. I went as myself. I got in the car and drove out to the Temple of the Zodiac. If it had been dark the night before, it was even darker now, and I couldn't help shivering a bit. I checked my purse. There it was, my little thirty-two, and I felt bitter. Then I walked up the steps, rang, was shown in by the same gent. He didn't bat an eye, so I knew I wasn't recognized. I went through the same briefing instructions about not talking to the madame until she spoke first and so forth, and the man left. After a moment or two, so did I, down the hall. Then I found the staircase and rambled up in the semi-darkness. There were three rooms on the second floor, none of them disclosing a thing. Besides, the agonized voice that had cried out, No, no, please don't, seemed to have come from further off. So on up another flight to the third floor. I opened the first door. Nothing. Then Kitty Corner and another door. Still nothing. But on the third door... I could see them in the darkness. Two bodies piled side by side. I went over and lit a match. And there they were. The bodies of Mrs. Allison Gray and that of what obviously must have been her husband, Mr. Gray. Very cold and very dead. You seem to have found something, Miss Taylor. Yeah. They look quite natural, don't they? Madame Natasha is here. She is highly displeased with you. Yeah, I'll bet. Hiya, madame. Miss Taylor seems to be the curious type. You're out of character, Mr. Warnicky. You'd look better without that wig. I said you were clever, Miss Madsen. Too clever. Quick, Walter, get Oh, no, you don't! <laughs> Mister, you fool, shoot again! Candy! Oh, for Pete's sake, Rembrandt! Are you all right? I'm okay. Bullet in the arm, that's all. 
Where on earth did you come from? We were in the room across the hall downstairs when we saw you pussyfooting by, so we followed. We? Yes, we, Diogenes Anderson and I. The, the swapping Swede? What were you two doing out Candy here? Candy girl, how naive you are at times. You told me you were coming back here tonight. You didn't include me in your plan, so that meant you were coming alone. Knowing your propensity for getting into trouble, I felt it incumbent upon me to enlist the aid of my friend Diogenes and come to your assistance. Well, bully for you, Rembrandt. I'm glad you did. What did you fellas do to these rats? <laughs> As we followed you up the stairs, we implemented ourselves with two sturdy chairs. <laughs> then it happened. They fired, you dashed past us. When those two beggars came abreast of us, we merely lowered the boom. Diogenes on one side, I on the other. <laughs> oh, my word, we really tagged them, I fear. Well, I wouldn't worry about it. They've been working overtime. They can use a little deep sleep. <laughs> Look, Candy, two bodies. Tell me about it. Well, it's very simple, Mallard, dear. This nephew of Mrs. Gray's at one time had been a ham, a, a female impersonator in vaudeville. So last year he decided to try to convince his uncle, Mr. Allison Gray, that his days were shortening, that he should atone for his wicked life. Now, how do you go about that? By telling his uncle he should visit a fortune teller. And by a very strange coincidence, the fortune teller is a nephew, Robert Warney. That's right, the impersonator. The same, telling his uncle, and I quote, that he should give all his money away to charities before he died. And the uncle went for the gag? Sure. Did you ever know a man like that who didn't want to repent before passing out? Was a cinch. But all the charities were phonies, and all the checks came right back to Robert Warnicky. Well, I don't see why Warnicky had to go so far as to bump off his uncle and aunt. Did the catch wise to this racket? Well, that's it exactly, Miller. He was in so deep that he might just as well go all the way and eliminate. I see. You see, the uncle, in the first blush of being a grade A philanthropist, never questioned the charities which Warnicky suggested. Yeah, that makes sense. About a month ago, he started wondering and snooping, and he found out there were no charities. He was like a wild man. That's what made Mrs. Gray think her husband was losing his mind. Well, if I unloaded that much money through a swindle, I'd have acted crazy, too. Yeah, I'll bet. Well, the uncle started following Warnicky's movements. Just as he discovered that Warnicky was also Madame Natasha, Warnicky caught wise that his uncle had caught wise. He forced him into the old house on Buchanan. Mm -hmm. Now he was frightened. He didn't know how much his aunt knew. So he went back to the Gray's place, told his aunt that he had a tip as to where his uncle was. Naturally, she went along with him. She was still up in the room with her dead husband the first night Rembrandt and I went out there. It was her voice I heard crying, No, no, please don't. She'd heard our voices downstairs and tried to make a break. Warnicky's goon boy grabbed her just in time, and after we left, they did away with her, too. Hmm. A very unpretty mess. Yeah. How did you first tip to Warnicky, Candy? When he kissed me. When he kissed... Wait, what? <laughs> sure he kissed me. I appealed to some men. When I got home, I remembered the way he looked with my lipstick on his mouth. All I had to do was mentally put a wig on the Joker and voila, Madame Natasha. I'll be darned. Yeah. Aren't you going to kiss me goodnight? What? And turn into a fortune teller? Why, you cad. <laughs> Come here, cupcake. <laughs> What's the matter with you? <laughs> Good night, Madame Mallard. Hmm? <laughs> well, take a look in the mirror and then get yourself a crystal ball and you're in business. <laughs> <laughs> Heard tonight were Helen Cleave as Mrs. Gray, Kurt Martell as the butler, and Earl Lee as Madame Natasha's assistant. Tony Barrett played the dual role of Warnicky and Madame Natasha. Tudor Owen was Rembrandt Watson, and Whitfield Connor was heard as Lieutenant Ray Mallard. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is directed by Monty Masters. The characters in tonight's story were entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. And don't forget... Johnny, what's happened to New York? I'm not with you, Lee. Well, we've been here two weeks. Two whole weeks. And no crime has come our way. I seem to remember statistics to the effect that uh, a major crime is committed in New York every 75 seconds. 
Well, they certainly haven't been coming our way. Well, for my money, it makes a nice change. You know what I feel like? I feel like watching the boxing. Watching? I'd leave. Yeah, yeah, I know. I can't watch. But that's what I've got you for, isn't it? You're supposed to be my eyes. Well, we'll combine a little business with pleasure tonight. Okay. I want to see the big fight at the garden. So we'll go along. And you'll see how good you are at explaining to me exactly what's going on. <laughs> I want a blow-by-blow -blow description of the fight. And heaven help you if I miss a blow. Goodyear presents... The Sounds of Darkness. Tire and Rubber Company, makers of passenger, truck, and tractor tires for every requirement in South Africa's farming, commerce, and industry, bring you Lee Masters, the blind detective who challenges the sounds of darkness. Tonight's Sounds of Darkness, you will hear Tony Jay as Lee Masters, James White as Johnny Bridges. Other than the cast are Louis Ife, Adrian Steed, George Carellin, and Hugh Rouse. Now let's join the world of Lee Masters in tonight's Sounds of Darkness, The Last Round. He's coming down to ring now, Lee. He's uh, prancing around the ring, holding his hands over his head. <laughs> They've made him favorite. He's six to four on the sailor. Uh, you fancy him? Yeah. Well, me, I reckon Tiger Jackson will stop him inside six. Oh, you got to be joking, Lee. No, no. Tiger Jackson's well over 30. This guy's young and he's prime. Yeah, I know, I know. Sometimes, you know, a couple of dozen fights under your belt stands you in better stead than five years the right side of 30. You know, the sailor guy now, he's uh, he's had nine pro fights, that's all. Ah, uh, yeah, I know, Oh, I but... know, I know, he's won them all. Six of them are knockouts. But I still like the Titan. Oh, here he comes now. <laughs> Not such a reception as the sailor, huh? He seems kind of... I don't know. Kind of what? Well, he's not looking around and smiling the way the other guy was. He's walking kind of slow. His head's down. You know, sort of looking at his feet. He's getting to the ring now. He's not playing to the crowd at all, this guy. He's going straight to his corner. He's sitting down. He doesn't look much to me. What's, uh, what's Sailor Powalski doing? He's standing in his corner, hands along the ropes behind him. He's sort of leering at Tiger Jackson. His Polak sure looks confident. Well, when you get a fighting pole, he's usually pretty cocksure. You say Jackson doesn't look so good. I've certainly seen better. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, a ten-round contest at the world of weight limit of 147 pounds. On my right, at 140 pounds, Tiger Jackson! One hundred forty-six pounds, 
Taylor Kowalski. Certainly with the pole, all right. He's got them both in the center of the ring now. I give him the old routine about breaking clean and so on. Quiet a minute, Johnny. Huh? I want to listen to that riff. Oh, now, don't tell me you Quiet. can't. Quiet. Okay, so the horse didn't win. Well, can I help it if the horse I back Rob home by 20 lengths? <laughs> Since when's the car to back a winner? Since you fixed it so the favorite would lose and doped your horse to make sure it won. That's when. You don't have to prove that cover. Me, I ain't say nothing till I see my lawyer. All right, you bums. Shake hands now. When the bell goes, come out flatting. That rep, Johnny. Who is he? What's his name? Look in the program. Oh, now, don't tell me you could hear anything he was saying over the racket going on. I heard. I can't remember the name, but I, I've heard that voice before at the wrong end of an interrogation session. It says here his name is Lucas. Snowy Lucas. In a pig's eye, his name is Lucas. I remember now. Yeah, his name is Bolt. Piggy Bolt, they used to call him on account. That's just what he looked like. A pig. You know, this, this guy looked at me. Yeah, now you come to mention it, he does. Johnny, my little warning bell is ringing like crazy. You've got to keep your eyes peeled. Might be a false alarm, but... I have a feeling that something crooked is on the program for tonight. like he's been polaxed. Hey, how about that? The polack was polaxed. <laughs> and around, ladies and gentlemen, the winner by a knockout in the first minute of the fifth round, Tiger Jackson. What is it, Johnny? What's the matter? Havelski isn't moving. He's just lying there. Trying to bring him around. Not a chance. Hmm. Hey, that guy really is out. How do you figure that? A little tap and he's still unconscious. If he is unconscious. You don't mean he's... I don't know. But with Piggy Bolt around, it's only natural that things should smell. Come on, let's get moving. I want to be in the dressing room when they carry that guy in. hurt bad. I'm Sailor's manager. He's hurt bad. I don't feel any pulse here. He's not breathing. Yeah. Somebody's got quite a lot to answer for. This was Povalski's last round. He's dead? Are you trying to say my boy is dead? He's dead. And just to make the party complete, his breath smells of bitter almonds. 
potassium cyanide to you. Okay, you better sit over there. Yeah, what is all this anyway? To my way of thinking, the murderer must be one of you guys. Yeah, Where are you getting that, Copper? You're first, Tiger. Oh, me? I don't know nothing. I mean, uh, for why should I want to murder the bum? I had him beat anyway. Sounded like a great fight tonight, Tiger. Uh, thanks, Copper, but I don't know nothing about it, honest. You're next, Collie. Uh, this is a lot of nonsense. Why would I want to harm my own boy? Why should I Name go to... first. Who are you? Collie Blake. I'm the sailor's manager. I was in his corner tonight, like I am every night. You was talking about Patar, whatever the name was. Well, I don't know nothing about that. Everything went like it usually does. I don't see how anybody could have slipped the guy a mickey. Well, we'll see about that. Tell me, Collie, the water bottle. Yeah? Did Sailor drink between rounds? A fighter don't drink between rounds. Very, very rarely. He takes a swig from the bottle and he spits it out. He maybe gargles a bit. But not very often does a fighter drink between rounds. Well, that way he'd get sluggish, you know? Yeah, I see. You got that water bottle, Johnny? I got both of them here. One from each corner. And I got the buckets they used to sponge them down. Good. All right, next. Well, I'm Snowy Lucas. Uh, I was ref of the fight. I, I can't tell you nothing. Oh, uh, yeah. Mr. Lucas. That's right. Would it have been at all possible, in any way, for anything to have been introduced into Sailor's mouth from Tiger's glove? Huh? Come again? You, you mean, could the guy, uh, Tiger, could, could he have had this poison on his glove and pushed it into Sailor's mouth? That's what I mean. Hey, now, listen, I didn't do nothing. I'm not asking you, Tiger. Well, Mr. Lucas, would it have been possible? No, no, not a chance. You see, when they goes down under the canvas, when their gloves touch the deck, before they start fighting again, it's the ref's job to grab the guy by the wrist and rub the gloves on his shirt, the, the ref's own shirt. Well, that way you get rid of the rosin, you know. They, they, they put the rosin on the canvas so the guy won't slip. Well, a dirty fighter will try to keep this on his glove. So that at the first opportunity, he can rub his glove in the other guy's eyes and temporarily blind him. Yeah, that I know. Yeah, yeah well, like I said, tonight's fight was clean. There was nothing like that. Uh, when Tiger did go down, I made sure he wiped his gloves clean. Yeah, I see. Well, there's just one thing that worries me, Mr. Lucas. Eh? What's that? The fact that your name isn't Snowy Lucas. Huh? It's Piggy Bolt. And the last time you and I talked, you were dodging a rap for doping a racehorse. Yeah, you won a lot of dough that time. You know, wait a minute. Maybe I... you also won a lot of money tonight. Maybe you backed Tiger Jackson to win. And maybe you made sure he did win by poisoning Sailor Pawlowski. Maybe somehow, when you wiped the rosin off Tiger's gloves, you... Managed to rub some poison on him. Must be nuts. Maybe, maybe not. But it's a possibility, isn't it, Piggy? It's a possibility that could send you right to the chair. <laughs> You're listening to the last round tonight's. Sons of Darkness, brought to you by Goodyear, the greatest name in rubber. Lab report on the gloves, eh? Yeah. What do they say? No trace of sign. I've not a thing. Dante, you was nuts. So you did, Piggy. Well, it looks like it maybe lets you out for the time being. Say, how long have we got to stay here? Till I find the murderer. Yeah, but it's one o'clock in the morning already. Yeah, that's right. It is. All right, who's next? My name's Wilkie, Jess Wilkie. I manage the tiger here. And you were in his corner tonight? Sure, I'm his second, too. 
Uh, what do you know about this? Honest, Mr. Masters, I don't know nothing. My boy was doing good tonight, and he would have won anyway. I had nothing against this, sir. I mean, why should I? My boy was the better boy, and he was all set to win. So why should I follow it all up by giving them poison? Anyway, I, I, I was never anywhere near him. So the lab reports show no traces of cyanide in either of the water bottles, or the buckets, or on the sponges, or the gloves. Is that right, Johnny? That's right. So how in the heck can somebody give a fighter in the middle of the ring, in Madison Square Garden, in the middle of the fifth round, a fatal dose of poison? Can I talk to you a moment, Lee? Well, I wouldn't leave this bunch alone with the body. All right, I'll tell you what. You got a guard outside? Sure, I got four fellows from the central precinct. Okay, let them escort this bunch of beauties into the dressing room next door and keep an eye on them. They're not to talk to anybody. And while they're at it, they may as well search them. Yeah, you can't search us unless you got a search warrant. Well, now, you're quite right there, Piggy. I know I am. I tell you what the position is. Either you let us search you here and now without a warrant. In other words, you cooperate with the police for a change. Or else I'll personally see that they tie a charge on you for resisting an officer in the execution of his duty, and you'll do six months before we even start. Well, hang on, wait a minute. And I'll search you anyway, by force if necessary. Huh? So, what do you got to say to that? Well, well look, I, I'm not beefing. I, well, sure, you can search me. I got nothing to hide. That's mighty nice of you, Piggy. I'll say this. Open the door, Johnny. Okay, Lee. Officer, take this uh, chorus line round into the dressing room next door and keep an eye on them till I let you know. Sure thing, Mr. Masters. Come on, you guys. This way. Yeah, I'm all right. Well, Johnny, what is it? I was thinking. Seems like the only way anybody could have poisoned that guy would have been to have given him the poison in the ring. That, Johnny, is the problem. I know it sounds impossible, but that's just what must have happened. But, Lee, I'm telling you, it didn't happen. Look, think back. Think hard. In between rounds, between the... I was at the fourth and the fifth rounds. Yeah. Anything happened? Anything at all? Jeepers, Lee, I don't think so. I mean, you know, the usual stuff. You know, like rubbing the guy's muscles, fanning him with a towel, giving him the water bottle, all that kind of jazz. Nothing special. You sure? If there had been anything, I'd have noticed. That I'm sure of. Uh, Which leaves us right back where we started. Somebody poisoned that guy while he was in the middle of the ring, watched by 6,000 people. you get, Johnny? Lucas or Bolt or whatever his name is was telling the truth. He backed to Grant on Tiger Jackson to win. Nobody else had a bet. But I ran into Droopy outside. Oh, is that who's with you? Yeah. Yeah, that's me, Mr. Lee. Well, you might be just the guy I want to talk to. Guess there's not much goes on in the sporting world, either on the level or crooked, that you don't know about, is there? Well, I keep my head to the ground. Now, what's the word on the killing? Killing? Somebody dead? Maybe. How was the money going? What was the betting like on the fight tonight? I mean, uh, last night. Ah, you mean Sayla Pawlowski and Tiger Jackson? Yeah, there was big bread floating around on that one. A lot of dough, huh? Uh, You asked me, the syndicate climbed in on this one. As big as that, huh? Yeah. And these guys don't open their eyes under a hundred grand. Uh, The way I heard it, they stood to win half a million bucks. And they won, of course. Of course. When the syndicate bets, that ain't a gamble. That's a certainty. One way or another, they make sure of that. Yeah. Okay, Droopy. Thanks a lot. See you around. Uh, here's something for your trouble. Oh, gee, thanks, mister. It wasn't no trouble. For you, Mr. Lee, it's only a pleasure. You know that. Sure, sure. Have a drink anyway. Yeah, okay, Mr. Lee. I'll see you around. Well... 
interesting, Johnny. Yeah. As I remember the fight the way you told it, Sailor didn't look as if he was losing until he dropped in the fifth. Is that right? That's right. And in spite of the fact that I fancied Tiger, Sailor was the obvious one to win, wasn't he? He started out as unfavored. Yeah, that's right. You know what I think? What's that? I think the Sailor was going to take a dive. Hmm? I think it was all arranged that way. And for some reason, he changed his mind. By this time, it was too late. Uh, the syndicate had already laid out close to a quarter million bucks. He had to lose. That's why he was killed. So now we know why. But we don't know how or who. Uh, just let me think a minute, Johnny. When you've eliminated every alternative, what you're left with must be the modus operandi. Huh? Yeah. Now, so far, we've eliminated the fact that he might have been given poison before he came into the ring. Uh -huh. He didn't pick up poison from Tiger Jackson's gloves. Uh -huh. He didn't get poison from the water bottle. True. And there were no traces of cyanide in the buckets. We've searched every one of these birds, and every one of them is clean. Of course. Why didn't I think of that before? Well, I, I must be slipping. If I'd seen the fight tonight instead of you telling me about it, I'd have solved this thing before we got up from our seats. What are you talking about, Johnny? You know something? I think I know how this thing was done, and I think I know who did it. Trouble is, I... I haven't got the faintest idea how I'm going to prove it. Okay, okay, gentlemen. I've called you all back in here to tell you that in any moment from now, you can all go home. Oh, that's the nicest thing you've ever... All of you, all of you, except one, that is. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'll tell you why Sailor Powalski was murdered. And this isn't guessing. We've checked, and we know. About two weeks ago... The syndicate approached Sailor through a third party and offered 20 grand for him to take a dive. Sailor agreed. The third party clinched the deal and took the 20 grand. When he went to give Sailor his share, the pole had changed his mind. No amount of persuasion on the part of this third party could get the Sailor to throw the fight. Now, our friend, Mr. Third Party, was in trouble. The syndicate had laid out big, big money. Sailor had to lose. On his form, he was a cert to win. So, Mr. Third Party, the murderer, hit upon a bright little scheme. He got hold of some prussic acid. Yeah, and I know where he got it from. The poison was put into a soluble capsule, long and thin. And then... The capsule was put into the sailor's mouth. What are you talking about, copper? Your brother-in-law develops photographs, Collie. Bet there's plenty of potassium cyanide lying around his dark room. Yeah. You put the capsule in the sailor's mouth, didn't you? You're nuts. When did I get that chance? Before round five started. In the ring, in full view of 6,000 people... You slipped the capsule in his mouth. Oh, the gum shield. Of course, the gum shield. That's huh? right. That's right, Piggy. Who handles a fighter's gum shield? Only his second. Prove it. I'd like to see you prove it. Just before the fifth round started, you slipped Sailor's gum shield back into his mouth. Only this time, the cyanide capsule was stuck to it. You knew. You knew with a couple of punches to the mouth that the capsule would burst and that the sailor would swallow the poison. And that's the way it happened. Ah, talk. Just talk. Prove it, copper. I have proved it. That gum shield went to the laboratory. They found the traces that I need. Why, you... <laughs> Get him, Johnny. <laughs> All right. All right, I did it. What could I do? It was him or me. 
You know the syndicate. If Sailor had have won, they'd have rubbed me out for sure. I didn't have no chance. Thanks, Collie. I got three independent witnesses to your confession apart from the police. Take him away. Okay, come on, Collie. Come on now. Come on. Okay. Well, maybe I'm not such a bad gambler after all. A gambler? What are you talking about? I didn't have that gum shield tested. What? It wouldn't have done any good. In the first place, all traces of cyanide would have been washed off it by the saliva in the mouth. And in the second place, it wouldn't have proved anything in the first place. You were bluffing? Yeah, I bluffed him into squealing in front of witnesses. He'll make a full confession down to the central precinct. That's the only way we could have got him, Johnny. Next time I suggest a night off watching the fights, uh, just sock me one, will you? Tonight's Sounds of Darkness, presented for your entertainment by the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, makers of world-famous passenger tires, truck, and tractor tires for every requirement in South Africa's farming, commerce, and industry. Join us next Friday and every Friday night at 9.30 when Goodyear will again present the blind detective Lee Masters in... The Sounds of Darkness. Oh, splendid. There's a nice fire going here in the morning room. And Roger's arranged all your letters on the desk. Let's have the morning quietly by ourselves, shall we, Felix? Oh, anything you say, my dear. It has turned cold, hasn't it? Yes, I'm content to stay at home, do my correspondence. I have letters to write also. Hmm, what's this? That's odd, the writing seems familiar. And a foreign stem, of course it does. Dear Droops, this will come as a shock to her job. I can't believe it. It's signed Brawny. What is it, dear? You've gone quite pale. Are you ill? Well, this letter, it, it claims to be from my older brother Matthew, but... But he died. He, he died many years ago. We present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. The Eldest Son. Looking back over the years and the hundreds of cases I've chronicled about Sherlock Holmes, I recall one of the most interesting to be the chance reaction brought by Matthew Inglethorpe for the recovery of his lawful inheritance. It was about the turn of the century that Sir Rufus Inglethorpe died. He had lived for many years on his own at a vast country estate known as the Elms, near Canterbury. After his death, his younger son Felix and his wife Jennifer took over the house. For a while, all was peaceful. And then, a ripple of rumour began to run through London society. The newspapers and social publications hinted that all was not well at the Elms. I think it was at that point that Holmes started taking an interest. Hmm. What do you know of the Inglethorpe family, Watson? Well, little or nothing, Holmes. It's a name that has been continually bandied about in society, but as I take little interest in such affairs, I confess I'm, well, more or less ignorant. Well, why should I be interested? Well, because the family appears to have the seeds of destruction planted within itself. I've noticed that it occurs regularly in history and continues... Right until the present day. Now, let me see. I have several old scrapbooks here that would prove invaluable upon family references. Now, let me see. 
Ah, yes, I think this might tell me. Ah. Yes, yes, here we are. There was an Admiral Inglethorpe who greatly distinguished himself in the wars against the Dutch. And, of course, Sir Rufus, who died recently, was a famous army man. Yes, it was well known that he had an ungovernable temper. He ruled the family with a rod of iron. And inevitably, the eldest son, Matthew, kicked against this imposed discipline once he became of age. There was an enormous row, and Matthew left the estate never to return. For a while, he wrote secretly to his mother, but she soon became ill and died. Matthew is thought to have died in Africa. Oh, dear. I seem to have heard those sort of stories so many times in connection with wealthy families. Uh, I agree. Also, it seems that the daughter, Phoebe, caused a sensation by marrying an actor named Clarence Howard. As might have been expected, Sir Rufus lost his famous temper and she also left the Elms. Yes, they also travelled abroad, America mostly. And who was left? Well, just the other son, Felix, who left only to marry a wealthy society beauty, Jennifer Trent. It's they who are the present owners of the Elms. Oh, this may be of interest to some people, but I'm surprised that you find it so, Holmes. After all, the domestic squabble of the Inglethorpe family is a family matter. There's nothing criminal going on, surely. Not at the moment, not at the moment, but there could be. You see, Felix Inglethorpe used to be a member of the Diogenes Club. He's recently resigned. My brother, Mycroft, attributes it to yet another family scandal. Ah, we appear to have a visitor. Now, this could be most interesting. You see, Mycroft was mentioning my name only recently to Jennifer Inglethorpe, who was distressed at her husband not using the club. Now, I wonder... A lady to see you, Mr. Holmes. Says she's sorry she doesn't have an appointment. But here's her card and she's waiting below. She's very nice. Proper lady, beautifully dressed. Oh, thank you. Ah, yes, yes. Show the lady up, Mrs. Hudson. Very good, sir. Well, I'd better put the scrapbook away, Watson. It makes it look a little too obvious. The lady is indeed Mrs. Jennifer Inglethorpe. Mm, and it is a coincidence, Holmes. Oh, no, not really. She must have seen the papers and realised things were coming to a head. Ah. Mrs. Inglethorpe. Ah, good day to you, madam. Uh, pray do come in. It's a very cold day, but we have a good fire. Thank you. But... Uh, allow me to introduce you. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Mm. Watson. You may feel free to speak to him as you would to me. This is a most delicate matter. Well, I'll leave you if you wish, madam. No. No. Your brother, Mycroft, has told me much about you, Mr. Holmes. And you too, Doctor. Uh, uh, may I remove my cape? Oh, uh, please, uh, allow me. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, do sit down near the fire. I shall be most comfortable here, thank you. I, uh, I hardly know where to begin. It is regarding your husband and the fact that there is a claimant to the Elms Estates. His elder brother, Matthew, who was thought to have been dead these 20 years, has now returned to this country and as the eldest son of the family maintains that the Elms is his. Is that not so? Mr. Holmes, I cannot think how you know this. We have done our best to suppress these facts. Ah, but some news has leaked to the daily press, and speculation is now rife. I do sympathize, Mrs. Inglethorpe, but I hardly see how I can help. I'm so confused, Mr. Holmes. I thought if I could present all the facts to you, you, you might be able to make me see the whole affair in a more reasonable light, and, and then I might be of more support to my husband in his dilemma. Very well. I'm willing to listen to whatever trouble you find yourself in. Well, it is much as you suggest. Matthew, Felix's brother, has returned after over 20 years. He approached the solicitors, Coins and Blanco, mm -hmm. and they have drawn up a sworn affidavit regarding the whole of his activities. He says his life is an open book and anyone is willing to question him on any matter. My husband agreed to meet him privately and... Well, he is inclined to believe that this stranger from the grave is his own brother. I see. But we cannot just accept his testimony at face value. We are therefore prepared to wait. If the matter reaches court, it will create a sensational scandal. Mm. Uh, Phoebe, that is Felix's sister, who has returned to this country, now that both her father and her husband are dead, she refuses to believe that this man is her elder brother. Phoebe and Felix have never got along at all well. But this matter has thrown them together again. I see. Felix invited her down to the Elms, and the arguments have never stopped. Things came to a head a few nights ago. We had sought legal advice, of course, but a frank discussion brought many facts out into the open. Felix, as always, was kindness itself, but Phoebe was adamant. She impressed upon Wilfred Simmons, uh, our family solicitor, that she would never accept this imposter. I tell you, Mr. Simmons, that Matthew is dead. I know he is dead. 
This man is an imposter. We've only to take him to court and trick him once or twice, and we can break him. But, Phoebe, the letter, the handwriting. Well, we have nothing to compare it with, but the fact that they call me Droops. No one else ever called me that. Well, I mean, since we were children, except Matthew. And I always refer to him as Braun. You know that, but how could an imposter have found that out? I don't know. But he has somehow. Look, if Matthew had been alive in recent years, do you think we wouldn't have heard from him? Of course we would. He would have been sponging upon us, writing, begging letters. Oh, come, come, come. He, he may have become rich, successful, made good. After all, your own husband, Clarence... Well, Matthew would never have become successful. Clarence might have started off as an actor, but he ended as a theatre impresario, a name to be reckoned with in America. And he did it purely by hard work. Matthew was a drifter. He put down no roots and never worked unless he could help it. He was perilous when he died in Africa. Phoebe, you can't say that. You don't know it. You were guessing. And Mr. Simmons is right. I've never received a begging letter from Matthew in my life. Well, I have. Uh, what? You have? Yes, many times. Though I suppose he must have reasoned that because I left the fold, that I would be more sympathetic than you. I've received about five, all told, over the years. But, but why didn't you ever tell us? My dear brother... We've hardly been on speaking terms during the last 20 years, no, have no, we? Can, can you produce uh, any of these letters? Uh, we could compare the handwriting and no, then... No, of course I can't produce them. I didn't keep them. At least I don't remember doing so. I'll go through my things, but it's very doubtful. Did you ever reply to the letters? Once or twice. I was even stupid enough to take pity on him once. Many years ago, we were in America. He was there, too, drifting about the San Francisco docks on his way to Africa... I sent him money. He never acknowledged it. Then I had another begging letter from Africa. It was just before Khartoum. He must have died out there about the time General Gordon was killed. Since then, I haven't heard a thing. But, Phoebe, this doesn't prove a thing. I, I mean... No, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. This may help me. If we confront this man and ask him casually if he ever wrote to his sister, and if so, when and where... It will place him in an extraordinarily difficult position. He'll be forced to give us facts and figures. If you can only find one of those letters, Phoebe, then I think we shall have the proof that we need. I shall look. As I say, I hold out very little hope. But please, don't let us give him the chance to do even greater research into Matthew's past. I, I beg you, leave it until he tries to take the whole matter to court. Let us keep all this up our sleeves. I'd sooner settle it out of court without a scandal. Do you want to give away the family fortune, the home, just hand it over to this man without fighting him? I always thought you were spying. Oh, no, 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 please, please, please. Phoebe, you haven't seen him. I'm sure it is Matthew. He, well, he looks like Matthew, speaks like him. You can remember how he looks and speaks after 25 years? You were a youngster when you last saw him. You can't believe it's Matthew. And I won't let you hand everything over to oh, him. Now, please, please. Uh, let's keep all this to ourselves. Uh, at least for the next few days. Uh, just let us wait and leave the next move to him. Uh, now, what do you say? Hmm? Do you agree? And that is where we are at the moment, Mr. Holmes. I came to ask your opinion. What do you think we should do? Fight the matter in court or not? What do you say? Jennifer Inglethorpe leaned forward in her chair and looked eagerly at Sherlock Holmes. He'd been listening intently to a story. His dressing gown wrapped around his tall frame, his head sunk upon his chest as he gazed into the fire. He placed the tips of his fingers together and then said, I advise you to remain quiet. Your sister-in-law is correct in one respect. In a position like this, the guilty parties will eventually give themselves away. But I think in this case, quite a lot of rope will have to be played out before the culprits hang themselves. I was surprised that Holmes phrased his reply in the plural. But Mrs. Inglethorpe seemed quite satisfied. She rose to her feet. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. But will you promise me one thing? If at any time you can take an active part in the conclusion of this affair, you will do so regardless of our personal feelings. I will give you that promise, yes. Good day to you, Mrs. Inglethorpe. After that, some weeks passed before a court action was publicly announced. It immediately hit the headlines. There was general sympathy for the claimant. It was a romantic story. The return of the repentant prodigal son, penniless, to take what was rightfully his. It lasted for days. 
Some witnesses swore Matthew Inglethorpe was genuine, others that he wasn't. Of course, the cross-questioning of the man himself was the highlight. Sir Arthur Woolsey, for the defence, subjected him to hours of interrogation and threw some very awkward questions at him. Now, tell me, we have heard of your travels throughout the world, how you dropped the name Matthew Inglethorpe for the less conspicuous name Ian Thorpe. During this time, did you ever attempt to communicate with your family at the Elms? No. You didn't write any letters to your father, brother, or sister? I didn't write to my father or my brother at the Elms. I did, however, write to my sister Phoebe. Ah. Can you remember how many letters you wrote and the times and places from which you wrote them? I wrote five letters in all. I can't remember the exact dates. I know the last one was from Africa. At the time before that, I was in San Francisco, and Phoebe was kind enough to send me money for my passage to Africa. I arrived there in 1881, just after the defeat at Majuba. I wrote again some four years later, at the beginning of 1885, when General Gordon was slain. That was the last time I tried to communicate with her. Oh, well, Watson, he's got round that one perfectly. If he can only prove his handwriting, he's in a very strong position. Yes, I think they're going to bring his sister for the defence. Phoebe Howard was calm, but I suspected very angry as she stepped forward to give her evidence. She denied any resemblance of the claimant to her brother, refusing to see any likeness. As to the letters, she spoke with total conviction. The handwriting on the letter my brother Felix received, calling him by those nicknames, and the handwriting on the letters I received, is, to the best of my knowledge, completely different. It is a pity that you did not keep those letters. I would have done had I known this would come about. But who keeps begging letters for five years? Naturally, I destroyed them all. Naturally. But what makes you so sure that the claimant is not your long-lost brother? What about his evidence, his knowledge? He could have found out all he's told us from a long association with Matthew. In one of his letters, Matthew mentioned a bosom friend who travelled with him. They were in Africa together. I believe that bosom friend to be here, sitting in this court, impersonating Matthew. In this court? court? Please, Your Honour... May I make a statement? Proceed. My brother Matthew was the black sheep of the family. I was also treated as an outcast when I married the man I loved. Can't you see that if this man was Matthew, I should be delighted that he now came back to redress so many wrongs? I've no love for the past. I would dearly love to see a change in the old ways. If I truly believed this man was Matthew, I should embrace him with open arms. But as it is, I cannot believe him. I do not know him. But I know you and our secret regarding the governess. Yes, <laughs> Governess Grinsley. We got her fired by placing stolen jewelry in her wardrobe, didn't we? You and me. And no one else knows this, not even Felix. Or have you forgotten oh, that? that? <laughs> Oh, my God! Oh, oh, oh. 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 Great heavens, Holmes. He has won the day. For that, it was literally all over by the shouting. Judgment was entered for Matthew Inglethorpe, and he was cheered when he left the law courts. There was great admiration also for Felix Inglethorpe when he was seen to shake hands most heartily with his elder brother. Phoebe Howard, however, heavily veiled and muffled in her furs, hastily climbed into a waiting hansom and vanished. The case was over. So, you think the case is over, do you, Watson? I, uh, I beg your pardon, Holmes. Well, ever since we returned home, you've been wearing a satisfied smile, yet you haven't said a word. The events at the law courts could hardly have been more dramatic, could they? It's caught the public imagination, and everyone is pleased with the result. Except uh, Phoebe Hart. Oh, I don't think she'll be too distressed. What do you mean by that? Well, simply that in her own words, she was prepared to embrace her real brother with open arms. I predict that it will not be long before she and Matthew are reconciled. Mm. Well, then the case really will be over. And if they'll all learn the lessons of the past, then perhaps this family will not fail again, as you think they're doomed to. I wish I could feel as confident as you, Watson, but I'm afraid I still think there is a considerable way to go. And until something positive occurs, well, we must just wait and see, mustn't we? And after that, I was determined to forget the whole affair. 
I concentrated upon my work. Although word did reach me that Holmes' prediction regarding a family reconciliation had in fact taken place. It seems that once again it was Felix Inglethorpe's generous nature that brought it about. Come, come, surely it is time that we behaved sensibly. The facts have been faced. It is only natural that one should feel a certain animosity, but we must all try to rise above the circumstances. After all, Jennifer and I are the ones who stand to lose most. We are making preparations to leave the Elms. We shall return to town and establish our home there. Uh, you don't have to hurry in any way, Felix. And in fact, I should appreciate it if you could stay on and assist me in running the estates. No, no, I could not do it. That they are yours to do as you like with. And what of you, Phoebe? I shall be all right. No need to worry about me. <laughs> but these vast rooms, the running of the house. I'm still unmarried. Uh, there's no one here to play hostess. If you would consider returning to the Elms after all these years, I am more than willing to adjust to your taking your share. That... Uh, that is very generous of you, Matthew. But surely, after all that has happened, after all I have said about you, blackened your name. Will you consider joining me back at the old home and trying to make a future happy for both of us? Will you, Phoebe? It was shortly after Phoebe returned to the Elms that Sherlock Holmes made a rather unusual request. He'd been to see Jennifer Inglethorpe and her husband Felix and had somehow contrived to get us all invited down to the Elms one Sunday. I confess I could see no reason for this, but curiosity made me accept the invitation. It was clear from the onset that Matthew and his sister Phoebe were slightly put out by our visit. Felix introduced us, and immediately Holmes dominated the proceeding. I'm extremely sorry if this seems to be an intrusion in any way, but really, Mrs. Inglethorpe, you've only yourself to blame. Me? I don't understand. When you came to see me at my rooms in Baker Street, you made a request, and that was that if ever I saw fit to take an active part in the family drama, I should do so regardless of anyone's feelings, remember? Yes. Yes, of course. But I don't understand. No, but you will. Now, Mrs. Howard, it is with you that I shall start. By all means, Mr. Holmes. What exactly is it that you want? The truth, from your own lips. You see, it's one thing to cause emotional scenes with clever stories, but quite another to prevent those lies being verified. I have a good many friends in the United States. It did not take me long to confirm or deny the facts. I don't know what you mean. Your marriage, your husband's so-called success story, and his apparent death. Of course you married the actor Clarence Howard. You did travel extensively with him, but he was out of work most of the time, wasn't he? What are you talking about? You ended up in cheap lodgings in Boston. Then you and he disappeared from the scene. There is no record of his death or burial in the United States, and no one has ever heard of him in the world of the theatrical impresarios where he's supposed to have made his name. Now look here, Holmes, what are you insinuating? Are, are you trying to say I am saying I... that Clarence Howard didn't die. He remained very much alive. But Matthew Inglethorpe, the real Matthew Inglethorpe, did die out in Africa under the name of Ian Thorpe. Records could be checked there, you see. Then, then this man is an imposter. Of course he is an imposter. He is Clarence Howard. Oh, Clarence? Really? Of course. Holmes, I beg of you. How else could someone give such a convincing performance? Retain all the facts and details of family life unless he was a trained actor able to sustain a characterization. And... And all the information he, he gave us was drummed into him by Phoebe, his own wife. She alone knew the secrets of the family and groomed him to perfection in the part. And then, very cleverly, she took the role of being his arch enemy, trying to trick him. It was a performance almost as good as his. This, this is unbelievable. Of course, he won the claim. Against all odds, he had proved himself. Everyone was taken in. In time, a reconciliation with Phoebe and then, of course... They could take over the elms and the estates while you bowed out quietly. How long they would have been able to sustain the roles of brother and sister is a matter of speculation. Well, what course of action you take is up to you. I should guess that the next court case will be even more of a sensation than the first one. Don't you agree? Holmes and I returned to Baker Street immediately. And I cannot imagine the scenes that must have taken place back at the elms. Once again, I was at a loss to know how Sherlock Holmes had arrived at the truth. Every little detail was so overwhelmingly glib. His evidence, I mean. He remembered everything. 
The man knew far too much at just the right time. And the one member of the family who was never mentioned was Clarence Howard. Uh, it was worth checking up on. Facts. That's what detection is made of, Watson. Lies can never replace facts. Oh, she was very clever, but just a little too clever. Don't you think... <laughs> Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage as Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watson. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Your call from Blood River is ready, sir. One moment. Go ahead, please. Hello, Deputy Gray? Yeah, is this Mr. Dollar? Yeah, right. I've been assigned to the Colburn shooting. Uh, I got your telegram. Will you be here? Well, I have to ask you a favor. I got a plane space to Parkinson, and I understand there's a bus to a place called Divide, but I can't find any transportation into Blood River. Well, there isn't any. I'll have to meet you in Parkinson. Oh, good. I'm due, due to arrive at 4 tomorrow afternoon. Say, what about Coburn? Did he make a statement? No, he hadn't come to yet. If you want one, you better show some speed. The doc says he may not last till tomorrow. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you Edmund O'Brien in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Here's a taste treat you can enjoy indoors, outdoors, at work, or at play. The cool, long-lasting mint flavor refreshes you. The smooth, steady chewing helps keep you fresh and alert. Adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Life and Casualty Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of the Blood River matter. Expense account item one, $240, transportation and incidentals between Hartford and Parkinson. I was paged at the airport and given a note that directed me to St. Paul's Hospital, where I was met by Deputy Sheriff Tom Gray. I brought Coburn in here this morning, trying to pump some blood into him, I guess. Nothing like a hospital out in Blood River. Any improvement? Yeah, I don't think so. Slugs from a 45, four of them. If it was me, I'd have left him where he was. Moving him 40 miles didn't do him no good. Um, what did this insurance company send you out for? Mm, just a routine check. When a policyholder gets shot up, they like to know why and by whom. How much insurance he have? $50,000 worth. Oh, I didn't know that. Who's it go to? Frank Colburn, a son, and Mary Colburn, a daughter. Oh. Do you have any leads, Sheriff? Leads? Oh, I got what the hired girl said. What was that? I didn't hear about it. Oh, she was a witness. She was in the kitchen that night. Man knocked on the door, asked for some grub. Old Colburn walked in, started to shoo him away, and the man shot him down. Have you got him? Oh, no, not yet, but a posse's out hunting him. We'll find him. Come on, operating room's down this way. Any news? Uh, not yet, Mary. Hello, Frank. I didn't know you two were here. Yeah, we came in as fast as we could. Now, this is Dollar. He's from your pa's insurance company back east. Miss Coburn, Frank. Who sent for you, Dollar? The insurance company was notified of the shooting. They asked me to come out. Why? I don't think this is the time to talk about it. Uh, it's just the way they work, Frank. They like to look into things like this. Come on, Dollar, in here. Oh, Tom, wait. Can't we go in, too? The doctor told us to wait here, but we've got a right to go in if anybody has. Well, I, I guess you have, Mary, but the doctor probably thought it'd be easier for you this way if, you know, if something went wrong, you know. Well, it isn't. I want to be with him. I, I have a right to be. All right, Mary, if that's the way you want. You too, Frank? I don't see how it'll do anybody any good, but I'll come. The 
son, Frank, was a huge man, well over six feet in his high-heeled boots. But the figure on the operating table must have towered over him during better days. I learned later that Max Colburn was more than a man. He was already a legend in the Blood River section. But here, under the intense glare of a battery of overhead lights, and under the probing instruments of the surgeon, Colburn was a great deal less than a man. Through the concealing sheets, you could realize the disintegration of his body and his massive head, skin now bloodless and drawn, had already taken on the aspects of a skull. I knew he'd never make a deathbed statement, but we stood there and waited two hours for him to die. That's all, nurse. Jot down the time, please, and notify the coroner. Yes, sir. 6.15. Oh, now, Mary, don't do that. It, it won't do no good. Oh, Tom, what'll I do? What'll I do? You'll be all right, Mary. Frank, take her out of here, will you? Come on, Mary. There's nothing anybody can do now. If it had been me, Doc, I'd... Never brought him in. Old bull might have made it in Blood River. I'm sorry, Gray. He had to be moved. No facilities at all out there. That's your business, I guess. It was point-blank range, Gray. Multiple punctures of the stomach, single puncture of the right lung. He had to be moved. Uh, how do you do? Johnny Dollar, Doctor. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Dr. Fulton. Uh, Mr. Dollar is representing my insurance company. How do you do? I'm sorry I couldn't save him, Dollar. Uh, you did everything you could. Yeah. Who was it that uh, shot him, do you know? Not yet. I hope you'll find him. Max Colburn was a fine man. Yeah, the best. Now, what are you going to do now, Dollar? Go to Blood River? I'm still not satisfied about this thing. I'll put you up in my place. There's no hotel. Oh, thanks. I'd appreciate it. Well, nice to meet you, Dollar. Too bad it couldn't have been under better circumstances. You should never have brought him in. Well, he probably knew what he was doing. You think he shouldn't have been brought in? Why'd you let him? You're supposed to be the sheriff out here. There's nothing I could do to stop him, Frank. No, and there didn't seem to be anything you could do before to stop it either. Oh, now, calm down, Frank. The county don't pay you to run around with my sister. If you'd been spending half the time on your job that you do with her, this wouldn't have happened. That's enough, Frank. Now, shut up. And if Mary don't know, it's mostly your fault. I'm going to tell her. He's a hot-headed buzzard. Yeah, I noticed. Can we make it to Blood River tonight? Yeah, we can make it, all right. Uh, look, Dollar, I want to tell you something. It's a funny little place, only about 300 people in it. They aren't going to like you butting in. They don't like strangers. I'm used to that. Okay, as long as I told you. My Jeep is out in the back in the parking lot. It was only 40 miles to the village of Blood River. It took us until 9.30 to get there. But long before then, I had begun to feel the place. It was at the foot of a range of mountains that rose sheerly from a narrow, choked valley. And it was the mountains that gave the feeling of oppression. In the moonlight, they seemed to be leaning over the village, ready to destroy it at any moment. Gray had comfortable quarters in his cabin office. I slept fairly well. And the next morning, he drove me out to the village, to the Colburn Ranch. Quite a layout. Yeah, only 400 acres now, and Colburn used to own the whole valley. There's open range up in the hills there. Well, this is the best fattening range in the whole... Will you get away, Duke? Is that dog dangerous? <laughs> yeah, could be, I guess. He's the old man's dog. He knows something's wrong, but he don't know what. Oh. That's right, isn't it, Duke boy? Yeah. Now, go away. Go away. Come on, boy. Go. Well, come on. We'll go up to the house. Our girl will be in the kitchen, I suppose. Oh, cut it out, Duke. He's all right. Now, shut up, will you? <laughs> He don't see many people dressed like you. He's got nothing on me. I don't see many dogs like him. Millie, it's Tom Gray. I don't want to talk about it no more, Tom. I told you what I saw happen. Here's a man from back east. He wants to talk to you. Why? You tell him what I said. I did, Millie, but he wants to hear it from you. I see it all happen again. 
That's why I don't want to talk about it. But I will if I got to. Well, thanks, Millie. I'll make it short as I can. Go on, Duke. Now, you stay outside, boy. Go on, go on. Well, this is where it happened, Dollar. He's lying right there. This way with his head on the table. Uh, two of the slugs hit the wall there. Hey, you see the marks? Yeah. It was he lying face up? That's right. Went over backwards. Shot from about here, I'd say. Is that right, Millie? I don't know. I went in the sitting room when I saw there was going to be trouble. How much did you see? I told Tom. It was after supper and I was cleaning up. A stranger come to the door and said he was hungry. I yelled to Mr. Colburn. I have to ask him about things. And he started right away to run him out. I fed a lot of strangers. I never heard him act that way before. Did it sound like he knew this stranger? I couldn't tell. He started cussing at him, and I run in the sitting room and held my hands over my ears till the shooting. Then I screamed. According to the description you gave Sheriff Gray, the man was short, stocky, with dark hair and heavy eyebrows. Now, can you remember anything else about him? I can remember one thing more. He was wearing some kind of a coat and had a newspaper in one pocket. Mm-hmm. Would you recognize him again if you saw him? Oh, yes. I'll never forget him. Why haven't you caught him, Tom? We'll get him. Did you see him after you heard the shots? No. I run back in here and saw Mr. Colburn. Then I run outside screaming. Randy come out of the bunkhouse. I didn't see the man. That's Randy Drew. He didn't see this stranger coming or going. Colburn's son and daughter, where were they? They wasn't here. I don't know where Miss Colburn was, but Frankie... Mr. Colburn wasn't home yet from riding fence. Millie. What? You telling the truth? Yes. You aren't protecting anybody. Of course I ain't protecting anybody. Why should I do anything like that? Who would it be? I only asked, Millie. That's all I want here, Sheriff. Good enough. Thanks for the help, Millie. Yeah, it looks like it's going to storm. Yeah, how old is she? Huh? No, about 20, I guess. With a little work, she could be an attractive girl. She's peculiar. She grew up outside, but never quite did inside. How does she and Frankie get along? Uh, pretty good, I guess. What are you driving at? Sometimes that stranger story sounds just a little too pat. Now, hold on. I take it that's the bunkhouse? Yeah, that's it. Now, how could somebody kill Coburn and then get across all this open yard before anyone ran out to check on the shooting? I don't know. I guess shooting out here don't mean what it does where you come from. Folks here do a lot of shooting. Well, Millie said she screamed. It's pretty dark here, too. Mountains cut off the sun about 4 o'clock. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, maybe so. I told you we found a gun in a ditch near here. She said she had a newspaper in his pocket. The gun was wrapped in one when we found it. Who's this? What? That looks like Charlie Baxter. Oh, yeah, it is. He was in the posse. I wonder what he's steaming that horse about. Oh, oh. What's the matter, Baxter? What? What? We got a... what? We got the killer. We found him a silver scar. Oh, well, good. Where is he now? We're bringing him to your place. It's Elmer Bryce. He came back? You better get in there. Right. Uh, you stay here and bring Millie in. She'll have to identify him. Use the truck. Okay. Let's get on back to town, Dollar. Who's Elmer Bryce? He used to be a hand here, just flunky. Kept the rain string watered. Choked a colt to death with a rope, and old man Coburn darn near killed him. When was this? Oh, two years ago. You know, in 35 years of ranching, Elmer Bryce was the first hand the old man ever had to fire. Folks around here ran him right out of the country. The thunderstorm swept in over the mountains and began to drench the valley during the trip back to the village. A group of maybe a dozen curious were huddled in slickers outside Gray's office waiting for a look at the prisoner. He arrived by car, went through the formalities of arrest, and a few minutes later, Colburn's hired girl walked into the office and faced him. That's him. He's the one. You swear on a Bible, Millie? Yes, I could never forget him. Okay. You can go on back to the ranch. Thanks for coming in. I'm glad they caught you. Oh, Millie. When they kill you, maybe I can sleep without seeing it happen all over again. That's enough, Millie. All right. Hey, the one, Millie? Well, Bryce, you're under arrest. Anything you say will be used against you. Uh, I didn't kill him. Do you deny being at the ranch? Well, I was at the ranch, but I didn't kill him. Well, what did you do? Uh, I, I was hungry. I, I thought I could get something to eat. He owes it to me. I can't get work no place because he 
talked about me so much. Nobody will hire me on account of the way he talks. It was my fault that Colt talked. He kept pulling and the rope jammed. Colbert, he told people I was crazy and I did it for fun. That ain't right. What happened at the ranch? Well, I asked the girl for something to eat. She called Mr. Colburn. He come and cussed me out and told me to get off his land. And uh, I left. Well, he says when he cussed you out, you killed him. I don't care what she says. What kind of a gun do you carry? I ain't got no gun, and you can't prove I killed him. Of course, I never did. Him two is three. We want Elmer Price. Why did you go to his ranch instead of some other? I told you. Because he owes me something for what he done to me. Why don't you tell the truth so we can get on with this? Huh? I didn't kill him. You hated him. Uh, I hate a lot of people. Listen to them. Who is it? Pat, let me come in. Just a minute. All right, come in. Gather fast, Gray. Must be near to 100 out there now. They sent me in to say they wanted Bryce. Well, they can't have him. You know how they feel about old man Colburn? They want his killer for themselves. I didn't kill him. Nobody can prove I did. I think you've waited long enough, Sheriff. You better get this man into a car and get out of here. All right. Come on, on, Bryce. On your feet. I ought to give you to him. Uh, I don't care. Well, what give you me mean. a hand, Dollar. Sure. The faster we move, the better. Yeah. Open the door, Baxter. And start out. We'll be right behind you. Yeah. All right, let's go. Move, right. Come on, move. There was no stopping them. I caught a last glimpse of Bryce's face as I went down into the mud of the street. Then there was nothing but hundreds of thrashing legs carrying the mob and their victim to a waiting truck. Blood River was in the process of living up to its name. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, full-bodied real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you keep going at your best. So for real chewing enjoyment that's refreshing and long-lasting, always keep Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. Healthful, delicious Wrigley Spearmint Gum will make every day more enjoyable. And now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return you to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Deputy Sheriff Gray had fared worse than I, a boot heel had stunned him. So it was 15 minutes before we got underway in the jeep. We found Elmer Bryce on the road to the Colburn Ranch, hanging from a bridge. We took his body back to the sheriff's office in the now silent village. You gotta understand how they felt about Colburn before you can begin to understand their actions. I'll never understand. I've never been part of a mob. And neither have I. Neither have they. But this is something special. The old man is gonna break up the rest of his land and parcel it out. He's done it before. He was loyal to the Blood River folk, and it meant they could have the land of their own. They could never afford it except the way he sold it. You're in a bad spot, aren't you? What are you going to do about this lynching? I'd like to call back the last hour and a half. That's what I'd like to do about it. Should have kept Bryce out of Blood River, but I didn't know. These people are my friends. I don't have to go into Parkinson and name as many of them as I saw. That's what you pay for wearing a badge, I guess. Uh, It's a lousy break. Is there anything I can do? I think I better strap on a gun. For the first time since I got this job. Uh, see there on the desk, a receipt I made out when I took Bryce's personal things? I better have that. Is it there? Yeah, it's here. Sheriff? What? What's this? Who signed this? Oh, Charlie Maxwell. He signed because Bryce couldn't write. That's his ex just above there. He couldn't write? Well, no, he wasn't much for brains. You saw that. He couldn't write his own name, but he carried a newspaper around with him? Why? Just to have it handy for wrapping guns? 
Or did he learn to read without learning to write? Well, oh, it's going to be a strange kind of justice, Sheriff. If he was telling the truth and your village killed an innocent man, those that go free will live with that for the rest of their lives. I'll leave the Jeep with you. I'll drive Maxwell's pickup into Parkinson. Yeah, thanks. Uh, there's some of my clothes and boots you can wear. Better get out of them wet ones. And just take this advice, will you? Don't go throwing your weight around. It's going to send them crazy. Be careful. I'll be back after supper. The single street was still silent and empty when I left the Colburn Ranch. The mountains were closing in again. There should have been lights in the windows of the houses, but instead they were dark. And I could feel the eyes of the people who stood inside them, watching me pass. Finally, almost at the edge of town, a knot of men stepped from a doorway and waved me to a stop. Where's Tom Gray? He went into Parkinson. What for? To report the lynching. Lynching? Hear that, boys? He says somebody strung up the killer. I don't believe it. From what I hear, he hung himself. And good... Why are you trying this out on me? I'm not here to arrest you. I couldn't if I wanted to. What are you doing here? I'm still looking for Max Colburn's murderer. Bryce hung himself. He shouldn't have, because he wasn't guilty. Who says that? Sheriff Gray and I. There was nothing against him but your personal feelings and some circumstantial evidence. He's the one who done it. He even said so. Said what? That he went to the ranch first off. Why else would he do that? He was hungry. Now, come on. Get out of my way. If you people think the rest of the story will help you peace of mind, any, I'll try to get it for you. But Bryce was innocent. Think about that for the time being. Come on, move it, Ben. I'm coming through. Let him go, Ben. Come on, boys. He can't hurt us. It's all right. Yep, these clothes belong to a friend of yours. <laughs> Who is it? Johnny Dollar, Miss Colburn. Oh. Who is it, Mary? It's Mr. Dollar, Frank. Oh, yeah. Come on in, Dollar. Thanks. We uh, heard about Bryce. I'm sorry it went that way. Any man, I... I don't care what he is, has a, a right to a trial. Yeah. Lynching is one of man's least pleasant habits. This one especially, it looks like Bryce was innocent. No, he wasn't. Millie said he was the one. There could have been a lot of things wrong with her statement. She didn't see it happen. She only heard it. Somebody else could have taken advantage of Bryce's visit and done the shooting himself. I don't follow you. He did come out here. He admitted it. But I don't think he killed your father. He hated him. Mary, stop that. Sure, he hated him. Everybody knew it. With that and Millie's statement, who would bother to look any further than poor, dim-witted Elmer Bryce? Oh, Frank. Oh, Frank, Frank. Shut up, Mary. Go on in the other room. Wait a minute. What's the matter with her? She's upset. Frank, you killed him. Shut up. No. You'd like that to be true, wouldn't you? You said you would. You said you would and you killed him. I'm going to the sheriff, Frank, and don't try to stop me. She's off her head. Like everybody else in this blasted hole. Yeah? Why should she have said that? Because I lost my temper one night. Told the old man he better blow his own brains out before I did it for him. Because he forgot how to think with them. When was that? Uh, a couple of weeks back. Maybe I was hot enough to mean it at the time, but I... Well, I cooled off. I wouldn't kill my own pa. Well, there goes your sister, Frank. Sheriff Gray mentioned that he was going to sell the rest of his land. Was that the cause of the trouble? Yeah. He didn't care what happened to his kids. I told him with all the war talk, this was the time to hang on to it, restock the herds, and get ready to make some money. Ranch is yours now. That's right. Mine and Mary's. Where were you when your father was killed? I was riding fences up by Red Knoll. Do you have any way to prove that? Any witnesses? You don't run into anybody up that way. That's our land. Folks stay off it. What about it, Frank? What about it? There's a lot stacked up against you. I know it. You can depend on my sister. You and anybody else would like to string me up for it. What about Millie? Was she in it with you? In it? 
Now, wait. Don't get the wrong idea. I didn't kill my pa. There's a lot stacked up against you. Well, there are places to go. I don't like jails and courtrooms. I think I'll just fade until it blows over. That's not the way. You won't make it. You're going to stop me? I'm being paid to see this thing cleaned up. I'll have to try. Get out of my way, Dollar. You sit down until the sheriff gets you. Get away from the door. You're an outsider. It's none of your affair. Now get out of the way. I said get out of the way. What's this to you? Stay where you are. You can't make me... No, I don't want to have to kill you. So don't get up. Frankie. What do you want, Millie? What are you doing with that gun? You've got to kill him, Frankie. Get out of here. You've got to. For me. Why? Because I lied. I lied to everybody. What about? About your pa. Elmer Bryce didn't kill him. Millie. Because I did. I killed him for you. You told me that night you wished he was dead. You remember that night? I remember, Millie. And I told you I'd do anything for you. Remember that? Anything. Yeah, I remember. I lied. Elmer Bryce came, but I stayed in the kitchen and heard everything he said. I knew he hated your pa, and after he ran away, I thought about it. You're crazy, Millie. I waited for a while. When I knew nobody saw that man leave, I yelled to your pa again. And when he come in, I shot him. And that night, I threw away the gun. What's the matter with you, Millie? You know what's the matter. Now, you can't run off and leave me. You've got to help me. I can't help you. you you've got to kill this man. I won't do it, Millie. Then you've got to take me away with you. I'm not going away now. I don't have to. I didn't have anything to do with it. This is the end for you and me. All right, Frankie. Hey, get down. Don't. Don't do it. Kill her. Drop it. Let go. All right. All right. I did it for him. Now I don't care what happens to me. As far as I was concerned, that was it. Frank Coburn lost a lot of blood, but not his life. And his sister still had to live at the ranch with her ill-tempered brother. The hired girl who brought all this about was taken by the sheriff. When I left Blood River, the state had moved in to see what it could do about the lynching. But what that is, I don't know. The entire village was guilty of murder. And what could anybody do about that? All I know is that the original murder was not committed with the idea of insurance fraud. And in spite of the mess I got into... That's what I was hired to learn. Expense account item two, same as item one. Expense account total, $740. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, to make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. There's lots of cooling, real mint flavor in every stick. And chewing Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, wherever you go, keep some healthful, refreshing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. To make every day more enjoyable, Treat yourself often to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Gum and stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role, written by Gil Dowd, with music composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Edmund O'Brien can now be seen starring in the Columbia Pictures production, 7-Eleven Ocean Drive. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Bill Conrad, Junius Matthews, Sammy Hill, Clayton Post, Tyler McVeigh, Dave Light, and Howard Culver. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you've enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum every day. 
We invite you to join us again next week at the same time when, from Hollywood, Edmund O'Brien returns in another adventure of... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Being a private investigator means two things. You can be sure you'll run into trouble, and you can never be sure you'll get out of it. Well, there's not much you can do about it, I guess. Except, like Julie always says... Walk softly, Peter Troy. And now Peter Troy investigates a far-out whale. After the First World War, there sprang up a clutch of writers who got themselves dubbed the Lost Generation. Now, Kerouac and many like him are pretty serious writers, and I, for one, would never like to be found knocking a serious artist of any kind. But I do not have a great deal of time for those weirdos who like to call themselves beat and aim to live the part by working as little as possible, washing but never, and making with a nutty kind of dialogue that nobody else can understand, unless maybe he's a bird. Now, this latter is something that Julie's inclined to criticize me for, and I plead a little guilty, which is the easiest way out. However, the characters I'm talking about leave me for dead. I am, of course, talking about those oddballs whom squares like myself have come to know as beatniks. May I take it, then, that we understand each other? Crazy. Now, what does that mean? Uh, like you uh, dig English? I understand English, if that's what you mean, young man. It would help if you would speak it. Uh, like I, I get the message. Oh, presumably that means you do understand our bargain. All right, then. Now, there's one other thing... Oh, would you mind stopping that eternal drumming? I, I can't think with that noise. Noise? Oh, man, oh, man, but you're sick. Sick? I'm perfectly well. A oh, guy was way out there like I was getting sense. Uh, you dig asteroid 4,073? And you give me this noise, Jess? It is no use. I can't understand a word you're saying, but I want you to understand one thing more. If Robin finds out anything about our arrangement, then the whole thing is cancelled as far as I am concerned. Crazy. Oh, but um, about the bread. Bread? Uh, you know, like uh, bread. Uh, now, what the squares call bread. Uh, oh, yes, uh, money. Oh, that... I told you. A hundred pounds now, and a hundred a month for the next six months. After that, it won't matter. The first I heard about this particular piece of buffoonery was when Robin Garraway came to see me. A Robin, although you wouldn't be sure from her name, was a girl. As it happened, you couldn't be sure of that from her appearance either, a fact which I found somewhat disconcerting because... Believe it or not, I come from an old-fashioned school that holds that men should look like men and dolls should look like dolls. Even my secretary, Julie, bless her cold heart, was not a little thrown when Robin slouched into the office demanding to see me. And, in fact, so surprised was Julie that she showed us straight in. I'm not sure whether she did this by mistake or to punish me for some ancient misdemeanor, but whatever it was, I didn't like it. Hi, Troy boy. Skin me. Uh, uh. I would imagine she, uh, he, uh, she is inviting you to shake hands. Oh, he is? Uh, well, she is. Wow, what a drag. The other end of Squaresville. Well, what is all this, Julie? I'm very busy. Don't bug me, Seamus. If it's the bread, like I'm loaded. Here. What? Yeah, what's this? Count it. Uh, you count it, will you, Julie? My rough guess is that there's 500 pounds in that little lot. You dig, Peeper. On the contrary, I do not dig. 
Now, I am very busy, and I have no time for weirdos in sloppy black sweaters and tight pants with their faces half obscured by dark glasses and hair that hasn't been washed for a month. Man, oh, man. So sick. Five hundred pounds is right, Mr. Troy. Yeah. Okay. For five hundred pounds, I should do what? And make it fast, huh, so I can throw you out even faster? Like, there's this square who bugs me every night. Mm Mm-hmm. And what do you want me to do? Shoot him? Like persuade him to split, that's all. Uh, tell me something. Uh, are you really a girl? Huh? You heard me. So it's the whole truth, man. Well, we got that settled. At Pete's place. Every night he's there, and he really bugs me, man. Pete's place? Sure. Same as you, man. That's why I dig you. Pete. Same as you. They must have named a beat joint after you, Mr. Troy. Quite a claim to fame you have. Uh Ha-ha. Say, uh, Queen Anne, why don't you split the scene, huh? What? (laughs) Like your drag, you know. Really? This is getting a bit much. Yeah. Now, I got news for you, chick. You are going to split the scene in right now and take your your bread and blow. the incredible characters. Did you ever see anything like her? Well, for once, I'm not even sure it was a her. Well, she sounded like one, and a young one at that. I'd say she was only about 20 or so. Well, I wouldn't risk any money on it. When creatures arrive from outer space, how are you supposed to know their ages? Well, there didn't seem to be so much wrong with it that a good bath and a change of clothes wouldn't fix. A change of dialogue would be enough. All that crazy beat talk. Hmm. Just a sad old imitation of the thing they started in the States. And phony as a nine-dollar bill. Anyway, we can put a mark up on the wall. How's that? But it's the first time you've thrown a girl out of your office. <laughs> Julie, are you sure it was a girl? It wasn't a trained monkey or something? I don't know. I'm curious. <sighs> you would be. That figures. That's dames for you. Now I suppose you want me to go looking for her and get a life story, huh? Well, you were rather hasty, Pete. Me? Mm. Hasty? She was insulting you right, left, and center, and I got rid of her. That's all the thanks I get. But did you notice she seemed to have a a well-educated voice? No, I did not notice. I never bothered to notice things about dolls who crawl out from some zoo. I wonder how she got like that. And then there's all that money. Yeah. Well, maybe she robs banks on a day off. It's very odd. Uh, What was the name of that place? Um, Oh, Pete's place, wasn't it? Yeah, what of it? Well, I was just thinking. You're not doing anything special tonight, and neither am I. Oh, now, wait a minute. Well, it can't do any harm just to go and look, can it? We might get a laugh or two out of it. Julie, I am not going to any crummy, smoky beat joint to listen to a lot of nuts spouting meaningless poetry. Now, you can take that appealing look off your face. I am not going, and that is final. Best vaudeville tradition, the man says to the girl, we are not going, and that's final. And in the next scene, there they are anyway. <laughs> here, remind me to see my psychiatrist, Julie. Well, I think it's rather fun. <coughs> oh, here. You were right, it is rather smoky. <laughs> smoky and crummy. Coffee tastes like I was brewed in a paint pot and strained through a very old sock. Oh, what funny things you've tasted. Huh? I wouldn't know what coffee brewed in a paint pot, etc. tasted like. Oh, my, oh, my, but aren't we on the ball tonight? Mm. You should be up there on that platform doing your stuff. I say, Pete, aren't they quiet, though? Well, doesn't anything, well, you know, happen? Oh, what did you expect, the dance of the seven veils? Oh, hello. Music stuff. Oh, that's something to be thankful for. Uh, hey, look. Hmm? It's your friend. Oh, now, don't blame her on me, honey. You let her into the office. Well, she's going to sing or something. She's going up on the platform. Mm, Just so she doesn't give us the beat arrangement of Land of Hope and Glory. Shh, she's going to start. Oh, I can hardly wait. The flowers that bloom in the spring are fingers of time. Half bent, half scent, yearning, stretching, down from the lowest, up from the highest, needing... And ever bleeding, never seeding, urging for hands drawing, heart enslaved, bold faced. Ergo, a man, the face inward crumpled, an end before beginning, arising, triumphant and downcast, going away, away, 
Away, away. Oh, that was just a doll. Oh, for heaven's sake, what was all that about? You didn't get the message. Oh, it was quite clear to me. What? Yeah, the girl is a nut. Hmm. Hey, hey, she's talking to someone. Yes, I noticed that man before. He doesn't seem to belong here. He's too old and too... Oh, what is it? Square? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Hello, he's trying to drag her off out of the place oh, by the look of it. Oh, please, shouldn't you do something? Well, there's no need to. The lady already has a knight in shining armor rushing to her aid. Oh, another beatnik. He must be a boyfriend. Oh, and hit him. Hey, this looks like getting rough. Oh, Pete, do something. Yeah, I will. I'm getting us out of here right now. Oh. Come on. Miss Cynthia Higgins, Mr. Troy. Oh, yes. Uh, please take a seat, Miss Higgins. No, thank you. Yeah. Well, now, uh, how can I help you, Miss Higgins? Uh, you won't need me, Mr. Troy. Hmm? Oh, uh, no, no, I guess not, Miss Summers. Oh, but uh, aren't you going to take notes, like always? I don't believe it will be necessary on this occasion. Miss Higgins is rather uh, different from some of our clients. Oh, yeah. What did she mean by that? How am I different? <laughs> well, it's uh, it's just that, uh, as a rule, I uh, I like to have Miss Summers present when I have a lady client in the office. No? Why is that? Uh, well, if you need to ask, ma'am, there's no point in my telling you. Uh, now, uh, what did you want to see me about, huh? I made some inquiries about you, Mr. Troy. I've been given to understand that your reputation is very good. Oh, well, you'll get no argument from me on that. The matter I wish to place in your hands is of a rather delicate nature and calls for the utmost discretion. Mm. Well, so far, I'm with you, ma'am. What? You have an odd way of expressing yourself, I must say. You're not one of those strange beatniks or something, are you? Beatniks? Oh, no, ma'am. I'm a Canadian. Apparently, you don't know what I'm talking about. I was not inquiring as to your nationality. Uh, well, shall we stick to business, ma'am? It might be simpler. Oh, by all means. I want you to find a man. My brother-in-law, to be exact. And nobody could ask you to be more exact than that. I may as well tell you that until recently, I thought he was dead. He went overseas some years ago, and nobody had heard of him. But now... He's turned up in London. Oh? Yes, and he narrowly missed being arrested last night. Arrested? For what for? Brawling. Assault and battery, that sort of thing. He was involved in a fight in some revolting little place in the West End. A nightclub? No, oh, I suppose some people would call it that. I really don't know what I would call it. Well, does it have a name? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Its devotees call it Pete's Place. <laughs> I sat back in my chair and looked hard at Miss Cynthia Higgins. And not so much because I wanted to look hard at an old lady like her. She had too much the appearance of having just been sucking a lemon. No, what was getting at me was the occurrence of one of those coincidences that occasionally crop up in my kind of business. Coincidences that might make things a whole heap easier if they occurred more often. Now, yesterday, a creepy young character had come to see me about some guy who, she said, was bothering her. Last night, Julie and I had gone, out of Julie's unreasonable curiosity, to a crummy beatnik joint where we'd seen a character annoy this young doll and get himself involved in a fight. And today, Miss Higgins comes and tells me that the guy she once located was last night involved in a brawl at this same beatnik dive. It was reason enough for me to take some time off to wonder at the workings of fate or some such. Why are you staring at me like that, Mr. Troy? Hmm? Oh, well... Was I staring? I'm sorry. Uh, but tell me about this guy you want me to find. Uh, you say he was involved in a fight at this uh, Pete's place. Yes, that's right. Uh, I believe the police were called and he was nearly arrested. Only nearly? Uh, did he start the fight or what? Oh, I, I don't know the details, but I understand he provoked some young man into fighting, but he escaped before the police could arrest him. Uh, the young guy, you mean? No, no, no. The man I want you to find. Oh, uh, what's his name? I don't know. What? Miss Higgins, how can you want me to find a man whose name you don't even know? Well, I... I do know his name, but I prefer not to give it to you. 
In any case, he won't be using that name, so it doesn't matter. Well, of all the crazy... Okay, Miss Higgins, uh, what about a description? No, I can give you that. And why do you want this guy? I'm afraid I can't tell you that either. Oh, great. Now, I'm sorry to sound so mysterious, Mr. Troy, but I assure you I shouldn't do so unless it were absolutely necessary. And I must ask you to observe the utmost discretion yourself. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that. I was just about to give the whole story to the newspapers. I always do that. What? Oh, forget it, Miss Higgins. I'll just get my secretary in and you can give us a detailed description of this guy. And there will also be the matter of my retainer. Well, she paid up your retainer like a lamb. You can't say she's in a good payer. About that old girl, I can say anything I like. She is not my type. Of course not. In the first place, she's over 25. And in the second, she probably never did look like Marilyn Monroe or Jane Russell. No, but did you ever see a picture Boris Karloff made called uh, The Bride of Frankenstein? Oh, are you kidding? She'd be a bit old as the bride, wouldn't she? I was talking about the bride. Anyway, we've taken her good money, so I'd better do something about this character we saw annoying that beatnik. Uh, well, what was her name? Robin, Robin something. Uh, Robin Garraway. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know something? What? For once, I'm glad you are a woman and consequently curious. Oh, it would have sounded nicer if you'd left out the curious bit. It was a lucky break going to that joint last night. At least I know more than Cynthia thinks I do. And maybe I can get some more information from our dear friend, Inspector Caswell. <laughs> Well, there it is, Troy. Rather routine sort of thing, you know. Bit of a brawl over some girl. Police took a few names, asked a few questions. An undertaking was given that the damage to the place would be paid for. No arrests were made. All in a night's work, huh? Yeah, Inspector. Well, about these names... Now, what's your interest in this matter? Oh, now, 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 Inspector. Breaking a confidence and all that, you know. Yes. Now, what you mean is you intend to pump me for information, but you're not going to tell me anything in return. Now, that's friendship for you. Well, I might just tell you something, if you're good. Thanks. I feel much better now. Yeah, well, these names the constable took, where are they? Oh, let's see. Um, hmm, uh, there was a girl by the name of Robin Garraway. Mm-hmm. Uh, funny, that seems to ring a bell. I wonder why. Well, I don't know. Maybe you're psychic. Now, uh, what about this girl? Two men fought over, and, and of course others joined in. You know? Oh, such fun. Uh, who were the guys who fought over her? Well, apparently this girl's a beatnik of sorts and has a boyfriend to match. And this other man was, uh, he was a much older type. Well, let's get this straight. Uh, this old guy accosted the girl and her young beatnik boyfriend objected. And there was a fight between the two guys. Mm -hmm. Now, the old guy had been frequenting Pete's place and trying to make time with the girl, right? Oh, if you know all that, I can't imagine what you're bothering me for. The name of the beatnik boyfriend, please, Inspector. Mm -hmm. Oh, that. Oh, um. Uh, King, Ronald King. His friends call him just the King. Mm. And the old guy, the one who was annoying the girl, what's his name? I don't know. The constable didn't get it. He managed to get away from the place before he could be questioned. <sighs> well, you're not much of a help after all, are you? I'm doing my best, Troy. Anyway, I think you might assume that the man's name was Garraway. What? According to our information, the young fellow, King, and the girl complained to the constable that the older man kept yelling at the girl that... He's her father. Her father? Yes. Then the girl said she never set eyes on him before. Hmm. What do you make of that, eh? So, Ronald King... So? You're not an easy man to find. They've been all over looking for you. So? Oh, what are you, a broken record or something? Now, come on, open up and let me in. I want to talk to you. I said open up! <laughs> now, you just listen to me, chum. To your little pals, you may be the king, but to me, you are but nothing. 
You're just a little creep who needs a shave and a bath, and I am very tough and pleasant. And I carry a point thirty eight snub nose revolver, and I just love to use it on people. Look, what's with you, man? I ain't done nothing. It happens you've been keeping company with a girl by the name of Robin Garraway, in whom I am very interested. She your chick or something? You might put it like that. Crazy man. You can have her. What? You mean she she doesn't mean anything to you? But like nothing, man. It was bread, that's all. Bread? Money. Now, come on. Who paid you to worm your oily way in with Robin? Jenkinson, I heard the doorbell. Who was it? It was I, Aunt Cynthia. Robin! What are you doing here? I decided to come home. It seemed the most sensible thing to do. Oh. Robin, I told you when you went off with those dreadful picnic friends of yours that I would make no attempt to bring you back. And you didn't. But I decided that that life is not for me. Oh, did you? Well, that's all very well, but did it occur to you that it might not suit me to have you back here at Garraway Hall? Aunt Cynthia, you told me my father was dead. Well, so he is. He went overseas years ago... His father disowned him. He left your poor mother alone. My mother wasn't very poor. Grandfather saw to that. He let her live here. And he let you, my mother's sister, live here at the hall with every comfort. Yes, he did. And you may as well know, Robin, I intend to go on living here. I've never said you shouldn't. You? Why should you have anything to say about it at all? Who are you? A mere child with no sense. You go rushing off to live in some horrible little room in the East End. You start talking and dressing like those dreadful people. I wanted to find out what the other side of life was like. Whether it was really something worthwhile. Instead of spending all my time just living in the lap of luxury. Well, you can go back there. You're not wanted here. You're exactly like your father. Absolutely no sense of responsibility. Aunt Cynthia, I met my father last night. What? He'd been coming to Pete's place. Somehow he'd found out I was there. He wanted me to leave there and not go back. There was a fight and he disappeared. Oh, really, this is, this is too absurd. Some dreadful man comes along and says it's your father. Uh, once more, yes. Well, what, Mr. Troy, I must protest. Oh, this is my secretary, Miss Summers. Uh, you've met, of course. Hello, Miss Higgins. Uh, oh, but surely this can't be Robin. That's right, Miss Summers. Mr. Troy, you are intruding on a private conversation between me and my niece. Oh. Now, would it have anything to do with the fact that in another few months, when she's 21, she comes into her grandfather's fortune? What? But only on condition that you're living here at Garraway Hall at the time, Robin. That's why your Aunt Cynthia paid Ronald King good money to keep you away from here, living in the East End as a beatnik. Aunt Cynthia? You didn't. Of course I did. And why not? Under your grandfather's will, Garraway Hall would go to me if you were not here at the time you turned 21. While I've lived here so long, I've, I've come to regard it as my home. You see, your father found out about the terms of the will, Robin, of which your aunt kept you ignorant, and came back to try to get you to return to your life here. Unfortunately, he went about it all rather foolishly. Oh, where is he? I must see him. At police headquarters. We'll take you there. And uh, it'll be a pleasure... I must say, now that you've got rid of that terrible beat outfit and started dressing like a girl, Robin, you look terrific. Uh-uh. You're beginning to bug me, man. Huh? So, uh, like, walk softly, Peter Troy? <laughs> Presenting Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. On stage tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another in NBC's parade of exciting half-hour presentations. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. 
and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Tonight's case, play for keeps. Five minutes past midnight on December 12th, several years ago, Sheriff Bob Smithers of Bradshaw County, Texas, staged a raid on a gambling establishment located on a country road. But there were no patrons in the house, and the sheriff's face grew dark red as he and the local constable failed to find any evidence. There's nothing in the upstairs room either, Sheriff. You're sure of that, huh, Jim? Not even a deck of cards. See, Sheriff, like I told you, I quit the racket. Yet this is the fourth time this year you rousted me out of bed. I know you're operating, Walton. And I'm going to get you for it. You're not going to milk the citizens of this county. Not while I'm sheriff. Look, sheriff, this happens to be my house. Warrant or no warrant, you finished your business here. How about getting out? I guess we might as well go, sheriff. No, Jim. We're going to stay a minute. I want to talk to Walton. And you. About what? I was sure of this raid tonight, Jim. Dead sure. Just like I've been sure the last three times, because only you and me ever knew about him. I didn't tell nobody but you, Jim. You, the constable. <laughs> Sounds like he's accusing you of tipping me off, Dunn. I know he tipped you, Walton. You better watch what you're saying, Bob. All that talk about law and order and wanting to uphold him. Let me see your wallet, Jim. Take it out and let me see it. Now, wait a minute, Sheriff. You shut up. Come on, Jim. I want to see if you're carrying the kind of money an honest man gets for being a peace officer. What I carry on me is my own business. Why, you cheap two-bit snake. Nothing cheap about a few hundred once in a while. Be smart, Sheriff. Get a few for yourself. Why don't you listen to him, Sheriff? He's talking sense. Come on, both of you. I'm taking you in. You can't make anything stick. Maybe not. But I'm going to make this county too hot for both of you. I'm going to run you out of it. Keep your hands off me, Sheriff. You're under arrest. Grab him one of I just I got it. Just hold him, fool, while I get his gun. I got there. it. There. Don't you. You killed him. Oh, no, no. No, you killed him. You grabbed his gun and killed him. He was after you, Walton. I got a gun of my own, and I'm the constable. Are you set me up for a frame? Not necessarily, Walton. It's up to you. His body could be moved out of here. What's your play? What do you want? No more chicken mash. Fifty percent of your take. And you can go right on operating. With him dead, you crazy fool? You're forgetting something, Walton. I'm top dog now. And investigating this murder will be my job until a new sheriff is appointed. <laughs> but I don't think I'm going to be able to solve it. The body of Sheriff Smithers was found the next morning, dumped in a ditch by the side of an old wagon road. During the next few days, Constable Jim Dunn conducted a seemingly honest but fruitless investigation, even following the efficient peace officer's routine of making use of the state lab facilities at Austin. But citizens of Bradshaw were not satisfied, nor was the editor of the Bradshaw Times. Clippings of his editorials were on file with Captain Stinson of the Texas Rangers. And the captain sent for Ranger Jace Pearson. You want to see me, Captain? Yeah, Jace, sit down. There's no acting sheriff appointed by the court of Bradshaw County here, Jace. I think you better take over. About the killing of Sheriff Smithers? Mm -hmm. I'd like to. I knew Smithers. See, that's right. You worked with him about five years ago. When he first took office. Cleaned that county up in three months and cleaned it good. Well, it doesn't look like it stayed clean, Jace. Not according to this editorial clipping from the Bradshaw Times. Yeah, I've read it. It's going to be a tough one, Jace. No clue to the killer, and the trail has had a couple of days to cool off. Well, and I better get going before it gets any cooler. You'll hear from me. Uh, Jace. Yeah, Captain. I just want to remind you, whoever did it doesn't hesitate to kill a man wearing a badge. I 
Reese Bradshaw in the early morning. The town was waking up, and the Bradshaw Times was turning out its bi-weekly edition. I went in to see the editor, Frank Carlin. So you read my editorials, huh? Well, I'm glad no somebody's reading. Yeah, you got readers, all right. People been clipping them out and mailing them into our headquarters. Yeah, I guess there's always a handful of people to hold out. <laughs> Wonder what the world would do without them. Everybody was so burned the day of the killing. Then in 48 hours, they want to forget it. Well, it's always that way. How about the constable, Jim Dunn? Oh, he's all right, I guess. But he's only been constable for a year. He just doesn't have the experience. It'll take the court a couple more days to decide on a new sheriff. I better knock out a story on you rangers coming in. Might wake the people up again. I'd rather you didn't, Mr. Carlin. I'll, I'll be around and they'll know soon enough. Oh, see what you mean. Want me to lay off the editorials for a while? If you don't mind. You know, the sheriff and I are on different sides of the fence politically, but he was an honest man and I liked him. I got a headline back there, all set and gathering dust. It says, Sheriff's Killer Caught. Ranger, give me a chance to use it. I found a place to park my horse trailer and put charcoal in a pasture. Then I headed for the constable's office and met Constable Jim Dunn. There are all the reports in my investigations, Ranger. You think I haven't done a good job, maybe those will change your mind. I even checked ballistics with the Austin lab. My being here isn't a criticism of you, Mr. Dunn. I'm here because I was sent until a new sheriff is appointed and to give you help. I've done everything possible. I've questioned almost a hundred people. I've checked alibis on more than a dozen possible suspects. It's all there. Yeah, everything's here. Everything except the murderer. And that's the only thing I'm interested in seeing, Mr. Dunn. A little cooperation between us might clean it up. I'm, I'm sorry I blew, Ranger. It's been getting under my skin. This murder could have been committed by anybody. Some bum from a hobo jungle, some drunk anybody. We can't arrest anybody. We've got to arrest somebody. Somebody definite. Now, exactly where was the body found? Old Wagon Road bypasses town about two miles north. Is it fit for a car? Yeah, but you've got to go round about to get to it. Almost 11 miles. You won't find nothing there, though. I'd like to take a look anyhow. Can't we cut cross-country on horses? Yeah, shorter if you want it. I want to. My horse is in a pasture. I'll meet you at the edge of town in five minutes. body was found just a little further on. You can see the road now. Not much of a road left. Uh, no use for it anymore. The sheriff must have had some reason for using it if he came way out here. Uh, here we are. Move one. Oh, oh, bow charcoal. Oh, boy. The uh, sheriff's car was found right over here by the side of the road. Where was he? Lying right beside it. Been dead about seven, eight hours when he was found. Who found him? cowpoke looking for some strays. Mm, that's lucky. Otherwise, the body might have been here for a few days or even weeks before somebody came across it. Yeah. You get pictures of the position of the car and the body? Of course I did. Anything else? Yeah. Any exhibits? Casts of footprints? Anything like that? Uh, no. When I got the call, I brought a bunch of men out with me. I was excited, and I didn't think to stop them from tramping around. Mm, you can see why you'd be upset. Well, if there was anything to find, it's a cinch it isn't here now. Whether it would have wiped it out if your men hadn't. You want to go back to town? Yeah. I want to look at the car. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. How about the exhibits from the sheriff's body? I sent the bullets and the gun in. Your lab checked it. Verified it was the sheriff's own gun. I'm talking about the clothes he was wearing. You got those, haven't you? Sure I got it. I got all the evidence there was. Well, you should have sent it all in. I want to look at that stuff, too. Well, let's step it up. Come on, Charlie. Yeah, get up. Yeah. There's everything. All tagged. Everything the sheriff was wearing when he was killed. I see. 
this the shirt he was wearing? You see the blood and bullet holes, don't you? Yeah. How come your lab didn't find any prints on the gun when I sent it in? Didn't even have the sheriff's own prints. It was wiped clean. Hmm. Well, this is kind of odd. What? Well, the sheriff was shot twice, and they dug one slug out of him. The other one passed clean through. Yeah, according to the coroner's report, one slug hit his collarbone. That stopped it. Yeah, that's what I mean. The course of the bullets. Both shots fired into the left side, just above the kidney. But the one that came through came out the right side of his shirt collar here, right through his neck. Well, what about it? Well, it's a funny course for a bullet to take, unless the man who fired the gun was lying down and fired up at the sheriff. Yeah, 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 that's what I figured, too. They must have had a fight for the gun. He got it, but the sheriff knocked him down and... No, no, that isn't the way it happened. How do you know? Because the sheriff wouldn't half turn his back on a man who'd just taken his gun. Besides, these powder burns show the gun was being held right against the shirt when it was fired. What do you think happened then? Well, the sheriff must have been in some position where he was bent over forward, which he wouldn't be unless somebody was holding him in that position. Here, stand in front of me for a minute. Now, you're back toward me. What are you going to do? Well, slip one hand under your arms and then up behind your head in a half Nelson and twist your other arm behind you in an arm lock and bend you over forward like this. The sheriff was held like I'm holding you now. And the bullets were pumped into him. See what I mean? Now that That's just a guess. It's a guess I'm going to back up. And if the sheriff was held in a half Nelson and an arm lock, it tells us something else. That there were two men in on the murder. Unless the killer had three hands and used the third one to fire the gun. That's a pretty smart figuring, Ranger. Only because it's the kind of figuring I've been doing for a long time. Uh-huh. Are these the photos that were taken at the scene? Yeah. The sheriff's body in the car. Uh, the car the body moved any before these were taken? Nope. The car was right there. With the sheriff flat on his face beside it. And less than two feet away from it. His right side toward the car. Yeah. The bullet that passed through the sheriff came out on his right side. That means it should have hit the car. But there's no mark. I don't see that that helps us any. It helps plenty, Dunn. It tells us the sheriff wasn't killed out there. He was killed someplace else and brought out there. are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Now we continue with tonight's case, Play for Keeps, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. I knew that Sheriff Smithers had been killed by two men, and that his body had been moved after the killing. But it wasn't nearly enough. It was evening before I figured out my next move, a move I didn't like to make. Evening, ma'am. Remember me? Why, it's Jace Pearson, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Been a long time, Mrs. Smithers. Oh, come in, Jace. Come in. I... I I suppose you know about Bob. Yes, ma'am. And that's why I'm down here, I... Came by to pay my respects. Funny thing. First time Bob brought you through that door. I never reckoned you might be back someday. Looking for a man who killed him. I wish it could have been for another reason, ma'am. But Bob kept things working so well here, there seldom was any reason for a ranger to come visiting in Bradshaw County. Uh, I know how you fellas keep working along. Can I offer you a bite to eat? Please, Jace. Well... That'd be real fine, Miss Smithers. I knew it might help her and me if she could keep a little busy with her hands doing woman things in the kitchen. And I tried to eat, but kept remembering the man who'd sat across this same table from me five years before. Big, honest, stubborn, and unafraid. It's mighty nice of you to stop by, Jace. Bob would have been happy to see you sitting here again. He always said a man with a good appetite was right with the world. Ma'am, I guess Jim Dunn has already asked you, but 
Do you have any ideas about who might have killed Bob? Oh, no. Everything went so well for a few years. All I know is the last year or so, Bob was upset about gambling. He after anybody in particular? A man named Walton. Lou Walton. Has a big house on the south road out of town. Bob always said it was a gambling house, but he could never catch Walton. You mean he raided the place? A couple of times. Last time was the night he was killed. Dunn didn't tell me about that. Bob was killed after he left there. Walton's, I mean. Dunn said they didn't find anything, so Bob started back for town. But he never got home. Mrs. Smithers. Hmm? I have to ask a favor. A favor I don't like to ask. I want to help, Jace, every way I can. I want your permission to have Bob's body exhumed for further examination. Is it necessary? I'm not satisfied with the examination that was made here. Uh, All right, Jace. I'd like to have a more thorough examination made for headquarters. I'm sending them the clothes Bob was wearing for lab check and... I don't want anybody to know about it for now. All right. You're going to get him, aren't you, Jace? I'm going to try awful hard, ma'am. Well, howdy, Ranger. I've been waiting for you. Thought maybe you might have turned in for the night. I'm going to in a few minutes. I just came back to pick up the clothing exhibits. Well, I locked them away again. Dig them out. I want to send them on to Camp Mabry for lab tests. Well, all right. I'll give you a receipt for them. Okay. Don? Yeah? In those reports of yours, I didn't see any mention of a man named Lou Walton. Why should there be? I understand that Walton's a gambler and that... You helped Smithers raid his place the night Smithers was killed. I hear the exhibits. You're thinking way out of line on Walton. His alibi's airtight. According to who? According to me. I was with him all night after Smithers left the place. You didn't come back to town with the sheriff? No. I stayed at Walton's. Why? Because the sheriff asked me to stay there. We didn't find anything, but the sheriff figured if I hung around, somebody might show up or call up looking for a game. And I'd be able to get him some evidence, eh? Uh, anything else you want to know? No. I guess that lets Walt now. I'll take these things. Sure. Go ahead. See you tomorrow, Dunn. Number, please. Oak Hill, 243. Moment, please. Hello? Walton? Dunn. Now get those people out and shut down. Why? What's wrong? That range is too smart. I tried to make things look good for myself, and, well, I guess I made them look too good. Well, uh, how much does he know? All he's going to know. You just close down and stand pat until he wears himself out. The sheriff's body was dug up in the examiner's report sent on to Austin. Headquarters also had the exhibits I'd gotten from Dunn. By late afternoon of the next day, Captain Stinson telephoned me long distance. Got a complete report from the lab, Jace. Go ahead, Captain. You were right about the position of the body when the shots were fired. Autopsy report shows the organs were pierced in a manner that would be possible only if the sheriff were bent over forward. Good. Anything else? Yeah. That shirt you set up. Lab thinks Smithers was killed indoors. Why? Some lint stuck to the blood and held when it dried. Analysis indicates it comes from a fabric used in expensive carpeting. Violet color. Thanks, Captain. That may be enough to wind this up. Then you're convinced that Walton was running a gambling joint, Mr. Carlin. Was and is. I'd swear to it. But nobody's been able to prove it. You know how suckers are. They lose their shirts and keep their mouths shut. Think they're in on a smart thing and they help the racketeers to cover up. Then Walton must have been tipped off that he was being raided. Part of the racket. They pay off and get tipped off. You ever been in Walton's house? No. no. You know anybody who has been there? Well, 
It's no secret the newspaper men gamble moans good for him. My line of type man plays horses, I know. Uh, uh, Pete. I'll be there in a minute. Howdy, Ranger. Howdy. Uh, Pete, you ever been in Lou Walton's place? Well, come on, I don't stall. Tell the Ranger it's important. Well, oh, yeah, I've been there once or twice. I only want to know one thing. You notice any carpeting in the house? Carpeting? Oh, sure, the house is like a palace. Wall-to-wall carpet all over the place. What color? Well, it's a kind of a purple, I'd say. How about saying violet? Yeah, yeah, I guess that's what it's called. You got something, Ranger? Yeah. I'm going to wake up the nearest judge and get a search warrant for Walton. You better brush the dust off that headline you told me about. I think you're going to get a chance to use it. I was wondering when you get around to me, Ranger. Seems like everybody who wears a badge just loves to poke his nose into my life. I wouldn't worry about your nose, Walton. If you want to be smart, watch out for your mouth. (laughs) I didn't mean anything, Ranger. Just that a man ought to, well, ought to have a little privacy. And you love the death cells at Huntsville. They're real private. Well, I, I always cooperated. The constable Jim Dunn, he'll tell you that. I'll bet he would. Nice carpeting you got here. I like the color. Yeah. Yeah, I... Hey, let me get you a drink or something, Ranger. All good stuff. I don't have anything but the best. <laughs> you know the old saying, the best is nothing too good. <laughs> Walden, there's been a strong cleaning fluid used on a piece of this rug. One spot faded just a little. Well, I, I spilled some wine. I had a party one night. The night the Sheriff Smithers was here last? No. No, before that. Oh. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Nobody was here the night Smithers came. No. No, nobody. The, uh, the constable, he stayed. Stayed most of the night after the sheriff left. Yeah. So he told me. Uh, let me show you the rest of the house. Upstairs. No, thanks. I just want to look at the walls in this room. Sure pretty. You know, at Huntsville, they don't have pretty walls like these. Just cold concrete and steel bars. What do you keep talking about Huntsville? I'll tell you as soon as I stand up on this chair and rip off this new piece of wallpaper. Don't. You have no right to. Just looking for this small bullet hole papered over. Of course, you know that one bullet went right through the sheriff. The hole was repapered because a heavy picture fell. The nail made the hole. Thirty-eight caliber nail? <laughs> I'm going to have this rug ripped up and sent to my lab, Walton. No cleaning fluid made will wipe out all of a blood trace. Even a drop is enough to hang you. I didn't do it, I tell you. Dunn shot him. Huh? It was done. Dunn shot him. Hold your wrists out. You'll never get those on me. You bet wrong this time, gambler. Now get up. I'm taking you in. I took him through town to the county jail and I walked over to the constable's office but Dunn wasn't there I had to find him quick before he knew I had Walt I headed back for the jail and as I turned into the street I saw something move in the shadows there was another car not far from mine the constable's car and Dunn was getting into it Dunn, wait a minute Get out of the way, people. Get back, please. Uh, a rat punctured my tires. Unit 10 to KTXA. Unit 10 to KTXA. KTXA to Unit 10. Go ahead, Unit 10. Unit 10 convinced Constable Jim Dunn is subject sought in killing of Sheriff Smithers, Bradshaw County. Attempting getaway headed north on State Highway 19 from Bradshaw. Alert Highway Patrol and all units for complete roadblock of area. Order no further radio communication. Subject in Constable's marked car equipped with shortwave receiver. We'll do, Unit 10. Unit 10's car out of commission. will attempt to commandeer another car for pursuit. Unit 10, 10-4. KDXA, Austin. Please, step back, please. Step back. Come on, Charcoal. Let's hope Dunn heard that call. Come on, get up. Get up. Get up, Charcoal. Come on. I had 
the gambler. The last part of my call had been a plant, a plant I wanted done to hear. He'd know he couldn't get more than 15 or 20 miles before he was blocked unless he took some back road. And I'd seen him take a north turn out of town toward the wagon road he dumped the sheriff's body on. It was 11 miles for him by car, two miles cross country for me. I raked charcoal all the way, reached the road and rope dragged a couple of dead logs across it. We finished just in time. I heard the whine of a car coming over the rise in the rough road as the first glimmer of the headlights stabbed the darkness. I tied charcoal back in the trees and dropped in the brush to wait. It's the end of the road, John. Don't try backing up. Now you haven't got any tires. I'm giving you a chance to surrender, Don. You get your chances, Ranger. You missed, Don. Now I'm coming around the car to get you. You want to shoot it out? Let's go. Now, wait a minute. No, Ranger. You don't shoot. Don't shoot. I'll... Look, I'll, I'll drop my gun. <laughs> You see? I ain't armed. Come here. I ain't armed. Neither was Smithers when you lifted his gun and killed him with it. Good thing for Texas all constables aren't like you. Come on. <laughs> Walton's waiting for you at the jail. Looks like you'll be partners again at Huntsville. following week, the headlines of the Bradshaw Times read, Sheriff Killers Caught. Though Jim Dunn protested his innocence, Lou Walton's confession and evidence submitted by the Rangers convinced the court of Dunn's guilt. Both were sentenced to life imprisonment at Huntsville. This is Joel McRae. In the 125 years since their organization was founded, the Texas Rangers have written many new pages into the history of law enforcement. With only a handful of men in a vast territory, they have never failed to live up to their slogan, first to advance, never retreat. That is the creed a ranger follows. And they have a belief that was impressed on me by one of their officers, a belief that often brings them victory over tremendous odds. In the words of the Texas Rangers, a man who is wrong can't stand up to a man who is right and keep on coming. Next week, we'll bring you another exciting case taken from the files of the Texas Rangers. Hope you'll be listening. Good night. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. You know this business I'm in can get pretty silly sometimes. I can go along for a whole month and get by on nothing but meals at the automat and a dozen laughs a day. The funny ones usually pay just as well as the tough ones, but eventually somebody starts something that's about as funny as an open grave. So then I put on a long face and start carrying my 38. I don't worry about those times because I don't think about them. I just know they'll be around and I know I won't have to bother about it unless I get my hundred a day in expenses. That's uh, the equalizer. As long as I get that ever-loving loot in my little hot hand, Lucifer can walk in with a machine gun and I'll arm wrestle him for the price of a hot dog. Last week, I stopped in the middle of a real yocker and realized that I'd been giggling overtime. That's right. The cycle had caught up with me, and the label on my future had changed from fun time to trouble, and no guarantee as to the date of expiration. Uh, what started all this? 
Well, one morning on 53rd Street, a couple of guys were just pulling up in front of a garage. This the garage? Yeah. Go on, drive in. Here comes a guy. Yeah, this is big luck for us. The guy coming is the guy I want. I don't want he should see me yet, so you keep talking to him and I'll get out this sign. Tell him to look at the motor or something. There's something I can do for you, mister? Yeah, take a look at the motor. It's been missing. It sounds all right. It don't drive like it sounds, so take a look at it. Okay, sure. I race it once. Huh? I said race it once. He down here so well. Huh? Hello, Billy boy. Where did you come from? How did you get here? One at a time, Billy. I came in the car, got out the other side. You're looking good, Billy, real good. What do you want? How did you find me? Can't you ask just one simple question? You get so all mixed up, Billy. Look, leave me alone, please. Sure, Billy, I'll leave you alone. <laughs> all alone, you louse. <laughs> Diamond Detective Agency, our 30-day test revealed that not one single case of throat irritation was due to strangling. Oh, Rick, you're awful. Oh, how can you say that? I'm lovely, I'm engaged, now you steal wool. Oh, you idiot. Ah, you peaked. Hello, honey. Hi. Am I going to see you tonight? Sure, what'll we do? You get here about eight, I'll think of something. Oh, let's stay in. I've got that awful broke feeling again. Oh, is business bad, Rick? Well, it's pretty bad, but it gives me a chance to get some exercise. Exercise? Yeah, I found a Japanese beetle in the desk the other day. Been giving me judo lessons. I'll just pretend I didn't hear that. Don't knock it. Vaudeville's on the way back. Leave it alone. Let it live. Helen. I'll see you about eight. Uh, uh, wait a minute, honey. I think I forgot to shut something off. People are running in. Clients? I'll find out. Oh, uh, would one of you gentlemen mind dropping a few hundred dollar bills on the floor? Well? Uh, I'll call you right back. I don't think they're spendthrifts. All right, Rick. Bye. Bye, honey. Well, now, lads, what can I do for you? Your name Diamond? Yeah. Would you mind closing the door? I've got a beetle that'll break my arm if he catches cold. Hey, this guy's screwy, boss. Shut the door like he says. You got a beetle, huh, funny man? Yeah, and I'll bet you eight to five he can throw you. Well, if you have got a beetle, he must be running around your head, but I ain't got time to find out. You know something? I, uh, I don't think we're going to get along. You may be right, funny man. It depends. On what? And whether or not you turn the bundle over to me. Look, Rockerhead, if you're looking for your laundry, you got the wrong bin. I don't like the way this guy talks. No, but first we ask him nice. We want the bundle, funny man. You just said that. I say it again for you. Then if you don't get it, I make you understand. Like how? You couldn't point out Clyde Beard in a lion cage. Here it is. Now try hard. I want the bundle. I know this will throw you, but what bundle? He's going to be difficult, boss. Shut up. Look, Shamus. Some of my friends think I'm kind of good-natured. But sometimes I fool them and get nasty. You should be ashamed of yourself. You want to know what bundle? I tell you. Maybe you snap out of it. The bundle the dame gave you. The 200,000. 200,000? 200,000 what? Girdles? That does it. Vern, see why the Shamus is lying. Now, wait a minute, Buster. You go on the muscle with me, and I'll tear off your biceps and stuff them in your fat face. Fine. Yeah. Oh, nuts. Why is it a 38 always changes my mind, and I want it to be so virile? I'm going to use this gun unless you tell us where you got the 200 dollars. Now, this is getting silly. No, it ain't. Mm. Well, it's getting bloody, see? Hey, now, what's going on? I told you, funny man. I want what you got. Well, what I got hurts, and you're welcome to it. You sure ask for it? No. Oh. Come on. You save your head from getting squashed, and me and Vern save a lot of time. Where you got the dough? Look, I didn't know what you were talking about when you started, and I'm just as stupid now. You are that, funny man. Vern? Hey, wait, now. Oh, oh. A gun barrel can cut you up pretty bad. You want to see how bad, or do you want to tell us? You think I like the massage? I tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't like to be kept waiting, you. I don't like it none, see? Now you spill your gut so my boy chops you up like hamburger. Open your yap and sing. Sing, you hear me? Okay, but you won't like it. 
I can't begin to tell you. Close this lousy mouth. mouth. Close it good. Oh, I knew you wouldn't like it. Oh, oh, oh. Now, funny man, you got a wise crack? You gonna still make like a hero? Answer me, funny man, or I step on your face. Boss. Shut up. But, boss. Yeah, 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 what do you want? He don't hear you. He's out. Huh? Oh. Well, what did you satin so hard for, stupid? Maybe you turned him off for good. Nah, he'll be around in a couple of minutes. Then I can work on his ribs. He'll tell us where he's got the dough. Ah, I don't know, I don't know. You don't know what? He's got the dough, you sure know that? Yeah, the dame says she'd give it to him. You think uh, maybe she crossed you? You think she skipped? I think maybe we'd better find out. This Shamus is pretty stubborn and pretty clean. I think we find out. How? You watch. I'll search the joint, then we'll get out of here. What about the Shamus? Ah, he'll make it all right. I want him around for a while. After we find the dough, you can put him back to sleep. Mr. Diamond? Mr. Diamond? Hmm? Mr. Diamond, wake up. Oh, it's all right, honey. I'm not coming in. Mr. Diamond, wake up. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh. Oh, what a nice sweater. How do you feel? Well, a quick comparison might be a garter snake and a log jam. You don't look very comfortable. Why don't you sit up? Afraid my eyes might fall out. Oh. Better? Yeah, yeah. No any shaggy dog stories, I could use a laugh. How did you get like this? It wasn't easy. How long have I been here? I just came in. I was going to call the police when you started mumbling. Mumbling? Yes, you said something like, Oh, it's not so late, honey. Can I come in for a drink? <laughs> you must have been dreaming. Uh, I'm glad I woke up. She probably didn't have a drink in the house anyway. Uh, pardon me, honey, but I gotta run some water over my bumps. You don't look so bad, considering. Oh, considering what? The people get run over by trucks every day? When you start feeling better, I'd like to talk business. Oh, well, with business, I straighten right up. What's on your mind? Oh, that sweater. I want you to guard something for me. Why? You're the type that goes bear hunting with a switch. Is that supposed to be nasty? Well, take a guess. I just get mauled up by two gorillas, and before they get nasty, they mention some dame and some money, and you know anything about it? Why should I? Well, I wake up, and there you are. I thought maybe you'd stop by to see if the boys get a gold star for the work. I don't know anything about it. Now, do you mind if I sit down? No, no. I'm sorry. I haven't got anything more comfortable. The termites just walked out of my couch. What do you want guided, lover? I can't tell you what it is, but it's in a locker at the 42nd Street subway. I want you to pick it up and keep it with you until I call for it. I get 100 a day in expenses, and when I don't know what I'm doing, the fee looks like a skyrocket. Here's $500. Mm -hmm. When I pick up the uh, item, you get 500 more. Ooh. And I'll be back in two days. Well, I was going to start looking for the guys who gave me this headache, but $1,000 makes me <laughs> impatient. You uh, uh, got the key to the locker? Yeah, right here. By the way... Do you work nights, Mr. Diamond? Well, not in the office. Don't you think I ought to know your name? You get the item and I'll introduce myself in two days. And I do keep a drink in the house, Mr. Diamond. She got up then and walked out of the room like Eve with half an apple. I put some iodine on my face and headed for the 42nd Street subway. All the way down, I kept thinking about those two mugs who'd worked me over, and for the life of me, I couldn't guess why. I didn't know it then, but if I could have guessed, it probably would be for the life of me. I reached the subway and went down. I found the locker, opened it, reached in, and pulled out a small black leather bag with a lock on it. Out of curiosity, I tested the weight and finally decided I must be guarding a sack full of spider webs. I tucked it under my arm and turned to go. But sometimes things don't always work out the way you plan them. Okay, Shamus. Let's have the bag. Oh, when am I ever going to make Eagle Scout? I should have smelled something. Hello, Baron. I'm in a hurry. If you're wisecrack, you get dead. Give me the bag. Where's your friend? Out collecting heads? I guess I got to kill you. I guess again. Here's the bag. Okay. I should make a hole in you just because you ain't honest. You had the dough all the time. You mean in that bag? Oh, now don't tell me it ain't in it. Well, if it is, Buster, it's all in one bill. Feel the weight. Hey, it is too light. Why, you lousy, no-good gumshoe. This time I don't play around. Frank wants that dough, and you're going to show me where it is. Oh, I wish you'd get yourself a 22. Those big guns make dents in my back. I'm going to count three. 
and you're going to tell me where the dough is, or I'll kill you all over the place. You couldn't make it a hundred, could you? It's so much fun when you're past 50. Be funny. You're only killing one guy. One? This never happened when I went on next to closing. Two? Oh, now, wait a minute. Look. You look. It's your last chance. Drop it, Byrne. You're boxed up. Hey, who's that? The Marines. Why, you dirty... Oh. Rick. Rick, are you all right? Oh, Walt, I know you're bashful about these things, but you're going to be kissed. Oh, now, stop that. Otis, have your boys keep the crowd back. All right, all right. Keep back. Come on. What about the gunner? You shot him good, Lieutenant. Well, I'm glad you noticed your mallet head. Now, what about him? Uh, he's dead. How did you find that out? Twenty questions? Oh, yeah? Well, I guess we saved your life this time. Well, I hope I can do the same for you sometime, Sergeant, but science will hate me. Oh. Now, don't you start blubbering again, Otis. I couldn't stand it. Go get the wagon like a good boy. Okay, Lieutenant. Now, what's this all about, Rick? Believe me, Walt, I don't know. How did you get here? We got a call from a dame about ten minutes ago. Said you were coming down here and some guy was going to kill you. Well, well, well. Now, don't you well, well, well me. I want to know what this is all about. Let's get on to headquarters and I'll tell you just what I know. Well, are you coming? You you mean you're going to cooperate? Well, certainly. Oh, Otis. What's the matter, Walt? I feel a little faint. Would you mind helping me up the stairs? I think I've been working too hard. Walt and I left the subway and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. On the way over, I told him about the girl and about the two hoods who had worked me over in my office. When we reached the station, he shoved the rogues' gallery at me, and I started going through the miles of photographs. Well, the guy we shot in the subway was one Vern Geronda, small-time torpedo, but we can't find out anything else. Can't you find the other one in any of those pictures? Well, I've looked through them all. All I know is his name is Frank. Maybe he hasn't got a record. Here, try this stack. Dates back to the year one. Well, you can bet on one thing, Walt. The girl who called you was the girl who was in my office. She was the only one who knew I was going down to the locker in the subway. But how did she know this Vern Geronda was going after you? Well, she must have known he was going to tail me and that he was after something. Something that could have been in that black bag. It was a plant because she knew it was empty. I think she'd planned that when when this Vern caught me with an empty bag, he'd get rough enough to shoot, and if you were there, you'd have to stop him. You mean she wanted him dead? Well, that's my guess. Dead or in jail, but out of the way. That 200,000 is probably behind it. Walt. Uh, you find something? Yeah. This is the other guy who came into the office. Yeah? Let's see. Hey, what do you think you're doing? What's the matter with you? This is the man. You're crazy. Now, you listen to me. If you're trying to start one of those routines oh, again... Oh, now, wait a minute. You asked me to pick out the hood that was in my office, and this is the boy. A little younger, maybe, but you know darn well I wouldn't make a mistake on identification. Now, this is screwy. This is ridiculous. Where's my bicarbonate? Oh, what is wrong with you? Rick, that's Frank Purcell, and he's been dead for two years. What? Oh, wasn't he the guy who went over a 50-foot cliff with his whole gang? That's right. The car burned. The only guy they didn't find in the wreck was Billy Crump. He disappeared completely. Well, this one got out of it, too, and stayed around long enough to pay me a visit this morning. And his first name was Frank. Oh, that's impossible. The boys chased them right after the holdup and shot out one of their tires. Watched the car go over and saw it turn. Didn't they knock over the payroll at the Martin shipyard? Sure, got away with 200... Uh, 200,000 uh, dollars. Lieutenant. Huh? Oh, yeah. What is it? Uh, I'm not killing down at the garage. That that guy was just identified as being one for armed robbery. Killing? Yeah, pretty bad. Somebody shot up a guy that worked in the place. Well, who was it? Her name was Crump. What? Yeah, Billy Crump. Stuck up some shipyard about two years back. Oh, and... shut up. Oh, I was only telling okay, you. Okay, okay. What else on it? He has a wife, lives at 64th Street, apartment 205. That's all. Well, don't just stand there, you applehead. Go get the car. Oh, oh, oh yeah, Lieutenant. Come on, Rick. I'm waiting. All right. All right, I apologize. Oh, you really don't have to, Walt. I was as confused as you were. Was? But you're not now? No, I don't think so, Walt. But let's get over to see Mrs. Crump. She can do a lot of straightening out. I hope Mrs. Crump is in. Oh, uh, I forgot to tell you, Lieutenant... She calls herself Stewart, Mrs. Edna Stewart. What? Yeah. Her husband used her alias instead of Crump. Oh, well, that's all right, Sergeant. Maybe when you start pounding a beat again, you'll think of those little things. Uh, 205, wasn't it, Walt? How about it, Sergeant? It was 205, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, Lieutenant. 205, that was it. I remember. <laughs> I might make a few months. Shut up, Walt. Hold it down. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold this. 
Yeah, Lieutenant. Shut up. Here it is, Walt. I'll give it a knock. Go ahead. Mm, looks like no score. Try the door. Why, Walt? Without a warrant? Now, don't you start that again. If Frank Purcell is still alive, we're going to grab that 200 grand. We've got to work fast. Besides, I'm not trying the door. You are. Well, it's open, unstained, and honest. I suppose you'd like me to trip you just so you can say you fell in by mistake? Oh, come on. Pick up your big feet, Otis. That would be hard, even for Samson. Oh, yeah. Now, you listen to me, wise guy. I'm getting sick and tired. Of... Ooh, holy cow, Ten. It's a body. Rick, how about it? Quite. Mrs. Crump. Mrs. Crump, Mrs. Stewart, the girl in my office this morning, no difference. I figured she might be the one in your office when I heard Crump had a wife. She must have had the 200 grand and Purcell killed her for it. Well, you can bet the cash wasn't in the apartment because she was too smart to keep it here. Well, there's no signs of a struggle. From the way she's lying, she was probably sitting at this desk. Uh, right and pat on the desk, Lieutenant. Keep your paws off of it. Well, she was writing something. Hmm. Went through to the bottom sheet. Yeah, numbers. Otis. Start casing the place and have a conscience when you pass the icebox. Uh, okay, Lieutenant. Too many numbers for a phone. Walt, Walt, what are we looking for? Why, Purcell and the 200,000. Okay, now we don't know where Purcell is, but that 200,000 had to cool off until Crump could spend it. So? Now, where would be the safest place to keep that much cash? The numbers. Safety deposit box. You have just won yourself, Sergeant Otis. I should cut my throat first. Now, it's a cinch Purcell has gone down to the safety deposit box. Hey, I found a couple of plane tickets, Lieutenant. And it it looked like they'd started to pack. Yeah, let me see them. Uh Uh-huh. Two for Mexico City and good for the first. That ties it. Would you mind whispering in my ear or am I asking too much? Walt, when Mrs. Crump came to my office, she made it very clear she'd be back in two days. That's the first of the month. I don't know how long she'd been there before I woke up, but she was interested in my office and she was coming back in two days. Now, if she wanted to hide something, the best place would be somewhere that had already been searched. Uh, uh, Otis, do you think you could dig up a safety deposit box under the name of Crump or Stewart? Here's the number. Mm, I can try. Stout fellow. Now, Walt, if Frank Purcell did kill the girl and then headed for the deposit box, I don't think he found much. And the only other person that Mrs. Crump contacted... And that he suspects is uh, yours truly. Uh Uh-huh. And he'll tail you, or worse. I hope so. But I want ten minutes alone in my office before he catches up. Now, what is get going and call me at my place? Right. Now, Walt, I'm going to walk around for about half an hour and see if I can pick up a tail. Then I'll lead him to my office. I'll get there at uh, exactly 2.30. You get there ten minutes later. I think I'm going to need help. I still wish I knew what you were up to. Now, as soon as Otis finds that deposit box and tells me if Mrs. Crump was at the bank around 11 this morning, I'll tell you the whole thing. And if I'm lucky enough to stay alive, you'll have Frank Purcell to fill in the details. I left Walt and started walking. If Purcell was after me, he was too smart to let me spot him, so I just kept going until I'd used up the half hour and I was on my way up to my office. Purcell wouldn't follow right away, so that gave me the 10 minutes I wanted. I went in and looked around. Nothing had changed. Desk, chair behind and chair in front. Small closet with sink, hat rack, and bookcase. I went to work on the bookcase first. Nothing. So I took the desk apart. I kept going. Closet, under the rugs, still nothing. I took a breather and tried to reason it out. If I had suspected something in the beginning... Where would be the last place I'd look? Something I never use. I didn't have a vacuum cleaner, so that was out. Then I remembered something. Something the girl had said that morning. Do you work nights, Mr. Diamond? I looked up at the big light bulb hanging from the ceiling. A little lost weekend, but it was worth a try. I walked over and snapped on the light switch. Ah, score for Diamond. With the light on... The bowl became transparent, and lying at the bottom, I could see the outline of a large bundle. I forgot to smile because the footsteps coming up at the hall sounded like company. I turned off the light, went over to my desk, and sat on with a very comfortable 38 between my legs. Well, good afternoon, rocker boy. Did you forget your bucket of blood? I forgot something, sure, funny man. I forgot to leave you dead. Don't look so unhappy. You tried. I've been getting a big run around all day. 
So I brought me something to slow things down. You want to see it, or do I keep it in my pocket? Well, if it's a mouse, I'll scream. In this pocket, I got six ways to kill a louse. If you ain't seen a louse, just grab a mirror. Oh, my George, my George. That was a good one. What's the matter? Was the deposit box empty? Oh, you know about that, do you? I figured you was working with a dame. Well, uh, you got a silent partner now. You're right. Last time I saw her, she was speechless. I'm going to do the same for you, funny man, but I make a deal. You say no or even maybe, and I'll kill you where you sit. You say okay, and I'll let you keep going till you choke on one of your jokes. You tell me if I'm right, and I'll give you a quick answer. You've been after Billy Crump ever since the shipyard robbery because he got away with the money. You finally found his wife, and she got scared. She bought two tickets to Mexico. I'm going to do it. Great. You tell a good story. When Mrs. Crump saw all that lovely cabbage, she got greedy. She got a hold of you and made a deal. Yeah, she was a pretty smart chicken. I knock off her husband, Billy, and she splits the dough with me. And if I guess right, at 11 o'clock this morning, while you were killing Billy Crump, she was grabbing the 200000 So that's how it goes. But after we rubbed out Billy, she called and said the dough was planted with you. She wanted the dough herself. She used me to lead you to the subway. Right. Where were you? Upstairs. I figured something was up. Well, nice little plot. You kill her husband, the cops kill you and your torpedo, and bless her little heart, she winds up with a pot of gold. Now, she winds up dead. The dough wasn't in the box, so she planted it somewhere. We saw her coming in here after we worked you over. Now, I think she stashed the bundle here while you was out cold. So, uh, do I get it, or do you die? What are you going to do about that big, bad policeman outside the door? I'm going to laugh at him, because he ain't there. Walt, stop snooping. Come on in. Hey. Well, what do you know? You wasn't kidding. This might mean a promotion, Purcell. You want to turn around and be a good boy, or do you want it the hard way? I stay the way I am. You're in a tough spot, Mr. Copper. If this funny man's a friend of yours, he's going to get it the minute you try your luck. Rick? Yeah, Walt? You got a point. I might be lucky and get him just right, but it's a long shot, and if I miss, he'll pull the trigger on you. You're pretty smart for a copper. Walt? Yeah? The way it looks, we could be here all night unless somebody gets shot. That's the way it looks. What do you think, Purcell? Like I said, the cop guns me, I gun you. <laughs> Silly, ain't it? Be a lot sillier if I had a gun. Funny man, that would be a riot. Well, start laughing, pal. <laughs> ah, you sure ruined that desk. Ah, well, I couldn't help it. At the gun between my knees, I, I move, he shoots. Had to try it right through the desk. Oh, what are you sweating for? Me? I could use you for a shower. How's Purcell? Unhappy. How about it, Purcell? I ain't giving odds. Hey, funny man, you know something? You ain't so funny. Uh, get the phone, Walt. Yeah? Lieutenant? Oh, no. Yeah? Uh, I found the box. The crump dame was in the bank at 11 o'clock this morning. I found it pretty quick, huh? Hooray for you. Wait a minute. Rick, you were right about the... Hey, where did he go? Who, oh, Lieutenant? King Kong. Now you get your big fat head over here. Lieutenant. What is it? Okay if I turn on the side ring. Oh. Here's the iodine and bandages, Miss Helen. Oh, thank you, Francis. Stop squirming, Rick. Oh, honey, I know what's coming when I leave here. I'm going to look like an advertisement for a snappy funeral. You baby. Just a little iodine and bandages. Oh, get her. You use enough iodine to stain an elephant and so much bandage you could roll up a herd of mummies. All right, then get infected. I am infected. Now, Rick, stop come that. Here now, come here. <laughs> I've had a tough day. I've been beat up, shot at, and been insulted by Sergeant Otis. I, I need some relaxation. I want to play. Uh, should I leave, miss? You stay right where you are. I think there's a wolf loose. Uh, Francis. Yes, Mr. Diamond. Have you studied your lessons on how to be a private detective? Oh, yes, sir. I'm up to Chapter 8. But have you read Chapter 8 yet? Uh, well, no, sir. Oh, that's too bad. I was going to give you some first-hand advice on that chapter tonight. Oh, oh, I'll go read it right away, sir. Sure. Uh, may I, Miss Helen? Go ahead, Francis. I can't win. Oh, this will be jolly. Now, come here, you. But Rick, stop it. Get away from that piano. No. You are my sunshine, my only oh, sunshine. Oh, you make me on. happy. 
on, come on. Yeah, what's that? Oh, All right, well, on. you know what they say about music soothing a savage beast. Oh. If you don't like it, you sing something. Oh, what for? You don't even look a little wild. Sing something. I'll get as wild as you want. Oh, now there's a statement. Go on. All right. Little girl, you're the one girl for me. <laughs> Little girl, you're as sweet as can be. Just a glance at you meant love from the start. And oh, what a thrill came into my heart. Little girl, with your cute little ways, I am yours for the rest of my days. And this great big world will be divine, little girl, when you're mine, oh. Now get wild. All right. Come here. Ah, a little wilder. There you go. And this is, um, I'd like to ask your opinion. It is in Chapter 8 that Hamas... Oh. oh. <laughs> well, look at that. And I'm not blushing. <laughs> oh, I must be getting used to it. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg. Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Gene Bates, Robert Carroll, and Ted DeCorsia. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. Now here is Dick Powell. Uh, say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you've been enjoying our show, and I sure hope you have... Be sure to listen on Monday evenings beginning October 3rd instead of Saturdays. Did you get that? Beginning October 3rd, we will be heard on Mondays instead of Saturdays. And check your local paper for the exact time. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Markham, it certainly seems strange being with you in the middle of the night when we haven't been working on a murder. Well, even district attorneys take some time off, Vance. And here's your apartment house. That it is. Well, thanks for taking Ellen home and for dropping me. No trouble at all, Vance. I'll phone you tomorrow if anything interesting happens. I'll be waiting. Good night, Markham. Meet you at a murder. <laughs> Oh, I beg your pardon, Mr. Vance? Yes, I'm Vance. I've been waiting here in front of your house for hours. Mr. Vance, I'm Edgar Walters. I must talk to you. It's, it's about my wife. She's missing. There's nothing I can do about that tonight. Not at this hour. But you've got to do something, Mr. Vance. I'm desperate. You know that gambling ship that's anchored offshore? Yes, I know about it. Why? Well, my wife went out there this evening to gamble with Lucky Saunders. He owns the ship. She can't help gambling. She she has to. Cards, roulette, horses. It doesn't make any difference. There are people like that. But as long as you know where she is, Mr. Waters... I know where she was, Vance. But all gambling stops on board at 2 a.m. And it's almost 4 now. She should have been home an hour ago. I, I know something has happened to her. And you want me to find out what, if anything? You're a private investigator, Vance. And I'll pay you well. I'll go upstairs and change my clothes. Be on my way in half an hour. Here's my card, Vance. Call me as soon as you find out anything, will you? And thank you. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome, Mr. Walters. I only hope I give you a real reason for thanking me before long. Your deal, Mrs. Wallace? Your cut, Mr. Saunders. 
How much did I owe you before we started this evening's session, Mr. Saunders? Uh, 12,000. And now I owe you 3,000. <laughs> uh, it's time to quit, isn't it? I have a stateroom fixed for you, Mrs. Walters. We could go on with the game in the morning. Uh-uh. Lady Luck's smiling at me right now. Tomorrow she might be laughing out loud. One cut, double or nothing. For, uh, 3,000? That's right. If I win, you join your friends, Mr. and Mrs. Henderson, and leave, huh? Oh, if I win, I'll stay here on board. There are no more water taxis to shore. I sent the last one off an hour ago. The Hendersons don't mind spending the night aboard ship. You're cut, Mr. Saunders. <clears throat> As you say. There we are. Nine of diamonds. And mine's the queen of clubs. That makes 6,000. Queen of clubs again. That's the third time you've picked that queen, Mrs. Walters. I suggest we quit. You won uh, 6,000. I have it here in my safe. I'll get it for you. Maybe you won't have to get me anything. Or 12,000. Double or nothing, Mr. Saunders. One cut? One cut. They say never fight the cards, but there is also a law of averages to be taken into consideration. You're cut first. 12,000 or nothing. You are a gambler, aren't you? Very well. My cut. The... Queen of clubs. Uh, why, yes. <laughs> you seem surprised. You shouldn't be. You've had a strange affinity for that card since we started. Perhaps we'll discuss that a bit after I've cut. There. Oh, Jack of Diamonds. You win 12000 Once more. Hardly. You want the cash now? I think so. Then in the morning, with my friends, Mr. and Mrs. Henderson, as uh, bodyguards, I'll leave the ship. Really, Mrs. Walters? Would you like to cut double or nothing on that, too? It's almost five o'clock, Ace. Do you think she's still playing? No, oh, she hasn't come to a stateroom, has she? Lucky Saunders told me he had the one next to this fixed for her. She'll be here as soon as she wins enough. Edith Walters mustn't win. She mustn't. When she plays with Lucky Saunders, the weather's clear and the track fast. But if she does win... Maybe she'll take care of the markers I've been holding. She's in my book for 10000 she dropped on the horses. You don't generally let anyone get into you for that much, Ace. You know, I think that... Uh-uh, honey. You're the one I marry to, and I like it that way. There's nothing between her and me. I suppose we just forget all this and go to bed. I've got to know whether she won or not. I've got to. In the morning. Comes the morning, we'll both find out. Go ahead to sleep if you want to. I'm waiting up until I hear her come in. And if she won tonight, I'm going to get that money she owes you. If she lost... Yes, honey. What if she finished out of the money? <laughs> then I'm going to fall asleep laughing. Who is it? Mary Henderson. Wait a minute. What do you want? You mean, what do we both want? Me and this gun. Same answer, though. We both want you. You're being a little dramatic, aren't you, Mary? Maybe. How much did you lose to Saunders? I don't know that it's any of your business, but I didn't lose. Mm, that's what I was afraid of. You know, I don't like you, Edith. I gathered that quite some time ago. I liked you more when I first met you. And I despised you then. I was praying you'd lose to Lucky Saunders tonight. Sorry to disappoint you. I still don't know any reason for that gun. I'll explain. It's very simple. There are no boats leaving for shore. And certainly none coming out from shore for the next couple of hours. We're practically alone on this ship. You and I, my husband, and Lucky Saunders. So? So you've got no means of either getting off or getting help. And I wanted to announce to you personally that you'll never leave this ship alive. You've lost sight of one thing, haven't you, Mary? My husband knows I came out here. Your husband thinks you came out here. Nobody knows except my husband, Lucky Saunders and I. And I'm sure none of us will ever remember seeing you on board. You're... You're going to kill me? Maybe. You're going to be dead, I can tell you that. I... You're afraid, aren't you? I was afraid, too. I've been afraid for months. Afraid I'd lose my husband to you. But I won't now. 
There'll be no you around to lose it to. You forget there's a radio room on board right next door. I can send a message for help, and I'm going to right now. Stop. Edith, stop. (laughs) One of these switches turns on the microphone. One of them does. It it must be this one. It's got to be. Anybody, anybody who can hear me anywhere, get in touch with the police. I'm going to be murdered. Listen, my name is Edith Walters. I'm on board the gambling ship Argus. Please, if anybody hears this, get get in touch with the police. Tell them to come out here. Tell them to hurry. They're coming in for me now. Tell them to hurry. Hurry before... It's too late. This is Edith Walters. Call the police. <laughs> Markham, this is Vance. I didn't wake you up, did I? No, no, you didn't. As a matter of fact... I've been trying to reach you on the telephone for ten minutes. Your line's been busy. I've been trying to get you, Vance. But it's six o'clock in the morning. What do you want me for? I've tried for two hours to get some sort of transportation so I could get out to the gambling ship Argus. I can't find a thing at this hour. I'm going to need a police launch. What do you want to get out to the Argus for? To look for a woman named Edith Walters. Her husband... Edith Walters? She's the reason I've been trying to reach you, Vance. A half hour ago, an amateur radio operator picked up a call for help from Edith Walters. She was screaming she was about to be murdered, and the call was cut off in the middle of a sentence. We've got to do something, Markham. How soon can you meet me? I'm down at the docks now. Well, Sergeant Heath is picking me up. I'll be there in ten minutes. The police launch has already been ordered. Pick up Edgar Walters on the way. He's at the Buckingham Apartments. I'll be waiting for you, Markham, at the foot of the docks to get to the bottom of this mystery. Take it easy, Walters. We'll be out at the gambling ship very shortly now. I know, Vance. It's just that I'm afraid of what we'll find when we do get there. Vance, we're a little bit lost. This fog is so heavy, the launch pilot says he can't see a thing. We're going by compass, but we don't know exactly where the Argus is anchored. Oh, I know, Mr. Markham. It's exactly two miles along the coastline from the dock, and we round a blinker light and head due east into the ocean. I was out there only the other night with my wife, and that's how we got there. Oh, that's fine, Walters. Thanks. I'll tell the pilot. Uh, Sergeant, he... Don't take it so hard, Walters. Things may not be as bad as you imagine. No. No, maybe they aren't. All I'm sure of is that they couldn't be any worse. There's the Argus Vance. Thanks again for those directions, Mr. Walters. Don't forget it, Mr. Markham. Let's worry about my wife. I'll try to find her for you, Mr. Walters, believe me. Let Heath and his men search the ship and give me a half hour to question anybody on board. And I promise you, if Mrs. Walters ever arrived on the Argus, I'll have news for you. You're going to use the master's cabin as an office vance? Temporarily, Markham. What luck has Sergeant Heath had? None at all. He's had men searching this ship for a half hour. They can't find Mrs. Walter's body, and they can't even find any evidence that she ever was aboard. This is really a case, Vance. Yes, I know. I'd like to see the owner of this ship, Markham. He's waiting outside. In fact, I'll see him and Mr. and Mrs. Henderson together. All right, I'll tell them right now, Vance. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Henderson and Mr. Saunders, will you come in here, please? Yes, of course. Yes, certainly. Glad to come in. Please sit down and make yourselves comfortable. What do you want with us, Vance? I'm not quite sure. You say you haven't seen Mrs. Walters in two days, that she was not aboard this ship last night? That's right. Mr. Saunders, how do you account for the radio message that was picked up and relayed to the police? I've got no idea how, why, or from where it was sent. The message did say it came from the Argus. (laughs) And we do have a radio sending set aboard. But there's no way in the world to prove it came from here. No, there isn't. Mrs. Henderson, your story, I take it, is the same as Mr. Saunders? Not at all. I beg your pardon. He said he hadn't seen Edith Walters in two days. I haven't seen her in a week. I see. And you, Mr. Henderson? I was supposed to meet her at the track yesterday afternoon, but she never got there. That proves nothing one way or another. 
Mr. Saunders, how long have you been operating this gambling ship in these waters? Uh, about a month. It's all very legal, Vance. That's a matter of opinion. It's legal. Well, let's say it's within the law. <laughs> it's outside the state's jurisdiction, so state laws do not apply to it. Has the ship always been anchored in just this spot? No, no. We move it around every night. A few miles up or down the coastline. Just to uh, prevent any possible hijacking. We move it every night. But we keep it outside state limits every time we do. I understand. They call you lucky, don't they, Mr. Saunders? Well, most gamblers are called lucky, Mr. Vance. I've got an idea, though, that your name isn't complete. Offhand, despite the fact that we can find no evidence that Mrs. Walters was here, and certainly none that points to your having murdered her, I'd say your name should be lucky up to now. <laughs> This is District Attorney Markham. The Argus murder case started when Edgar Walters came to Philo Vance, asking him to help find Walters' wife. She had gone out to a gambling ship, the Argus, but nothing had been heard from her for several hours. Then, an amateur radio operator relayed a frantic message from Mrs. Walters to the police, and it sent Vance, Sergeant Heath, and me, along with Mr. Walters, out to the Argus. There we met Lucky Saunders, owner of the ship, and Mr. and Mrs. Henderson, both of whom knew Mrs. Walters, and both of whom deny she was ever on board. Hi, Mr. Vance. Oh, yes, Sergeant Heath. I was just on deck getting a little air. What have you found? I haven't found a thing. No trace of Mrs. Walters anywhere on board, but I'm sure that dame was on board this boat, Vance, and that she was murdered. Only how do we prove it? We don't. We can't unless we find the body. And if she were murdered and the body thrown overboard, which is probably what happened, if she were murdered, we'll never find it. Hey, I never heard you so pessimistic before, Vance. Never had more reason to be, Heath. I'm going ashore to check over my facts, and I'm taking Mr. Walters with me. I'll contact Markham if I find out anything. <laughs> Well, that's it up to date, Ellen. You've got all the facts? Yes, Vance, all of them. Can you think of anything to add to what I've dictated to Miss Deering, Mr. Walters? No. No, I can't. You've been very thorough, Vance. Ellen, when will you have those notes typed up so I can see them? Oh, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Please be sure. I'd like them in a half hour. Uh, come into my private office, will you, Mr. Walters? Uh, wait a minute, Vance. I beg your pardon. I'm not going to transcribe these notes today. I'm taking the rest of the day off. I'm sorry, Ellen. Some other day, if you like. Come along, Mr. Walker. Vance, I said I was taking the rest of the day off. I'll be back in the morning. You may take all day tomorrow, if you like, but, Ellen, those notes must be transcribed now. Sorry. There is something I've got to do, but that's not it. Goodbye. Ellen, if you leave now, I'd just as soon you didn't come back to work for me. Okay. If that's the way you want it. Mr. Vance, I... I'm sorry that I... nothing to do with it. I've felt this coming for quite a while. Let's get back to your wife, Mr. Walters. Who were her friends? Who might she have been with if she actually didn't go out to the Argus last night? She had few friends, Mr. Vance. Nobody she was very close to. Most of the days she spent at the track. Oh, the track, eh? Hmm. Where would she be at the racetrack if she were going there? Oh, somewhere around Ace Henderson's box. He's a bookmaker. You met him on board the Argus. Hmm. I'm going out to the racetrack this afternoon. Maybe I can pick a winner. And that has nothing to do with horses. Hello, Mr. Henderson. Oh, hi, Vance. Didn't know you follow the ponies. I don't, generally. I got something good going in the next race, if you're interested. I'm interested, but not in races. Mrs. Walters? Come on, Joy! Come on, Joy! Yes, Mrs. Walters. I'd like to talk to you about her. Right after the race. 
Joy. The second is dropping back. Rasputin's closing in on Dave Derry. At the three quarters, it's still Dave Derry and Rasputin. Dave Derry by three lengths, but Rasputin's closing in. Dave Derry by two lengths. One length, Rasputin is alongside as they approach the finish line. It's neck and neck, nose and nose. There goes Rasputin out in front of Sparker, goes for the whip. It's Rasputin by half length. Rasputin the winner! In second place, Dave Derry. Third place, Count Joe. Winner's time, 1.37. Next race, 20 minutes. Well, Vance, I dropped a few on that one. We won't bother, then, about the good thing you had for me in the next race. Henderson, how much did Mrs. Walters owe you? A few... Eight, ten thousand. How did she intend to pay you? That's never my problem, Vance. Isn't there some way bookmakers have of making sure that their clients do pay them? Yes, there is. What is it? What happened to Mrs. Walters? Coming, coming. Hello. Oh, I, I don't think I know who you are, do I? You should. I'm Ellen Deering. I was Philo Vance's secretary. Remember me now, Mr. Waters? Oh, oh yes, yes, of course I do. Well enough to ask me to come in? Don't bother. I don't need an invitation. I, I don't understand what you want with me. Don't you? Okay, then I'll tell you. I'm the only one that knows that you murdered your wife. Do you want to know how I know you murdered her? Oh, I, I, I didn't kill her. I, I haven't even seen her since she, she left here yesterday morning. Oh, no. You told the police you'd been out to the gambling ship exactly a week ago, right? Well, of course that's right. They changed the position of that ship a couple of miles every night. Yet the time when you and Vance and Markham went out there, you gave exact directions on how to reach the Argus. Now, the only way you'd have known that is if you'd been there earlier. Well, that's now, right, don't but... don't get excited. Nobody realizes that little fact except me. And what do you want? Money. Ten thousand will do. I don't have that kind of money. Well, then go get it. Here's my apartment address. Shall we say uh, 9 o'clock tonight and $10,000 in cash? What time is it, Vance? A few minutes to nine. Frightened, Ellen? Yes, but I'll go through with it. You were right about Walters, of course, but uh, what happens when he gets here? I'll be in the next room. You get him to talk and tell the whole story. Take the money. Then I'll come out and take him. Well, suppose he has other ideas. Ideas that he can pay me less expensively with a bullet than with a, a bundle. What then? Don't worry, Ellen. Nothing will happen to you, I promise. Oh, listen, that's the door. And that'll be Walters. Vance, please stay close. Hide, but stay close uh, just in case. Don't worry, Ellen. I'll be here. Well, right on time, Mr. Walters. Uh, come on in. Oh, no. You're coming out. Out here in the hall. Come on. Uh, hey, listen, you're hurting my arm. Your apartment might have been a trap, taking no chances. We'll talk out here in the hall. I just locked your door, and here's the key right here in my pocket. Now, come on. You can't make me. See this knife? I'll slash it across your face if you don't come. What happened to your wife? You tell me that first. She's in the cellar at my house, all dressed up in concrete. Oh. And you'll be keeping her company. Are you coming, or do I use this knife? I think I... I'm coming. Yeah, this guy's going. Oh, this, this. Oh, Sergeant Heath. Am I glad to see you. Didn't you expect me? Oh. Didn't Vance tell you he asked me to be here in the hall in case this guy got cute? No, he didn't. And that reminds me. I've got something to say to Mr. Philo Vance. <laughs> You won't be able to see a thing for a moment, Vance, now that Heath has turned the lights out. I figured that out for myself, Markham. Hmm. The FBI have done this, Vance, taken movies of an actual confession, but it's not done too often in police work. I think you're entitled to see the film, though. The film featuring Edgar Walters in his first and last starring role. Okay, Markham. Let's see and hear it. All right. 
Chief, let's have the film. Right. This is Edgar Walters. Of my own free will and volition, I'm confessing that I murdered my wife by going out to the gambling ship, Argus, in a small boat I had chartered the day before. I met her by arrangement, and I killed her as soon as we reached land. Her gambling was ruining me. I, I had to kill her. I don't know how anybody could have figured my actions, but Philo Vance did. That is all. All right, Heath, let's have some lights. Right, Mr. Markham. Very interesting, Markham. Very interesting explanation. Which reminds me, I've got some explaining still to do to Ellen Deering. She won't be satisfied till she knows the whole story. But then, neither was I. <laughs> I know you've waited very patiently, so let's talk about the Argus murder case. It really had me puzzled for a while. I was quite certain that Mrs. Walters had been on board the Argus, but the denials of Lucky Saunders and Mr. and Mrs. Henderson threw me for a while. Why did they lie, Vance? They all had reason. Saunders would have made himself a wonderful suspect if he'd admitted that Mrs. Walters had been on board, and in addition, have given his gambling ship a bad reputation. A gambling ship, a bad reputation. <laughs> well, that sounds like a reason skunks don't eat scallions, but <laughs> I'll buy it. Why did the Hendersons lie? Mrs. Henderson hated Edith Walters, and Edith Walters was welching on money she owed Ace Henderson. Mm -hmm. Both would be ready-made suspects if they told the truth. I suppose I'm dumb, but it's hard to figure out why Walters came to you in the first place. He was trying to be smart. He figured it was a perfect alibi to ask me to work on his wife's disappearance. He knew I couldn't possibly get out to the gambling ship at four in the morning. But he could, and he did. But what about that radio message that Mrs. Walters sent? Mrs. Henderson admits now that she threatened Edith Walters, that Mrs. Walters ran into the radio room and sent the message that brought us out to the Argus. And then? Then, while she was sending the message, Saunders came along, let himself into the radio room with his own key and put his hand over Mrs. Walters' mouth. He didn't want the police out on his boat, naturally. Commonly known as Natch. Hmm. Then what? Then Saunders talked Mrs. Henderson out of any desire for personal revenge against Edith Walters and saw to it that Mrs. Walters got to her cabin. But she had arranged with her husband to meet him, as we know, and she rode with him to the shore and her death. It was a very clever plan, Walters had. There's a moral in this somewhere, something about wives, not gambling. Or playing around with gamblers. Hmm. That was the beginning of Mrs. Walters' trouble. Yes, I suppose it was. And this is the end of the Argus murder case. What's the matter? What is it? Another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, The Drug Ring Murder, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Left-Handed Killer. <laughs> Well, Mr. Nicholas Carter, are you going to answer your telephone or are you going to take me out to lunch as you promised? There's no reason why I can't do both, Patsy. Nick Carter speaking. Nick, this is Riley at headquarters. Oh, how are you, Lieutenant? There goes my It's on your mind. Right. Murder. And you're right in the middle of it, Nick. Meet me at the city morgue as quick as you can. I'm waiting here. What's the matter, Riley? Can't headquarters solve this case without me? Who said anything about your solving the case? You get yourself down to the morgue right away and that's an order. An order, Riley? What are you talking about? The body of a man was washed up on the beach this morning, only he didn't die from drowning. It was murder. Yes? There was no identification on the body. None at all. Except one of your business cards. Nick Carter, private detective. What? 
I hid the card in my pocket as soon as I laid eyes on it. But there's a chance one of the reporters saw it before I did. Now, do I have to draw you a diagram? You've already done it. I'll be there in the double rally. Bye. What's up, Nick? Plenty. Look, Patsy, hold on the office until you hear from me. I'll call you within an hour. I knew you shouldn't have answered that phone. Business before pleasure, Patsy. And right now, I've got business at the city morgue. Where have you got him, Riley? On a slab out here? Uh, He's on ice. In the box at the end of the room there. And I'm telling you one thing, Nick Carter. It's lucky for you that I was here when he was brought in. Now, look, Riley. Surely you aren't trying to pull me into this thing just because the fellow was carrying one of my cards. Uh, Well, there are probably hundreds of people I never heard of are carrying my name in their vest pockets. Well, if you'd rather be explaining to the captain how your card got on a corpse... Oh, now, take it easy, Riley. You know what it means for an officer of the law to conceal evidence, Nick. How do I know one of those reporters or photographers isn't telling the captain right now that... Let's worry about one thing at a time. You said the body was washed up on the beach on the north shore of Long Island? Yes, it was. Stuffed in a gunny sack with every bit of identification removed. Hmm. Everything was ripped out except a concealed pocket. Yes, I know. With my card in it. Yes. Uh, Here we are. Last box here. Now, take a good look, Nick. Yeah, did you ever see him before? Oh, yes. That's Stanley Phillips. Huh? Dr. Stanley Phillips. He's a research chemist. Sort of an eccentric. Oh, Oh, balmy, huh? No, no, just strange. He's assisted me in a few investigations. But for the most part, he was pretty much of a hermit. Didn't like to mix with people. Yeah, that don't make sense. People who mind their own business don't get and go around getting themselves murdered. Where did he live? There's a big house on a Long Island Sound, but his laboratory was on his yacht. It was anchored about half a mile or so out from the house, if I remember correctly. Laboratory on a yacht? Mm-hmm. Oh, he was balmy. Hey, Riley, look. Here in his neck. Well, what did you expect? I told you he was strangled. The autopsy showed he was dead before he was put into the gunny sack and thrown into the water. I know, but that isn't what I mean. Here, look at the prints in his neck. Closely, look at him. Yeah, yeah, well... Lest I miss my guess, Riley, he was murdered by a left-handed killer. Say, maybe you've got something there, Nick. I'll phone the fingerprint expert... Now, wait a minute, Riley. Let me hit the phone first. I gotta be in my way. Hey, now, now, don't be forgetting you can't take long on this, Nick. The captain will be wanting to question you about your card being found on the body. I can't hold off more than a few hours. Give me those few hours, Riley, and I'll wrap the murderer up in wax paper. Nicholas Carter's office. Oh, hello, Patsy. I, we got work to do. Yes, Nick? I want you to go through the files and dig out all the stuff we have on Dr. Stanley Phillips. That queer duck who did some work for you once? Yeah, that's the one. Research chemist. Uh-huh. Get all the dope on him and meet me down in front of the office in ten minutes. I'll pick you up. All right, Nick. That's all. Yeah, where are you headed for, Nick? The Phillips estate on Long Island Sound. Meet me there as soon as you get the report on the fingerprints and Stanley Phillips' neck. And apparently neither he nor his sister ever married. After the parents died, they continued to live in the big manor house. What did you say the sister's name was? Rose Phillips. Rose. Go on. Mm, you know all about his laboratory being on his yacht. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be one of the best private laboratories in the country. Used to do a lot of research work for big companies. That's a laboratory assistant, Tom Marks, young man. And let's see what else. Um, oh, his hobby was writing. Scientific articles they were. Usually about the effects of habit-forming drugs. He had an article in Popular Research last month entitled Morphine Exposed. So he wrote about habit-forming drugs, huh? Hmm. You know, Patsy... This case might turn out to be more than just an ordinary murder. I guess nobody's home, Nick. You're wrong about that, Betsy. Saw the curtains at the window move. (laughs) Pounding on the door isn't going to do any good either. Whoever's in there evidently doesn't want callers today. However... What are you going to do? Open the door. This little lock picker of mine. There it is. All right, come on, Patsy. We're going in. I don't see anybody. Stay behind me. Put your hands up. Over your head. She's got a gun, Nick. You're Rose Phillips, I take it, miss? Keep your hands up. I'm asking the questions. Who are you? I'm Nick Carter, and this is... Nick Carter? Yes. And this is my assistant, Patsy Bowen. Nick Carter, the great detective, when my brother often speaks of you, he thinks you're wonderful. Nick, she doesn't know yet. Miss Phillips, I'm sorry to have to tell you like this, 
But your brother is dead. He's... He's dead? Yes. <laughs> I'm afraid he was murdered. <laughs> murdered? Stanley murdered? <laughs> now, if you'll just put that gun away, Miss Phillips, we'll talk things over. Good, Mr. Conroy. I'm sorry. This is all such a shock. It was a fiendish killing. And I'm going to do all I can to bring the criminal to justice. You may be sure of that. Oh, Rose. Rose. I'm in here, Richard. Oh. Well, uh, who are these people? I thought Stanley told you never to let strangers in the house. It's all right, Richard. This is Nick Carter, the detective, and his assistant. Oh. Oh, Well, that's different. How do you do, Mr. Carter? I'm Richard Coles. I take it you've already heard about Dr. Phillips. Yes. Ghastly, isn't it? I can hardly believe it. The police say it was murder. For the life of me, I can't imagine who would want to murder Stanley. He was a strange man, Mr. Carter, very strange. He had a phobia about not letting anyone in the house when he was away. You seem to manage an entrance all right, Mr. Coles. Well, I... Mr. Coles is a very old friend of the family and has always had a key to the house. He's our lawyer. Look out, and... Nick! There's someone at the window! He's got a gun! <laughs> I can't get over it, Nick. You don't seem to be surprised that you were shot at back there in the house. I'm not, Patsy. That's why I was standing beside that suit of armor. That protected me by deflecting the bullets. Nick, your presence on the Phillips case is most annoying to someone. Too bad that window was frosted glass. Mm. Couldn't get a look at the gunman. That tiny crack the window was open. Well, now, did you find what I told you to look for in the cottage occupied by Tom Marks, the lab assistant? Yes, I found a pair of his gloves. Good. I had to go through all his desk drawers to find them, too. Let me see them. Mm Mm-hmm. All seems to be adding up. Almost too neatly. Adds up to a pair of gloves. That's all. Look, Patsy. Coles told me back there's something about the terms of Philip's will. If he lived to be 50, his estate was to go to a foundation. If he died before that, Rose was to inherit all the estate. But that makes Rose the... Oh, no, 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 no. I don't suspect Rose. Her grief seemed genuine. But there's something else I learned. Tom Marks, Philip's lab assistant, is in love with Rose... They've been wanting to get married, but Phillips opposed the marriage. Now the field is clear, with oodles of money to boot. But that still doesn't make Tom Marks... Betsy, I'm almost certain Phillips was strangled by a left-handed killer. These gloves of Marks you brought me show that he's left-handed. Oh. And that leads us where? Right out to the laboratory and the yacht. I've got to find Tom Marks. Nick, why in the world do you suppose Dr. Phillips had his laboratory way out here in the middle of the sound? There's no mystery to that one, Patsy. He told me why once. Well, why? So people couldn't bother him. I'd have used his technical knowledge a lot more often on cases myself if it more accessible. Well, here we are. This is the Phillips yacht. I'll tie up here. I've never climbed up a rope ladder before. And you're not going up now either. Not until I look around the boat myself. Oh, Nick, am I helping you on this case or not? You are, but I don't want you taking unnecessary chances. Nick, please. Now, quiet a minute, Patsy. Let's see if we can raise somebody from here. Hello, up there. Hello, aboard the Phillips yacht. It's funny. Tom Marks is aboard. He's keeping quiet about it. Well, we'll find out right now. You better stay here in the motorboat. And let you solve this case alone? Not a chance. Okay, okay. But stay directly behind me, remember? Phew. Climbing this rope ladder is no cinch. I'm glad I'm not a sailor. Can you make it? Uh Uh-huh. I'm coming. What do you think you'll find, Nick? Tom Marks, I hope. Here. Let me give you a hand over the rail. All right. Oopsie daisy. Oh, Thanks. Well, there's nobody to lay out the welcome rug on the deck of this floating laboratory. Well, that doesn't mean we're alone, Patsy. Come on. We're going down this companionway. Okay. I'm not mistaken. It leads to Phillips' laboratory. Mm Mm-hmm. This is the laboratory. All right, Patsy, stay behind me. I'm going to open the door. Hey, Marks. Tom Marks, you in there? All right, Patsy. We can go in. Well, Tom Mark seems to have vanished, but he certainly left a mess behind him. Yes. Overturned retorts. Bunsen burner knocked over. 
Hmm, look here on the floor. Hmm, broken bottle. Sulfuric acid spilled and eating into the floor. Yes, this is where Dr. Stanley Phillips met his death, all right. And when the killer came at him, he was sitting at this desk writing. Well, how do you figure that? That bottle of ink tipped over. Wonder if he has any papers here that'll tell us what we want to know. Desk been rifled. Everything of any value has already been taken. It still all adds up to Tom Marks, doesn't it? Yep, seems to. We'll know for sure as soon as Riley gets the report from the fingerprint expert. Nick! Hmm? Nick, come here. Look what I found in the sink. What? This piece of paper. Let's see. Now, that's in Dr. Phillips' handwriting. Well, somebody tried to burn it out. Then they threw it on the drain board of the sink here. Part of it didn't burn. Let's see if I can figure it out. Like you to know... The man whom I have trusted and worked with these many years is, I have discovered, the head of a giant dope peddling ring. Been using my premises to carry on his business. This man is... Wait, the lights have gone off! Oh. Patsy. Mm-hmm. Patsy, where are you? Patsy. Nick. Are you all right, Patsy? Uh, my head... Somebody hit me. Stay where you are, I'll find the switch. Do you have your flashlight? Yeah, I'll find the switch in just a second. Oh, the lights won't work. Uh, it must have been turned off with the master switch in the engine room. And that means there's more than one person on this boat besides us. One of them turned off the lights and the other one shot at us in here. You were right when you said you felt everything wasn't okay on this yacht. You able to get up, Patsy? Oh, sure. I'm all right now. Just a big hen's egg on my head, that's all. Okay, come on. Nick, did they take the note? It's just what I want to find out. Let's see. Flash a light down in the sink. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah, but wait. What are you going to do? Clean up the sink a little. Ashes don't look well scattered around in a white sink. Carefully now. A little bit. Yeah, there we are. Now we're ready. Ready for what? To search this yacht from stem to stern. <laughs> What in blazes has been keeping you, Nick? I've been cooling my heels on this dock for the past half hour here. I hope you'd be here, Riley. Hello, Lieutenant. Hello, Patsy. Well, say, you look as if you'd seen a ghost on that yacht. I did. Somebody took a shot at us in the dock. What? Patsy got knocked down the fracas and got a nasty bump in her head. Well, say, who did it, Nick? Whoever it was made a neat getaway. Patsy and I searched the ship afterwards from end to end, but didn't find a soul. Did you see anybody coming in from the yacht, Lieutenant? Oh, nary a soul's come in off that boat since I've been here. In fact, the only two people who've been near here was two fishermen. Are you sure they were fishermen? Am I sure? Now, now, look, Nick, don't be giving me that. It was bonafide fishermen, all right. They pulled their little rowboat to shore a ways down the beach, and I saw them bring in their catch. And a nice string of fish it was. Okay, okay, Riley. So they were really fishermen. Well, what about your report, Lieutenant? Oh, oh, that. Well, Nick was right. Our fingerprint expert examined the marks on Dr. Phillips' neck and said he was undoubtedly strangled by a left-handed killer. And now all we've got to do is find a left-handed man who had a reason to murder the doctor. We found him. Uh, well, what's that? Dr. Phillips' laboratory assistant, Tom March, is left-handed. You say you sure worked fast, Nick. And it's a good thing, too. The captain found out about your card being found on the body. Hey, w- what kind of a scoundrel is this Tom Marks? I don't know. Haven't seen him yet. He wasn't at his cottage, and he wasn't in the lab in the yacht. Now, let's make tracks, Mr. Private Detective, and search the grounds here. Wait a minute, Maybe Riley. We... Wait a minute. There's one thing more you ought to know. Huh? Whoever killed Dr. Stanley Phillips is the head of a giant dope ring. Duh. Phillips was killed because he was about to expose the man. Hey, that would be the laboratory assistant. He'd have access to drugs. Mr. Carter! Mr. Carter! Uh, who in tarnation is that? Richard Coles, a close friend of the Phillips and also the lawyer. Oh. O'Reilly, yeah? put this envelope in your pocket. Careful of it. It's a piece of evidence I picked up in the boat. Okay, Nick. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, I've been hunting everywhere for you. Oh, Mr. Coles, this is Lieutenant Riley from headquarters. Oh, I'm yeah. glad you're here, Lieutenant. We're up against a dangerous criminal. Uh, don't worry, Mr. Coles. The law always gets its man. What do you want to see me about, Mr. Coles? Rose Phillips. She's gone. G- gone? How do you know? Come up to the house with me. I'll show you. Something has happened to her, I'm sure. Hurry! Here. This is Rose's bedroom, Lieutenant. Well... Somebody was making a fast getaway, all right. Yes. Just look at the room. Clothes strewn all over. 
One of her suitcases is gone, and this suitcase, half-packed, was left behind. She and the laboratory assistant must have been in on this together. If she wasn't guilty, she wouldn't have run away. Oh, she must have been out of her mind. Of course, Rose was in love with Tom, and... Nick. What's the matter, Patsy? What are you frowning at? Rose Phillips didn't run away. Uh, what's that? Didn't run away? What are you saying, Patsy? No girl would run away voluntarily and leave all her makeup behind. Well, look at that dressing table. Nothing's been touched. You're right, Patsy. Say, do you suppose... Oh, no, no. What is it, Mr. Coles? Do you suppose that Tom could have forced her to leave? You mean... You mean kidnap her? Yes. Well, he won't get away with it. I'll call headquarters and have a cordon thrown around this entire district. We'll catch Tom Marks before he gets to the next town. Good idea, Riley. Do that. Well, Mr. Coles? Yes, Mr. Carter? I guess Lieutenant Riley has this case all sewed up. His men will have Tom Marks and Rose Phillips within the hour. Well, Mr. Carter, it was nice of you to take such an interest in my friend's death. Um, would you care for a cigarette? Oh, no, thanks. Uh, you, Lieutenant? Why, why, sure, sure, I don't mind if I do. Of course. Uh, light? Yeah, thanks, thanks. Well, good day, Mr. Coles. Goodbye. Carter. Come along, Patsy. Hey, uh, where's the telephone, Mr. Coles? There's uh, one right over here on the table. Hurry up, Patsy, we got work to do. I thought you said the case was finished. Not by a long shot. I said that for their benefit. You and I are going over this estate for the fine tooth comb. I'm not satisfied yet. You see anything, Nick? Come on in. Shut the door. Do you think anyone saw us headed for this boathouse? I hope not. Oh, well, be careful you. Don't step off in the water. Nick, there's a small speedboat in the water. Wouldn't you think they put it in dry dock so late in the season? Depends, Patsy. Look up there, mounted in the bow. A machine gun? Mm-hmm. This boat was used for business. Gee, who'd ever think a quiet little chemist like Dr. Phillips kept a mounted machine gun on a speedboat? I believe this setup down here was news to Dr. Phillips, too. Hold on to my arm. We'll look around. Oh, Nick, don't step on the fish. String of fish? Oh, dear. Nick, those fishermen Riley saw must have come in here. Patsy, this catch isn't fresh. What? Those men used this string of dead fish just to fool Riley. And those were the men who made trouble for us on the yacht. Yeah, they must have been. Well, plenty of life preservers stacked up in here. Yeah, that's strange. Here, Betsy, hmm? take the flashlight and play it on this one. Okay. Well, what are you doing, taking it to pieces? No, just examining it. Aha! There we have it. What? A small waterproof pocket's been sewn in here. Yes, and it extends all the way around inside this life preserver. Pretty clever. Look, Betsy. What is it? These secret compartments are filled with dope. I bet every one of these life preservers is filled with drugs. Nobody would ever think of looking in a life preserver for evidence. I think Dr. Phillips did. And that's why he was murdered. <laughs> Nick. Nick. Are you okay, Patsy? Yes, but I can't stop crying. Well, that's not surprising. Somebody threw a tear gas bomb through the window. Oh. That's right, friends. It was tear gas. Who's there? <laughs> Pretty clever of me using the tools of my trade that way, isn't it, Mr. Carter? But Tom Marks is always clever. So you're Tom Marks, huh? I've been waiting to set my eyes on you. It's too bad your eyes are filled with tear gas. Because now you'll never have that pleasure. Okay, Pete. Come in and get the lady. Right. I'll take care of Mr. Carter myself. Okay, Nick, come on. Nick, come on, sister. Come on. Let her go alone. Let her go alone. Yeah, let her go alone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you got those iron weights in the bag, Pete? Sure, both of them. This guy will never be washed up on a beach like the doc was. <laughs> Good. 
see you tied a bag good and tight. You know, I think he's passed out. He ain't moving none. I did a job on him before we put him in the bag. <laughs> 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 Listen to that dame, will you? <laughs> Sounds like a hoot owl with a cold in the head. <laughs> Shut up. Oh, no. Oh, tighten the gag, Pete. Okay. There you go. That'll do it. Hey. Say, Carter ain't dead. What does it take to kill that guy? I choked him like a rat and he's still talking. All right. All right. Speak your piece, Mr. Carter. Because you don't have much longer. You're not going to get away with this. <laughs> you hear what he said? Uh, I'm telling you. <laughs> I doubt it, Mr. Carter. You're going straight down to Davy Jones' locker. You'll pay for this. I'll have you behind bars within 24 hours. Oh, listen to him. What do you fellas think you're going to do with Patsy Bowen? He's worrying about a dame when he's going <laughs> to lose his own neck. Go <laughs> easy with her, I'm warning you. Uh, well. Come on, let's get rid of him. Okay. It's dark enough now. All right. You got him? Yeah. All right, All lift right. him up. That's it. I'll Not get you one, fellas for this. Two, two three. three. Uh, let her go. I came as soon as I got your flashlight signal from the shore, Nick. You think the criminals are aboard the yacht here now? You'll see in a minute. The laboratory's right down this companionway. Hey, you're dripping wet from head to foot, Nick. What happened? They tried to pull the same trick on Nick that they pulled on Dr. Phillips. Ah. Only it didn't work, because Nick can expand his neck and wrist muscles. Yes, I had my hands free before I hit the water. There was no trick at all to cut my way out of the sack. And then I clung to the back of their motorboat until it reached the yacht here. I waited for the would-be killers to get aboard... Untied Patsy, and here we are. Ah, you're lucky, Nick. He's smart, that's all. Quiet. This is the door. Keep your gun ready. Right. Good evening, Mr. Coles. What? Oh, Nick Carter. Well, come in, Mr. Carter. These two friends of mine and myself were just discussing whether you had found the criminals. I think we have, Mr. Coles. Good, good. There's just one thing more I need to make sure I have the criminals. Riley. Yeah? Yeah. Give me that envelope I asked you to keep for me. Oh, sure, sure, Nick. Uh, here you are. Thanks. Now, I'll just take the piece of burned paper out of this envelope. Are well, those the pieces you gathered from the drain board? Yes, Patsy. Oh. They were from the note Stanley Phillips wrote just before he was murdered. Now, I'll just use some of these chemicals in the burned paper. Oh. You see, gentlemen, even though this piece of paper's been burned, it is possible by using the correct chemical solution to bring out the writing that was on the paper before it was burned. In this case, I expect the writing will give the name of the man Phillips designated as head of the giant drug ring and his killer. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Yes, here it comes. The chemicals are beginning to act. The writing is beginning to show up. Good. The name is... Nick, look out! Oh, you got me, boy! Get out of here! Oh. Oh. Man, I got these two thugs, Nick. Knocked him out cold. So I had to plug in the shoulder, Coles, but I had to put you out of action. Now, Riley, there's your murderer. Uh, so it was Coles who did it. You're right, Carter. I killed him. Uh, the powers be praised, Nick. I thought Tom Marks was the killer. Coles had me fooled too, Riley, until this afternoon when he came running down from the house. And then I noticed his feet were wet, as if he'd been in waiting. Then he was one of the men on the yacht, one of the fishermen Riley saw. Right, Patsy. And another thing. The man who strangled me in the boathouse claimed to be Tom Marks. But Tom Marks is left-handed. The man who tried to strangle me used his right hand. And you knew Phillips was murdered by a left-handed man. That's right. I knew I was after a left-handed murderer. O'Reilly, huh? did you notice that when Coles lighted your cigarette for you this afternoon in Rose's room, he used his left hand? See, by golly, he did. Th th then he's left-handed, too. Right. When I saw him do that, I knew he was the killer. But I had to make him prove it. Oh, you did that all right. That business about making the writing stand out on a piece of paper after it's burned is a new one to me, Nick. Nick, can you actually do that? Well, it can be done under ideal conditions. But this time, I was just putting on an act for Mr. Coles' benefit. You mean you didn't actually make any writing appear on the burned paper? Not a word, Mr. Coles. And I fell for it like a sap. Nick. Hmm? What's that? Well, I'm not sure, Patsy, but I have a hunch. It's locked, Nick. Oh, Patsy, since when did a locked door ever stop Nick Carter? Quite right, Riley. When did it? This is no time for it to start. So, this one ought to do the trick. There we are. Nick Carter. Oh, thank heaven, Rose. This man with you is Tom Marks, Miss Phillips? Yes, I am. 
They were going to kill us, Mr. Carter. They tied us up and threw us in here. We heard them planning to throw us overboard. Have you been imprisoned in here all this time, Mr. Marks? Uh, no, not quite. I got a telephone call last night summoning me into the city to pick up some chemicals Dr. Phillips and I needed in an experiment. I was slugged as I stepped out of the car. And when I came too late this afternoon, I, I was in here. And so was Rose. Uh, that call was a smart one. Throwing suspicion on you and then trying to get rid of you in order to make it look as if you'd run away. Smart, but not smart enough for Nick. Well, Riley, you've got your murderer. I have that. And Rose, you and Tom are safe. Yes, thanks to you. And I guess that's that. Oh, no, Nick. You still have to solve my case. Well, what's that, Patsy? That luncheon date you promised me. Oh. Where are you and I going to have lunch at this hour? Why, uh... Oh, say, that's easy, Patsy. I know a swell place in town, right across from the morgue. Come on. <laughs> This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, master detective, called the Drug Ring Murder, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Left-Handed Killer. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, what can you tell us about next week's story? When a young man who was a very good friend of mine arrived in town to claim his bride, he suddenly became aware that she was not the girl to whom he'd become engaged. You mean she wasn't his fiancée? That was the question that started off the whole case. Yes, indeed. Because we couldn't be sure whether the girl he loved was really the girl he loved, we prevented two murders and saved a gigantic fortune from disappearing. But you didn't save me from disappearing, Nick. Oh, quite true, Patsy. But after all, you weren't gone very long before we found you. But I'm sure glad you found me when you did, or I might not be here now. So long, folks. Get the rest of the story next week. Right. So long. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In The Strange Adventure, you have just heard Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Barth Connery. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. <laughs> And Peter Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. A private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn. Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. The guy on the customer's end of your office desk, no laughs here. This one is strictly business. He's a round little man, balding on top, pudgy in the middle. He's got eyes like a vulture and a cranky voice. Mr. Chambers, you've been highly recommended to me. You're supposed to be number one in your uh, racket. <laughs> he chuckles with a phony heartiness, and the eyes crinkle up, vulture's eyes, with an extra set of bags under him. The upper set are dark bulbous circles from lack of sleep. The lower set are worry bags, purple and networked with wrinkles. I'm out on a writ of habeas corpus, Mr. Chambers. Yeah, and uh, on a murder rap. They haven't got a thing now, on me. Now, just a minute, just a minute, pal. Let's get some of our facts ironed out. Your name is Charles Avon. Uh-huh. You're a druggist here in New York. Right. You're married and you've got no kids. Correct. Wife's name is Nancy. Lives 1688 Gramercy Park North. All right, now let's get to the meaty part. You're accused of the murder of one Alan Lewis. Yeah. Used to be a clerk in your drugstore. That's right. Please claim you killed him Monday, which is yesterday, mm -hmm. yesterday evening mm -hmm. at his Park Avenue... Par Park Avenue? Yeah, so they claim. Well, did you kill him, Mr. Ravine? Absolutely not. Mm. And my job... Is to find out who did kill him, so that I don't have to carry that burden around, too. What's the other burden, Mr. Ravine? Well, there are two sides to every question in my business. I don't... All right, we'll skip that temporarily. Now, let's see. The cops hauled you in for the murder of your clerk. Ex-clerk. He hadn't been working for me for a year. Living off the fat of the land. Why'd they pick on you, Miss Ravon? Because I was supposed to be there last night at 8 o'clock. That's when it happened to him. And also, I'm supposed to have a motive for his murder. Well, did you have a motive? Well, if a guy's been blackmailing you for Black a year... Blackmail. What do you have on you, Mr. Avon? Well, now, I, I don't know that I... Ma, let's uh, have it. Uh, well, narcotics. Narcotics? We had a deal going, sort of, with uh, 
Narcotics. The oh, lawyer knows all about it. I want to know. Well, I, I was looking for easy money, and I'm doing all right. This this Alan Lewis, he learns about it. He was working for me, you understand, and, and he starts holding me up. And so last night, when he's murdered... I came there to talk with him, but he wasn't home. That's all. He wasn't home. Then last night, the police picked me up, and I don't even know what they're talking about. Who's your lawyer? Richard Evans. Dick Evans. Oh. You know him? Yeah, I know Dick. Mr. Chambers, I, you, you've got to help me out of this jam. Not the narcotics, pal. No, no, the, the murder. And it'll cost you 5,000 simoleons. Yeah. That's fair enough. Cash on the barrel head. I don't trust guys like you. Okay, but I don't have it on me. If you'll accompany me to the bank, well, yeah, I... I can't say I admire my choice of companion. You're an insulting well, one, Let's go, Mr. Other. Avon. We'll discuss it on the way. You get to the bank and you're paid, and you kiss him off like you'd kiss off a king cobra that just became a client. But if the guy's not guilty of murder, it's your job to prove it. That's what you're being paid for. So you get rid of him, and you go downtown to the offices of B. Richard Evans, Regal, Legal, Eagle. Hi, honey. Mr. Evans in? Uh, well, I'm in. All right, Pete. Come on. Ah. I've been expecting you. Hi, Dick. How are things going? Fine, fine, Petey. Come right on in. Okay. Dick Evans, boy lawyer. Black hair, beak nose, and cyclone sell a voice. A two-tone personality split at five o'clock. Tricky as a slippery bath mat before the deadline, but afterward, wide open and roaring. A wielder of martinis, like a good farmer with a pitchfork. What brings you, Mr. Detective? Charles Avon, Dick. How easy was it getting him out on that writ? Easier than getting stepped on in the subway. Because why, Counselor? Because the prosecution doesn't have a thing on him. Well, they got motive. Motive isn't murder, Mr. Chambers. Well, how'd that guy get it, that uh, Alan Lewis? Two bullets. One ripped through his right shoulder, rather unimportant. The second one pasted in over his right eye. Very important. Hmm. Prosecution got the gun? No, sir, they don't. All they got is motive, period. They gave him a nine-hour grilling, and all they could come up with was motive. Okay, okay, okay. Now, what about the other charge? What other charge? The narcotics. Well, I'm going to plead him guilty on that. He ought to get a light sentence because without Alan Lewis, they've hardly got a case. Well, here comes motive again for the death of Alan Lewis. Well, the police know all about that. How much good has it done them? By the way, uh, how do they know? Who told them? Uh, Frankie Tokers. Frankie Tokers. Uh, male or female? Female, but good and female. You're uh, going to like that when you come to it. I like it already, just from looking at your face. Uh, have another slice of motive, Mr. Chambers. This one's on Frankie. She was engaged to Alan Lewis. That's motive? Not yet it's not, but this is. She's the beneficiary on his insurance policy for $30,000. Plus, she's the one who informed the police that the Lewis boy was putting the touch on Avon for the blackmail. Well, how'd she know? Her boyfriend confided in her. Oh. Well, how'd she stand, uh, suspect-wise? Oh, she's got an alibi, don't they all? Frankie told me. A very gorgeous number. It sings at the rumpus room with an equally gorgeous blonde partner with whom you will kindly have no truck. Why? Because that one is sort of reserved for me. Do <laughs> uh, you have this Frankie Tokers phone number, Dick? Got it written down somewhere. Name, address, and phone number. Ah, right, here you are. Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah. Cute little trick. Five, That's Frankie. Six, Miss Tokers? This is Miss Tokers. Uh, Collins from the insurance company. There's been a slight complication. May I come to see you? Oh, uh, well, when? Oh, right away. The sooner the better. Well, all right, if you insist. I should be here most of the afternoon. Ah, good. I'll see you shortly then. Bye, Miss Tokers. So you leave the lawyer and you go visit the lady. This is supposed to be the part the private eye enjoys, but don't make book on that. Because most of the dear ladies turn out to look like bats on a vacation from the belfry. This one happily doesn't. Uh, 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 Miss Tokers? <laughs> yes, I'm Miss Tokers. Uh, Mr. Collins from the insurance company. Oh, yes. Please come in. Frankie Tokers. She's wearing a hostess gown, a metallic number in gold. Imagine that wrapped around a dream-bunched figure. Frankie Tokers. Tall, with an oval face and wide, dark eyes that glint like brandy bottles under bar lights. You don't fool around with a kid like that. Um, 
Mr. Collins? I'm sorry. My name's not Collins, Miss Tokers, and I'm not from the insurance company. My name's Chambers, Peter Chambers. I'm a private detective. And they tell me that you're on a spot. Get out. Now, just a minute. Get out. Get out, I tell you. Look, 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 lady. I think you've got me pegged wrong. Please. Oh, please. You explain the situation, and tears come up in the blackberry brandy eyes. Naturally, you put your arm around her, and just as naturally, she puts her head on your shoulder. A sobbing brunette close in the arms of the private detective. There you have the classic situation. But you've been paid 5,000 bucks to find out who killed Cock Robin, so <laughs> reluctantly you break it up. No, no, no. I know how you feel, Miss Tokers. You love the guy, but he's dead. Not true. Huh? I hated him. You were engaged to be married, weren't you? That was going to end when I found out what he was really like. And um, whose idea was that $30,000 life policy with you as beneficiary? His. His, of course. But that was going to be finished, too. Hmm. Mr. Chambers, I couldn't tell the police, but I will tell you. Why? Because I want you to help me. Look, sister, you didn't kill him, did you? Oh, no, no, no. Listen. Listen, last night, the night he was killed, I went there. I was going to tell him off and finish it off completely. What time? Nine o'clock. It was between shows. I'm a singer at the Rumpus Room. Yeah, I know. Anyway, when I got there, there was no answer. I kept ringing, but there was no answer, and I was worried. I went back to the club, and I called on the phone. No answer. Then I called the police and told them that there was trouble there. I didn't say who was calling. Oh, wait, now, wait, but... hold, hold, hold up just for a minute. First... Why the police, just because the guy's not home? And second, how did you know there was trouble there? Because I knew that he had an appointment with Mr. Charles Avon for 8 o'clock. And it was going to be a long talk. And I knew what the talk was about. What was it about? About more money. More blackmail money. Oh. Oh, I see. It figured for a trouble party, huh? Yes. And when the guy didn't answer at 9 o'clock, was your idea that the trouble had exploded? Exactly. And one hour after the phone call, the police were at the club, investigating the murder of Alan Lewis. I told them everything I knew about the narcotics that Mr. Avon was dealing in and about Alan's blackmail and about how he was going to raise the ante at this meeting between them. Well, that answers why Charles Avon was picked up. Uh, what about your alibi? I fixed that up with my singing partner. I arranged for her to say that I'd been with her all the time in our dressing room. But I'm scared, Mr. Chambers. I'm sick scared inside of me. Help me. Please help me. Oh, Miss Tokers, I'd hate it if you did put those slugs into Alan. I didn't. I didn't. Oh, I didn't. She's asking for it. And you answer. You take her face in your hands, put your lips on hers, and you leave them there. With excellent results. But then you quit. You crash out of there and you're heading for police headquarters. But you detour for Charles Avon's drugstore. Good to see you again, Mr. Chambers. I, I was uh, thinking I might want to drop into your home tonight. Uh, would you be there perhaps later on? No, but my wife will. Oh, you don't know her. Oh, oh. she's here right now. I'd very much like to have you meet her. Nancy? Yes? Yeah, my dear, Peter Chambers, the gentleman I told you about. Uh, my wife, Nancy Avon. She's a small blonde, too young and too pretty for Charlie Boy. She's wearing gold-rimmed black lens goggles and you can't see her eyes. She's smooth-skinned and good-looking. But jumpy, nervous as a lion tamer who's lost his whip. Did, did, did you wish to speak to me, Mr. Chambers? Uh, very much, but I don't have the time now. May I speak with you later? Of course, but I'm leaving for home now. Well, may I call you there? Well, it's a little upset. It's made day off, but if you wish... I wish. I wish. See you later. Bye, Mr. and Mrs. Avon. <laughs> And so you're riding your broom again, making time for police headquarters, and then you're there. Come in. Come in. Well, Pete, to what do I owe the honor? Charles Avon, Louis, a paid-up client. So? Maybe you think you can do more than cops can do, huh? I doubt it, but I can try. Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker, homicide. Thick set and sturdy like a brand new refrigerator and just about as enthusiastic. But a good cop. And mostly a good friend. What's pitch? I'm being paid $5,000 to find out who put the chill on Alan Lewis. Well, $5,000 to do what we'd do anyway, huh? Brother, yours is one business. Hmm. Okay, what do you want? Help. <laughs> That's hot. You're getting five Gs. What do we get? Well, any information happens to fall my way. And no byline. You get all the credit. You buying? What do you want, kid? 
Well, I'd like to see the inside of Alan Lewis's apartment. I'll buy that. In fact, I'll go with you. You got a cop staked out there? Nobody's staked out there. I've got better things to do with cops than having them sitting around getting fat. <laughs> okay, what else? Well, anything else that's not too terribly confidential? Oh, not this case, Petey. We got us a nice fat group of nothing. Ah, well, then that's it, Lieutenant. Let us go look at apartments. <laughs> Alan Lewis's joint turns out to be the usual bachelor's flat fitted out to please the ladies. Parker snoozes in the bedroom while you poke around like a critical matron seeking dust in the upholstery. In the library, a book sticks out like a sore thumb in a working pickpocket. You pull it out and an envelope drips to the floor. You pick that up and examine it. It's slid on top and it contains a letter. It's addressed to Mrs. Nancy Avon, 1688 Gramercy Park, North New York City. You don't stop to read the letter. You stick it in your pocket and you're ready to leave. Then Parker comes into the room yawning. Oh, you finished, Sherlock? All done. Let's get out of here. Oh, uh, by the way, I assume you guys gave this place a going over. Yeah, most of last night. Been through this apartment with a fine tooth comb. Yeah, a fine tooth comb. Hey, is that a crack? No, no crack intended, Lieutenant. Leave us, leave. Yeah, leave us. Outside, Parker goes off, and you're left alone. Frankie Toker's place is nearby, and... Well, maybe you're looking for an excuse to go back. Hello, Mr. Chambers. Oh, may I come in? Please do. You bring her up to date, you take the letter out of the envelope, and you read. Dear Nancy, finished is finished. Now you've got it in writing. I don't see the sense, but if you insist, you can come over Monday at 7.30. You can't stay long. As it happens, I have a date with Charles for 8 o'clock. Yours, Alan. The date matches. Monday, yesterday. The night he was killed. That letter puts her right in the middle, doesn't it? Say, do you know anything about these two, Nancy Avon and Alan Lewis? She was sweet on him, and he encouraged her. Oh? Charlie Avon didn't even know it was cooking, but she was planning to divorce him. And then Alan Lewis cooled off. You mean, uh... When he met you. He'd have cooled off anyway. That's the kind of guy he was. Real loyal. Shot through with integrity. Hmm. Well, how'd she take it, you know? He told me. She was plenty worked up over it. Okay, Miss Tokers. Uh, Frankie. <laughs> well, you cross your fingers, and if I'm lucky, you're out of a jam. Oh, I'd appreciate that. Would I appreciate that? You figure your next stop for your last stop. 1688 Gramercy Park North. Oh. Oh, Mr. Chambers. Please come in. Mrs. Avon. She's dressed in Chinese type lounging pajamas and she's not wearing the dark lens specs. You look at her eyes and a chill goes through you like winter's suddenly gotten into the marrow of your bones. Wild eyes, quick-moving, darting, half-mad eyes. The pupils dilated almost to the rim. Something, Mr. Chambers? Uh, a few questions. Questions? Why questions of me? Well, I've got a hunch I've stumbled on something the police don't know. Like, like, like what? Uh, like you had a thing going with Alan Lewis. I... Your husband, you hope, didn't know about it. But I, I... There are letters. You saved them. Right, Mrs. Avon? Yes. You were there last night? Yes. I'm sorry, Mrs. Avon. Now, where's the gun? Do you have it? You, you, you say the police don't know? Perhaps, perhaps, I, I mean, I have Look, money. I'm one of the dumb ones. I'm allergic to bribery. Now, where's the gun? I, I have it. It's hidden here, 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 hidden in the apartment. Will you, will you get it, please? Yes. Yes, I'll get it. it it's my own gun. <laughs> You wait while she goes for it, and you don't like it. But you haven't got the time to work it out now. Because she's coming back, and she's carrying the thing. A chunky, nickel-plated item. And she's holding it, business end forward. You get a scratched hip and a hole in your pants. And you're all ready to slug her, but you don't have to, because she slides down in a faint. You get the gun away from her, find brandy, pour a lot into her, and a little into yourself... And finally, she starts coming, too. I... I fainted. You certainly did, lady. I'm ill. 
I- I'm under the care of a psychiatrist. Uh, gunshot, the sound of gunshot. One shot and I pass out. Even if I do it myself, I pass what out. What happened last night? <laughs> Almost like it happened here. I was there before he was, and when he came, we argued. I, I brought the pistol. I was wearing my gloves, and I shot him. And then I fainted. When I came to, I saw he was dead, and I got out now, of there. Just a minute, just a minute. You say you were there before he was? How'd you get in? I, I have keys. You get her to an easy chair, and you call down to Parker at headquarters. You put in a request for a lot of law. And also for Mr. Charles Avon. Pretty soon, the place is crawling with cops, and you point a finger, and to Lieutenant Parker, you say, I give you a murderer, Lieutenant. But you've got it wrong. You're mistaken. No mistake. It's just where my finger's pointing. I give you, Lieutenant, Mr. Charles Avon. This guy's nuts. A lot of things he is. Nuts he ain't. Go on, Pete. Here's a guy who comes in and hires me for $5,000 for something the New York City police can do much better and for nothing. You're stealing my lines, chump. But the guy's not crazy. He's got a purpose. Oh, He's also got a large contempt for the thoroughness of the police, which I haven't. Start making sense, Petey boy. Read this. You toss the letter to Detective Lieutenant Parker and the room is as quiet as a cemetery until he's through reading it. So? I found that letter... From Mrs. Avon to Alan Lewis. I found it in Lewis's apartment. Now, wait a minute. We gave that place an extra special going over. That letter wasn't there. Pa. You don't have to convince me. Convince Charles Avon. That baby goes and sees the wrong movies. He's got no confidence in cops. No, wait. No question. The letter wasn't there. But I Pete. found it there. So it adds up to plant. Somebody planted it there. Wanted it found there. Somebody wanted to implicate Mrs. Nancy Avon. Who? Who had access to her mail? Huh? Friend husband, that's who. Oh. Why do you think he hired me? So I could bumble around and find a few things he wanted me to find. Like frustrated love, like that letter, like like maybe a confession from Mrs. Avon, which I got. She confessed? Doesn't mean a thing. Let me do it chronologically, will do you, Do it any way you like, pal. Nancy Avon goes there at 7.30 to keep her date. Yes. She brings her gun because the young guy's giving her the air. She waits for him, he comes, they argue, she shoots him, and she faints. One shot. But the guy had two bullet holes in it. Correct. But here's how he got the second... Charles Avon's got a hate for both of them, for Alan and for Nancy. Alan's been blackmailing him, plus the wife is sweet on Alan. He's been steeping open her mail, and he knows she's going to meet him last night. So he oh. follows, he follows, hoping against hope for action, and action happened. And then he gets in there, he sees Alan bleeding from the shoulder wound, and the wife in a faint on the floor. He picks up the gun, finishes off Alan, wipes the prince off, puts it back in her hand, and vamooses. She comes to, sees the dead Alan, and she gets out convinced that she killed him. And then we pick up Charlie on the strength of Miss Toker's story, but the lawyer gets him sprung on a writ. Right. So this morning, he goes to Lewis's apartment, and he sticks that letter where it can't be missed. No, no, I... Real contempt he has for the efficiency of cops, hasn't he? Anyway, he hires me so I can clean up some loose ends and lay the whole deal in the lady's lap. The minute I saw that letter, I knew it was a plant. It happens that I've got respect for cops. They'd never miss that kind of evidence. Uh, one great big catch. Yeah, I know what you're going to say. What? How did he get in there twice? Once to croak the guy and once to plant the letter. Correct. Mrs. Avon had keys. Mr. Avon made duplicates. He figured he'd have use for them sooner or later. Well, he used them all right, and by now he's disposed of them. But he hasn't disposed of the key maker. Meaning what? Meaning that when a guy swipes his wife's keys to make duplicates, he doesn't go far. So you can demonstrate to Mr. Avon about the efficiency of cops by producing, and with dispatch, the neighborhood keymaker who did the job, and that, that will put the final finger on Mr. Charles Avon. No, no, I didn't. All no, right, Mr. Mr. Avon. And that does it. Charles Avon goes white and topples, and when he gets up, the manacles are around his wrist, and he's babbling his brains out. Lawyer or no lawyer... This time, he's going to get locked away for good. Nice work. Great A job, Petey. Congratulations. <laughs> well, now. Appreciation from a detective lieutenant to a private eye, that's sweet music indeed. But you start breaking out of there because you're heading for Frankie Toker's place. Appreciation from Detective Lieutenant Parker, good enough. But appreciation from Miss Frankie Toker. Well, no. (laughs) 
And there you've had Crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers transcribed was created and written by Henry Kane. Bill Zuckert was heard as Lieutenant Parker with Leslie Woods, Edgar Staley, and Lawson Zerby. It was directed by Fred Way. This is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Who? Oh, yeah, hello, Doc, how are you? <laughs> what? In trouble, you? <laughs> More trouble, you track trouble, Archie, hang up. It's our dentist, Dr. Thrumming. Let him wait. We never can find him when we need him. Tell him it's after office hours. Doc. Doc, you're talking so fast, I can't make head and the tails of it. Look, look, listen, Doc. Come on over here and we'll be able to hear you. It'll only take you a few minutes. Right. You consistently disobey me. I want to work on my paper about Odonto Cousins. Doc Thrummick has a friend who's in some trouble and he needs our advice. Besides, we owe Doc a fair-sized little bill, remember? Money again, Archie. Money is the curse of our times. Yeah, man. Bring on all the curses that is available. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, balkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-born mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> This story is one we refer to as the case of the Midnight Ride. Oh, yeah, there was a ride, all right. But it would never have happened if we hadn't received another phone call a few minutes after our Dr. Thrummig phone. It was late in the evening, and Nero Wolf was studying his paper on orchids while I was absorbed in playing some phonograph records. Archie, Archie, not so loud. I can't possibly think when you play that infernal thing at such volume. Oh, is that you said, boss? I said I can't understand why you can't get music from a phonograph without vibrating the top of the instrument. That's right, that's right. I can't understand why the neighbors haven't called the police. Do you hear that, Archie? Archie! All right, I'll answer. You're fired. Naturally. Hello? Hello. Is this Archie Goodwin? I know, Mr. Wolf's... What? Me? Archie. Yeah, who is it? I need help, Archie. Please. Come at once. Please. Oh, please. You and Nero. Who is this? This is Gloria Bar... No. No, don't. Gloria who? Ronaldo... West... Hello? Hello? Well, did you hear that? Another female bar. What happened? Boss, who do you know named Gloria? Gloria? I know nothing about anyone named Gloria. She said her name was Gloria something. I couldn't quite get the last name. But she did say Ronaldo Road. Well, it's quite possible that she resides on Ronaldo Road. First she asked if this was Archie Goodwin speaking, and before I had a chance to say anything, she asked me to come to her at once. She needed help and for you to bring me along. I mean, for me to bring Nero along. You don't even know what you're talking about. Well, she said she was Gloria Barr or Mar or something like that, and then she said Ronaldo Road West, and then the scream, and that's all there was. Hmm. The usual pattern of your experience with women. It sounded like a hand was slapped over her mouth, or she was grabbed by the throat. Bring Nero with you. I am taking no more assignments this week. Ronaldo Road West, where is it? I don't believe there is a Ronaldo Road West. If I remember correctly, Ronaldo Road runs north and south and is approximately 12 miles long. But she said west. What she probably tried to say when she was interrupted was Ronaldo Road West Chester. 
Westchester, of course. Asked Inspector Kramer to try to check on that phone call. I'll ask him to try. By the way, do you expect to find this Gloria alive, Archie? Well, I certainly hope so. And are you aware that if someone strangled her, then they must have heard her speak your name? Yes, and yours too. Shall I open it, boss? Why not? Let us face it, Archie. Huh? It's me, Archie. <laughs> Wait till I slide the night chain off, Dr. Thrummy. Yeah, my nose. <laughs> I forgot all about you, Doc. Where have you been? It's only been three or four minutes. I have never had such a disturbing night since I had my first patient. But at first I was afraid to leave the house. And why were you so afraid, Dr. Thrummy? Well, there were two men sitting in front of my place in the car. Oh, oh good evening, Nero. Were they waiting for you, Doctor? Well, why not? It's very likely. Since she called me, I've been so completely unnerved. Here, I... Doc, here. Have some brandy. Oh, no, 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 no. You know I never... Uh, well, that is, uh, well, a small one. I, I am upset. Uh, you understand, Archie. Uh, 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 oh, well, that's better. Just who called you and upset you, so? Oh, hello, Nira. Did someone call me? Uh, when? You phoned me frantically that a woman called you. I couldn't understand you on the phone. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, poor Gloria. She was cut off. Oh, Gloria. Did you say Gloria? Well, didn't I? I thought I did. Oh, dear... What did you say? I said Gloria. Oh, my, isn't that strange? I thought that's what I said. No, no, no more, please. We just had a call from Gloria. Who is Gloria? Well, you remember, we all went to school together. Uh, that is, oh, you do too remember. Uh, Gloria, you know, she was, um... Uh, just what is Gloria's last name, Dr. Thrumming? Well, it was Gloria Barnesworth. I don't know what it is now. That's what she was trying to say to me, Barnesworth. Did she tell you where to find her? Uh, no, she didn't. Uh, Oh, dear me. She was just about to tell me when I said I'd call you and Archie and get your help. And then she was cut off. How do you know she's the Gloria Barnesworth you knew and I'm supposed to know? My. Whew. Uh, could you open the windows? Why, yes. Archie. Oh, sorry, Doc. The air outside's contaminated. Oh, is that so? With what? Oxygen. Mm, oh, these factories, factories, factories. Oh, well, I found her picture in an old class photo. Here it is. Oh, yeah, now I remember. But, Doc, you and this gal were several years ahead of me in school. I, I'm not in this picture, so she must be about 40 now. Well, gentlemen, you both seem to have the situation well in hand now. So if you'll excuse me, I will retire to my room. Oh, oh yes, but we don't have anything figured out yet. Ah, but you will. Let me know in the morning how successful you have been. Good night. Well, anyway, a woman called here, and just as she was about to tell me who she was and her address, she was cut off as though she was strangled. Yeah, Archie, did you say someone strangled her? I don't know, Doc. I hope not. Well, let's start our search along Ronaldo Road. Hey, hey, Archie, Archie, don't answer it. They're after me. The men in the car, they saw me come in here. After you, nonsense. They found out Gloria phoned me. Don't let them in. Now, how could you know all that? Oh, dear me. Do you mind? A short one? I'm so weak today. Please, Archie, don't open it. I warn you. Now, just relax, Doc. I'll handle this. Good evening. Evening. Are you Archie Goodwin? Uh, no, he is. Yes. No, I'm not. He is. Put up your hands. Unhook the night chain. Now just turn off this light. Oh, I told you. I told you. Where's Wolf? Oh, he's been in bed for hours. And who is this little man? Why, well, I'm... Well, don't you know? This is my, uh, my, my brother, Brother Cuthbert. Yes, he's quite right. I'm a bit older than he is. Shut up, Cuthbert. All right, get your coats and hats off that rack. What for? We're all going for a little ride along the river. And it's a bit chilly. Oh, dear me. Uh, I feel faint. I'm getting dizzy. Get your hat. Uh, yes, sir. And put that bottle down. Yes, but it's so cold out there. Get tonight. along. Here's the car. Now, Mr. Goodwin, hand over that gun in your pocket. But I haven't got... Okay, there you are. Thank you. Now, get in the car. You get in the front seat with the driver, Goodwin. Your brother can get back with me. Okay, you know where we're going, driver. Yeah, yeah but... Yeah, but I... what? Get going. But do you know who this guy is? I do. Why? Well, now, look, I... Well, this guy is Archie Goodwin. What if he is? Well, this won't work. I mean, I didn't know it was going to be Goodwin. He's with Nero Wolf. What's your name, pal? I can't see you, but I seem to recognize your voice. Well, well, you see, it was like this. I was in on... Are you going to shut up of... and start driving? Okay, okay, I'm going. <laughs> Now, see here, it's 
getting very late. I, I don't like this. Uh, where are you taking us? Keep calm, Doc. Yeah, don't get excited. Just take it easy. Listen, Goodwin, I got a record Shut for up, you. Shut you my... What's the idea back of all this, friend? We're off the road here, driver. Yes, but we're way out in the country. Now, we'll all get out here. Now, wait a minute. I said get out. You too, driver. Oh, now, wait a second. What's the big idea? Now, all of you start walking over to that clump of trees. Go on. <laughs> What's he going to do? What do you think? Okay, that's good. Just stand there. Now, get out your gun, driver. Get... Oh, now, wait a minute. This is the way you Get out your gun see... and don't turn around, driver. Now, let him have it. Go on, or I'll kill you. I don't go in for this kind of stuff. Besides, come on. Shoot and empty the... your gun into them. Go on. Oh! Now, just drop your gun on the ground. There. Now, I will take Goodwin's gun, and after I finish with it, I'll just toss it over beside his body. You what? Hey, now, wait a you minute. You'll notice I have gloves on. <laughs> Doc. Dr. Thrumming. You all right, Doc? Oh. Oh, Archie, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I got you into this. I I can't last long. Where are you hit? Tell Nero I make him a present of his new bridge work I put in. Let me have a look at you. I wanted to die in my bed with my friends around me. You're not bleeding. I wanted the choir to sing. What? I'm not bleeding? No. Are you? No. The driver was a bad shot. He missed both of them. Then what am I doing down here on the ground? You fainted at the first shot. I dropped purposely on the second shot. He missed every time. Come on, get up from there. Uh, We're very lucky people. uh, What became of them? Hand me my gun. Uh, Oh, is this your gun? Wrap it in this handkerchief. Come over here. Yep. Here he is, the driver. And he's dead. This is dreadful, Archie. What do we do now? You got a lighter? Uh, here's my pocket flash. Well, here's his gun beside him. Don't touch it. Have a look through his pocket. I wish I knew what he meant when he said he had a record for me someplace. A picture of a girl. It says, to Mike from Violet. Mike. Mike. The fellow's face is certainly familiar, but I can't... Hey, wait a minute. Mike. Mike... Mike Jordan, that's it. Mike Jordan? Yeah, Wolf cleared him on a frame-up three years ago, and this uh, this girl, Violet, is an entertainer in a nightclub downtown. Uh, Violet, yes, but what does all this have to do with Gloria? It's strange, there's no other identification on him. Maybe the other guy took it off of him. Well, now we got to find Violet. How? Oh, we can't even find Gloria. I think now that this guy, Mike Jordan, missed us deliberately. Let's start hoofing it back to that last crossroad. There was a telephone there. I'll call Nero. <laughs> So that's the story so far, Mr. Wolf. Sorry to wake you up, but we wanted you to know. Yes, we did. Oh, such a night. What was your reason for telling the man that Dr. Thrumming was your brother? Well, I didn't want him to know that it was Doc, because Gloria had called Doc, and he must have known about it. And the driver turned out to be Mike Jordan. And what did Mike say to you in the car? Well, he didn't finish, but he said, I got a record for you, Goodwin, and then the man shot him up. And when you located Violet at her place, she was cataloging recordings, hmm? Bring her in here now, Archie. Sit down, Dr. Thrumming. Uh, yes, yes, I am a bit weary. Come in, Violet. Uh, Violet, this is... Hey, wait a minute. You, you're Nero Wolf. Sit down, Miss Violet. Oh, what's the idea, Mr. Goodwin? Why'd you bring me here? Will you look at this photo? It says, to Mike from Violet. Where'd you get this? I got it, Violet. What we want to know is, where's Mike now? What's he doing? Can you tell us where he lives? What's Mike done now? Can you tell us his address? Maybe. Do you know who he has been working for? Yeah. A guy with a big car and a lot of dough. You've seen this man? Yeah, kind of a good-looking guy. I think his name is Durant or, or something like that. I understand you've been occupying yourself with cataloging some phonograph recordings. Yeah, that's what I was doing when Mr. Goodwin came in. Mike's got a home recorder over at his place. Do you have all the records that have been made on the machine so far? No, just what we made in the last week. Lots more at his place. Do you and Mike know of a woman named Gloria? 
No. At least I don't remember. It was on Rinaldo Road. Gloria Barnesworth was her maiden name. Where is this Rinaldo Road? I, I don't know. It's in Westchester, we think. I've never been there. What has Mike done, Mr. Wolf? Is it bad? As a matter of fact, Mike is in the clear. Good. There's no charge against him, and there never will be. You haven't seen him for a couple of days? No. And I never go to his apartment unless him and some guests are there. Do you know where he is? Will you give me the address of his apartment? Okay. 324 East 35th Street. Thank you very much, young lady. What's all so mysterious? Well, something's happened to Mike. I can tell by the way you talk. Very well, Archie. You have a special visit to make. Look for the machine, and it's quite late, so you had best hurry. Well, I'm going with you, Archie. Uh, good night, Nero. Oh, I mean, good morning. Oh, I don't even know what day it is. Come along, Violet. We'll drop you at your place first. Well, there we are, Doc. Yes, has his name right on it. Mike Jordan. No, well, we're fairly certain that no one's in there. Well, what do you know? It didn't lock. The lights are on. I know. I know. Listen. Yes, a light humming noise. Huh. But where is it coming from? Over in that corner, those wall cabinets. There it is. A radio. And a phonograph combination. This and a recording machine. And the recording arm's still down on the record. I'll just lift it off and put the playback needle on. Yeah, there we are. say Ronaldo Road. And that's where our Gloria called from, so they're all tied in together. Come along, Doc. We're going back to Mr. Wolf again, and we'll just take this record with us. Well, Archie, I guess this phonograph was worthwhile after all. Yes, indeed. Hey, don't you find this a very interesting recording, Nero? I'm sure we're going to add it to our collection. And these are the two men who took you on the right. That's right. But we're really no further along in our desire to help, Gloria. That's right. We're on Ronaldo Road. Boss, if we can find the address, will you go with us down there or over there or wherever it is? I might. And you already have the clue to the address. We have. Where? In that phonograph recording. Play it again, Archie. Just the part where he uses the telephone. And slow the speed way down. Then take down the numbers I call off. Okay, boss. No. Six. Five. Three. Two. Two. Three. That's enough. By slowing down the record, we were able to count the clicks of each number he used on the dial. Now, there's the number the man called. We hope it is on Ronaldo Road. Have Inspector Kramer get the address of that number combination, and we are ready to make our assault. 
I'll call Kramer and then I'll get the car out. It hadn't been out for weeks. Maybe it won't start. Hmm. No such luck, Archie, I assure you. No such luck. Oh, here it is. I think we must go through this big gate. Uh, yes, yes, there's the number. 23, Ronaldo. Slip up to the entrance as softly as possible. Turn out your headlamps. Well, here we are, boss. Easy now, getting out. Don't pull, Doctor. Don't pull on me. Oh. Yeah. There we are. Now, come along. Yeah, spooky sort of place, isn't it? All big houses are like that. Must be 20 rooms. Yeah. There's not a light in the place. Use the knocker, Archie. Uh-oh, stand back. Here comes somebody. Yes? Uh, is Gloria in? What? Gloria? And who are you? Uh, uh, we are here to see Gloria. Uh, uh, come, come. It's this hour of the night? Certainly not. Uh, just a moment. She's an old friend of mine. Uh, yes, and his too. He's Archie. My good man, what is your name? Uh, Jennings, sir. In the um, household is in bed at this hour. What is it, Jennings? Who's at the door? Uh... They're asking for you, Miss Gloria. For me? Well, come in, gentlemen. You may go, Jennings. Please. Very well, miss. Just as you say. Now, what did you want? Say, Doc, is this the Gloria? Well, I, I don't know. It doesn't seem... Are you Gloria? Yes. Well, why did you call us? Oh, then then you're Archie Goodwin. Yes, and I'm Dr. Thrilling. Uh, but you I are... I called you because I need your help. Desperately. Gloria, oh. what is going on here at this hour? Uh... Oh, and who are these gentlemen? Well, you... You see, Uncle, Mr. Goodwin came... Came to see you? Why? Well, I... Because I... I think you'd better go to your room, my dear. Don't you think that is best? Your room and rest? No. No, I don't want to. I won't. Go to your room. No. No, I won't. I can't. All those people walk in and out. They want to kill me. Jennings, take her to her room. Uh, yes, sir. Come along, please. No. No, I won't. I won't. Let me go. There are hundreds of people. They'll kill me. Come along. No, no. Please. No. I'm so sorry. But there's nothing we can do with her. Now, Mr. Goodwin. Yeah? What is it you wish? The girl called you Uncle. Oh, pardon me. I'm near a wolf. How do you do, Mr. Wolf? Yes, she called me Uncle, but I'm not really a relative. I'm Dr. Gunther, retained by the family. As you can see... The girl is quite ill. Oh, uh, well, we're old friends of Gloria's, and we'd like to see her. But you just saw her. We don't refer to this young lady. We have in mind the elderly Gloria. Now, come, Dr. Gunther. You know to whom we refer. What? You, you mean the girl's aunt? Well, it's very strange. If you are a friend of the aunt's, that you are not aware of her condition. Her condition? Yes. The aunt has been bedridden for nearly a year paralysis. And it seems to be most coincidental with your visit, but she passed away this afternoon. Died? Gloria? This afternoon? But how could that be? We'd like to see the remains, Dr. Gunther. Yes, we'd like to see the remains. Just where are they? They are here, Mr. Goodwin. And if you and your brother and Mr. Wolf will step this way to the small parlor. There you are, gentlemen. I'll leave you alone. I'll be in the library. Well, gentlemen, there she is. What do you say? Do you recognize this woman? Well, yeah. It's been many years, but that is Gloria Barnesworth. Well, good heavens, yes. It's Gloria, all right. Poor woman. I remember now. She married a very wealthy manufacturer named Kenton, who died. She's remained a widow, I guess. Uh, he said she died this afternoon. Are you sure it was an elderly woman who called you this evening? And by the way, just feel her forehead. It's warm. She couldn't have been dead more than an hour. She isn't dead. No signs of pulse. Your cigarette case, please. Hmm. Very slight moisture. Respiration, barely perceptible. She's under heavy narcosis. Been given a heavy dose lately. Uh, let's get out of here. Wait. Do you recognize the uncle? Rather, Dr. Gunther? No, do you throw me? 
No. Does he look like the man who took you for a ride? It was too dark, boss. And he was all bundled up in heavy clothes. Let's get out of here. The door was locked after we came in. He's right. Come on, Doc. Let's put our shoulders to it. One, two... Go! Well, gentlemen, what on earth does this mean? Why'd you lock the door? Oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's a spring lock. I had no intention of locking the door. And I suggest, Archie, that you have it repaired. And now, Archie, will you step to the door and let Inspector Kramer in? He followed us up the driveway. There, yeah, about time. Getting cold out here. Inspector Kramer, this is Dr. Gunther. In that room is a woman he claims is dead. She is actually under the heavy influence of narcotics. Yeah? Well, who is she? Mrs. Gloria Canton, widow of the wealthy shoe manufacturer. And this attractive young lady coming down the stairs is supposed to be mentally ill, which I do not believe. Her name is Gloria, too. A niece of the elder Gloria. But Archie and I both knew Gloria Barnesworth. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I get it, I get it. And I suggest that this man is not a doctor, but his young Gloria's husband... And they're attempting to force the Aunt Gloria to change her will in their favor. This is utterly ridiculous. The aunt was able to phone Doc Thromick and me tonight, but she was apparently caught in the act. And this man, who is posing as the uncle, hired Mike Jordan to drive his car while he picked up Archie with the intent of killing him. But this, this is the same man? The same. And if Mike Jordan hadn't recognized Archie, both of you would be quite dead. This man double-crossed Mike and killed him believing that the whole thing would be blamed on Mike. Mike deliberately missed. All right, so what's he going to do about it? Come on, let's get out of here fast. Look out, he's a cop. <laughs> All right, now get those hands up and keep them up. Come along, Archie, I have another appointment. The inspector can handle it from here on. Oh, oh dear me, I... What happened? Uh, am I all right? Yeah, you just fainted again when the shooting started. Oh. Really quite fortunate that Mike Jordan recorded that conversation. Fortunate indeed. How did you know this uncle was the same guy who took us for a ride? First by his speech pattern, he is undoubtedly a Canadian. But you must have missed the most important slip-up. What was that? When he escorted us to see the body, he said to you, Archie, if you and your brother and Mr. Wolf will step this way... Now, uh, how would he believe that Dr. Thrumming was your brother? No one mentioned it. Of course, the clue I planted and then missed myself. Quite right, Archie, quite right. What time is it? Uh, 8 a.m. I certainly appreciate your coming out for me on this deal. Oh, but I didn't do it just for you. There is an orchid lover's convention this morning at 9 o'clock. What? And you mean... Yes. I'm sure you'll enjoy it tremendously. <laughs> Both of you. Oh, brother. Uh huh. What's that? What's that? Nothing, Doc. Nothing at all. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Johnny Dollar. Dollar, this is Adolph Dorfman at Amalgamated Life Association. Oh, uh, yes, Mr. Dorfman. Where the devil have you been? I've been trying to get you for days. Well, I've been out of town, sir, in Las Vegas on a special oh, assignment. Oh, never mind, never mind. Just get yourself over to this office, Dollar, and run away. Well, now, Mr. Dorfman... what do you think you're up to, anyway? This is absurd. This is ridiculous. If you say it is, I'm sure it must be. Of course it is. Do you mind telling me what you mean by it? The Cleet Martin case. What did you think I was talking about? I wasn't quite sure. But don't tell me you have solved it and just haven't bothered reporting to me. No, Mr. Dorfman, I have not solved it as yet, but I think I'm on the right track. You think? You think? Don't you know? No, because there is one possible clue to be checked out before I can be certain. Yes? Certain of what? That it actually is a clue to that murder. What? Do you mean to say you've been wasting valuable time and a lot of company money on just... just... 
Just theories about that killing? That you haven't really accomplished a thing? Mr. Dorfman... Oh, that's ridiculous. And what about this expense account you've sent in and the fact it's marked incomplete, no total given? Does that mean I'm to expect another one? Yes, it does, Mr. Dorfman. Maybe more than one by the time I'm through. Oh, that's ridiculous. Whatever gave you the idea we'd pay you before the case is closed? Why do you expect us to pay you now? I don't. Then why send in these itemized expenses? Because you yourself demanded I send in my expense account on Friday of each week, whether complete or not. Yeah, oh, uh, uh, now look here. Some of these, these, these items you've listed, these charges you've run up... When it's all over, all wrapped up, I'll be glad to explain every one of them to you. Not a bit of a Dollar. You get yourself on over here and start explaining them now. Why, I, I, I've been trying to reach you for days. As I tried to tell you, Mr. Dorfman, if I... If you w- have anything to tell me, you can say it to my face, not waste my time on this telephone. Well, you're coming over here? I certainly am. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer and the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Amalgamated Life Associates Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the wayward gun matter. Adolf Dorfman always had been, always would be a short-tempered, crotchety old maid. Nothing but trouble on a case. But Amalgamated Life Mostly through Al Spangler, a VP and a very nice guy, has done mighty well for me over the years. So when Dorfman called me in on the Martin case, I couldn't very well turn him down in spite of resenting his high-handed manner. Expense account item one, $1.10 for a cab to his office. Oh, all right, all right, I'll accept that one. But look at this item right here. Four eighty dollars for a tank full of gasoline. Because I used my own car to go over there to Lakewood. Yeah, but four eighty. When you could have made the trip on a bus for less than two dollars? Sure, sure I could. Then why didn't you? Then we'd have had to spend eight or ten dollars in taxi fares between the Martin home and police headquarters. Is that what you would have preferred? Yeah, well, no, 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 of course not. But just the same, Look, Dollar, we're you just can't... wasting time here, if you'll excuse me. Yeah, we're wasting time, you, huh? In the beginning, you'd question every single item in this expense account. You always do. And why not? And that's why, instead of handing one in that would give you some real cause for worry, I decided for once to keep expenses down to the barest minimum. But it hasn't done the least bit of good. So if you don't mind... Uh, minimum? Man. What about this? One seventy-five for lunch. What about it? Do you deny that it included an overgenerous tip to some pretty waitress? The tip was exactly twenty-five cents, and it came out of ah, my. Ah, there you see, a twenty-five cent tip on a dollar and a half meal—that's ridiculous. I started to say the tip came out of my own pocket, Mister Dorfman. If you don't believe me, take a look at the cash register slip. It's right there. Go ahead, look at it. All right, all right, all right. I'll take your word for it. The fact remains that you still haven't solved the case. I think I have. You think you have. But I'd rather not talk about it just yet. Well, I don't know why not. You either know who killed Mr. Cletus Martin or you don't. Now, which is it? I'll be able to give you the whole story, I hope, after I get a phone call from New York and not before. New York? Yes. From a friend of mine at 18th Precinct Police Headquarters. Oh, so that explains this item here. Return ticket to New York and several cab fares. That's right. But why? What possible connection can they have with the Martin matter? They just happen to have a top ballistics technician. Ballistics? What's the matter with the police in Lakewood? Not a thing. Or with their county police over there? Not a thing. Then why go all the way to New York? Because once I got hold of the picture of the bullet that killed Mr. Martin, I didn't want Lakewood or Lakewood County to know what I intended doing with it. Why? I'd rather not say... Now, you've had these items explained, so if you'll excuse me... No, 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 no. Wait, wait, Dollar. Sit down, sit down. There is nothing further I can do until I get my call from New York. Oh, but there is. Uh, There's uh, something else I want to talk to you about. The really important reason I sent for you. Well, I hope it's a lot more important than quibbling about this expense account. Oh, it is. Then why the big stall? Why all the waste of time? A stall? Yes. I don't know why, Mr. Dorfman, but that's all you've been doing for the last ten minutes is stalling me. Oh, no, no, no. Not a bit of it. Not a bit. I was merely... I, I was only... Uh, uh, now, sit down, please. Sit down. All right. Well, what is it? You, uh, say you were out of town? I was in Las Vegas, but it had nothing whatsoever oh, to yes, do with... Oh, yes, 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 yes. So well, that's it. That's the reason we couldn't find you anyway. We? I mean, I. I couldn't find you. Yes, that's, uh... 
Very pleasant out there at this time of year, isn't it? Look, will you please quit stalling again and tell me what this other important matter is? Well, all right. All right, all right, all right. Eh, uh, have you seen the papers? Did you know another client of ours just met a violent end? Mr. Barryman, here in Hartford? Yes, Alfred W. Barryman. You didn't know him? No. Nor that he was a client of yours. Nor that he was a big contractor like Mr. Martin? No. Now, uh, do you plan to assign me to that case, too? Do we have to? Of course you don't. And if you want the truth, Mr. Dorfman, if you're the company contact on it, so why wait until now to tell me? Why waste all that time picking away at the expense account? Don't you know? I certainly don't. Now, what goes, I would give... Ah, uh, now you may know. Come in, Sergeant. All right, Mr. Dorfman. How about this? Johnny Dollar, huh? That's right, Sergeant, uh... Sergeant Bill Hansett. I told you I'd find him for you, Sergeant. I don't know how you did it. What is this? All we know was he'd left town, Mr. Dorfman. Wait a minute. Why the gun, Sergeant? You ought to know. Up in your feet, Dollar. You mind telling me what this is all about? Just hand me your gun, Dollar. That nice big thirty-eight you carry. Well, what's the matter? I'm sure I don't know. It's for my thirty-eight. I don't happen to have it on me at the moment. I know. What? Because we got it, Dollar. Serial number and all down at headquarters. And maybe that's the reason I'm holding you on suspicion of murder. Do you have a match? The old gag. Sure, I said. Do you have a cigarette? She had one. Newport. Newport filters cigarettes. We lit up. Some smoke. Finest, rich tobacco flavor I'd ever tasted. Real tobacco. The way I like them. The right touch of menthol and just a hint of mint. A great combination. She suggested. Makes Newport more refreshing to begin with. More refreshing all the way. She wasn't kidding. Been smoking them ever since. Newport's. Newport filters cigarettes. Sergeant's bombshell wasn't repeatable. Me, Johnny Dollar, arrested on suspicion of murder by a cop with a grudge, fingered by a tight-fisted people hater named Amalgamated Life Dorfman. Thanks, Mr. Dorfman, for latching on for us. Yeah, pleasure, Sergeant. Now, wait a minute, Sergeant. If you're talking about the Martin matter... Now, don't try and kid me, Dollar. We got you nailed down for the murder of that other contractor, Barryman. What? <laughs> and he pretended not to know much about it. It was almost evasive when I brought it up. That explains all your stalling. Waiting for this man to get here. I think I did very well. Oh, you were great. Next week, he's still in. Now, look, son. No time for talk, Tyler. On to headquarters now, and account of you happen to be under arrest. I am. Quite so. In which case, I'm entitled to one phone call, am I not? Sure, if you want to call a mouthpiece, you're entitled. You mind if I use your phone, Mr. Dorfman? No, not at all, not at all. Thank you so much. Provided, of course, you pay for the call. Don't bank on it. I beg your pardon? Don't be surprised if you end up paying for it. Through the nose. My call was to Lieutenant Randy Singer, 18th Precinct, New York Police Department. Now, he still had no word for me, but he promised to call the minute he did, so I told him where to try if I wasn't at my apartment. Okay, now, Johnny, you ready? Look, are you sure this isn't some kind of a gag? Are you kidding? Because if it is, it's a pretty bad one. Sergeant, don't you know who I am? I mean, what my job yeah, is. Yeah, 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 Dollar. Oh, I know all about you. What a great guy you are. Thanks. And nobody wasn't any more surprised than me. But Lieutenant Bartley don't go off half-cocked, and you know it. Bartley? So when he says to bring you in, well, baby, in you go. He sent you after me, Harry Bartley? Lieutenant Bartley. Now, come on. Hello, Mr. Okay, now, Lieutenant, you want me to book him now, lock him up? In a couple of minutes, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Well, Johnny, I'll say this for you, Harry. Yeah? When you pull a boner, you really do. 
Wasn't that one of the gentlemen of the press outside there? Yep, no doubt he's on the phone to his paper right now. Harry, this is ridiculous. Is it? You know me better than to think I could have killed this, this barrowman, is it? When your own gun was found beside the body, when a bullet from it killed him... Just oh, no, make let me, me handle this, Sergeant. Uh, yes, sir. Right. Look at the facts, Johnny. You've been on the Martin case up in Lakewood, haven't you? That's right. But you've been stalling on it. But there is reason for that. You even left town, went to Vegas, presumably on another investigation. It was on another investigation. Would you like some verification? No, I'll take your word for it. Thanks a lot. But you found no real clue to the Martin murder, did you? Have you forgotten the microphoto of the bullet that you got for me? No, but you didn't tell me why, Johnny. Why'd you want that? Because maybe it was his gun did that kill him. Sergeant. So, so he figured on changing the barrel. So the markings wouldn't look like that for him. Okay, Sergeant. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Let me go on, Johnny. Please do. Then Barrowman got killed here in Hartford. And he's also a contractor bidding on that redevelopment project there in Lakewood County. Is there a tie-up, Johnny? Are you kidding, Lieutenant? Sergeant. Don't you say? There's some other contractor wants that business and hires Donald to knock him off. Well, Johnny, Harry, if you'll get rid of Big Mouth here for a couple of minutes... Hey, now, just a minute, baby. Okay, okay, Sergeant. I'll call you when I watch you. But didn't you hear when he just called me? Yes, I heard. Just close the door quietly. Go on. Yes, sir. All right, now, Harry. I've held out on things, but for good reason. Don't you know about the rotten political situation up there in Lakewood? Well, I've heard some things. Well, then you know the contracting job on that redevelopment project is going to be one big juicy plum for somebody. I know. And who gets it depends, unfortunately, on one man. On one politician whose own brother just happens to be in the contracting business. Do you know the man I mean? This Mr. Politics I'm talking about? Yes, I'm afraid I do. And he's powerful enough to make things pretty rough for you or me or anybody else who might cross him. Are you saying that he might have killed Martin? Exactly. Killed off one of his brother's competition. And the same for Barrowman's death? Yes. And for the same reason. Because there is no doubt that Mr. Barrowman or Mr. Martin could have underbid Mr. Dirty Politics' brother if they stayed alive. So with that in mind, I call him Mr... On this politician. On what excuse, Johnny? Just to suggest some possible changes in his insurance. He fell for it and he let me in. And Harry, there in his study on the wall, he had quite a collection of guns. Most of them flintlocks. Very old and very well cared for. Flintlocks? But I also spotted one half hidden behind some books on a shelf that was a dead ringer for the gun I always carry. Same make, same model, same caliber and finish. Oh, so by the simple device of dropping a lighted cigarette into his wastebasket, starting a little fire, well, while he was throwing it outside, I switched guns on him. Why, Johnny? So that I could have his checked against the microphoto you gave me of the bullet that killed Mr. Martin. Checked there in Lakewood? Oh, no. Why not? Because if my hunch was wrong, Harry, and if it got around, that man could make more trouble, could hurt more people than you or I ever dreamed of. And his first target would be the Lakewood police who made the checkup. You can be thankful that you don't have that kind of politics to contend with. I am. But if you're right, if his gun matches that bullet... Then he's through, Harry. The big construction job will be handed out legitimately. And more important, Lakewood and Lakewood County will be clean for the first time in years. And you'll have your killer. Yes, if this story of your switching guns is true. If it's true? Yeah. Harry, you've got to be kidding. Don't you see now why I've had to go this thing alone? If it was his gun that killed Martin. If not, the story about your gun, why it was used for the Barrowman killing, is going to sound pretty fishy. What do you mean? Johnny, we know only one thing. It was your gun that killed Alfred Barrowman. And I've told you why. Yeah, but what if the tests show your gun also killed Martin? Harry, that's impossible. When Martin died, I had my gun in my own possession. That's exactly what I mean. Now, wait a minute. Sergeant, answer. Harry, will you wait a minute? Yeah, Lieutenant. You can lock him up now. What? Yes, sir. It'll be a pleasure. Only first I better book him, hadn't I? Oh, uh, just leave that to me. Harry, you're out of your ever-loving mind. Am I? Come along, Dollar. Hey, shut up. You like a car with plenty of pep. A car with reserve power for safe passing. Most good drivers do, but they don't like to pay extra for premium gasoline. Listen, in three out of five cars, regular priced Sinclair Dino Gasoline matches performance of premium gasolines, saves you up to four cents a gallon. 
Almost anywhere you see the Sinclair Dinosaur sign, you can save up to four cents a gallon with Dino. Drive with care and buy Sinclair Dino Gasoline. Okay, Lieutenant. Thanks, Hanley. I'll call you. Yes, sir. Well, seems to me the least you can do is ask me to sit down, Johnny. Sure, jail, Harry. Make yourself at home. Thanks. <laughs> Cigarette? No, thanks. I have one. Now, what goes, Harry? Well, don't you believe what I told you last night? You seen the morning paper? Yes, and I'm sure you went out of your way to have it brought into me. That's right. And the cigarettes and extra coffee and the reporters who call on it. Did you tell him anything? You know darn well I didn't. Yeah, I thought you'd clam up, huh? Harry, don't you see what you've done to me to my reputation in this town? You think so? I'll never live down this boo-boo of yours. And worst of all, you're letting a killer run around loose. I am? Well, wasn't it your idea to try to pin the Martin murder on him, too, as a clincher? Well, of course it was, but... Look, Harry, will you listen to me? Sure, if you think it'll do you any good. Now, I'm expecting a call. A very important one. Yeah, from where? From whom? Well, you wouldn't like it if I told you because I didn't contact you instead. But I had to stay away from this territory to prevent even the remotest possibility of a leak. But if you'll let me out long enough to take that call when it comes in, and I told him to try to reach me here... Don't you mean if it comes in? No, I mean when. It'll be a ballistics report on the gun. His gun. As compared to the photo of that bullet that killed Martin. But what if they don't tell you what you've hoped for? Harry, don't you see there is still a matter of my gun? I know. Well, don't you believe what I told you about it, about the switch? Lieutenant, I've got an urgent one for you, real urgent, up in your office. Okay, Hanley, thanks. Harry, listen to me. You've got to let me out of here to get that call. We'll see. Behave yourself, Johnny. Well, what is it this time, Hanley? I don't get it, Dollar, but out you go. Well, thank you. Come on, I'll lead the way. You uh, mind telling me where we're going? Sure. Up to Lieutenant Bartley's office. Phone call for me? Uh, gee, how should I know? Come on, let's find out. This could be very important. Now, take it easy. Huh? My feet hurt. Hey, listen. Yeah? Tell me one thing. How come a smart man like you didn't get a lawyer to spring you? Only one reason. I know your Lieutenant Bartley a little better than he thinks. Huh? At least I hope I do, because if I don't, if he's pulled the boo-boo, it looks as though he's pulled. Well, come on in, Johnny. I have a little surprise for you. Oh, uh, that's all, Hanley, and thanks. Yes, sir. Now, this had better be good, Harry. Believe me, Johnny, it is. Oh, uh, sit down. Thanks, but that's all I've been doing for the last 15 now, hours. listen. Now, that urgent call I got when I had to leave you a couple of hours ago? Yeah. Well, it was a phone call for you. Randy Singer in New York? Have you forgotten he's an old friend of mine, too? But look, look here, see? This is a transcript of his call. Let me see Kind of proves you were right, Johnny. It was that gun of Mr. Dirty Politics that killed Cletus Martin. I knew it, Harry. It had to be. And, of course, that gives full credence to what you told me about switching with him. And that means that he also killed Alfred Berriman. No doubt about it. So, once again, Johnny, one of your crazy hunches paid off. That hunch was based on plenty of known facts. Anyway, you're a hero again. Oh, some hero after spending a night in the clink, after being booked in a murder charge? My name is Mud. Uh, booked? Well, certainly by you. It's funny, you know, I must have forgotten to. What? Yeah, so if you want to sue me for holding you illegally... Oh, if I had any sense, I probably would. <laughs> but now, would you make with a good reason for all this, Harry? Well, it's a trick I learned a long time ago from a fellow. A man I've admired for a long time, Johnny. You. Me? Yeah, I suspected Mr. Dirty Politician, too. As would anybody who really knew about his methods and his machinations. All his shady deals up there in Lakewood. So? So, stealing a page from your book, I decided that the best way to throw him off, make him careless, keep him around here feeling smug, was to broadcast that we had absolute proof of your guilt. Uh -huh. And don't you see, with not only the papers, but even the boys here on the force believing it, well, he couldn't possibly smell a rat. Mm. As a result, instead of running away, well, we picked him up right here in Hartford. Well, that's all very fine for you, Harry. And when I faced him with a report on his gun that killed Martin, and then told him about the switch with your gun that he then used on Barrowman, well, believe it or not, Johnny, and so help me, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I was that surprised. Yeah. Johnny, this smart, clever old crook, got so rattled, so completely confused, he broke down and made a full confession. 
Congratulations, Harry. <laughs> you have made a real hero of yourself. Uh, of myself? Mm. But I just wonder how long it's going to take me to live down that phony newspaper story. But you have, Johnny. You have. I have, huh? Sure. And just wait till you see that afternoon edition. Giving you full credit for the whole stunt. Oh? That's right, Johnny. The only hero on this case is you. Well, now, wait a minute. <laughs> I mean, after all, Harry, you're the one who wrapped it all up. Oh, yeah? But where would I be if you hadn't laid all the groundwork? If I hadn't got the idea for this little trick from some of those cases of yours? Absolutely nowhere. No, Johnny. It's yours. All yours. <laughs> After this, I think I'd better keep my tricks to myself. Well, now, wait a minute. How can I? When every case I handle gets broadcast all over the country. Well, I guess I just can't win. Expense account total? Well, all I want now is one big, fat apology from meddling old Adolf Dorfman at Amalgamated Life for having trapped me into that night in jail. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, San Francisco and a ship. A most unusual ship. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Ladies and gentlemen... The American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak, for hire. what the sign out in front of my office says, Pat Novak for hire. You gotta put it in block letters because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, there's a price tag on everything. You gotta do that or marry a rich widow. I don't like to work that hard, so I rent boats and do anything else that's cash and carry. Oh, it's all right. You don't mind trouble because that's one thing you can't duck. It's like trying to dance the minuet and skis. And the best trouble always looks good from the outside. You're all smiles and you feel like a kid opening a hand grenade under the Christmas tree. I found that out Tuesday night. It was around 7 o'clock. I was getting ready to close the office when this little guy showed up. He was about the size of a golf bag with arms. If he had a cigar box, he could see over a pool table. He walked up to the desk and started talking in a voice that made you think he was trying to put a lily ponds out of work. Hello, you Novak? You're doing all right so far. What's on your mind? I'm Jackie Gregg. You heard of me, huh? You're the shy type, I know. I'm Jackie Gregg the jockey. You heard of me, huh? All right, now I heard of you. Put the show on the road. I'm looking for a horse. You want to find me a horse? Yeah, I breed him in the back room. What color you want? You're so tough I got to take that from you? Calm down before you wind up in a boy's choir. If you got anything to sell, put it on the line or beat it. I'm riding a horse tomorrow called Fleet Lady. She's disappeared. Well, she's not here. I'm supposed to ride the sixth race with her tomorrow. The Bonanza handicap, and she's gone. All right, she's gone. Maybe your horse likes to go out at night. I haven't seen her. Get to the point. I'll give you 200 bucks to find that horse. Somebody took her in a van. I trailed him down here at the waterfront. But you lost him up at the ferry building. That's right. Something funny's going on. My mount disappeared, and you got to find her. This is a big waterfront, and where's the 200 bucks? You'll get that, all right. Found by Pier 19, they turned in. You think you can find Fleet Lady? I don't know. Who owns her? Woman named Sybil Thornton. She's, um, 
mixed up, I think. Yeah. Why steal your own horse? I don't know. Run a ring in, maybe. That's a tough trick. This woman's got some good ones. You want the 200 bucks? Yeah. How are the odds? What's the difference? You gonna open a book? You better take the 200 bucks now. Yeah. The dough will keep. You sound frightened, Junior. And you sound nosy. Here's the 200. I want you to find the horse. You let me know at the Kingston Hotel, huh? Sure. If you don't find anything around the waterfront, maybe you better try the track. Ask around there. Yeah, by the way, how do you fit in? How come you got $200 interest in that horse? Maybe I love horses. What do you care if maybe I love horses? I don't. A guy like you's got to love something. Oh, it was a real sweet proposition. A jockey in search of a horse. There was something phony about the whole thing. I had the 200 bucks, but I didn't feel good. It was like a guy stealing a murder gun to help out on a scrap metal drive. Well, after the little guy left, I closed the office and started to hit the docks, but it didn't work out. You can buy good whiskey these days, so you feel funny walking up to some guy on the pier and asking, Have you seen a racehorse around here, mister? Well, by nine, I was sure that horse wasn't around, so I borrowed a car and drove out to the track. I found out where Sybil Thornton's horses were quartered and headed down that way. It was pretty dark. So when I bumped into her, all I got was a vague outline. She had a good-looking vague outline. I'm very sorry. Yeah, I'm full of regrets, too. Should we try it again? Aren't you a little mixed up in your animals? They keep horses here. You don't seem to mind. No, you lean nicely. But you'd probably feel safer with a platform. Well, we'll try this again when I've had three good meals. That's a horse. Yes, I know. In fact, I own it. I see. That'd make you Sybil Thornton. Yes, what would that make you? A guy named Pat Novak looking for your horse. I was hired in the waterfront to find her. Why, they grow big on the waterfront. You must get a lot of sun. By the way, is Fleet Lady missing? Your jockey says she is. That's why I'm snooping around. Didn't know he had any friends. He's got a checkbook. How about Fleet Lady? Is she tucked in bed? Yeah. Let's take a look. You'd find it very dull, Mr. Novak. Yeah, that's what they said to Anthony. Let's see the horse, huh? Suit yourself. She's down this way. Okay. I'm doing this out of the bigness of my heart. I think you're wasting my generosity, Mr. Novak. Don't use it all this trip. It's from in the stable. Come on. All right. Down about here. Sweet lady's stall. Here. There's a flashlight on the wall. Okay. Poor thing. Do your horses die broke, too? Who is it, Fleet Lady? Yes, are you satisfied? No, I'm going to ring up headquarters. Are you crazy? Then I'm going to call Jackie Gregg and tell him his hunch paid off. I wouldn't do that, Mr. Novak. Stop kidding me, sweetheart. She didn't get killed in a fight with another horse. Gregg figured somebody was tilting the machine. That's why Fleet Lady's dead. That's why I'm going to call headquarters. Shoot yourself, but remember what happened to Fleet Lady. You getting tough, Angel? No. You just wouldn't look good with a saddle, Mr. Novak. <laughs> I watched her as she turned and walked out of there. It was the kind of a walk that makes you flip the calendar and find out how far away spring is. Well, I looked around a while, but it didn't do any good. The place was full of doors, so whoever killed Fleet Lady got out easy like a rumor at a church picnic. I closed the door and went down the line to call headquarters. As I stood in there talking, I saw Sybil Thornton drive by. It was a long convertible with red asbestos seat covers. After I called headquarters, I went back and waited near the stable. About a half hour later, a police car pulled up, and when I saw who got out, I began to get unhappy like a three-legged man in a ballet school. It was Hellman from Homicide, and he had a squad with him. All right, I'll talk to him. I'll talk to him. Hello, Novak. Where's your trainer? Your boys get paid to laugh at you, Hellman. I don't. Yeah. Where's the horse? What are you doing on the case? I came for the ride. You mind, Novak? No, I just wondered if they wised up downtown. Yeah. Because you could find a dead horse, Hellman. If they staked it out in the middle of Market Street, you'd find it before long. I'll try this time. Where is it? Stall 18 over there. Yeah. Keep an eye on him, boys. I'll be back in a minute. 
In here, Novak? Yeah, the one with the teeth like yours. You better shut up, Novak. Don't get jumpy. You haven't seen the horse. Just shut up, huh? Well, wasn't going to be much of a conversation anyway. What color horse was that, Novak? What do you mean? Take a look. Yeah, I did. I just took a look. It's a smart horse, Novak. Huh? That's right. That dead horse in there is wearing a double-breasted suit. <laughs> Hellman got the message straight. I walked in and took a look. Jackie Gregg was lying there on the floor as dead as last year's love. The sickness didn't show until we rolled him over on his stomach. Somebody had gone duck hunting in the middle of his back. I began to feel a little sick myself and was ready to send out for the same gun when Hellman started to talk. You forgot to mention the guy when you phoned headquarters. He wasn't there. I was in here before and the guy wasn't around. What was he doing out of the horse? I don't know. Hellman maybe crawled out of a crack. I don't know. There were two shots. I came in and found the horse. Yeah? Check the horse. You're trying to tell me the horse shot back? Who is he? A guy by the name of Jackie Gray. He gave me 200 bucks to find a missing horse. Yeah? A horse called Fleet Lady running into Mars Handicap. This is the end of the line. How do you know it's the same one? I don't. Maybe you gotta be a horse to tell. Why don't you ask one of your boys? <laughs> Yeah. The boy's real tough. Call him off, Hellman. He's nasty. We all hate him, Novak. It's all right. I'll put it on your bill, Hellman. That's good. You can write it up at headquarters. Hellman, you ought to run an idiot. The heavy thinking's too much for you. I can piece this together. We come out here and find a dead man with you kicking up dust 40 feet away. Look, Hellman, I didn't kill the guy and then call up headquarters. I know they're bad in homicide, but I'm not that big-hearted. We got a spare hook for you, Novak. That's where you stay until somebody gets you off. Well, you can start out with Sybil Thornton. Another horse? She's got the speed for it. Look her up. She owns Fleet Lady, and she was dashing around here in the dark, playing easy to get. I'll look her up. They better leave the boys behind. After all, she's only a woman. When you see her, ask about that van down on the waterfront, and ask what she was doing before I made that phone call. I'll tag all the bases. Don't worry, Junior. And if things fit together, you'll both be in the jug. I'll see you later. I got work to do. Yeah, it's getting late. You better put the boys back in the cage. <laughs> I began to worry after Hellman left. There was no murder gun, and he didn't have too much to go on, but there was no one else wanted my job. I knew the girl was going to have an alibi, and I was the last guy that Jackie Gregg had seen. I had about as much chance as a fat girl at a Princeton prom. Hellman didn't like me, and he was a smart cop with a disposition like a ton of rhubarb. I had to start right from scratch. I felt like Adam the first morning he woke up. So I looked up a guy named Jocko Madigan, an ex-doctor and a boozer who will give you a lift if you show him where the stirrups are. Oh, a good guy, but he thinks all food makes a gurgle. I hit all the bars and finally found him up at Maggie Nielsen's apartment. She's a good-looking voice that lives up on the hill, and Jocko was working his way into her liquor supply. Hello, Patsy. You're just in time to join me for my first drink of the evening, uh, or one of my first at least. Yeah, I see. Maggie's not here, but I found her whiskey. It was in plain sight, locked in the closet under some newspapers. All right, Jocko, when are you going to sober up? I plan to do it briefly on April 1st, when the rest of the world plays the fool also. I'm in trouble, Jocko. you got to help me. Good. I've got a special bottle I use to forget your troubles. Stop caressing that jug and listen to me. I'm in a jam. Patsy, there's nothing in nature so sad as a half-empty bottle. It's like a broken vow or an unfulfilled promise in the skies. A falling star, almost. All right, Jocko. A falling star, and you shrug it off, never realizing that a whole world has ended at that moment. A hundred million dreams, maybe, and you watch it fall and make an asinine wish, and that's all the good it does is start to fall. It gives some kid a chance to wish for a bicycle. You finished now, Jocko? Yes. What kind of trouble? Anything I could aggravate? I'm mixed up out at the track. A guy by the name of Jackie Gregg is dead, and I don't look good. Uh, Hellman? Yeah. The guy's a jockey, and he hired me to find a horse named Fleet Lady. Did you? Uh, the horse and the jockey ran a dead heat. But there's something funny about the whole deal. Did you talk to the jockey? Not enough. Well, Patsy, you've got to break yourself of the habit of waiting until people are dead before you think of a question. Jocko, I want you to hit all the horse rooms. Find out what you can about the sixth race tomorrow. It's the Bonanza Handicap and hurry up, will you? Well, if it's the sixth race, why can't we wait a while? Start now. Get everything you can and call me. I'll leave a message at your place. 
Where are you going? I don't know. Maybe up to see the girl. Oh, Patsy, you're going to be waving at the hangman's wife when they spring the trap door. I gotta see her. She owns Fleet Lady. Why don't I see her? She's got a stake somewhere. I got a lot of questions. What could you do up there? Uh, yes, if it weren't an academic question, I'd argue the point. Looked like a bum deal right from the start. Oh, Patsy, you have the instinct for recognizing trouble, but not the intelligence to duck it. Jocko, will you get out to those horse parlors? I need facts, not fables. Now give me a hand. All right. Give my love to a fleet lady. Her name's Sybil Thornton. Well, I'll bet I'm not far wrong. Good night, lover. <laughs> After I left Jocko, I went to the Chronicle morgue and looked up Paul Stangle. We pulled out the clips on Sybil Thornton. We were nice and fat because she'd been to Reno four times and hadn't broke training for years. She'd been traded around more than a Red Sox pitcher. The clipping said that she was 32. There were a lot of pictures, and from her eyes, we got the idea that she was around 35. But there were arguments the other way, too. There weren't any stories on her for the last few months, just a few items from the columns. They all said the same thing. She was hitting the night spots with a gambler named Rudy Hauser. There were pictures of him, too. Oh, he would have looked real good in a cave with heavy curtains. I asked Paul. He said Hauser had a gambling place out on Geary, so I took a cab out there. For ten bucks, the guy at the door said Sybil Thorne had left the place an hour ago. That made me feel good. When Hauser opened the door to his office, I lost the glow. Yeah? What's with you? I got a problem. You got the wrong door. Well, you can't get any tougher, so I'm coming in. Hmm. Suit yourself. I never throw anybody out until I'm sure they've lost all their money. What's on your mind? A horse named Fleet Lady. She disappeared at 7 o'clock tonight. Hey, you check under the rug. I'll try the cabin. She got back just in time to greet somebody's gunsel. If I say no, will you go out and lose your money like a good boy? Fleet Lady was owned by a gal named Sybil Thornton. The columns say you're number five on her list. And they never lie. The whiskey's too good. Also, a little bird says she was in your office an hour ago. That's right. She said your name's Novak. Oh. The next time you got a bombshell, give it a test run. With Fleet Lady dead, your money's going to look good in the sixth tomorrow. What makes you think that gal would throw a race? For the same reason she goes out with you. Huh? When a gal takes a great dame like you out in public, it generally means the guy's a few bucks ahead of her. <laughs> you want to fight the team now, Novak? Oh. Just remember... Sometimes you can't be right in the gentleman, too. Yeah, I hope that's the way you feel when they pick you up for Jackie Gregg's murder. Huh? Oh, you do a real nice double take, mister. The jockey checked out with a horse. I didn't know that, Novak. Yeah, with no brains, you built this gambling club. I didn't know that he was dead. I told you that, Novak, and I meant it. It was all right for a little punk. I'm sorry he's dead. So is he. I'll see you later, Hauser. I got a nose around and find out where you were tonight. Yeah. You seem all right, Novak. So I'll tell you. If you got any dough left when you leave my table, it's better than a horse named Fleet Lady in the sixth race tomorrow. You always bet on a dead horse? You got the tip. Use it or bury it, but don't loan it out. Oh, the case was a regular grab bag when I walked out of Hauser's office. I began to tick off the things that didn't add up. First on the list was that van down on the waterfront. If it was Fleet Lady, who got shot in the stable? If it was the ringer, that meant Fleet Lady had run tomorrow. I couldn't figure out why Hauser was so sure she'd win. An idea kept racing around in the back of my mind like an ant in a cookie factory. Jackie Gregg lied about that van down on the waterfront, but why? Not to bail me out of the poorhouse with 200 bucks. I got part of the answer when I stopped by the pay telephone and called Hellman. Yeah, Hellman talking. This is Novak. I got some news. You'll have to put it on the back page. What do you got? Your friend Jackie Gregg had some love life. Well, there's a chance for you, Hellman. Who's the girl, Sybil Thornton? Yeah, we found her picture in his wallet, the gooey kind. I'll bet you stole it for long train rides. What time did he die? The right fit for you between 9 and 10 o'clock. Two shots from a 32 caliber pistol. How about the horse? 45 caliber. Two people? It's getting involved. Maybe, maybe not. You got two hands, Novak. Look up a guy named Rudy Hauser. He's got a joint out on Geary Street. I got enough friends. You look him up. I did. He's still talking about Fleet Lady in tomorrow's race. All right. Maybe he's sentimental. Look, Novak, I'll pick out my own work. I don't need free help from you. 
Jackie Gregg paid 200 bucks, and look what he got. Suit yourself, but Rudy Hauser and that gal are close friends. Yeah? Like two-part harmony in a telephone booth. Now, get off the dime, Hellman. Hauser's got that gal in his hip pocket. She owns Fleet Lady, and he's betting her to win. You're trying hard, Novak. It's got to be a slow field to lose to a dead horse. Wake up, Hellman. You couldn't smell a rat in a basement full of cheese. I did all right in your apartment. Huh? That 32 caliber pistol. We found it up at your place. See you later. <laughs> Well, I wasn't too worried about that. Hellman's smart enough to know a phony plan. I began to think about that thirty-two caliber pistol. It's a woman's weapon, but that doesn't prove anything. So is a bread knife if she's in a bad mood. Must have been about midnight when I got to Sybil Thornton's place. She was wearing black lounging pajamas, tied tight around a slim waist. She looked like a wasp with a nice sting, and she had company. Come in, Mr. Novak. Yeah. Mr. Novak, this is Ronnie Stark. Hello, Novak. Oh. Well, he's not very friendly, Sybil. He's just pouting because they're going to arrest him for Jackie's murder. How do you like Hellman? You've known him longer. Yeah. Somebody left the murder gun up at my place. Where you been all night? Please, Mr. Novak. You're embarrassing Ronnie. That's right. I'm blushing, and it's not the whiskey, Novak. I see. You must stay longer, Ronnie. He's persuasive, huh, Novak? I'll see you tomorrow. You won't forget, Ronnie. No, I won't forget. Oh, I'm betting on you, Novak. What won't he forget? Mr. Novak, I hope nobody ever asks you that question. You don't want to talk about putting that gun in my apartment? No. Let's talk about Rudy Hauser, then. Hmm? Your meat grinder friend. We just had a good talk, and he opened up a new road. What'd you tell him? Don't break a spring. He's all right. Will you do me a favor, Patsy? Like not talking to Hauser anymore, huh? That's right. Won't do you any good, Patsy, and it'll do me a lot of good. How's he going to know which horse got killed? I'll bet you lied to him, Angel. It's my apple cart, Patsy. Leave it alone. Sure. But play your hand right, baby, because I'm going to watch your cards. And if you've got one that says Jackie Gregg, I'm going to call you the hard way, too. Patsy, you're a nice beast. I really think you would. Sit down. Yeah. Drink? No. Do you good? Not right now. Well, you've read the book. Just a couple of chapters. Bet they're the right ones. You better watch out, baby. I may be a long shot. Well, you care as long as I bet. I don't. That's good. I didn't think you'd mind. All right, Angel. It's time to wire the folks. You to know that. Just wait till you know me better. That's for me. I left the number. It's your fault, then. Yeah. Hello, Patsy. What'd you find out, Jocko? Not much. Nobody seems to care about the six race. I care about it. Well, that's because you killed one of the jockeys. The rest of the people have a more casual interest. How do the odds run? No heavy favorites. Vin Air and Sleepy Time Gal figure to be the best at around five to one. What about Fleet Lady? Down the line somewhere. I talked to one fellow. He says she's a dog and couldn't beat a paralytic goose over a hundred yards. Yeah, what else? Well, that's all. What do you mean, that's all? Start digging, Jocko. We're not getting any place. Well, not even at your end? Huh? I counted on you to do better than that. Right, lover? <laughs> On the way home, I bought the morning papers. There was a story on Jackie Gregg. No details. Most of the story was a statement by Hellman on Hellman. There was no mention of Fleet Lady. And at one o'clock in the morning, there was nothing I could do but roll into bed. I woke up about nine and called Jocko. It was like sending a message out to the Farallones by Indian Runner. He just muttered and said he'd meet me out at the track. Well, I had to have some more dope, so I called Ira Snow. He calls the races and bets on them. The way he does it, a horse is a real beast of burden. He was playing elf when I got him on the wire. Yeah. Ira, this is Novak. What do you know about the Bonanza handicap? It's a horse race. Oh, you're funny. What about the field? Are the horses any good? Uh, for hamburgers, maybe. Nothing else. How about Fleet Lady? Uh, Eastern track. Nobody knows. Would she be worth a heavy plunge? If you want to be a monk. What's this all about? 
Or I'm in trouble. How about a fix? Could they run in a ringer on Fleet Lady? It's been done before, but it ain't easy. That's what I figured. How's Rudy Hauser on horses? He ain't. He got burned a long time ago. He never bets. I think you're wrong. Look, Novak, I know every guy in town that's got the itch. Rudy Hauser, no. You know a guy named Ronnie Stark? Sure, he runs a book. Why? Nothing. I may see you at the track. I'm going to make a bet. Yeah, I'll tell the horses. <laughs> Well, that left me in a hole. If Ira was right, Rudy Hauser on Fleet Lady didn't make a bit of sense. I got out to the track about 2.30. Jocko was there, and Hellman was wandering around up in the grandstand where they couldn't push him into a starting gate. Sybil Thornton waved from her box as I moved over to get a better shot at the starting line for the sixth. They were almost at the post when Jocko came back from the betting window. Well, Patsy, I bet two dollars on a horse called Scotch Victory. It seemed like a good omen. Yeah. I saw your friend Rudy Hauser at the window. Huh? He was pouring money down on the favorites to win. That's why the odds have gone down on Venere and Sleepy Time Gal. Look at that board. Yes, Fleet Lady's gone all the way up to 12 to 1. Yeah, from 8 to 1, all the way up. Maybe the word got around she's dead. No, that's the funny part. She's down there, number three on the rail, see? Not a peep out of anybody. Fleet Lady runs well for a ghost. Yeah. yeah Rudy Howes had better hurry or he won't see much, huh? He better hurry. He left the track ten minutes ago. Huh, are you sure, Jocko? Yes, I heard him tell someone he had to make a phone call just before the betting closed. Well, Jocko, you're a sweetheart. Oh, I like to Let's go to the stable. The... Well, the race isn't over. It was over five minutes ago. Well, how about my two dollars? Come on, will you? There's only one person who won't try to fix a horse race. That's a horse. <laughs> I knew there was going to be trouble fast. The horses were just coming under the wire when I waved to Hellman and started for the stable. When we got there, Sybil Thornton was clearing out like a fire sale. I'm in a hurry, Patsy, darling. Let me by. No, you made a bad play, Angel. Stick around. Let me by, Patsy. You heard him, lady. Stick around. Thanks, copper. I'll take charge. That's a big gun, Hauser. I got up big deep. You let me drop a hundred grand, Sybil. Was your idea, Rudy? Not this way. You let me drop a hundred grand because you ran Fleet Lady. The program said Fleet Lady, and that's who ran. I brought those odds into line at the window. My other 80 looked bad on Fleet Lady. You didn't stay to watch her trail the field. All right, I didn't stay. You lost your hundred grand. You killed the ringer. You were a smart big shot who was going to sew up the race. You ran Fleet Lady and cost me a hundred grand. All right, copper, move away from her. Over this way, Sybil. No. Don't let him do it, Patsy. I want to see how tough you are. Come on, Sybil. Let you and me move over against the stall. Watch out, Hauser. You're backing into the horse. Grab the horse, Novak. He's going to trample him. You grab him. It's your idea. Is he dead? Yeah. Should have learned the first time. You can't beat the horses. That's a bum joke, Novak. I guess it is. Now that we're all here, who do we book for Jackie Gregg's murder? I'll answer that one, friend. Who's this guy? One you missed, Hellman. Hello, Stark. Hi, Novak. Well, what are you waiting for, Sybil? Tell the man you killed Jackie Gregg. I've had enough trouble today, Ronnie. You got more coming. You figured it out yet, Novak? Hauser dumped his 80 grand on you. That's right. It's a lot of spending money. Wait a minute. Ronnie, I don't like this. Now you get your half, baby. I'm going to write out an I.O.U. And when they book you for murder and the vote's in, you can't use it. You wouldn't do a thing like that, Ronnie. A dead girl can't spend 40 grand. She killed your guy, Copper, and tried to palm it off on Novak. I was there, so I'll testify. Ronnie, you're a no-good guy. Don't be silly. I love justice. Well, book her for murder, Copper. I want to tear up that I.O.U. <laughs> Hellman 
and finally worked it out. Started out as a fixed race, and when they were all through, it was up to the horse. Rudy Hauser put the squeeze on Sybil for some dough. She offered to run a fast ringer in place of Fleet Lady so Hauser could pick up a bag full. Rudy just wanted to make sure, so he sent one of his boys around to knock off Fleet Lady. Only the guy killed the ringer instead. It was a break for Sybil. She made a deal with a bookie named Ronnie Stark to take all of Hauser's bets and guaranteed him that Fleet Lady couldn't win because she wasn't that good a horse. It panned out that way. She let Hauser think Fleet Lady was dead. He spent 20 grand at the window pushing up the odds on Fleet Lady and dumped another 80 on her to win. A moving van? It was a phony story Greg used to get me to scare Sybil. He wanted in on the deal. He went back to the stable that night, got in a beef, and she killed him. She had him out in her car. When I went to make that phone call, she figured it was a good way to pass the buck. Well, Hellman asked only one question. Why would a nice, tame horse go crazy and trample a man to death? Jocko had the answer. The horse that killed Hauser was a filly. The Armed Forces Radio Service has just brought you Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced by William P. Russo. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. Be with us again next week when over most of these same stations we'll bring you Pat Novak for Hire. My telephone rang. It jerked me out of one nightmare and right into the middle of another. Where a woman with a secret, a worried man, and a shadow out of the past met with fear and fury in the dead of night. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Friend from Detroit. There was a wood nymph dressed in nothing but a veil of dewdrops. She was pirouetting from one huge bluebell to another on gossamer wings. And with every turn, she smiled. And came closer. But just as I reached out for a hand, something happened. The bluebells changed into old tomato cans and started to ring. A bandy legged little man with a jackhammer went to work on my head. I fell over a cliff, and just before I landed on a red hot pile of broken scotch bottles. Oh, I woke up. <sighs> but the jackhammer didn't stop. I switched on the light and looked at my watch. It was one in the a.m., and the phone on my bed table was screaming for an answer. Hello? Marlo, this is Dave. Betty's gone. She's in trouble. You gotta help me, Marlo. You gotta come over to my apartment yeah, right away. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who is this? Dave, Dave Pryor. I run the coffee joint on the corner. You know oh, me. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, Dave. I remember. What's the matter? My wife, Betty, she's gone. You gotta help me. Dave, it's one o'clock in the morning. I'm in bed. Besides, you know I don't monkey with family quarrels. It's not like that, Phil. Believe me, I'm scared for her. Phil, please come over to the apartment. Two thousand beats would right away. It's okay, a matter of life. Okay, and... I'll be there in ten minutes. Marlo, 
Marlowe, I thought you'd never get here. Look, somebody fired a shot through the door, and when I got back with the aspirin, Betty was gone. Oh, and right, I wait a minute, the... Dave. Hold it. I'm not even awake yet. Look, sit down. Take it from the top. Slow. Yeah, okay. Maybe it started this morning at the coffee joint when a fancy guy came in and talked to Betty. She waits on the table. Yeah, 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 I know. What do you mean, fancy? Well, a slick dress, a cufflink, stick pin, all that. I didn't know him, and Betty tossed him off to me as a masher. Maybe he was, but she seemed upset. Slower, huh? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, tonight about nine, another guy came in, a chunky bird with a deep voice. Betty had just got back from shopping, and I was in the kitchen. See, when I heard a tray of dishes fall, and Betty came back white as a sheet, she was scared, Phil, scared, scared. Hey! Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Go well, ahead. I looked out, and, and that chunky guy was leaving. Betty insisted he had nothing to do with it, that she was just nervous. Was somebody else in the place at the time? Uh, let's see. Yeah, some Tribune reporter that comes in every night was up at the counter. He was the only one. And Betty stayed on the job till you closed, huh? Yeah, till midnight. But, Phil, she was in a bad shape. Mm-hmm. After we got home here, she sent me out with some aspirin. I was only out for 15 minutes, Phil. When I came back, she was gone. And look, look, this bullet hole in the glass doors of the backyard. Somebody out there shot at her. And maybe hit her All or something. All right, Dave, steady. Now take it easy. You and Betty have a gun? No. Why? Well, in the first place, the bullet went out through this glass. It didn't come in. And another thing, Dave, who who did you call tonight after you phoned me? Why, nobody. Phone directly on the dresser here is open to the bees. Boone to wardrobe. Mean anything to you? No. I didn't even realize it was over there. I looked you up in the classified. Mm-hmm. Okay, come on. Let's take a look in the backyard. Any light out there? Yeah, I rigged one up for the barbecue. Look, Marlo, there must take be it something easy. you... Now, we'll straighten this out, believe me. Let's see. A line of sight seems to run somewhere between the barbecue and the gate. No footprints, though, maybe. Marlo! Hmm? Marlo, here by the tree, it's a hat. Gray snap brim, initials V... VR on the sweatband. VR? Mean anything to you? Oh, I know. Well, sure! That's Van Remini's hat. He's the newspaper guy I told you about. Tribune reporter that was in your place tonight? Yeah. Why should he be dodging bullets in your backyard? I don't know. Dave, where's Betty from? Detroit. When she came out here, I gave her a job. And then you both fell for each other and got married, huh? Yeah, two years ago next month. And we've been happy, Phil. We've been... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, look, Dave. Why did you call me instead of the cops? I... Well, I guess I'm afraid she's mixed up in, well, in something bad. You know, if it turns out that way, I'll have to call him myself. Okay, Phil. But you're on my side until you know for sure. Yeah, yeah. All right, now you stay here, close to your phone. Okay. I'll check with you. Right now, i got to get a line on a bare-headed reporter. He can get us started if he hasn't lost anything more than his hat when I find him. So long, Dave. A reporter's hat, two strangers, and a bullet hole somehow added up to the fast fate of a hard-working kid named Betty, whose husband's only claim to fame was selling the best cup of coffee in town. It made no sense, but as I walked up the street toward my car, I figured that through Van Remini, I could get to the first answer. I was wrong. The first answer got to me. A thick hedge suddenly sprouted arms. One jerked me around while the other held the cold throat of a forty-five against my throat. Your car registration tag says your name is Philip Marlowe. No kidding. How do you suppose that happened? But it doesn't mention your racket. Shamus, maybe? Could be. And you? I'm a tourist. Oh, sure, sure. Just out to see the sights. That's huh? it. One in particular. $25,000 that belongs to me. I don't want any interference from you or that square inside there. You mean Dave Pryor? I mean Dave Pryor. I'll go back in there and tell him to cool off. A little woman is all right. She's just helped an old friend, you might say. Might I say you're the friend? Never mind. Unless Mr. Jitt is in there, kicks up a fuss, everything will be fine. Betty knows what she's doing. She's got a lot of talent for it. Too much to waste slinging hash. And remember what I said, Marlo. Lay off. I'll remember more than that about you, Foghorn. Just remember to count ten before you move, boy. Well, there's no point in trying to outsmart a forty-five. And with three steps, Foghorn vanished in the night. Also gone was a big chunk of my respect for a doll named Betty Pryor and her taste in old friends. Just so I wasn't jumping to conclusions, I went to my car and drove down to Hollywood Boulevard. At the first all-night gas station, I stopped and put in a call to the Tribune, where a guy on the desk told me through a mouthful of mango cigar that unless Remini was at Bungalow 24, Beverly Crest Hotel, covering the murder of an ex-Detroit hood, he was fired. Then he hung up. But the one word Detroit made the call a jackpot, so I headed for the hotel on the double. It was pink and Spanish and squatted in a grove of well-behaved palm trees at the edge of a domesticated jungle which gave the illusion of privacy to a string of bungalows that weren't. 
But number 24 had all the privacy of a glass-faced cutaway beehive when I pulled up in the middle of two squad cars in an ambulance and went inside. Sprawled on the floor in front of a desk was a very well-dressed Exhibit A. Complete with cufflinks and stick pin and presiding as usual was Detective Lieutenant Ibarra, who didn't see me until I walked up beside him. What are you doing here, Marlowe? I can smell blood clear across town. What's the story, Ibarra? The name is Speck Willard, a gambler from Detroit. Retired out here to California a few years back to play horses and women. He was shot to death at about 8 o'clock tonight by a person or a persons unowned. Another gang jam? No, I don't think so. Looks more like armed robbery that got out of hand. How so? We found a currency wrapper from a local bank that read $25,000 in an open drawer in the bedroom. And one of the bellhops saw a woman, unidentified so far, run out of here about the time the coroner says that Willard was shot. A woman? Yeah. That fits because he was known to be quite a nightclubber and general playboy. You wouldn't happen to know something about this woman, would you, Marlowe? Me? Certainly not. <laughs> no, I'm after a man alive when I hope. Mm hmm. Well, look, Marlowe, take this nickel. Hmm? In case you should just happen to hear something, I want you to spend that on a phone call to the police department. <laughs> now, who is it you're looking for? A Tribune reporter named Van Remini, you know him? Unfortunately, that's him over there, the sticky-fingered one by the window, swiping that book of matches just now, the one without a hat. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Thanks, Lieutenant, I'll see you. Hey, uh, Remini, can I talk to you a minute? Yeah, sure, what's on your mind? I'm Philip Marlowe, private detective. Well, don't apologize. What's up, Marlo? Know a girl named Betty Pryor? Pryor? Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah. She and her husband run a one arm joint on Franklin, don't they? That's right, Remini. I understand Betty got into a little trouble tonight. Heard about it? Nope. Wouldn't worry, though. Trouble's not new to Betty. Yeah, that's one popular school of thought. Incidentally, you seem to be going a long ways out of your way on this run-of-the-mill murder story, Remini. You're taking a long way around to the point, pal. Get with it. I'm in a hurry. Okay, pal. But keep it under your hat. Won't you? The gray one, I mean. Oh, so that's how it is. Yeah, that's the way it is. Yeah. Now, do you mind telling me what you saw in Pryor's backyard tonight? You name it. Shall I play dumb or lie? Suit yourself. See, my press card's just as good as your license, sweetheart. It gets me in, gets me out again. In my dodge, that's called reporting. Remini, I'll squeeze the truth out of you eventually. I'm sorry, I can't wait. I've got a deadline. Anything else? Yeah, one thing, a match. Yeah, sure, Marlo, any time. Thanks. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Remini. Yeah? Don't hang on too long, huh? Love will send your pinkies. The reporter blew out the match and looked at me steadily for a moment. And his lips shaped a word I ignored. And then he walked away. I had seen enough of the book of matches he'd stolen to know it was in the star room, a glossy, glass roof, dine, dance, and drink emporium near Arthur Murray's studio on Wilshire Boulevard. So I made like I was in for the night and watched Remini leave. All the way to his car, he kept looking back over his shoulder as if he expected to be followed. I waited till he was out of sight, and then I headed for Wilshire in the Starkish room. But when I got there, it was closed. Remini's car wasn't in the neighborhood, and the only thing that kept the trip from being a total loss was a spotlighted picture. Ten feet square of a sultry, svelte chanteuse labeled Carla Borden. Who's come on in smile and almost costume was a cinch to increase the accident rate of the block by 20%. But then I took another look at her name and got back to business. It started with a B, as in phone book, opened a Boone and Bordeaux. I found a directory, got it open to Boone and Bordeaux, and halfway down the page was Borden, Carla, 2840 North Lucerne. It took ten minutes to get there and two more to find out that she had an apartment, number 17, at the end of the first floor hall. The door was open and I started for it, but stuck back close to the elevator when a woman came out and ran down the corridor toward me. It was Betty Pryor. Hold it, Betty! Whoa! What? Mr. Marlowe, what, what are you... Never mind the stall, Betty. I've been in a long time. Why, well, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, look, about. you left a pretty worried guy at home. Dave, did he send you after me? That's right. Why oh, can't you fools leave me alone? Why does he have to be so stupid? Hey, you've got a few ideas mixed up, kid. Oh, sure, I'm wrong. I'm the one who's all mixed up. <laughs> Let go of Not me, Not until you... I've got a couple of things straight. Now, what happened? Did life in a hamburger stand get a little stale? Yes, you two-bit snoop. Okay. Dave thinks you're in trouble, I think you're in trouble, and I think somebody waved a few bills at you and you lost your grip. Why, And you're in so me... deep now you can't get out and it's no more than you deserve. Now, come no, on, you... we're going right back down the hall to Carla's apartment. 
We're going to have a little chat, just the three of us. No, no, I won't. Let Come on. Take your hands off, Marlowe. Stand still. Well, by two chums, the Foghorn and its forty-five caliber equalizer. Easy does it. You were lucky the first time. Well, Betty, did you get it? No, something went wrong. Something terrible. Shut up. Marlowe isn't deep. We'll talk after he's out of the way. All right, you. Get in that elevator, chum. And we'll wait right here to see you leave. Get on here. here. That 45 makes you awful brave, chum. <laughs> this way we don't offend the lady by being uncouth. And you get a chance to go up in the world. Just put your finger on a button. Now, uh, wait a Come minute. Come on. All right. Now, all you have to do is push. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, the most famous neighbors in radio, the Ronald Coleman's, will pay Jack Benny a visit again tomorrow as CBS's great Sunday night gets underway with another star-studded group of famous entertainers. Amos and Andy, Lum and Abner, Eve Arden as the gay schoolmistress, our Miss Brooks, and Helen Hayes as a hillbilly. These are only four more of the ten great entertainments which will come your way tomorrow night. Go visiting with the Coleman's on all of these same stations on the Jack Benny Show and hear the rest of CBS's great Sunday Night 10 as they come one by one over most of these stations. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Friend from Detroit. My cage on cables was ten exasperating seconds getting to the next floor. And I was another ten getting free of it back down the stairs and out into the dark street where the red splash of a taillight disappeared around a corner. And that was all that was left of Foghorn and company. So I turned back toward Carla Borden's room. When I stepped across the threshold, I found that with the exception of a single bureau that was still intact, apartment number 17 looked like it had just played host to the vortex of a cyclone. The bed, a chest of drawers, another bureau, a desk, everything was inside out. And in the middle of all that was the body of Carla Borden. Blood from a deep, ugly cut on her head, staining the snow-white front of her Angora sweater. I saw something else, which reminded me that this was not the first corpse of the night. The plush leather frame was shaped like an oversized lifesaver, and in it was a picture of a handsome man, all smiles, inscribed, With love to my very best girl. Speck Willard. It was ten minutes before I got Tennedy Barrow, who was still up at the Beverly Crest Hotel. And after I told him about Collar and her connection with the late Mr. Willard and Betty Pryor and my connection with Dave, I stopped talking and listened. Marla, we just learned that Willard had some kind of a $25,000 caper going with one of his old mobster friends from Detroit, named Joe Lazar. Who well, maybe is something with a voice and active below bottom? The same, Phil. Anyhow, it looks like they worked out a gambling deal for old time's sake. At the last minute, Willard tried to welch on Lazar and got killed for his trouble. Then Lazar searched the place until he found the 25000 No, no, no. That part doesn't fit, Ibarra. How so? Well, I've run into Lazar twice tonight. I know he and the money are still strangers. Oh? After what happened here with the team of Betty and Lazar getting to the singer Carla, I figure they're still looking for it. Also, I figure Carla was somewhere near when Lazar killed Speck Willard and that she took the money and... I'll call you later, Ibarra. You got clumsy company in the hall outside. All right, ballerina, get your foot out of that bucket and come on in with your hands up. Well, <laughs> the man with the very long nose for news. What brings you around, Remini? For one thing, the fact that you got no corner on brains, Marlowe, and for another, who did that to her? Our mutual friend, Betty Pryor, and her running mate. I believe they were looking for 25,000 bucks. Did she and Joe Lazar get the money, Marlowe? No, they... Remini, how did you know the man with Betty was named Joe Lazar? Haven't you heard? I'm a good reporter, Marlowe. The mm. kind that keeps eyes and ears open and mouth shut. It isn't until I know the whole story. Which, as far as you're concerned, is precisely what? That I happen to you be... You happen to be? That I happen to be in Dave's restaurant early this evening, where I recognize the only other cash customer is Joe Lazar. Oh. An out-of-work mobster from Detroit. He said something to Betty that scared her right out of a tray of dishes, so I figured I'd find out what was going on. I've been in on the show ever since. Yeah. Including a corny blackout up at 2000 Beachwood Drive where you lost your hat running away from a bullet. That's right. Uh -huh. And just so you don't toss and turn when you get around to going to bed tonight, I'll fill in the rest. 
I followed Betty and Dave from the restaurant to their apartment. I watched her get rid of Dave, and then when I saw Lazar come in, I moved up close to the window. And stayed there. Until Lazar spotted you and threw a bullet your way? You're very clever. Yes, I am, man. But before that happened, I heard him tell Betty that Speck Willard had talked about a girl singer at the Star Kiss room named uh, Carla Borden. And that since he didn't know Carla on sight, she could have been a lady he'd seen running out of Speck's apartment with a 25 gram. Oh. Now that phone book of Dave's open to the bees ties in. I'm so glad. Now, Marlo, lest we digress too far, how come this one bureau here hasn't been turned upside down along with everything else? I don't know. Any more than I know why you're holding back so much from the law. Well, maybe it's because I don't like cops, Marla. Oh, a black one. Or maybe it's because I'm in the same kind of racket as you. Chin way out and a lot of fast talk, just so papers can know what's going on an hour ahead of the rest of the world. Well, there's no 25000 in here. I got to blow. Before Ibarra shows? Before Ibarra shows. He always arrives with an entourage, Marla, one that includes other news mm. hounds. So it's me for a fast cab in downtown and my paper with a story. Go on, fellow. I'll see you around. Hey, wait a minute, Remini. Yeah? I'll give you a lift. I'm going that way myself. Okay. I got a story, too. A lousy story. I've got to tell a nice guy named Dave. Come on. All the time we drove, Remini half-faced me and smoked one cigarette after another while he rattled oh, on about Joe Lazar. The great story he had and a lot of other things I didn't hear because I was busy trying to find the right words with which to tell Dave Pryor that his wife was no good. So when we were about halfway to Beachwood Drive and Remini, who was pushing close to his deadline, decided to get out and phone a story in from a drugstore, I was glad. So long, Marlo. second after that, I knew I was kidding myself. Because even with just silence for company, I was still no place with the right words. Ten minutes later, when I stood in front of Dave on the steps to his house and stammered out the facts just as I had run across them, I forgot about words, right or wrong. I thought instead about my client, a badly hurt guy, but one who would never say die. Marlo, I can't believe all this. I won't. Tell me, where's Betty now? I don't know, Dave. Now look, maybe we ought to head for police headquarters because sooner or later we're each going to have a story to tell Lieutenant Ibarra. Come on, my car's over here. Okay, Phil. I guess that's the only thing to do, all right. Yeah, I guess so. Here. Better have a cigarette, David. Oh, thanks. Kid, we'll try to make this as painless as we... As we what, Marlo? What is it? Hmm? What are you staring at? Front seat. But I don't see anything, Phil. What is it? What are you staring at? Shut up, Dave. Shut up. Give me a minute, will you? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Come on, Dave. Pile in. But why, Marlo? Where are we going? Star kiss room to play a long shot. Slapped my foot down hard on the accelerator and kept it that way right through a string of I didn't care what color traffic lights until five minutes later when we screeched to a stop away from the side entrance to the star kiss room. I left Dave in the front seat, piled out fast, and ran a dozen yards to an abrupt halt at the sight of something that turned the long shot I was playing into a into an odds-on favorite. It was the stage entrance door open a couple of inches, and in front of that, and unconscious on the hard sidewalk where it had fallen, was the clad in blue form of a private patrolman, his pistol holster conspicuously empty. Inside, I slowly picked my way along an L-shaped corridor until I saw a shaft of bright yellow from a flashlight. It was moving away from a door marked Carla Borden. It brought me up short and flat against the wall. But then as the man on the other end of the beam of light moved away from me, I I got a very steady grip on the thirty-eight in my pocket and started after him. A minute later, he entered the main room of the club, and it was there as he started across the glass ceiling dance floor that I recognized the very self-confident gait of a very self-confident guy. And that made the next move mine. Bars closed, what? Remedy, and don't move, Buster. I'll blow your head off. Ah. Looks like you're making news this time, good reporter. Or isn't that package in your hand the 25 grand you just found in Carla Borden's dressing room, huh? The same Carla Borden you murdered not an hour ago in an apartment on Lucerne, where you first thought the money was, where Betty Pryor surprised you before you could finish searching, where you later returned in the role of an all-American newsboy so you could get to that last bureau. All right, all right, I've heard enough, Marlowe. But I'm not going to stick around for more details. You make a break and I'll shoot, Remini. Try it, Eagle. Stop, Remini, stop! Uh, 
nice shooting, Marlowe. But don't turn around because where I'm standing, it's dark. And where you're standing, it's light. Now, throw your gun away, fella. Come on, toss it. That's better. All right, Betty. Get over to that dead newspaper guy and get the money. All right. We'll take care of the private detective here. What do you mean, take care, Joe? I I can't go along with murder. Speck Willard's death didn't seem to bother you any. Shut up, Marlowe. Speck Willard. Joe, you... Joe, you killed... Yes, I killed Speck, that welcher. Eight o'clock tonight. And I had to stay under cover, but still get my hands on the money. So, I came to you for help. I didn't tell you about the killing, because I didn't think you'd play ball if you knew about it. Now, all that's history now, and I'll still go to your dear husband, Dave, and talk lots about the kind of cheap kid you used to be in Detroit if you don't get moving. Now, what do you say, Betty? I say no, Joe. I also say I made a mistake in the first place letting you use me to run your filthy errands. Just so the guy I love wouldn't have to know about the kind of people I once ran around with before I had any brains. All right. That's the dumb way you want it. That's the dumb way it'll be. Taking care of two years is much harder than taking care of one. What about three, Lazar? Dave, Dave, stay back. No, Marlowe, no. I've stayed back too long already. I've stayed back while Betty has been risking her life to protect what we've got. If you take another step out, shoot, kid. I'm warning you for the last time. Stay back. No, Lazar, I won't. (laughs) You thinking scum, Lazar? Oh, Dave, you're a kid. Yeah. Yeah. But, But I'll be all right. I'll be all right now, Betty. Dr. Reese. Dr. Reese, please report to surgery. Well, Mrs. Pryor. Dr. Reese. Marlo, the doctor says that Dave's going to be fine in a couple of days. Yeah. Caught one on the shoulder, the other on the hip. He certainly had courage, didn't he? Yeah, and you did all right, too, Betty. Mixing in this whole mess just to keep the home fires burning. Wow. Tell me, whatever Dr. made you Reese, think that a guy like Dave Reese wouldn't understand that you turned over a new leaf? Well, I... Dr. Reese wanted in I surgery. don't know, Phil. I guess I wasn't very smart. No, you weren't, Mrs. Pryor, but you're lucky because Marlowe here was. And that brings me around to a loose end, Phil. How did you know that Remini was your man? All right. Because of something I saw in the upholstery of the front seat of my car, Ibarra. Tufts of snow-white angora, which was the kind of sweater that Carla Borden had on when she was murdered after they struggled. And since you didn't touch the body yourself, they couldn't have come from your suit. No. And Remini was the only other one who had been in my car. So I figured that the Angora fuzz had gone from Carla's sweater to Remini's suit to my upholstery. Yeah. All of which means that Remini must have been in Carla's room before I got there as well as after. See? And then once I thought back about his getting out of my car to phone his story in, I... Well, I realized that when I dropped him near a drugstore, he had also been near the star kissed room. Yes. That's exactly where he'd headed. Mm-hmm. You see, Phil, Joe and I followed both of you from Carla Borden's place because, well, after Joe put you in that elevator and we ran, Joe said we had to return and wait for Remini, who was sure to come back and finish his search. And the whole business, because Lazar, after he had murdered Speck Willard, was afraid to publicly go after Carla Borden and the money he felt was his. Yes. He knew about me and Dave because Speck Willard accidentally dropped into our place this morning. Uh, correction, for... baby. What? Yesterday morning. Oh. It's now 9 a.m. Oh. <clears throat> and a good time to call quits, huh? <laughs> good night, kids. By the time I got back to my apartment on Franklin, it was half past ten in the too bright morning. I was sporting sandpaper eyelids and a knot in the small of my back that felt like a wet dish rag. Oh, but once I had all the shades down and was undressed and in bed, I forgot about that. And I thought instead of the wood nymph dressed in nothing, hmm, with a veil of dewdrop. But then suddenly I stopped. The telephone. I got out of bed. I picked it up with both hands, opened the dresser drawer, and jammed it deep under all the socks I owned. And then I got back to bed. And the wood nymph, in her veil of dewdrop, she was she was pirouetting from one huge bluebell to another. Oh my. Uh, on gossamer wing. The 
The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore, and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg as Betty Pryor, Peter Leeds as Dave Pryor, Harry Bartell as Van Remini, and Ed Begley as Joe Lazar. Lieutenant Detective Ibarra was played by Jeff Corey. The special music was by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It was a hunt through a jungle of city streets with danger waiting at every intersection until halfway through when the hunters became the hunted and death brought an end to the game. Being a private investigator means two things. You can be sure you'll run into trouble, and you can never be sure you'll get out of it. Not much you can do about it, I guess, except like Julie always says. Walk softly, please, Troy. And now, Peter Troy investigates the Lovelorn Lady. Love makes the world go round, said the man, and I'd hate to argue about that. It could be love does make this tired old planet revolve, but personally, I wouldn't be at all surprised if one day it brought the world to a dead stop. One thing I'm sure of, it brings some folks to a dead stop, and I mean dead. For if love often urges folks to make great sacrifices, it sure enough also gives some others a terrible yen for murder, as any history book or dime novelette can demonstrate like, for instance, the thing that happened to a character by the name of David Murray, a none too savory jerk who ran, of all things, a Lonely Hearts Club. He had the Lonely Hearts game sewn up. By day, he ran the club for those unfortunate people who need someone else to find mates for them. And by night, he ran his own private Lonely Hearts Club in which he shared himself out among a number of dolls with whom he was apparently quite a hit. Until one certain night... Oh, don't be that way, darling... You know there's nobody else but you. What's her? Oh, no, don't be silly. She doesn't mean a thing to me. Hmm? Well, I'm telling you now, aren't I? Hmm? Of course I do. All right, then. I love you. How's that? <laughs> I love you, I love you, I love you. Madly, uncontrollably, without ceasing. I love your eyes, your lips, your... Uh-uh. Somebody at the door. Just a sec, darling. Come in. What's that, darling? Now I don't know who it is. Hmm? No, of course I'm not expecting anyone. Oh, blast. Just a second, darling. Come in. The door's not locked. Who is it? <sighs> darling, just hang on while I see who it is. Someone very different. Doesn't seem to want it. What the... You. What are you doing here? I told you never to... Hey, hey, what do you think you're doing? No! Oh! Had I known about the passing of David Murray at the time, which I didn't, I would have been inclined to get hold of his little red book and use a pin to pick the name of any one of a dozen dolls who might have bumped him off. He was, as I indicated, that kind of a crumb. I first heard about him in a different way when I arrived at my office one morning to find Julie looking rather happy about something. Good morning, Pete. And a lovely morning it is, too. Oh, I suppose you know you just stole my line, honey. Did I? Well, you can have it back. What sort of a morning would you say it is, Pete? Um, it's a lovely morning. There. You happy now? Yeah, more to the point, what's making you so happy? Why shouldn't I be happy? It's such a lovely morning. Oh, I think that's been mentioned. Well, what's new? Client in your office. Already? Oh, uh, a male or a female? Female. A beautiful girl. And you're happy? Oh, don't make me laugh. You love her, I'm sure. Just your cup of tea. Hey, Julie, no kidding. No kidding. Oh, this I've got to see. Oh, 
good morning. You're Mr. Troy? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm Troy. Uh, excuse me a moment, ma'am. Julie, that was a filthy trick to play on a guy at 9.30 in the morning. Oh, what trick was that? That, that monster in my office. She is a dog, an absolute dog. <laughs> if you could see the look on your face. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> but I won't forget this, Julie. I'll get even. You sure you wouldn't like me to come in and take notes while you're with Miss Wellington? Wellington? Is that her name? She even sounds like a dog. <laughs> but next time she wants an appointment, make it at night time. Then she won't be able to come. Why not? Because she'll be too busy haunting a house somewhere. <laughs> oh, uh, now, uh, Miss Wellington, isn't it? That's right, Mr. Troy. Nora Wellington. Miss Nora Wellington. Uh, you know, I think I have the name right now. Uh, Mr. Troy, I want you to handle a matter of some delicacy for me. Mm-hmm. Shoot. I beg your pardon? I mean, what is it you want me to do, Miss Wellington? I want you to expose a dreadful man called David Murray. Expose him? Yes. He's a terrible man. He took my money and absolutely no good came of it. He introduced me to a lot of very unacceptable people. Unacceptable to me, that is. And then when I said I wasn't satisfied, he ordered me out of his office. Just like that. Uh, well, look, I I'm not with you, Miss Wellington. Uh, you say this Murray took your money. Uh, well, what did you pay him for? For introductions to some... some nice gentleman friends, of course. Oh, David Murray owns the Murray Lonely Hearts Club. Don't worry, come to Murray. That's his slogan. And he makes money? Lots of money. He's made a fortune out of the misery of other people. What, well, that slogan? Must be a genius. He's a very unpleasant person, Mr. Troy, and he should be drummed out of his very undesirable business. Uh, Miss Wellington, you said you paid this man money. How much? Twenty-five pounds. Well, and you feel it's worth engaging me to get your money back? It could be that it's not really worth the trouble for so small a sum, you know. I don't expect to get my money back, Mr. Troy. And it's not the money that worries me. It's Murray. He's a fake, and he should be exposed. Well, maybe, Miss Wellington, maybe, but I'm no crusader. I'm not asking you to crusade. I want to prosecute Murray for fraud, and I want you to get the evidence... And I'm prepared to pay you for that, Mr. Troy. I don't care what it costs. I want that man shown up for what he is. Hi, Julie. I'm back. Yes, well, I kind of figured that. Thank heavens. This typing sure is a drag. Well, um, how'd you make out with friend Murray? I didn't. I didn't even see him. You know, you'll make a great detective someday. There's no doubt about that. Hmm? Well, I send you down to the Murray Lonely Hearts Club to interview this creep, and you don't even get to see him. I didn't see him because he wasn't there. He hasn't been in today, the girl said. Oh. Well, uh, where is he, young? Uh... On holidays or something? No. They don't know where he is. They've even tried to get him on the phone, but it's engaged. Engaged? What, all day? I don't know. The girl just said it was engaged. Yeah. Do you have his home address and phone number? Yes, I've got all that. Yeah, that's something. Look, get on the blower to him and make an appointment to see him. For you? No, for you. I told you, I don't want to get mixed up in this Murray thing unless I have to. I don't even want this case. This kind of thing is pretty low bracket, you know. Oh, thanks. Now I know why you put me on it. No, just call Murray, huh? I don't know why I have to do all the dirty work around here. Well, you asked for it when you played that trick on me about that doll with a Dracula face. Miss Wellington? She's your client, remember. How could I ever forget? You know, she must have more money than sense engaging you to expose Murray. It will cost her a lot more than 25 pounds she paid him. Mm, anyway, we shouldn't have too much trouble getting something juicy on Murray. From what I hear, he's quite a guy with the dolls. And some of them must hate him, and they're probably willing to talk. Well, his phone's still engaged, so that fixes that. Still engaged? I don't know that I like the sound of this very much. How do you mean, Pete? I don't know. Come on, Julie, let's take a little drive. Where to? Murray's home. See if we can persuade him to get off the phone. Come on. 
He's in no hurry to answer the door, anyway. If he's home. If he's not, why is his phone engaged? Remind me to ask him when I see him. Well, it's no use buzzing anymore. Uh, we uh, may as well uh, try the door. Oh, I don't... Oh. It's unlocked. It's odd. Yes, isn't it? Shall we go in? We surely shall. After you. Thank you. Mr. Murray? Hello, anyone home? I gather there's nobody home. Pete, I don't like this. I mean, if he... Pete, look. What? Oh, wow. No wonder he didn't answer the phone. Now let's take a look at him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is yeah, he... Yeah, he's dead, all right. Uh... He's been dead some time. The phone's off the hook. Receiver's on the floor. No wonder we couldn't ring him. I wonder... Uh, don't touch it, Julie. Don't touch it. Fingerprints. Oh. Don't touch anything. Oh, there, there's a gun on the table here. Yeah. Yeah, an automatic. And I wonder what it's doing there. Oh. Why shouldn't it be there? Well, I, I don't know, but if it's the murder weapon, I'd say it should be on the floor. What? Hey, see that? In the floor. It looks like... The bullet hole. Yeah, with powder burns around it. That means the gun was fired close to the floor. Yeah, possibly in a struggle, but as there are no signs of a struggle, I'd say the gun went off accidentally when dropped to the floor. After the murder? After the murder. Well, then the murderer picked it up and put it on the table. Yeah, the murderer or somebody else. What makes you think it might have been somebody else? Well, I don't necessarily think that, but it's a possibility. Well, shouldn't we um, phone the police or something? Mm -hmm. We should and we will. Come on. Oh, the phone's right well, there, couldn't you? I don't want to use that phone. Now, if Murray was calling somebody when he was shot, that phone will still be connected with theirs. Well, even if they've hung up? Yeah. In which case, the police will be able to trace the call and find out if the other party heard anything. But what if the other party was ringing Murray? Well, in that case, the connection would be broken when the guy hung up at the other end. Oh, Anyway, honey, as far as we're concerned, I'd say this turned out to be a nice, simple case. After the police get onto this, friend Murray will be well and truly exposed, just as Nora Wellington wanted him. Come on, let's go call the police. case was not over for us at all. It might have been, but for my pet poltergeist, which kept whispering to me that there was an angle to the murder of David Murray that made it something that I should follow up, even though nobody was paying me to do that. It was because of this little whisper nagging at me that I later checked the thing out with Inspector Norman, who was pinch-hitting for my friend Caswell. Well, you haven't missed much, Troy. All pretty straightforward. Not another of your open and shut cases. That's right. We picked up the girl and she's being charged right this minute. Girl? What girl? Name of Eileen Jarvis, one of Murray's numerous lady friends. Oh, and I suppose you have a good case against her. Well, you judge for yourself. Her prints were on the pistol, the murder weapon. Uh, the one on the table in the room? That's right. Yeah, I was curious about that gun. Looked a rather ancient weapon to me. Oh, it is. Not in the best condition, either. Safety catch doesn't work, and the mechanism's so worn, it works more or less as a hair trigger. Yeah, well, no wonder it went off when it was dropped on the floor. Uh, I guess that's how that bullet hole got on the floor. Apparently. After dropping the gun, the girl must have picked it up and put it on the table. She admits doing that, as well as the murder? <laughs> no, of course she doesn't. She said she picked up the gun involuntarily when she walked in and found the body. Uh-huh. Her story is that she was on the phone to Murray when it happened. Heard the shots, left her home, and went straight over to Murray's. Uh, did you check Murray's phone? If he called her... Oh, we thought of that. But she said that she called him. At least that part of it would fit. His phone wasn't connected to any other. Uh, it's a pity... There's no way of proving whether he was on the phone to her or not. No, but it's understandable that she says he was. How did you get on to this girl? Oh, we went through the little red book that was in his pocket and started checking out all the names we found there. By chance, Eileen Jarvis was one of the first we looked up. She had left her home in a hurry, leaving a trail a mile wide. Yes, and when you picked her up, she gave a guilty start and began protesting her innocence, etc., etc. That's right. Wouldn't you say it was all just a little pat, Inspector? Just too easy, maybe? Perhaps. But you get some easy ones now and then. 
Not for me to fly in the face of Providence when we get a quick solution to a case. It isn't the face of Providence I'm thinking about. It's the stern old face of justice that worries me. I must say you seem to be going to an awful lot of trouble at this stage, Pete. You couldn't have cared less about Miss Wellington's case when she came to you, and now that it's over, you're rushing out to report to her. Well, ever the conscientious detective, you know, Julie. Oh, is that what you call it? I would rather say yes. that... Uh, oh, Mr. Toy, I didn't expect to see you. Oh, I'm just reporting on the business you left in my hands, Miss Wellington. Uh, you know my secretary, Miss Summers. Oh, of course. Uh, come in. Thanks. Um, come into the living room. It's lighter there. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I see by the papers that you haven't been able to get very far with Mr. Murray, Mr. Troy. Then you know about the murder. Oh, yes. Terrible thing. It's funny, I wish that man all kinds of punishments when he was alive, but now, well, one doesn't speak ill of the dead, does one? Uh, that's what, uh, what they say. Uh, and seeing Murray's dead, there's not much more I can do for you, but... If it's any satisfaction to you, he won't be swindling any more lonely-hearted ladies. Uh, no, that's true. And that, at least, is a good thing. Like many others, I went to David Murray in the hope that he would introduce me to some nice gentleman. I have been lonely. It's no use pretending I haven't. And I'm not very good at making friends for myself. You have a lovely home here, Miss Wellington. Oh, please don't think me rude, but... I'm sure there are a lot of men who would regard you as a pretty good catch. It's easy to see you've never been married, my dear. Men seem very different to a woman after marriage. But you've never been married either, Miss Wellington. No. Oh, of course not. Well, then how come you have such definite ideas about what a man's like after marriage? I... I've heard from married women, I know... I see you're admiring my photographs, Miss Summers. Yes, yes, I was. Especially this set over here. Oh, those. Yes, they are good, aren't they? Those were taken in Cornwall about six or seven years ago. I, I spent a very happy time there. Oh, did you live there, or was it just a holiday? Why, well, I, I lived there for a time, in Penryn, you know. Oh, in many ways, I wish I'd never left there. The photos make the countryside look very attractive, I must say. Uh, Julie, I think we'd better be going. Oh, all right, Pete. I suppose we can't do anything more for Miss Wellington now. Uh, no, I'm afraid you can't, but thank you for all your trouble, Mr. Troy, especially coming out to see me. If you post me an account, I promise you it'll be paid promptly. <laughs> Why, Pete, wherever did you get that? Hmm? Oh, it's a photo of our dear Miss Wellington. Oh, I can see that. As a matter of fact, I swiped it from her place while you and she were ooing and eyeing over the Cornish countryside. Well, you shouldn't have done that. Anyway, what do you want it for? <gasps> Don't tell me you succumbed to an irresistible urge to have a picture of Miss Wellington by your bed. Oh, very funny. No, this photo is for you. Me? <laughs> What do you want me to do with it? Take it to Cornwall, to Penryn, where she said she lived six or seven years ago. Whatever for? Are you checking up on Miss Wellington? I am. For the simple reason I do not like her. I do not like the odd coincidence of her getting me to chase up David Murray shortly after he'd been shot dead. And I do not like the intense way she talked about marriage when she's making like she's an old maid. Pete, you don't think... Well, right now it's just an idea. Now that's why you're going to Cornwall. Now, I'll sit by the phone with Sam just till I hear from you. You're not telling me anything, Troy. We know Murray was married. Oh. Well, have you found his wife? No, apparently they were separated. Her maiden name was Duke. Nora Duke? That's right, but how did you know? Well, it figures. The change from Duke to Wellington, I mean. Change? What change? Nora Duke, Murray's wife, now calls herself Nora Wellington. It was she who came to me about Murray, and it was as a result of her call that I went out to his place and found the body. What? But, but how do you know this woman is Nora Duke? Well, on a hunch, I sent Julie to Penryn in Cornwall with a photograph of dear Nora. As she told us she spent a happy time there a few years ago. What's that to do with her being married? Well, I was trying out a theory... We know Murray was a lady killer. Now, Nora is a plain Jane, if ever there was one. 
If she was married to Murray, which we now know she was, she'd have a pretty good motive for her killing Murray. Jealousy. I still don't see how you know... Julie that. shopped around Penryn, churches, marriage registry and so on, carrying the photograph. A minister identified the woman in the photo as one he'd married to David Murray six or seven years ago. And all this checked out with his church register. Hmm. Look, uh, let's play my hunch a little further, Inspector. Do you have the murder weapon handy? I can get it. What do you want it for? Well, I'll tell you. And then I want you to get Nora Murray in here to your office. <laughs> I know nothing at all about the murder of David Murray. I can't think why you dragged me all the way here. To Miss just... Wellington, or perhaps I should say Mrs. Murray. What? Well, that's right, isn't it? You were married to Murray in Cornwall about six years ago. I... Uh, I... Mr. Do... Troy has a theory he'd like to expound to you, madam. Go ahead, Troy. Well, it goes like this. On the night David Murray was killed, he was on the telephone to one of his many girlfriends, a doll by the name of Eileen Jarvis. You'd known about his affairs for some time, and you decided that you'd had enough of it. I don't know what you're talking about. No? You went to Murray's home. You weren't living together at the time. You took with you this pistol, loaded, just as it is now. I've never seen that before. Oh? Well, then I'll, uh, I'll just put it here on the desk. The sight of it may refresh your memory. You walk into Murray's home to find him on the phone to Eileen Jarvis. You shot him several times and then threw the gun on the floor. It went off, but you left it there. You listened to the phone and you heard the Jarvis girl calling over it. And an idea occurred to you. So you hid somewhere in the place and you waited. Inspector, I must protest. Just listen, please, madam. <laughs> that idea you had paid off very well. You saw Eileen Jarvis come to the house. Or oh, she saw the body and, without thinking, picked up the gun, thus putting her fingerprints on it. Oh, that suited your book very well. Your prints weren't on the gun because you wore gloves. Then Eileen panicked and ran out. She went home and packed, tried to run away. But you'd already guessed that she might do this. So you hired me on a phony assignment to make sure the body was found before Eileen could get away. Oh, really, this is the most absurd story I ever listened to. Do you deny that you are Mrs. David Murray? Well, can I come in, Inspector? Please do, Miss Summers. Hi, Julie. Now, you're just in time to tell Mrs. Murray what you found out about her marrying David Murray in Cornwall. That's the truth. Mr. Tregarning, the minister, was quite sure about that photo I showed him. Is he the old fool? His tongue's too big for his boots. Mrs. Murray, unless you can convince me that what Troy's been suggesting is false, I'm afraid... <laughs> You're not going what? to charge me with any murder? Mrs. Murray, put down that gun. Oh, if any of you tries to stop me, I'll shoot. You can't. The safety catch is on. You can't fool me like that. The safety catch on this gun doesn't work. You shot your husband with that pistol, didn't you, Mrs. Murray? All right. He was a swine for all those women. He never loved me. It was my money he wanted. I'll take that pistol, Mrs. Murray. Stand back. I'll shoot. Oh, no, you won't. It's not loaded. It is. You told me it was. And I know something of guns. I can tell by the weight. The magazine is full. Oh, it's full, all right. Full of dummy cartridges. There's no powder in them. What? Now, come along, oh. Mrs. Murray. I'll take that gun, oh. if you don't mind. <laughs> Thanks for your help, Troy. It's a pleasure, Inspector. A pleasure? Well, it wasn't much pleasure for me. You had me doing all the dirty work and foot slogging while you snatch all the glory. If I don't get a bonus out of this, you will need to walk softly, Peter Troy. <laughs> You think you got the step now, Betty Lou? Yeah. Uh, only I'm not sure. Let's try it once more, Eddie. Okay. I'll set the tempo. You come in after. Ready? Uh-huh. All right. <laughs> 
All right, all right, all right, let's quit. Now, you missed it again. I'm sorry, I, I guess my brains aren't in my feet. Let's try it once more. I won't miss it this time. Well, what's the use of trying it again? So you'll get it this time, you'll miss the next. Oh. I will never make it, Betty Lou. We might as well quit right now. Quit? Sure, quit. Oh, no. Well, what do you think this is, fun? Rehearsing in a joint with no mirror to watch ourselves, no piano, no nothing? Uh. Trying to teach you a sock routine when you can't even do a simple routine. What is this, fun? Well, it isn't fun for me either, Eddie. Well, right now I'm selfish. I'm worried about me. <laughs> right now you stay here and practice that routine. I'm going out for a sand. Oh, bring me one, Eddie. Get it yourself when you're finished. Well, aren't you coming back? I don't know. I ain't sure. Maybe I better make up your mind for you. You're coming back, Eddie. And you aren't going to be too long either. Well, what makes you think so? I'm telling you. That's what makes me think so. Don't try to walk out on me, Eddie. It isn't smart and it isn't healthy. Oh, the sweet little gal's getting tough. I used to be a sweet little gal before I met you. If I'm tough, you made me tough. So don't try walking out, Eddie. Just make sure you come back. Or? Or the next dance you do is going to be at the end of a rope. Hello, Eddie. Hi. What can I get you, Eddie? Draw one for me. Black, Danny. Sure, Eddie. Draw one for you, Black. How's your business, Eddie? Why ask me? Why ask you? Who else would I ask? <laughs> okay. Gee, Eddie, you've been up there in front of people, hoofing, listening to them applaud. That's living, Eddie. That's really living. What happened to the coffee I ordered? Coming up. Hey, how's Betty Lou? She all right? She sure is a swell kid. She's real show business, she is. Gee, how I wish the I could coffee, be... The coffee, Dan, the coffee. Hey, draw one in the dark. Okay, we'll Sometimes at night, I kind of imagine this restaurant is a stage-like, and I'm only acting up being a waiter. I guess that's just another kind of dreaming, isn't it, Eddie? Yeah, I guess. Look, Dan, I got a problem. Now, how about... Uh, room at this table for one more? Oh, hello, Joey. Sure, sit down. Yes. I'll go get you your coffee, Eddie. Hey, aren't you going to wait and see what I'll have? You decide what you want. Yell it out yourself. You ain't in show business. I don't have to wait on you. <laughs> What a character that Dan is, huh, Joey? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Well, how's the dance team going, Eddie? It's going bad. What's going with you? Oh, I got a new little gimmick that's paying off kind of cute. Oh? A guy named Euclid taught it to me. Mathematical trick. Euclid? Euclid? Didn't he do a mind-reading act in Vortel? Uh, Euclid was a Greek. Well, I think this guy I'm talking about was a Greek, too. He worked with a black boy. Euclid's been dead a thousand years. Oh, <laughs> Couldn't be the same guy, then. Yeah, nice figure in it. Uh, now, look at it. Uh, I get a sucker to put any three numbers down on a hunk of paper. Uh, then underneath them, he reverses a number and subtracts. So? Then he gives me the last number of his answer, and I bet him I can tell him the first two. Whoa. Everybody bets. <laughs> Match. They know I didn't look at their numbers, and I collect. Well, are you kidding? That's a cinch. All you gotta do... Shut up. Shut up, hey. or I'll break your neck. What's with you, Joey? All I was doing was telling you how that thing works. Yeah, I The guy used to do it in Vaudeville and showed it to me. Any three numbers, you reverse them. Shut oh, shut up, Eddie. Stop wising up the suckers. I'm good for a couple of hundred bucks a week betting guys on this gimmick. You don't spoil my racket or I'll spoil your kisser. <laughs> No, I'm sorry. I can't talk to him right now. Philo Vance is in my office. Tell him I'll call him back. Bye. I'm sorry, Vance. Where were we? No reason to apologize, Mark. Well, it's... Any time a private investigator drops in to see the district attorney, he expects interruptions. <laughs> uh, we were discussing some complaints you said you'd been getting. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, it seems that some people have called and mentioned a fellow named Joey Sanders who has a mathematical gimmick of some sort. You take any three numbers, reverse them, subtract... Tell him the last number of the answer, and he tells you the first two. How's that done, Max? Oh, it's very simple, Markham. In fact, there's a much cuter trick with four figures. You see, all mathematics is based on the figure nine. Now, remember... I'll be right with you, Vance. I want to hear that. Hello, Markham speaking. Hi, D.A. This is Heath Homicide. Yes, Heath. Got a murder, D.A. Murder? A fellow named Eddie Stone, a dancer. What are the details? I'd been knifed. Found him in a deserted section of town. 
No fingerprints, but we've got one clue. And I'm picking up a girl who was his dancing partner. Name's Betty Lou Taylor. Uh Uh-huh. You want to come down and question her? I'll meet you at your office in an hour. Philo Vance and I were just discussing a mathematical formula. I'm sure he'd much rather figure who killed Eddie Stone. No. No. No, I don't know, Sergeant Heath. I tell you, I don't know who killed Eddie. And I tell you, you do. Now look, Miss Taylor, this is my job. This is my office. I'll keep you here with me all week if I have to. You know something about the murder of Eddie Stone, and I'm going to find out what it is. I don't know anything about it. I danced with him, and that's all. I didn't kill him, and I don't know who did. I know differently. You were at the scene of the murder. We know definitely you were there. I wasn't. I wasn't near the place. I didn't know Eddie was dead until you came for me. Oh, please, leave me alone. I can't tell you anything I don't know. Oh, hello, Mr. Markham. Hello. Hi, Vance. Steve, this is the young lady who told me about on the telephone, Heath. Yeah, yeah. She says she didn't even know the guy was killed. But what she really doesn't know is that we can put her right at the scene of the murder. No. How, Heath? We found a girl's footprint right near the body. That's how. Now, footprint is the same size as this girl's shoe. No. No, no. she says. Yes. Heath, that's hardly conclusive evidence. A footprint of a woman's shoe isn't completely incriminating. This one is, D.A. This girl's a dancer. The footprint we found had a mark on the toe and the heel. You know what made that mark? Toe plates and heel plates. Toe plates and heel plates. Yeah, and who wears toe plates and heel plates? Well... Only a dancer. Now, Miss Taylor, will you still deny that you were at the scene of the murder? Isn't it rather unusual for a dancer to wear her dancing shoes out in the street, Heath? Well, you get... No, Mr. Vance. Not if it's the only pair of shoes she has. I was there. Oh! I saw Eddie's body after he was killed. We'd quarreled and I went out looking for him. And I found him. Dead. I... I lied about it because I wanted to keep out of all this. That's your story. No. You found him and you killed no, him. No, I didn't. Ah, there's no need of you wasting your time here, D.A. I'll have a confession out of this girl in an hour. Friends? Well, apparently Heath doesn't care how I waste my time. I think I'll take a look into this case. What for, Vance? I tell you, this girl did it. Perhaps. But maybe I don't care how I waste my time either, Sergeant Heath. Maybe if I spend a few hours, I can save the state a lot of trouble. You mean all I have to do, Joey, is think of a card, and you'll tell me what the card is? That's right. You can't do it. How much says I can't do it, Sam? A buck. A buck? Are you kidding? No. (laughs) I wouldn't try to read a mouse's mind for a buck. You make it five, and I'll show you something that you never saw before in your life. I never have to tell you the card. All I do is think of it, and you'll tell it to me. Five bucks says I can do it. Okay, you got it. I'm thinking of a card. What is it? Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're going too fast. Okay. Now, first, the card has a number on it. Right. Sure. Take that number, double it. Yep. Add one. Got it. Multiply it by five. Uh, five. Okay, I did it. What's my card? Oh, wait a minute, pal. Relax. You got that number, right? Mm-hmm. Now, if your card's a club, add six. Six. If it's a diamond, add seven. If it's a mm-hmm. heart, add eight. And a spade, add nine. Mm-hmm. Got that? All right. What's the total? Ninety-two. Your card was the eight of diamonds. That's right. Hey, Joey, how'd you do it? (laughs) Come on, tell me. How'd you do that? I'll give you ten bucks if you show me how it's done. Are you kidding? (laughs) Get lost. You dropped a fin to me. What do you want to do? Live here the rest of your life? Now, come on, sucker. Move out before I start. You tell anybody you were coming here? No. I didn't. Okay, stick tight. Who is it? Mrs. Leeds, your landlady. What do you want? My rent's paid. Open the door, Joey, please. Uh, Well? Joey, why don't you be nice to me anymore? Why don't you... Look, you, you, my rent's paid. You want me to move out when my week's up? I move out. What do you want up here? Oh, Joey, don't be mean to me. I don't want you to move. I want you to stay here as long as you want. Oh, let me come in, Joey. Oh. Uh, so finally you see that I got company, huh? Oh, Congratulations. Honey. What's keeping you here now? Please come out in the hall. This is important. Oh, okay. Wait here, Sammy. Sure. Uh, 
Uh, well, what is it that's so important? Joey, Eddie Stone has been murdered. I just heard about it on the radio. Oh. What makes you think that concerns oh, me? You don't have to talk like that to me, Joey. I wouldn't say anything, never. Well, that's better. Wild horses couldn't drag it out of me that you and Eddie had a fight today. Eddie, you, you know about that, huh? Oh, sure, but I wouldn't say anything about it, Joey. I wouldn't say a okay, word. Okay, okay. I'll get rid of the sap inside. Come back to see me in an hour. <laughs> Mike's Coffee Shop, Danny speaking. Hello, this is District Attorney Markham. D -d District Attorney? Yes, District Attorney. Look, is there a man in your shop named Philo Vance? There isn't anybody in my place right now, Mr. Markham, not a soul. Well, Vance is on his way there with a young lady named Betty Lou Taylor. Betty Lou? Yes, do you know her? Well, sure I know her. She's in show business, ain't she? If anybody's in show business, I know them, believe me. Very well, I believe you. Now, look, this Miss Taylor has been released in Vance's custody. Yeah. I know they've gone to your shop. I want you to have Vance call the minute he comes in. Sure thing, Mr. Markham, sure thing. Bye. Danny. Hey, Joey, you scared me. What's the idea of sneaking up on a guy when he's on a telephone? Gee, you scared me. Danny, listen to me. I'm listening to you, Joey, and I am listening. Okay. Keep your ears open and your trap shut, Danny. Hey, quit it. You bend on my apron. I only just put it on. Danny, anybody comes in here and asks if Eddie Stone and I had a fight this morning, you say we didn't. You hear? Yeah. Now, get me. We didn't have any argument. Sure you didn't. I didn't hear any argument. Of course, I saw you slug him twice, but... You didn't see me clip him. You didn't see nothing. You better cut it out, Joey. Somebody's coming oh. in. So this is the place where Eddie Stone used to hang out, Miss Taylor. Uh -huh, and that's Dan the waiter right there. Hello, Danny. Hello, Miss Taylor. Hi. Gee, I was sorry to hear about them arresting you. If you ever need anything, if you ever need a friend to stand by you, just count on me. Well, so long, Danny. I'll be seeing you. Just a moment, my friend. Huh? My name is Philo Vance. Did you by any chance happen to know Eddie Stone? Eddie Stone? Let me see. Yeah, yeah, I think I did. A dancer, wasn't he? A dancer, wasn't he? He was the best dancer in show business. Present company accepted, of course, Miss Taylor. Well, thanks. Uh, this is Joey Sanders, Mr. Vance. He knew Eddie. He knows everybody. Joey Sanders. I know that name. Well. You're the young man who's been the cause of a lot of complaints at the district attorney's office. Well, I'm flattered. Something about swindling people with a mathematical trick. The very old three-number routine. Hey, that's no swindle. I bet I can't name the first two numbers in their answer. I bet I can. Sometimes they win, sometimes I win. Yes, of course, I know. That trick is awfully old and completely foolproof. If you take any three numbers, reverse them and subtract them, yeah. the answer will always have a nine in the center, and the first and third numbers will add up to nine. Oh, so that's how it's done. Gee, no kidding. Gee, he's smart. God. Thank you, Dan. Now, suppose Miss Taylor and I escort you over to that table there, Mr. Sanders, where we can talk. About what? Eddie Stone's murder. You see, I think I know who killed Stone. Hey, you're... Uh... Vance, that's Dan. He's making a break for the door. Never mind. I'm nearer to him. I'll get him. Joe, he's stopping Dan. Oh, no. I got him, Vance. I think I knocked him out when I tackled him oh, and his head hit the floor. Yes, I imagine you did. Well, I guess you owe me one now, Vance. You said you knew who killed Stone. Well, this Dan character made a break, and I grabbed him for you. You most certainly did. But I don't think I owe you anything. I don't remember ever saying that Dan here was the man I thought murdered Eddie Stone. This is District Attorney Markham. Our current murder case opened with the knifing of Eddie Stone, dancer. His partner, Betty Lou Taylor, has been picked up and released. And Vance, in an attempt to track down the killer, has made the acquaintance of Joey Sanders, a small-time swindler. Something about a restaurant called Mike's Coffee Shop and Dan, the waiter there, seem to intrigue Vance. And he and I are approaching the place right now. What is there about this Dan that intrigues you, Vance? A lot of things. First of all, I want to know why he tried to get out of that coffee shop when I said I knew the murderer of Eddie Stone. Oh, do you know who killed Stone? No. Believe me, it wouldn't surprise me if you did. Nothing you do surprises me anymore. <laughs> Sorry to hear that, Markham. <laughs> However, I promise you, you won't be able to say that with any honesty very soon. Won't I? You know why I said I knew who killed Stone. Uh, to see the reaction of Joey Sanders and Dan. Exactly. Yeah. Well, this is the shop, and in one moment we'll be talking... What was... What... what? Vance, somebody threw this coffee cup through the window. Somebody inside the shop. Come on, Marker. I'm with you, Vance. That's Dan, the waiter over there with his head on the counter. Yeah. Oh. Oh. What happened in here? 
What happened? Oh, my head, my Steady head. Now. Dan, remember me, Mr. Vance? My head. This is District Attorney Markham. We were outside when that coffee cup went through the window. Oh, I throw it. A man wearing a handkerchief over his face was in here. He held me up, took the money out of the register. I threw the cup through the window, grabbed him. Yes, yes. He hit me on the head with the gun and went out the back way. Do you recognize him? Well, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. I want to think it over. We'll report this to headquarters. One thing is certain, Vance, this holdup has nothing to do with the murder case we're working on. Hasn't it, Markham? I don't think so. You said I couldn't surprise you anymore. Try this for a surprise. The holdup has a great deal to do with the murder, and will have a great deal more to do with solving it. You don't like me, do you, Betty? You really can read minds, can't you, Jim? Hey, now, wait a minute. Take it easy. I didn't come over to hear you insult me. Only way for you to stop that is to leave. I got a business proposition for you, Betty. No, thanks. But this is honest. Oh. And look what Eddie did. What are you going to do? You got to do something. Yeah, that's true enough. Now, this is what I got in mind. Shoot. I'll teach you card code. You stay here in your place, and I'll be out with a sucker. Yeah. I bet him I can dial a phone number, hmm? then have him show me a card... And the voice on the other end of the phone will say what that card is. Huh? <laughs> this is how it works. Yeah. The phone rings, you answer it. Uh-huh. Now, instead of saying hello, you say clubs, diamonds, hearts, well, till I stop you by saying hello. Okay. Now, right away, if I stopped you when you were saying hearts, you know the card the sucker's showing me is a heart. Yeah. Uh, but how do I tell the number? Well, as soon as you know the suit, you start to count. One, two, three, four, you know, like that. All the way up to the king. I got you. Now, when you get to the right number, I'll say, wait a minute, hand the phone to the sucker, and you tell him his card. Oh. <laughs> it's a sense. It's a sense. We'll clean up. Oh, it isn't bad at that. Yeah, see what I told you? Now, aren't you glad I come over? Sure. But you're not going to be so happy. I don't need you to work that gimmick with. All I need is some stews to stand by a telephone. You wouldn't kid around with me, Betty Lou. No? Well, you wouldn't do anything about it, Joey. You wouldn't dare. What? The cops have it in for you right now, and I have an idea Philo Vance thinks you killed Eddie. Well, maybe what you say is so. But all I got to tell you, kid, is this. What? You try and use that code I taught you, and you'll get what your ex-partner got. Joey, please. Not now, not now. Leave me alone, oh, will you? Oh, Joey. Ain't you got anything to do but follow me up these steps? Oh, please, Joey. What doesn't run in this room and house keep you busy enough? All right, Joey, all right. Oh. All I wanted to tell you was that there was a fellow in your room. I let him in. What? You did what? I let him in. He asked for you, so I opened the door and let him wait. What'd he look like? Come on, talk. Oh, tell Joey. me. Was he a tall fellow, good looking? Philo Vance? Who? Vance. No, no, it was the same fella you had in here yesterday, the fella Sammy. Oh, oh, that's different. Uh, Look, I'll come downstairs when I'm through with him. Wait for me. All right, Joey. Uh, Hello, Sammy. Hello, Joey. You don't mind me coming here, do you? Well, it all depends on why you're here. Well, Joey, listen, I've been a fall guy for you for a month now, betting you on things and always losing. Give me a chance to get my dope back. How do you mean? Well, show me how you do that thing where I think of a card, then you tell me to add and multiply and everything, and then you say what the card it is. Let me get my dope back from some other sucker. Oh, is that what you want? Yeah. Well, go away, Sammy. Get lost. Not a chance. But I just... I hope I'm interrupting something. Vant, what do you want here? I want to talk to you. Who's your friend? You're a cop. I'm no friend of his. I just came here to get him to tell me how a trick was done so I could get some of my dope back. Shut up, you. What trick? Tells me to think of a card, double it, Add one, multiply it by five. And if it's a club, add six. A diamond, add seven. A heart, eight, and a spade, nine. That's right. Mm Mm-hmm. And he gets me to tell him the total, and he tells me the card. I'll teach you that. In fact, I think I'll give it to the newspapers so that nobody will ever bet it can't be done. The things guys who've got nothing to do think of. Don't like that, do you? Well, how's it done? It's a mathematical formula. Whatever the total is gives you the card. If the total ends in a one, the card is a club. If it ends in a two, it's a diamond. Uh-huh. Three, it's a heart, and four, it's a spade. Uh-huh. Uh, how do you find the figure? Whatever the first number is, you subtract one. Understand? Oh. In other words, if the total is 64... The card is the the five of spades. Right. Nice wise and up a sucker, Vance. You could be thrown out of the union for that. I know. 
Joey, I came here because I just learned about a fight you had with Eddie Stone the day he was killed. Oh, Dan told you, huh? Okay, so I clipped him a couple of times. What'd you come up here for, to pay me back? Uh, I better get out of here. You stay. Okay. No, Joey, I didn't come here to slap you around, although I'd enjoy that very much. Big talk. I just want to warn you not to leave town, at least for the next few hours. After that, after I prove what I'm going to in that time... District Attorney Markham may have a specially prepared itinerary for you. What time is it, Heath? It's almost time, D.A., pretty nearly. Another 30 seconds. We've got to do this exactly on schedule. Vance left explicit instructions. And after we do, then what? Then we'll know who killed Eddie Stone, and what's more, we'll have proof. Mm, 20 seconds, D.A. All right. You ready, Miss Henderson? Yes, sir. Uh, that secretary of yours is always ready, D.A. She's solid. <laughs> I hope that means something good. <laughs> it sure does. <laughs> oh, okay, D.A., now. Pick up the phone and make the call, Miss Henderson. Yes, sir. I sure hope this works. I hope Vance doesn't get into trouble. We're miles away and can't help him. Shh. Mike's Coffee Shop. Dan speaking. Hello, Dan. This is Betty Lou Taylor. Miss Taylor? Gosh, hello, Miss Taylor. I have a cold, and my voice may sound different, but, Dan, I want you to meet me right away. Well, gee whiz, what for? Oh, for a lot of reasons. I think the police are going to figure out you staged the phony holdup in the store to get getaway money for yourself. I think, I'm pretty sure they're going to know you killed Eddie. What are you talking about? Eddie Lou. Yeah? That was somebody pretending to be you. What? That's what? right. Somebody said they were you. How could they know I faked the hold up and that I killed Eddie? That was the cops. The cops or Philo Vance. It wasn't Philo what? Vance, my friends. I've been here all the time. Mr. Vance, how'd you get here? I've been in here for quite some time, hiding, of course. What? What are you doing at that telephone? Who are you calling? Nobody. But if you object to my being near the phone, I'll move away. There. That better? What do you want, Vance? You realize I heard enough of the conversation between you and Betty Lou while I was in hiding to know that you killed Eddie Stone, Dan. Well, what if I did? Sure, I killed Eddie Stone, and I faked the whole up. Dan! What's the difference if I tell him that? He knows it already. It isn't going to do him any good. What he knows and what he can prove are two different things. What was the idea of that phone call, Vance? It was a trap. I knew it would make you talk, and it did. So you listen. Only it's our word against yours. See if you can prove I killed Eddie. Go ahead. I don't have to prove it, Dan. You've done it already. Oh, yeah? The district attorney has your confession in your own words. What do you mean? Let's get down to see him, and you can hear yourself confess to murder. He couldn't hear me just now. I hung up the phone myself. Yeah, that connection was broken when Dan hung up. Was it? Hmm. In that case, suppose you come down to Markham's office and find out how he heard Dan confess. <laughs> the switch on that playback machine, Markham. I want to hear this before I bring Dan and Betty Lou in here. Certainly, Vance. Here's the part you want. Well, what if I did? Sure, I killed Eddie Stone, and I faked the holdup. Dan! What's the difference if I tell him that? He knows it already. It isn't going to do him any good. What he knows and what he can prove are two different things. What was the off, idea Martin? of that phone right. call, Vance? Well, there's his confession in his own voice, Vance, just as you promised. Yes, there it is. Now, why did he kill Stone? Well, he idolized Betty Lou. She probably goaded him into killing Stone and was threatening to walk out on her. Yes. She even went along to see that the job was done. That's why her footprint was at the scene of the murder. You never forgot that, did you, Vance? No, I knew it was important all the time. But I had to resort to a trick to get the proof we needed. I still don't understand how you got Dan to confess in front of a telephone connected with this office so we could record his words. He didn't know I had taken the phone off the hook, Markham. And even if he did know it, he wouldn't have realized that the connection between this office and the coffee shop wasn't broken just because he had hung up. I wouldn't have realized it either. In order for a connection to be broken, both parties have to disconnect. Try it sometime and see. Oh. The connection must be discontinued at both ends. <laughs> if you say so, it's so, Vance. <laughs> and the only end I'm interested in right now is that this is the end of the mathematical murder case. <laughs> New 
post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, are you going to break into this apartment? I don't have to, Patsy. Sally gave me her key. Oh, gee, you think of everything, don't you? I sure I do. Okay, come on in. Uh Uh-huh. Well, this is certainly a pleasant living room. Nothing sinister here. Uh huh. Looks as though there are two bedrooms, too. Wonder whether this one is Mary's. Let's see what. Oh! Great Scott! Nick! This girl's been shot through the temple. Oh, Nick, I wonder if she. Somebody just came in the front door. It's all right, Miss Carlyle. It's. And now, the case of the quiet roommate. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It's late in the afternoon, and Nick and Patsy are in the lavish office of John Fenrus, president of the Fenrus department store. I'm glad you brought Miss Bone to the store with you, Mr. Carter. She'll understand this business. You said you were being annoyed by a blackmailer, Mr. Fenrus. Precisely. A girl who worked here until last Saturday night is trying to shake me down for a lot of money. You were involved with her? Of course not. Nothing of the sort. Then what's the trouble? Our fashion designs are being stolen. Oh, you mean that the clothes sold in the Fenrath store are exclusive? A great many of them are, Miss Bone. Two years ago, I hired Jerry Bartlett, one of the best-dressed designers in the business, to create designs exclusively for the Fenrath store. Well, I knew Fenrath models couldn't be bought anywhere else in town. Yeah, but that's the point. They can be now. Oh? The cut-rate stores have our exclusive styles at markdown prices before we even put them on sale here. That can't be very profitable. Profitable? We've lost a fortune. And this girl says she knows how our fashions are being pirated and who's responsible for it. And she won't tell you who it is? Tell me. She has the gall to ask $2,500 for the information. Then you want me to find out who's stealing your design? No. I want you to force Mary Danville to give me that information. Without paying for it, you mean? I have a right to know. And it's her duty to tell me without blackmailing me. I want you to scare her. Scaring girls is out of my line, Mr. Fenris. You want me to investigate your problem? Oh, so you want to run up a lot of investigating fees, do you? Well, I won't fall for it. I'm not asking you to fall for anything. I'm responsible to the board of directors for every dollar I spend. It isn't my money. It's your store, isn't it? Well, it was my father's store. Now it belongs to a great many people. And they expect me to show a profit. I can't throw money away on detectives. Well, it's probably just as well, Mr. Fenders. I don't think I'd enjoy working for you anyway. Mr. Carter, if my secretary were here, I'd have, I'd have her show you out. Oh, we can find our way out. Come on, Patsy. With pleasure. Mr. Fenris. Miss Carlyle, do you think my office is a public waiting room? Miss Drake isn't at her desk, and I have to see you. Just the same. What you do to Mary Danville is none of my business. But when you start ransacking my apartment, just because... Control you... yourself, Miss Carlyle. I've done no such thing. Then if you didn't do it, you hired someone to. Your accusations are in particularly bad taste in front of outsiders, Miss Carlyle. Oh, don't worry about us, Mr. Fenris. This young lady's outburst hasn't changed my opinion of you a bit. I think I'd like to talk to Miss Carlyle privately, though. I forbid it. Oh, you do? I certainly do. This man's a detective, Miss Carlyle. Fine. Mr. Detective, if you'll come down to the Fenris exclusive shop, I'd like very much to talk to you privately. <laughs> Well, I didn't imagine you'd have a private office like this, Miss Carlyle. Oh, yes, Mr. Carter. I'm in charge of the Fenrus exclusive shop. But with a job like that, I should think you'd be afraid to antagonize Mr. Fenrus. Wouldn't you hate to be fired? He won't fire me, Miss Bowen. What makes you so sure? Because Mr. Fenrus is the only person in the world who would have any reason for ransacking the apartment that Mary and I share. He wants the information Mary has. Hmm. Do you have it too, Miss Carlyle? No. But if I did, I'd do exactly what she's doing. I'd make him pay for it. Hmm. Uh, Was the lock on your apartment door broken? No, it wasn't. But somebody had been there because Mary's wardrobe trunk had been turned inside out and my room had been all torn up, too. Was anything stolen? Nothing of mine, and Mary says Fenris didn't find what he was after. I see. Miss Connell, you said Mary Danville hasn't told you what she knows about the fashion thefts. Are you and your roommate on friendly terms? Yes, of course. 
I got the store to hire her, and I also saw to it that she was pushed ahead. But she still doesn't trust you enough to tell you. That is not the point. She said I'd be better off not knowing. That what she discovered was dynamite. Look, Miss Carlyle, I don't want to alarm you. But can you get a room for yourself and marry Danville at a hotel for a few nights? Why, uh, well, I suppose so. Then I'd do it if I were you. I wouldn't let anybody know where I was staying. But everything's happened while I've been here at the store. Nobody would dare to try anything while Mary and I were at home. I'm not too sure of that. Is Mary at your apartment now? I think so. Why? I want to talk to her, and I'd also like to examine your apartment. Do you want me to take you there now? No, I want you to line up a hotel room. Besides, Patsy and I may do better talking to Mary alone. If you think she... I don't think anything yet, Miss Carlyle, except that you may not find it healthy to stay in your apartment. All right, Mr. Carter, I'll do whatever you say. <laughs> somebody in there, Nick. Maybe she's afraid to open the door. Miss Danville, Sally Carlisle sent us. I'm Nick Carter, a private investigator. <laughs> Look, Miss Danville, I know you're in there because I heard you moving around. <laughs> I guess she isn't going to let us in, Nick. I'm going to camp right here on your doorstep till you open this door, Miss Danville. I'm here to help you if I can. <laughs> Well, now, you're being sensible. I don't know you. What? Miss Bone and I would like you to tell us what you can about your apartment being searched for you recently. Sally Carlisle told us about it, Miss Danville. Nick and I are here to investigate. So if you'll let us in? Uh, I'm in a hurry right now. I, I have a date. Couldn't you come back some other time? I'm afraid this can't wait, Miss Danville. But I can't talk... There's one thing I want particularly to know. Was anything stolen from your wardrobe trunk? No. Miss Carlyle thinks Mr. Fenrus did the searching. So what? Well, do you have any idea? Uh, look, Mr. What's-Your-Name, I told you I'm in a hurry. I'm late for my date now. And, and... Is your date with a gentleman friend? Oh, yes, my date's with a man. Then we'll just talk to you here outside your door till he arrives. But I'm to meet him downstairs in the lobby. Oh? Your callers meet you in the lobby, do they? Look, I don't know you. Maybe you're a detective and maybe you're not. But until Sally's here to say you're okay, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm ready to leave, and I'm going right now. You're making a mistake, Miss Danville. Maybe, maybe not. But don't try to follow me down to the lobby. If you do, I'll... I'll call the police. Very well. We won't even go down in the same elevator with you. Go right ahead. That's what I intend to do. Nick, aren't you going to follow her? No. I'm going to wait here and see what she does. Well, what do you expect her to do? Let's see if you were Miss Danville. Would you leave two strangers standing in front of your door after a conversation like the one we've just had? Why, that all depends. Depends nothing. You'd meet your boyfriend in the lobby and then get right back up here to see what's going on. Well, if you ask me, I don't think she has a date. You don't? No. And if she did, it wasn't with a man. Well, why do you say that? Well, she didn't powder her nose and it was shiny. And her lipstick wasn't on straight. No, Nick. I have a feeling she just wanted to get away from this apartment as fast as she could. Hey, maybe you're right. Mm. Come on, let's get inside and see what was bothering her. What? Oh, Nick, you aren't going to break into that apartment, are you? Don't have to. Sally Carlisle gave me her key. Oh, gee, you think of everything, don't you? That's right, dear. All right, come on. Right, right. Well, it's certainly a pleasant living room. Nothing sinister here. Mm-hmm. Looks as though there were two bedrooms. I wonder which one is Mary Danville. Well, not this one. At least I wouldn't think so. Why not? Because the picture's on the vanity. And you'd hardly have your own picture in your room. <laughs> Good girl. <laughs> So Mary Danville's room must be the other one. Of course. Well, let's see what's there. Great Scott! Nick! No wonder Mary wanted to get away. This girl on the floor. She's been shot through the temple. Nick, do you suppose... Quiet. Uh... Somebody just came in the front door. Let's listen. Maybe we can hear something. Okay. Who's there? Who is it? Wait here, Sally. No, Jerry, don't. Let's get out of here and call the police. Nonsense. Whoever you are, come on out or I'll shoot. All right, Miss Carlyle, it's... Oh, Jerry, you fool, that's the detective. Oh, Mr. Carter, are you hurt? Not a bit, Miss Carlyle, but tell your trigger-happy friend to quit pointing that revolver at me. Oh, I'm sorry, old fellow, but I, I was nervous. After what's been happening here, well, I... It's good most people can't hit anything with a revolver. This is Jerry Bartlett, our fashion designer, Nick Carter, and his secretary, Miss Bowen. Uh, how do you do? I'm awfully sorry I frightened you, but I, I was... Excited. I thought I told you not to come back here, Miss Carlyle. I know, but I got to thinking about Mary Danville and... Well, if it was dangerous for me to be here, it was dangerous for her, too. So I came up to get her. Well, she just left a few minutes ago. Oh, I see. 
Well, in that case, Jerry, I suppose we might as well leave, too. Right. Just a minute, Miss Carlyle. Did you see your roommate in the lobby just now? In the lobby? No. Well, there's somebody else in this apartment, in one of the bedrooms. You mean you've caught our mysterious visitor? Oh, that's wonderful. But who is... Suppose you take a look. That's a good idea. <gasps> oh, no. No. Recognize her, Miss Carlyle? Of course we recognize her. But that's Mary Danville. What? You mean this murdered girl is your roommate? Oh, yes. But why would anyone... Mr. Carter, you've got to catch her murderer. You've got to. I think I did catch her murderer, Miss Carlyle. But I let her get away. <laughs> Mary Danville was apparently murdered by the girl who made a cool, daring getaway. But the fugitive's picture is on Sally Carlisle's vanity, so we should know who she was in just a moment. Now back to The Case of the Quiet Roommate, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. The scene is Sally Carlisle's bedroom, and Nick stares grimly at the photograph he's removed from Sally's dressing table. This is a picture of the girl who left your apartment just as we arrived. Who is she, Miss Carlyle? Why, well, that's Dorothy Drake. Is she a particularly good friend of yours? Well, she gave me the picture, and she stops in to see me once in a while, that's all. She's Fenris's secretary, so everybody in the store tries to get in solid with her. Oh, I see. Well, I think she can give him a boost with Fenris. Do you really have that much influence with him? Well, if I think I'll have trouble getting Fenris to okay one of my fashion designs, I try to sell Dorothy on it first. If it's okay with her, he'll take it. Oh, then she gets to see your designs before they're approved? Well, sure she does. Uh Uh-huh. Who else sees them? Well, Fenris, of course, and Sally here. Oh, yes, I see them, too. You think this Dorothy Drake would commit murder to help Fenris? You said she was here in this apartment when you got here, didn't you? Yes, she was. Well, I don't see why you let her get away. She told us she was Mary Danville. We had no reason to doubt her. But she doesn't look the least bit like Mary. Don't forget, Miss Carlyle, I never saw Mary Danville before. And we didn't find Mary's body until after Dorothy Drake had left. She must have killed Mary. All you have to do is find her. You know where she lives? Well, sure, there's no secret about that. Over on Prince Street. But she won't be there. Mary must have known that she was the fashion thief. Oh, just a minute, Miss Carlyle. We can't assume that she's guilty of Mary's murder or of the fashion thefts either. You and Mr. Bartlett and Mr. Fenris all had access to the fashion designs. But if she isn't guilty, why did she run away? We don't know that she has run away. If she's smart, we'll find her at home. Let's see if she is smart. All right, all right, come in. You don't seem surprised to see us, Miss Drake. I knew you'd be here after me. Well, are you coming in? Thanks. We are. I suppose you found Mary's body? We did. And I suppose you expect me to say I didn't kill her? Naturally. And I suppose you won't believe me when I do. Well, you lied to us at Sally Carlyle's apartment. Of course I lied. I was frightened. I just found Mary's body. You mean she was dead when you went into her apartment? Yes, she was. And how did you get in? I... I, I had a key. Where'd you get it? That's none of your business. Solving murders is my business, Miss Drake, and unless you give me some straight answers, I'm going to escort you down to headquarters. I wouldn't try that if I were you. Why not? I'll sue you for false arrest, and I'll collect. You seem pretty sure of yourself. You'll find out how sure I am if you try to make trouble for me. You think Mr. Fenris will back you up, huh? I wouldn't count on that if I were you. No? Look, if you're going to take that attitude, Miss Drake, I'll have to show you I'm not bluffing. Come on. Come on where? To headquarters. Where do you think? Now, look, you can't I certainly can. And if you won't come willingly with me, I'll have Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Squad here within ten minutes. You just try it and see what'll happen. Very well. Where's the telephone, Miss Drake? It's in the hall, Nick. Fine. Call Maddie, will you? Right. No! Don't you dare! Walter! Mr. Carter. Well? If I were you, I wouldn't make any phone calls until I knew what I was doing. Why, Mr. Fenrod... I won't have my secretary, myself, or the store mixed up in a murder scandal, Carter. And if you do it, I'll run you right out of business. What are you doing here, Fenris? He came because I called him as soon as I got away from Mary Danville's apartment. Okay, now that we're back to that, Miss Drake, I still want to know why you went there. She was following orders, Carter. Your orders? Naturally. I was entitled to the information the Danville girl said she had, and I was going to get it. Even if you had to steal it. Her attempt to extort money from me was outside the law. You have to fight fire with fire. So you gave Miss Drake the key to Miss Danville's apartment? I did. Where did you get it? We have a key shop in the basement of our store. 
I borrowed Sally Carlyle's key from her locker long enough to have a duplicate made. Did you borrow it with Sally's permission? I told you. You have to fight... I know. You have to fight fire with fire. Okay, so you had Miss Drake sneak into Miss Danville's apartment. What was she supposed to steal? Mary Danville claimed she had a package of correspondence that proved the identity of the fashion thief. I wanted it. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You say you sent your secretary to get the letters Mary Danville had? I did. But before she'd had any chance to let you know whether she got them or not, you called me and asked me to get them. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. I had no intention of hiring you. From what I'd heard about you, I was quite sure you wouldn't take the job. Suppose I'd said I would. I'd have found some excuse for not hiring you. Then why did you call me? That's really very simple, Carter. If Miss Drake had been successful in getting those letters, Mary Danville would have immediately accused me of having her apartment burglarized. But I would have been in a position to deny it. How? I could have proved that I was trying to hire a detective to get the letters for me at the very time somebody else was actually getting them. Very clever, Fenris. And now you've put your secretary right on the spot. He has not. I was... You were in the apartment with Mary Danville's body when we found you, Mr. Rick, and you admit why you were there. But that doesn't mean By the way, I... did you get the letters? No. When I saw Mary's body, I didn't even stop to look for them. I think perhaps you did. What? I think perhaps you found them and didn't want Mr. Fenris to know you found them. You're accusing Miss Drake of being the fashion thief, and that's preposterous. Mary Danville's murder is preposterous, too, Fenris. But it happened. Just the same. Did anybody else except Miss Drake check out at the store just before the murder? Yes. Sally Carlyle took an extra hour at lunchtime because she said she was nervous about her apartment and wanted to go home to check things. How about Jerry Bartlett? Say, I remember now. What? He came in while you were out, Mr. Fenris, and said he wanted an hour off to attend to some personal business, and I told him it would be all right. So nobody's eliminated. Well, looks as though our first job is to find those letters. But where are you going to look for them? I don't know, Mr. Fenris, but I'm going to start looking just the same. And when I get any information, you can be sure I'll let you know. Miss Bowen, what's the idea of summoning all of us here to Carter's office in this high-handed manner? He has some information for you. He isn't even here. He said he'd be delayed a bit, Mr. Fenris. Delayed? Doesn't he know my time's valuable? Should we go back to the store, Mr. Fenris? You can go back if you like, but I'm staying right here. Oh, you are, are you? We'll see about that. I'm staying, too. Mr. Carter must have had an important reason for asking us to come here. The only thing that's important to me is to find out who's been stealing our fashion design. You mean murder doesn't bother you? Mary Danville was outside the law, Miss Bone. She deserved what she got. Did Carter say how soon he'd be here? I'm sorry. He didn't. Just the same, we'll wait until he gets here. All of us. This is an outrage. We've been here nearly two hours. And I refuse to submit to such treatment any longer. Where is Carter, anyway? I'm sure I don't know, Mr. Fenris. All he said over the phone the last time he called... I know. He said to tell us to wait. Well, I'm not going to wait any longer. I'll bet you are. Your curiosity wouldn't let you do anything else. What the devil's he up to, anyway? Oh, Miss Board wouldn't tell, even if she knew, Jerry. Always not to reason why. Always just to wait. Hi, everybody. Well, it's about time, Carter. Do you realize you've kept us waiting here? Yes, Mr. Fenris, I've kept you waiting about two hours. Well, your explanation better be good. I'm a busy man. My explanation's very good. I intended to keep you people waiting here when I called you. Why, of all the colossal nerve... I had to get you here so I could search your homes without being disturbed. You mean you... I mean I've made a thorough search, Miss Drake, with the full approval of the police department. I'll... I'll have you thrown into jail. I'll have you... Calm down, calm down, Mr. Fenris. You said the proper way to fight fire was with fire, remember? I confound you. You were interested in results, Fenris. Well, I've got results right here in this package. What's in it? The letters that cost Mary Danville her life, all ready to be turned over to the police. Have you read them? I haven't even examined them. I thought I'd prefer to do that with everyone present. Well, why wait any longer, then? I don't intend to wait. No, I'll take care of this. Nobody's going to frame me. Nick, he's got a gun. So I see. Has anyone accused you of anything, Mr. Bartlett? No, and nobody's going to. Well, as long as you have that gun in your hand, I suppose you're right. You just keep away from me if you don't want this gun to go off. Now, let's see these letters. Why, they aren't the letters at all. Carter's trying to trick us. Quite right, Mr. Fenris. They're fakes. I didn't even look for the letters. What? You You didn't look for them? No, I didn't. Mr. Fenris, how did you know these letters are fakes? Why? You said you'd never seen the letters, and yet you know at once these aren't genuine. How about that? 
Carter, are you accusing me of something? Yes. I'm accusing you of Mary Danville's murder. That's utterly ridiculous. You don't think I'd steal my own fashions, do you? They aren't your fashions. That's just the point, Venris. They aren't your fashions. Now, see here. You're president of the store because of your name, because your father founded the business. The money you made stealing those fashions and selling them was probably more than your salary. So Fenris murdered Mary, then deliberately sent me to her apartment so that if anything went wrong, I'd be the suspect. Miss Drake, don't be a fool. I'm not anymore. I'm getting smart. The rest of us had to check out before we could leave the store, but you didn't. And I'm the only one who knows you weren't around the store at the time of the murder. Nick, that's right. She said Mr. Fenris was out. So she told Jerry Bartley it would be all right for him to leave. Look, Carter, it may be news to you, but there aren't any letters. There aren't? No. Mary and I worked out that scheme because I thought Fenris suspected me. What scheme? Well, you see, it was like this. I, I paid Mary to quit her job and make Fenris that proposition. My professional reputation was at stake, and I thought I could get the fashion thief to show his hand that way. If you knew there weren't any letters, why did you pull that gun? Well, I, I got excited, I guess. I knew there weren't any letters, and then when you showed up with a whole bundle of them, I, I figured I was being framed with fake letters. I wasn't going to stand for that. Oh, you've all lost your senses. You're leaving that fantastic story about hiring Mary Danville. Look at him with his gun in his hand. Jerry, look out! Oh, oh, I, That's quick enough, Bartlett. I'll you... try to get your gun back, not unless you want a slug in the heart. And that goes for all of you. <laughs> Mr. Fenrus, covering the group with the revolver he grabbed from Bartlett, edges his way toward the door of Nick Carter's office. We'll see what happens in just a moment. And now for the conclusion of The Case of the Quiet Roommate, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Mr. Fenrus, revolver in one hand, reaches for the door of Nick's office with the other. So you thought Mary Danville knew you'd been selling those fashion designs, huh, Fenris? And that's why you killed her? Yes. I thought she was all set to blackmail me for the rest of my life. It's Bartlett's fault that I killed her. Oh, I, you, you can't hang the blame on me, Fenris. And you can't leave this office either. Try to stop me. See what happens to you. I have a trick lock on the door to prevent just such things. But, Nick... I snapped the secret catch when I came into the room. You'll never be able to find it, Fenris. Thanks for telling me, Carter. In that case, I'll let you find it for me. Oh, no, no dice. You don't have any choice... Get over here and open this door or I'll blow your head off. Well. I mean it. Okay. I guess you got me. Get it open. And be quick about it. All right, all right. Take it easy, Fenris. I can't be quick about it. First you twist the door handle slightly to the left like this. And a full turn to the right like this. Don't try any funny business, Carter. I'm right behind you. And I'm ready to pull the trigger if I have to. I'm sure you are. Now you turn the doorknob to the left again. And open it. Oh, wait. Right, give me the gun, Fenris. Give it to me before I break your arm. You tricked me. You slammed the door into me. And I'm going to slam my left fist right into your face if you don't drop that gun. You. All right. I've got it, Connor. All right, good. Hold on to it this time. I didn't want to kill Mary Danville. I thought I had to do it. I'm sorry I can't sympathize with you. You tricked me, Carter. How did you know? I didn't know, Fenris. Didn't have any idea of who was guilty. But you remember what I said about guilty people running away? But... That's why I arranged this meeting, to give the murderer a chance to try to run away. And it worked. But if there weren't any letters, Nick, if Mary Danville didn't have any letters... There were letters, Patsy. There, there... But she didn't have them. The letters were from Fenris to the people who bought the fashion designs from him. Yes. They wouldn't buy unless I gave them something to put them in the clear in case the store ever brought any suits against them. I thought she got hold of those letters in some way. But you acted as though you thought I was double-crossing you. Oh, you had me half crazy. I had to accuse someone, didn't I? And you're still trying to justify yourself, aren't you? The store should have been mine. I only got a small part of what I deserved. Well, starting right now, Fenris, you're going to get more than a small part of what you deserve. You're going to get the works. Well, Nick, let's hear something about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week. Mike, it started when Patsy and I went on a visit to another city and were greeted by a welcoming committee. A welcoming committee with uh, machine guns, no less. See, I went there to look for a gangster, but I spent most of my time looking for Patsy. Um, you see, Mike, I found the gangster first, and uh, I was sorry I ever did, believe me. Yeah, Patsy pretended to be a gunball. 
He played the part entirely too well for her own safety. It sounds as though we're in for an exciting half hour, Nick. What do you call this adventure? I call it The Case of the Great Impersonation. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by George B. Anderson. Original music is played by Henry Silvern. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. With millions of additional children entering our schools during the next few years, the nation faces serious educational handicaps. Inferior education for our boys and girls may damage our prosperity, our traditions of freedom, our security. That's why we urge every adult to work with local civic groups and school boards to help improve educational conditions. Show by your interest and friendliness that you appreciate the importance of your children's teachers. They mold our nation's future. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.